I was driving from Tucson to Denver in the middle of the night. Got tired and was pulling off and crawl in a sleeping bag in the desert, far away from the Tuling blacktop. I was on Highway 666. It's since been renamed because everyone was sealing their signs. Anyway, I pull off the road onto a dirt road and then a little further. I kind of hid the truck behind some vegetation and tossed down a sleeping bar and pad in the middle of the pitch black, huge New Mexico starry night. There was no one around, no light, nothing at all. Hardly any visibility for miles. I'm completely alone in the pitch darkness. Nothing. I'm getting wound down, my eyes getting droopy. That's when I hear it. It sounds goofy to say, but it's the same Indian music you hear in old black and white westerns. Native music, voices and drums. I literally think I'm dreaming. And when it starts, I'm petrified because that noise is just appearing out of nothing. And it simply put ice into my veins. I relax a little and unfreeze and try to be logical about what I'm hearing, which has no physical manifestation of its origin. So I'm thinking logically, and instead of pure panic, it could be that I'm at a reservation. Perhaps it's coming behind a previously unseen hill. I get up and look around and don't see anything. It kind of comes and goes in volume. It doesn't seem to be coming from a direction. I'm clueless. I look for evidence and don't find anything. I crawled back into the bag because I'd been driving for hours and they sang all night. Logic tells me it had to be a group of people I didn't see, but I looked and there were no ancillary noises like talking or stopping or anything, just that Indian drum and the hiya ya hi ya that was originally terrifying and it became calming and I ended up sleeping fantastically. Later, I learned that there was a terrible stretch of road for very bad things to happen. It sort of lived up to its 666 moniker for wrecks and bad stuff occurring apparently. I was mountain biking deep in the desert in New Mexico. Terrain was high desert mountain foothills. Think juniper, sand, rocks, grasses, cacti, and lots of hills. That's when we noticed something shiny and flashing periodically glinting in the sun at the top of a hill. We decided to stash my bike at the side of the trail and hike up this hill to check it out. When I get to the top, I find a shiny, mylar-looking weather balloon slung over a juniper branch and dangling about a foot off the ground. A massive rattlesnake is lying below the mylar balloon, hissing and lunging and biting at it periodically, causing it to swing around. The thrashing motion of the mylar was catching the sun and causing the glinting that I originally saw. I nope the hell out of there and started traversing back down the hill. On my way down, I noticed what looked like a grey gravel platform built into the side of the hill, just a few hundred metres across from where I was coming down. I traverse over to check it out. Mind you, there are no roads or man-made trails or steps or any other indication that any human or machine has access to this man-made looking platform. As I approach this pile of gravel with a flat top built into the side of this hill, I see a warning sign with more warnings on it than I have ever seen on one sign before. The warning signs included poisonous gases, nuclear hazard, trespassing, toxic substances, landslides, pooling water and open shaft. Being a dumb teenager, I'm intrigued and decide to check it out. I scramble up to the flat portion of the platform and see an open hole in the ground leading straight down further than the eye can see. This opening is squarish, about five feet wide, five feet long, with rounded corners and seemingly infinitely deep. Being the oaring explorer slash scientist I was at 15, I decided the best way to see how deep it was was to pick up a large rock and throw it in the hole. So I pick up a rock and drop it in. Nothing, probably not that deep. 
and the rock just landed in some soft sand a few feet down without making a noise. To be sure, I grab another large rock, and this time, instead of dropping it, I chuck it straight down as hard as I can. I wait a few more seconds, and finally hear a very satisfying thud. Okay, it's really deep. I'm getting out of there. Then, I start walking down. I hear a second massive thunk. Oh, that first thud must have been the first rock, and I'm only hearing the second one now? This thing must be crazy deep, like a mile at least. I sprint down to my bike, jump on it and bike away as quick as I can. Funny thing is I went over there a year or so later and couldn't find the shaft again. I think it must have been really well concealed from the trail because I was looking for it and I knew where to look, but still never found it. My friends and I were high in the woods deep in the Sierra Nevadas in the California back country and decided to travel a few miles off a path to reach a river and shoot at targets with our 22. The path was littered with deer bones and claw marks from bears, so we're freaking out a bit, but finally make it to where we set up camp. I notice off in the distance about half a mile upstream, the river, and there are two guys walking towards us in the exact direction we are firing our gun. I yell at the guys for them to stop shooting, and we just watch these men wide-eyed in their late 20s and early 30s, walking quickly along the river, when suddenly they both decide to jump in. I should say at this point the river is moving very quickly and could easily sweep you under, and is definitely not safe for a casual swim. We watch as both the men are swept away towards us downstream. One of my friends, Mike, decides to brave it out and get close to the edge and extend a piece of wood for them to grab onto as they're about to pass. Both of the men latch on, and Mike is a hero pulling them to shore. Everyone watches them catch their breath and we ask the men what they're doing out here, as it's super remote and at least three to four miles from the nearest trail, and why they both jumped in clearly deadly water. They give us short answers like, Oh, we're just boys having fun. Just free swimming in the river, you know, while they're leering at us. Immediately, the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end, and every fibre in my body tells me that they meant us harm. We tell them we're going to head back to the trail, and they say that they'd come with us. Given that we're so far away from civilization and these guys are clearly high on something and dangerous to themselves, we reluctantly agree and allow them to follow us. It was the most quiet hike of my life. I felt them trying to feel out if they could take us in a fight. There were three of us and two of them. We had a 22, but were young, squirrely adults. I don't know how to explain it, but the hike was us constantly positioning against each other with body language without ever directly fighting. They would get close to the gun and try to both be near it, and then we would counter by getting between them and the gun as naturally as possible, while hiking up a path that was littered in bare claw marks and dung. We finally made it to the car and they decided we weren't suitable targets and moved on. No idea what two random guys were doing risking their lives in freezing cold raging rivers in the Sierra Nevadas, or why they felt they needed to size us up if they could attack three random teens, but I'm glad at the end of it. Nothing came of it. I was driving across the country with my friend. At this junction, we're at North Dakota. It had been a long day with lots of driving. At this point, it was 1 a.m., and I had awoken from my nap, my back killing me. Hey, man, let's call it a night. My back's killing me. Let's go grab a hotel. All right, we'll get off at the next exit. We're driving, there's nothing around, just nothingness. Eventually we grab the next exit and after a little drive we spot a hotel. There's some road construction going on around it and some of the roads were closed. We try driving up to it, but every intuitive path is fenced off. Now the hotel was more or less right in front of us, so we drive there and it's kind of a dirt gravel road that went into a thicket of trees. 
about 500 yards down this road, there is a bright light. This road is the complete opposite direction of the hotel and the main road. Remembering there's nothing around but this one hotel and infinite fields and trees, it's also like 1.30 a.m. and completely dark. We keep driving around, unable to get the hotel, when my friend just drives towards the light on the dirt road, which is barely wider than the car. I instantly get a bad feeling. This makes no sense. Why is there a light at the end of this dark, dirt road? Dude, what are you doing? This is like bugs flying to a light. Turn around. I will once I find a spot. I don't exactly have the space. Okay, that makes sense. The road was narrow and kind of dropped off on each side. Anyway, he kept driving closer to the light, which I thought may have been a generator light for construction. As we get closer, it's a huge flatbed truck with its high beams on. As we realize this, we are also blinded by the brightness. I thought these people have us exactly where they want us. I'm shielding my eyes and my buddy is slowly driving to pass the behemoth of a truck when the blinding light of the high beams is interrupted by someone walking in front of them, and then our car. My friend hits the brake. The figure walks up, and my friend rolls down the window a little. It's a well-dressed guy. My friend goes, Oh, hey, we're just trying to get to the hotel over there, but there's all that construction. Oh, yeah, the hotel's the greatest. Just follow us and we'll get you there. Great, thanks. The interaction was pleasant enough. My friend rolls up the window and drives past the truck. As he's driving past with the window not all the way up, the guy outside calls another guy. Get in the truck. I see some guy from the shadows toss a cig and walk up to the passenger side. We have to get out of here now. I know, man, I'm working on it. At this point, we're doing a 15 point turn in the dark on a road in the middle of nowhere. We get turned around and the truck is driving slowly and in the middle of nowhere, intentionally taking up the whole path. I'm bumbling on about how this makes no sense and we need to escape, when all of a sudden the truck slams on its brakes and both guys simultaneously jump out and start running towards us. The guy on my side has a shotgun. My friend didn't miss a beat and just floored it and we went flying off the little drop off to the side of the road. We sped all the way back to the road, got back on the highway, and made sure we weren't followed and went to the next town. Sleep was not good that night. I lived out on the high desert for most of my life. 6,000 above sea level if you're wondering. I was riding my horse alone in the absolute middle of the BFE in the Badlands, with no trees and hardly any brush to speak of. So, sound carries a long way, and there's nowhere to hide for long. When all of a sudden his ears perk up, I feel my skin start to crawl like I'm being watched. My normally mellow gelding starts to panic, and I start to feel really dizzy and my horse stumbles, and I black out. I come to an hour or so later about three miles away from the inciting incident still on my horse. He is frothing with sweat, and shaking all over. I'm still unsure what happened. I had plenty of water and snacks. It was 65 degrees and breezy. I don't believe weather or dehydration slash hunger were a factor. I have never before or after had a fainting spell, and that was the most reliable, quiet horse I ever owned. I now have a serious case of heebie-jeebies, just thinking about it. When I was 20, I used to work as a pizza delivery guy in a small city in northern Germany. On my way home, I had to drive a few miles on a remote state road that led through forests and farmland. One night at around 1am, there was a huge thunderstorm, so I had to drive slowly and carefully. When I arrived at the junction, I noticed a figure standing in the middle of the road. It looked like a tall and slender man in a long black leather cloak with a hood. At first, I thought it was someone who had an accident and was looking for help. But when my headlights hit the figure, I noticed that the cloak, especially the hood, appeared to be empty. 
My headlights did not illuminate the cloak like they should have. It was just the lighting reflecting on the smooth, wet surface that allowed me to see the shape. Of course, I floored the gas pedal and went as fast as I could. A few miles later, I ran into the same or at least a very similar figure again, standing in the middle of the road, unmoving. This time, I didn't even slow down and rush past it. It nearly scared me to death. A few weeks later, this time without a thunderstorm, but a beautiful warm summer's night, I encountered another creature right where I saw the black figure previous. It looked like a giant deer, but without fur and pale gray slash white skin. It was extremely skinny, nearly skeletal, and had an abnormally long and thin tail. It ran alongside the road and kept pace with me quite easily as I drove by it. Only when I slammed on the gas pedal and went suicidally fast, did it start to fall behind and eventually disappeared into a crop field. The very next day I quit my job and have never used that road again at night. It was 2001. My friend and I, 17 both female, are driving back from a late movie to my house one night. I lived in a pretty rural area in Maine, about 20 minutes from the nearest town. As we were driving down the highway through the woods, we passed a median with a car sitting in it, facing in the oncoming direction, with all its lights off. Right after we drove past it, it flashed its lights, did a three-point turn, and started driving behind us. We giggled that, oh, it must be a gang initiation and we're going to get murdered. Because this was Maine, and that was obviously not going to happen. The turn off on my road was a few miles away, and this car stayed behind us the whole time. We made the left turn and the car kept going down the highway. But 30 seconds later, we realized the car must have been backed up on the highway and made the turn after us. Now we were getting a little worried. There was still one more road to turn down before we got to my house as this was way in the woods, and the car did the same thing, backed up and made the left after us. Now we were legit freaked. I had a long driveway and the car followed us right up to the driveway and almost up to my house, which had all the lights on because my mum was home. We ran into the house just in time to see the mystery car reverse back down the driveway and drive away. To this day, we still have no idea why that car was following us if they thought we were someone else, or if they actually had bad intentions and only changed their mind when they saw that my house lights were on. Since we only ever saw the front of the car and never caught a license plate or a better description than just the blue car. My mum and her friend were out and about late at night, heading to a party, but their car broke down and being a rural town with a small population, they had to walk about a mile to the nearest house for help. They got to the front door, and of all the people to answer the door, it was one of their high school teachers. He was horrified to see them out late at night alone. He let them use his phone, but scolded them, saying it wasn't safe. The location, time, and circumstances. He let them know they were absolute fools and heeded a somewhat vague warning. My mum called my grandfather to come bring gas and or possibly tow their vehicle. When the girls got back to their car, there was a severed cow head on the hood. Blood everywhere. This was near Hermiston, Oregon, apparently well known for devil worshippers. Last October, I was in California for 11 days after my brother's wedding in San Diego. I just wanted to drive around the state and visit California places that had captured my imagination over the years, and I love driving almost as much as I love cars. Some destinations, the Pacific Coast Highway, San Francisco, Bodega Bay, where part of Hitchcock's The Birds was filmed, 
This movie scared the hell out of my now deceased mother. I also wanted to visit Clipper Mills, where the longest audio of Bigfoot was captured one night in 2012. I don't necessarily believe in Sasquatch, but would never discount someone else's experience, especially if I wasn't there, so off I went. Clipper Mills is in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, about 70 miles northeast of Sacramento, very near the dam that was in danger of falling last year, and quite remote. After Bodega Bay, I head across the state for my destination, arriving near Sacramento in time for a late dinner. So it's after dark when I set out on the final leg. Very dark. It takes me a good while on all the twisty, turning roads to find my way there. I wanted to get to this exact spot the person who posted the video parked that night. He never specified where exactly within the video, but I managed to do some digging in the YouTube comments section and related videos, and more or less found the spot he was actually at. Around 11 p.m., I pulled my rented Camry well off the dark two-lane road to avoid any issues with the very sparse traffic. I saw none whatsoever, as I sat in the darkened interior, listening and allowing my eyes to adapt to the dark for about 20 minutes. I heard nothing but assorted insects, and I sat there, saw nothing moving at all. Eventually, not wanting to activate my car's interior lighting, I crawled out the driver's side window into the black night. I army crawled with my cell phone, with no service, and my handheld GPS to find my way back should I get lost in the dark, and the red flashlight I use with my telescope. I stand there, right by the car window for a solid two minutes before I screw up the courage to move away from the Camry. Eventually I walk up the road, still not hearing anything but bugs. Suddenly, without conscious decision to do so, I veer right and head up into the woods. My feet are crunching pine needles now, and to my mind, I sound like Bigfoot stomping around myself. After what was about 20 minutes, I stopped to listen, and added to the insects, I hear this faint screeching sound far off in the blackness that doesn't sound like an insect at all. It has more consciousness. Now, the thorough darkness adapted my mind, and I hear whispering. It sounds like a person in distress, or perhaps a large primate. I remain still. I hear something small scurrying around in the underbrush, followed, a minute later, by that same forlorn sound, now closer. It's time to return to the car. As I'm walking back to the car, I hear this spooky sound every 20 to 30 seconds, and now it's coming from behind me, and in front of me. It seems to have a vocabulary of some sort. Different vocalizations, some guttural, some high-pitched, and everywhere in between. My mind is having fun just messing with me now. I was never so happy to see a Camry in all my life. I started it up before my ass was in the seat, and I think I half expected to see scores of red eyes glowing at me in the headlights from the dark forest. But... I didn't. Now spooked to my mind telling me some homicidal axe-wielding lunatic was nipping out of my heels, I went back the way I came at a much quicker pace of the road and in the woods on the other. I barely missed crushing it. It scared the hell out of me right there. I slowed down a bit, the thought of nearly mowing down an innocent mutt overcoming my mind. The same hour down the road towards Sacramento, when I noticed I had cell service again, I opened my Expedia app and found a hotel nearby for the night. Once safely ensconced in said hotel room, I began scouring the internet on my iPad and came to the conclusion that what I heard was a barred owl or western screech owl, but I could never be 100% sure. It was very creepy though, and I'm done with wandering alone in the woods at night, I think. In 2014, I was driving at night on Highway 81 in Oklahoma. It was around 2 a.m. and I hadn't seen another car for at least 30 minutes. It was on a stretch of road between Chikasha and Rush Springs. In other words, the middle of nowhere. 
I come over a small rise and see a car upside down in the ditch and a body just laying out of the car. Kind of looked like he was sleeping on his side. I slam on the brakes, get out of the car and run over to the guy. I touch his shoulder and he kind of slumped over on his back. It was then I could see his head was smashed flat on the left side and his abdomen was open. I could smell whiskey coming out of his gut. It was horrifying. This man had no pulse. So I get my phone out and call 911. I give them an estimate of where I am and they tell me the nearest help is 25 minutes away and that I needed to wait with the wreck until they arrive. Hell no. I hang up the phone and look around. I am alone in Oklahoma, in the middle of nowhere. My only companion a dead man. Not knowing what to really do, I took his hand and said the Lord's Prayer, then covered his face with a shirt just hanging out of the car. I was seriously shaking a bit. It was then I heard coyotes turning up. If you haven't heard this sound, it's akin to small children being badly hurt. They wail and screech in what I think is a big circle around me and this man. It's been 15 minutes and no cars have shown up. I hear them on the highway. They are crossing out just out of the headlights of my car. Now I have a decision. Do I get in my car and let them come up and tear this guy to pieces? Or do I find something to swing and protect his body? I chose the latter. I got the tire iron out of my trunk and got out over to where he's laying. I guess I'm making a stand. I wait another five or so minutes and hear them running around in the dark. I realize I'm not truly in control of the situation and something very primal comes over my brain. It's akin to rage along with a heavy dose of fear. Whatever was gonna happen, I was gonna fight like a crazed ape in the savannah. At that moment, I see car lights. Finally, a car shows up and wouldn't you know it, it's a Pontiac Grand AM full of methed up country boys. They pull over and look at me and see the dead man then the car. I say, guys, that guy is dead and there are coyotes circling me. They go into their car, pull out several handguns and a few flashlights. They are wired as hell and excited to kill these coyotes, although they are almost as unnerved as the wild animals out in the dark. A few minutes pass and we hear a siren off in the distance. The guys say, it's the cops. They jump in their car and haul ass. I'm alone again. Me and this poor man. 60 seconds later, a state trooper shows up and then two deputy sheriffs and finally three city cops from some small town called Ninica. And finally, an ambulance. They look at the guy and pronounce him dead and ask me at least a hundred questions, finally asking if they could search my car for drugs. I'm sober for the last seven years. They search, find nothing, and say thank you for staying with the wreck and that I can leave. I left and start driving down this pitch dark road yet again. I feel like I've been in a battle for my life and thinking our civilized behavior is little more than a thin veneer over a wild animal that wants to survive. When I was a teenager, my friends and I liked to go exploring uninhabited islands. They're called the Thousand Islands in the Indian River Lagoon. We camped, played paintball, all pretty innocent stuff. One day we decided to explore a new island for a fresh spot. We found a big one. So to save time, I was inserted on the southern end to explore while the others canoed around the island to see what was there. The plan was for me to meet them on the north side. That did not happen. The island was hell. Brambles. Bush so thick I had to crawl through the muck. The perimeter was a swamp with dead trees and God knows what lurking under the film of green algae. And then there were the skeletons. As I crawled my way up the island, I came upon skeleton after skeleton. Turtles, raccoons, deer. That's when it hit me. This is an alligator heaven. I freaked out and made a break for the open water, not wanting to die. I yelled out as loud as I could. Unfortunately, my friends heard me and paddled ferociously out to me. I had made it only one third of the way up the island and was thankfully extracted. 
we named that one Hell Island and never returned. Looking back on it, I think we got very lucky. We camped slash canoed in places alligators bred and got bitten to hell during the West Nile outbreak. It was fun though. When I was younger, my family was extremely poor and lived in a very old mobile home on some land my grandpa owned. This piece of land was in a very small town out in the middle of nowhere in Texas covered in wood. The town itself was your typical small country town where football was king and there was nothing to do but get drunk or high on the weekend. It was also the typical type of town along with it being the early 90s where one didn't typically have to worry much about locking their doors or setting an alarm. Now our trailer was a two bedroom and my parents, always putting us kids ahead of themselves, slept in the living room on a fold out couch. My room was directly connected to it and my sister's room was down a hallway past the kitchen and bathroom at the other end of the trailer. One night after everyone had gone to bed, my dad is woken up by a feeling that there is someone in the room. He looks around a bit and sees a large male figure sitting in the easy chair just feet from the bed. My dad quickly flipped on the light next to his bed and saw it was a neighbor from down the road named Carter. Carter was known for being a frequent drug user and was often in trouble with the law because of this. My dad asked him why the hell he was there and what he was doing and asked him to get out. I can't, Carter replied. The demons are chasing me. Your house is the only safe one. My dad, who I should say is fairly large and a terrifying person, responded that if he didn't get out now, the house would be a lot less safe for him. If they leave, they'll get me. They've been chasing me all night. And if they catch me, I'm dead. My dad's response was that there was no demons, but that if he didn't get out of his house now, he would be dead. From what I've since been told, I was asleep for this part. My mum also hurled a few threats. While she may not be big, she was equally as terrifying. I believe it was her anger that finally scared him off. My dad got up and locked the doors and watched through the blinds as Carter decided, since he couldn't outrun the demons, he'd steal our old beta suburban that my dad always left the keys in. He drove around for an hour and we called the police and it took us about that long to get us out since the closest police station was about 20 or so minutes away. He finally brought it back and was arrested and taken to jail. He was deemed crazy and ended up being locked in a mental institution. The scarier part is that for years after this, we'd get phone calls where we'd all hear this music that would have lyrics like, I'm gonna kill you. These calls lasted for years and followed us from house to house even though we always had different numbers and would even be in different states. We always thought it was him sending us a message. The call stopped when I was 12. I later found out that it was around the time that Carter thought the best thing to do for himself were to be soak himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. I live in rural Western Canada and have been hiking in the swamps all my life. I almost never run into people, but all kinds will drive out here to dump their trash. Lots of poachers too. I almost never find trash deep in the woods. It's mostly near roads. I've gone on many night walks as well, but saw nothing odd on those. When I was a child, my brother and I found a skinned bear with no head dumped in the ditch. We live out in the boonies, so I suppose the poachers thought it was an okay place to dump it. It certainly gave us a real fright. We thought it was a human at first. The skinned bare hands look pretty human, especially if you don't know any better. I've seen a dead boar inside of a dumped freezer. This one was really wild to me because I've never seen a boar in my life. We don't get them wild up here. So it must've been from a farm too lazy to dispose of it properly. It had hair and tusks. I've also seen ribs inside of a dumped washing machine, too small to be human. I once found a trash bag beside a tree that had a cross etched into it and there was a cat in it. 
I suppose they couldn't be bothered to give their cat a burial, but the cross was a nice touch. Aside from that, I've seen bear and moose, and I hear about people saying if you smell garbage in the woods, it's a Sasquatch. If you smell death and trash, I bet money that it's a grizzly, and you should go home, because they can smell you roughly 30 kilometers away against the wind. If you can smell them, they already know you were there a long time ago. Be safe, and always carry bear mace and tell someone where you're going. Have a compass, and make some noise when you're out. While cougars are dangerous, they are rare and spook easily. A bear or moose is much more likely to cause you harm. Coyotes are almost always harmless unless they've been breeding with wolves. I think there's only one confirmed death from coyotes in Canada. Koi wolves that were guarding food. If you don't know anything about bears and are planning to go hiking where they are prevalent, please look up bear safety and never feed the bears. They might just take you as their next meal as well. When I was young and adventurous, my boyfriend and I would go four-wheeling deep in the mountains and set up dry camps. There were rough trails for driving, but we were truly remote, and no cell coverage or other means of communication were available. We're in the tent sleeping until we hear a vehicle. We think they'll drive past, but they stop and sit there with their engine on and lights off. We look outside. It's a dark van, no side windows, and looks sketchy as hell. We stay in the tent watching to see if anyone's gonna get out and try something. We were armed because, you know, America. So I got to sit there for 20 minutes waiting for this van full of idiots or criminals to decide whether they're gonna keep driving or not. They finally left, and so did we as soon as we got packed up. It took us four hours of driving through the mountains in the dark to get back on the highway and grab a hotel room. That was the last time I ever went out alone like that. Getting lost in the middle of nowhere certainly has an appeal, but driving through and encountering some of the horrors is something that's also likely to happen, which is why we're going to be listening to some I road trip stories I recently moved next. out in the middle of nowhere. I was about five minutes away from home when I stopped at a stop sign to look for a lighter in my purse. I noticed a man walking towards my car from the tree line and immediately drove off. It was pretty late at night, and my closest neighbour is about ten minutes out from where I am. It's all woodland and farms. There's no good reason the man should have been out in the middle of nowhere like that. I picked up my neighbour, who lives a few miles away, who had a couple of young daughters himself, and we went out to look for the man after reporting it to the police. We never found him, but there were footprints all around the tree line. I never got out of the car, but my neighbor, who was properly armed and protected, spent a good 30 minutes searching the area. A few months rolled around, and they found the guy living on private property, along with another man. They had been kidnapping young women for months, and eating them alive slash selling them on the blank market. They used an abandoned shed as a slaughterhouse and had meat hooks hung everywhere. They found a missing woman naked and locked in a cage when authorities believed dozens of the missing women cases ended up there. It freaked me out for a while and still does. Being a woman, I'm usually extra careful anyway, but I definitely felt like this was a wake up call to be extra precautious. I remember getting the Amber Alerts at least once every other week. All with the same description. Long brown hair, around 5 foot 3, blue eyes. I have long brown hair, I'm 5 foot 2 and have blue eyes. Really creepy. After this happened, I made a point to become very familiar with firearms. I'm originally from Chicago, so that's saying something. Crime in the city is predictable. Crime in the South is straight up out of a horror movie. I'll start at the beginning of the worst day and a half of my life. Right now I'm a female at 31. At the time this happened I had just turned 22. I got off work early from my second job. 
the cool breeze kissing my face, cooling me down as I drove up the long driveway. It was so calming. My husband and I at the time lived on this ranch that we also worked on. It was dark, desolate, and just had a completely different feel at night. The creatures of the night howling and chirping, the shadows of all the trees dancing in the headlights. Then there's our house, smack dab in the middle of it, the forest unraveling around it as far as you can see. I made it to my front porch, and something just felt off. I can't explain it, but I soon found out when I walked in there. They were there, on the couch, completely naked. The next hour was a complete blur of shouting, crying, and him begging me to listen. I just couldn't, not again. This was the end of us. I packed up everything I could in my small black Honda, spiraling gravel into the house, and sped back down the same driveway I had just not too long before been so serenely driving home on. It was about a four hour drive back to my dad's house, my safe space. I wanted my dad, reverting back to my 10 year old self, longing for my dad to fix my proverbial boo-boos. I drove on determined into the night and everything was going smoothly until I was almost back to my hometown. You see, my gas gauge hadn't worked in a long time, and through the horrible situation, I just endured doing laps in my head and had forgotten to fill up before I left. The car started to sputter and cut out in the absolute worst of places possible. I was on a three-lane highway at three in the morning, and the only place to pull my car over was a tiny bike lane butted up to a retaining wall. I was screwed. There was no one on the highway at this time, and if there were, they weren't going to stop for me. I put my hazards on, but that was just a band-aid for the moment. A couple of semis had passed me in the ten minutes or so that I had become stranded. They barely saw me in time to move over. They passed so close that my entire car shook. It shook so hard that the crack in my front windshield started to spread haphazardly across it. I was scared at this point, and I didn't know what to do. Suddenly, I saw a car on the opposite side of the highway slow down and make an illegal U-turn across three desolate lanes. The small SUV pulls up next to my window. In the car were two young males in their teens and what looked to be like their young girl companions. The guy driving asked me what happened. I gave them a brief rendition of the story and he then offered to drive me to the nearest petrol station. I was hesitant at first, but quickly realizing my current situation, I reluctantly obliged. We made it to the parking lot of a Wally World, which I thought was odd. I dare not question it yet. I held onto my purse closely, trying not to draw attention to the nervous sweat beading down my brow. The driver then tells me his friends have somewhere to be, and they all but the driver just exit the car without rhyme or reason, leaving me alone with the young male driver. He tells me that he'll quickly take me to the gas station, and now a small sense of relief comes over me. Then quickly fades. Because I knew this town, I had grown up here, and he was not heading towards any gas station. The young man, which I did not get a name of, suddenly turns down a dark, dimly lit alleyway and just parks the car and says, nonchalantly, hey, I just need to park here for a minute and take my insulin, insinuating he's diabetic. It wasn't insulin, it looked dirty. It was drug paraphernalia. I've seen enough cops to know what they look like. At that moment, my heart sank to my buttocks. I said to him, uh, can you just take me back to my car, please? I'll figure it out. He didn't respond. Just then I caught a glimpse of two skinny men clumsily trying to duck behind a dumpster behind us in the alley. I was naive enough to bring this up to my unwanted capture. He said in a menacing tone, I don't know what you're talking about. You're tripping, girl. I instantly went into fight or flight mode. I started telling him my tragic life story like how my brother had killed himself, and I was all my dad had left. He even tried to shush me. I kept talking, told him about my cheating husband, 
and the fact that I just wanted to get home and be with my dad. For a moment he paused and looked at me and then something clicked in his brain. Before I knew it he was speeding off to the poorly lit alleyway and to the scorching lights of the highway and the Walmart across the street. He screeched to a stop in front of my car, threw out my purse and a random half full gas camp from behind his seat and uttered the words which I will never forget that are seared into my brain. Don't ever get into someone's car you don't know. Now get the hell out of here. And he sped off down the highway vanishing forever. There are so many things I wish I did differently, but thinking back, I'm alive. And it could have been much worse. I, for one, will never be the same because of it. I service firefighting breathing air compressors and was on a service call in the northwest of Pennsylvania. I was running a bit late, so it was dark when I left the fire station, as this was in February about 15 years ago. As I drove down this twisty rural two-lane, I passed a Dodge Durango on the side of the road with its headlights on. It wasn't near any houses, just in a wide spot, so I thought maybe they'd broken down or gotten a flat. I slowed down and went behind the Durango to see a shape lying on the ground. I thought it might be a driver trying to get the spare wheel out from under the vehicle, but then I realized it was a man on top of a woman holding her down and apparently trying to strangle her. I had to drive about a quarter of a mile further before I found a spot to turn around. I was in a 16-foot box van, so I couldn't just do a U-turn in the road. I turned around and headed back. The Durango passed me, heading the way I had been going originally. I got to where it had been parked, and the woman was lying there in the snow. I thought she might be dead, but as I pulled up, she sat up, then shakily got to her feet. She was probably in her 40s, very thin and in a skirt, and an inadequate jacket. I asked if she was okay, and she just said, I'm cold. I had to get her into the passenger seat of my truck, and cranked up the heat. She sat there shivering, her body hunched forward. She had blood on her face and her fingers were red. She didn't say anything about what had happened. I pulled out my phone and surprisingly had enough signal to call 911. I explained what I'd seen and they dispatched a state trooper. It took 15 minutes for him to get there. The only thing the woman said was, they're gonna arrest me. I offered her some napkins and water and she wiped her face off. I didn't want to bother her since she seemed to be in shock, so we just sat there in silence for a while. The trooper arrived, and she let out a designated sigh, opened the door and said, thank you for helping me, and walked over to the trooper. He spoke to her for a few seconds, then had her sit in his car. He came over, and I explained what I had seen, and described the Durango. He thanked me and said I could go. A few days later, my phone rang while I was away from it. It was a restricted number, and the voicemail was from the trooper, thanking me again, saying that he may need me to offer some more testimony if I was willing. I never heard back from the police. I never found out what had happened. I think it was either a sex worker or a drug deal that went bad, but I never saw anything about it. This happened about a year or two ago. I'm in the Alabama Air Force National Guard, but I work in a city in Florida. I'm traveling home for the weekend late on Friday night, since I had to be at my unit the next morning. I have drill once a month. I have been traveling for a while, and I am on a highway in Alabama near my parents' house. It's about 9 p.m., and there are no lights to light up the street. It's pitch dark. When I see a car stop, at a stop sign about 60 to 70 yards in front of me, and he goes across the street I'm driving on. Mind you, it's dark, and the car had his headlights on. When I go to the street, he crosses, and I look down the street he went down, and there was no street, no cars, no lights, nothing. There was only grass and a telephone pole. I would have seen the red back lights at least, as I was going too fast for him to disappear before I got to him. I got out of there as fast as I could. And to this day, I still cannot explain exactly what happened. 
When I was 20, I used to go driving around a lot at night. One time I was doing my usual drive around to no particular destination, when I decided to go down this dirt road in the middle of nowhere in South Georgia. There was a cotton field on the right side and woods along the left side. It was like this for miles. Shortly after driving along the road for about a mile or two, I noticed something hanging from a branch along the wood line. This branch stretched all the way across the road, nearly reaching the cotton field. What was hanging from this branch is stuck in my mind, even years later. It was a deer. But not just any deer, this deer had been mutilated. It was hanging from its antlers by what looked like towing straps. It also looked as though it had been beaten with blunt objects. Its body was filled with deep lacerations and it was also nearly split in half horizontally. Its lower half was barely hanging by a thread. Still to this day, I have no idea what it was doing there like that. I'm a motorcyclist and was driving my way down from my girlfriend's house. It's about a 20 minute ride, but it was 3 a.m. and the road goes through a forest without any street lights. So I ride through the forest, already giving everything to my little 50cc dirt bike, when a naked mannequin is suddenly visible on the side of the road. I saw it appear in my headlights and drove by it doing 60 kilometers an hour. It was scary as hell. A mannequin standing there naked on the side of a dark road in a forest at 3 a.m. in the morning. Damn. I'm sure if any one of you would have passed it in the same situation, you'd have all got shivers too. I went on a cross-country RV trip this past spring with my friend Melissa and her seven kids and two young German shepherds starting in West Virginia in a 20-year-old RV christened Big Betsy and almost everything that could go wrong did. Among other things, the water lines broke the night before we had to go, so we relied on jugs for the entirety of the trip. The gas tank cap was busted, so it was a hell of a job to get it off. Tires had good tread but a couple were pretty old, so they worried me. We found out the auxiliary batteries sucked, so we needed to jumpstart them with a power supply every time we stopped. The main battery cable had a bad connection, so every time we started the engine, I had to stand in front and jiggle the cables while she turned the key. The slide jammed, and we had to get a pry bar to get in and out of it. Driving through Colorado Springs, we blew a spark plug out and had to stop for repairs. Luckily, her brother, who used to be a diesel mechanic, was traveling with us and only took a day to fix it. Regardless, we were still having a great time, seeing the scenery, stopping at landmarks and national parks like Garden of the Gods, Mesa Verde, and the Grand Canyon. The furnace went out the night before we got to the Grand Canyon and it got down to 17 degrees. I got up every hour for 10 minutes to heat the RV a bit using the propane stove, turned it on and off to rest, then did it again every hour that night. We went to Roswell, Las Vegas, then on to Malibu to see the ocean and LA for a few days. Then we headed up to Yellowstone and were blown away not only by the park itself, but the drive there from California, through Utah and Idaho, just so breathtakingly beautiful. If you've listened this far, You've come to the point of the story. After Yellowstone, we had to leave from the west entrance, since the other roads east and south hadn't opened yet. We drove up into Montana, and for some reason her brother insisted on getting off at I-90 to a two-lane highway through the Crow and Northern Cheyenne reservations. He was perpetually driving like an hour ahead of us because his RV was faster, and he's a bit of a reckless dude but we didn't want to be far from him in case we ran into engine trouble, so we didn't really have a choice but to follow him. Even though I voiced much hesitation on taking a back road route in the dead of night through a reservation. So we find ourselves taking the ramp to route 212 and had just gotten onto the Crow reservation and stopped to gas up and immediately things just feel odd. It's past 10 p.m. and as I'm pumping gas, I'm hearing children running around and playing off in the dark. 
and cars keep driving up to us slowly, checking us out. I get back in and Melissa is already saying, get us out of here, it's creepy as hell. So I do. We haul off down 212 in pursuit of her idiotic brother. All right, he did save our bacon in Colorado Springs, so maybe idiotic is too strong. And there is nothing out there. Inky black skies, long, desolate roads, sporadic groups of four or five houses every few miles. I'm acutely aware that we lost self-service as soon as we got on that highway, so I'm just praying that nothing goes wrong. I try to ignore the acute feeling that something is watching us. Her dogs start to whine in their cages. The feeling of unease has continued and I really don't want to stop, but Melissa said we need to let them out to poop or we'd be cleaning up a mess. I pull over next to a big field and she gets her oldest daughter Ariana and Isabella to leash them, and I throw open the doors to let them out. As soon as they hit the grass, the two German shepherds sight something in the darkness and start going absolutely mental. They're barking, and straining against the leash, and the girls are struggling to control them. My blood pressure spikes, and I look over at Melissa, and she looks completely bewildered. And I reach up to the overhead compartment and pocket my handgun, which I brought for protection. We get the girls and the dogs back in the RV, and peel off down the highway again, cognizant of the fact that we're probably going to have to clean up crap, since they couldn't go outside. They're back in their cages and continue to whine. I drive on for another half hour or so and they're still whining and Melissa says we really need to let them go outside again. This is the last thing I want to do because this whole time I've had this feeling that something is watching us and I'm just running through my head all the scary stories I've read about evil spirits, wendigos, skinwalkers and all that stuff. And I reason with myself that I'm just scaring myself and they probably just smelled foxes or coyotes or something. And I really didn't want to have to clean up dog poo from the inside of the cages on some forgotten highway using jugs of water in the dark. We pull over again, and this time I take my gun with me, and I walk outside with the girls as they take the dogs out. I distinctly remember thinking, I don't know what good a gun will do against evil spirits, but I'm not going down without a fight. The moment their paws hit the ground, they immediately start to howl and bark into the darkness. The hair on the back of my neck stands up, and I'm looking at Ariana, and she has this look of terror on her face. I say to the girls, get the dogs back in the RV, we're getting the hell out of here. But her dog Hazel is straining so hard at the leash, and she can't get her inside. So I pick up this German Shepherd in both arms, and have to heave her through the door, and run inside. As I lean out to pull the door closed, I think to myself, this is the moment where something with sharp claws grabs my arm and pulls me into the dark. Thankfully, as I'm here writing this today from my bedroom and not the belly of a skinwalker, this did not happen. The dogs go back to their cages and continue whining. I jump back in the driver's seat and gun it down the road, and Melissa leans over and says in a panicked whisper, What's going on out here? Don't you feel it? Am I crazy or does something feel really wrong? I glance at her and remember one of the big no-nos of skin war law. You don't talk about them. You don't even think of them if you can help it because it draws their attention to you. I say, no, you're not crazy, but I can't talk about it right now. I feel it too, but just trust me, we cannot talk about it now. As I'm cresting a small hill on the highway, I look over at her and say, just trust me, we'll talk about it later, okay? But we can't now. I look back ahead, and that's when I see it. This enormous white rabbit standing on its back legs in the middle of the road. Looking back now, with the benefit of a cool head. I'm sure it was just a bit bigger than normal, but I'm telling you at that moment it looked huge. It looked like it was three foot five. I swerved this 37 foot long RV around this beast of a hare but thankfully keep control. I pull the pedal to the metal and say, I'm sorry if I don't care if the dogs have poo in their cages. I'm not stopping again. And I didn't, thankfully. And they didn't either. We made it to the town of Spearfish safely and stopped for the night. And after visiting Mount Rushmore the next day, 
We recounted the fear we all felt that night, and I told Melissa specifically why I don't want to talk about it. And she said, yeah, I knew why. I've read all kind of stuff about the Native American legends. And I realized later with a chuckle that maybe those spirits were real. Maybe they weren't. But if they were, they probably didn't appreciate me wearing my Cleveland Indians cap throughout their reservation. This happened in Sydney, about 2013. I was driving through a factory area early in the morning to get to the airport. It was still dark, and there were no other cars on the road. When we see a huge, tall figure just start to casually walk across the four lanes. As we drove closer, our lights shined on him, and he slowed down even more and just glared at us and kept walking forward. My boyfriend yelled out loud as he rolled to an almost complete stop. And as my eyes focused on the man crossing the road, I noticed the swastika tattoo on his shoulder, among others. The combat boots, the camo pants, and his hands were balled into fists. It was bloody terrifying. And the way he confidently slowed down and turned to stare at us as we drove towards him. I honestly felt like we could have hit him with our car and we would have bounced off him. It took a good five minutes before we spoke about it. It was just so unsettling and the first time it ever dawned on me that people like that lived in my city. I still feel extreme shock about this whole thing when I realized he was for real and his confidence was terrifying. I got the feeling he could be a person that would cause extreme violence with no cause and continue on as if it had never even happened. I didn't think those people really existed near where I lived, outside of documentaries. When I was 19, I was driving around town with a friend sometime after midnight, talking crap and listening to music. We drive past this road with a signpost to an area neither of us have heard of, despite both living in this town our whole lives. I asked if she wanted to go see where the road went, and she said yes. So I pull a U-turn and off we go. It's a paved road with heavy trees on each side and a few houses. Nothing unusual for either of us. I was living on a street like this at the time anyway. Within about five minutes, the conversation just kind of dies off. And a few minutes after that, I start to get this uneasy feeling. Then we passed a kangaroo on the side of a road. It remained perfectly still, just turning its head to watch us drive past. And I got this distinct impression it was standing guard. After that, I just got more and more anxious. I ended up turning to my friend and saying, this is gonna sound stupid, but can you? She was already taking her seatbelt off. I'll lock the back doors. We kept following the road even after that because we were stubborn and didn't know when to admit defeat. It was at least half an hour. Besides my 60 minute cassette tape had flipped twice over. 30 minutes of music on each side, between pulling on the paved roads and coming to a sign saying dirt road ahead. By this stage, I felt physically sick and my skin was crawling. Without a word, I did the quickest three-point turn I was able to and head back down the road. The closer we got to the turn off, the better I felt, until we were back on the main road, where I felt like I could breathe easily again. We told a few people about it and got brushed off by most. We didn't even drive past that turnoff without flinching or shuddering for a few months. The feeling of dread had been that strong. Then about six months later, she turns to me out of nowhere and says, let's drive it during the day. So we went. My friend has both her phone and mine on her lap with the emergency numbers punched in and we're playing upbeat pop music trying to keep us calm. It took us less than five minutes to reach the dirt road, and on checking the odometer, the paved section was only one kilometer long. Once again, we got the hell out of there, and have never been back. No idea what the hell was going on that night, but I can say with certainty that we were not meant to be there. 
Even 20 years later, if someone mentions the area of the signpost, we shudder. And recently, I turned to her out of nowhere and said, Hey, was that you with me on the road where... Yes, and I don't want to talk about it, she'll reply. I'm a truck driver. I was crossing Texas in the middle of the night. After a while, I become white line mesmerized when I notice a few red lights slowly flashing ahead. Huh? Construction zone, I guess. Except, as I'm coming out of my self-imposed hypnosis, I slowly become aware that more and more red lights are there, on both sides of the highway, and they're all blinking at the same time. Fully awake now, I find myself trying to find the ends of the light, to the left or the right. I feel like hammy and over the hedge. It never ends. It never ends that way too. I'm really beginning to freak out, but, oh, wait. It was just a wind farm and I'm an idiot. Last December, I went to a kayaking trip that was a five hour drive away from my place. I was invited by my friend to accompany his wife, so I left quite late, but I predicted I would get there around 8 p.m. The campsite itself wasn't that secluded. It was by the river, behind a little town, but to get there, I had to use a two lane expressway that goes through a forest reserve. It was around 7 p.m. when I reached the expressway, but what I did not expect was how winding and dark the road was. A few solar road lights and some signs of beware the animals passing here and there. I was driving alone and it was drizzling, but I wasn't too worried because the expressway was filled with cars going in the same direction as me. Because of that, the traffic was slower than the average speed. I have to admit I'm not a patient driver by any chances, so any chances I have to pass the cars in front of me until I get to this van at the end of the line. But I decide maybe I should just stay behind the van to be safe since the road was getting dark. Then we reached the passing line. The cars behind me started to pass us. The van maintained in slow speed. I encountered and there were already six cars past us. So I ramped up and left the van. There was a right bend. And once I got through it, I was alone on the road. I waited for the cars behind me to come out from right behind the bend, but there was no one. I thought I was driving too fast, so I slowed down. Not even the van showed up. The passing lane ended, and now I was driving through a ravine. I saw a temporary signboard saying, drive slow. And a few meters ahead, another signboard saying, landslide 100 meters ahead. What the hell? Is this road closed? But I didn't see any alternate route on the way and there was no junction so I drove as slow as it could be and there was no landslide whatsoever and still no sign of any vehicle on the road except mine. It was the most agonizing 10 minutes of my life, driving alone on a narrow winding road in the middle of nowhere, just hills and trees all around me. No light but my car lamp in front of me and my phone screen. It was eerily silent. I put the volume of my car radio up, but I just didn't feel right. And it was so cold, with the air conditioning turned off too. I saw a welcome signboard at a left junction, turned left, and have never felt so relieved, seeing random shop lots with people in them. When I was driving this one time, I saw what I thought was the goat man of Nerdy Mountain. I was driving home from work late one night at 11 p.m. The car overheats, so I have to pull into a lay-by in the middle of an empty mountain road to let it cool down for a bit. Slowly, I drive in when I see a white, translucent humanoid figure run in front of my headlights and disappear into the forest. I sat in my car for a half hour, crapping myself while I waited for it to cool down. It was the most bizarre experience of my life. This happened to a friend of mine and her brother, who I also know. The car had two other people in the back seat, so it wasn't some sort of illusion or mind trick. They were driving down to Tennessee from Kansas. 
It was a very dark and lonely road, as told by my friend called Kate. They were doing between 60 and 65. Two hours pass and there are no signs of life. It was 2 a.m. And suddenly they see a black dog running towards them with blood eyes, and they slam on the gas and go faster as they near the dog, when it just vanishes. Five miles down the road, they saw the dog again with red eyes and they slam on the brakes and turn the other way. Till this day, they don't know what it was. The scary part was everyone saw it too. Kate, her brother, Jim, and the two friends in the back seat. They all saw the dog. They've speculated it could have been a bloodhound, but they don't know. I was going home from my girlfriend's apartment fairly late, between 12 and 1 a.m., when I noticed a man walking slowly on the driver's side. Given this is an old road with only two lanes, oncoming and going traffic, it freaked me out. I called my dad and he mentioned, usually when immigrants are tired and needing help, they show themselves and walk next to the highway. I called 911 and I hope they got the help they needed. Have you heard the story about the people who were driving? And as they're driving, they see a mysterious creature run along the road catching up to their car, only for them to drive away even faster, seeing the horrific visage of a skinwalker. Well, maybe that, maybe something else. Why don't we find out with some cryptid stories? I was out hunting at our normal spot. Mind you, this was almost 13 years ago. I'm sitting in my spot. See the deer. Nothing worth shooting. I'm enjoying watching the animals. It's getting to the magic hour about twilight. About 85 yards away is this tree line that bumps against the other property. I've been hunting in these woods for the better part of almost five years. That's when I notice something big and black, moving against the tree line. Its moving was somewhat cumbersome. My first thought was that it was another hunter. I get kind of upset that he decides to mess around at this late in the game, when all of a sudden he takes off sprinting. This creature takes four to five leaps and has crossed the tree line. Mind you, it's nearly 200 yards long. This creature maybe took six to seven leaps and cleared it in a few seconds. My buddy and I had walkie-talkies to keep each other informed about our location or if we saw deer moving to each other's location. I immediately tell him something human is moving along the tree line at insane speed. After I talk to him, he confirms it and we nope the hell out of there. We never saw whatever it was again. About five years ago when I was 15, I would frequently walk home from school with a few friends through a wooded area, which was on a steep hill. We had explored the area for a decent amount of time as we had been walking that way since we were all 13. Next to the forest, there was a field with a wire fence round two sides of it, blocking off the forest. The fence had a human-sized hole in it, which we explored a few months before that led through bushes to what we believed was an abandoned homeless person's camp, complete with a badly built shelter out of a tarp and crates, a few plastic chairs, and a small pit in the middle. We went there a few times to show people, and it always stayed pretty much in the exact same spot, except the chairs would move positions every so often, and sometimes be thrown into the bushes. We went here often, but never saw anyone. To get to our houses, we would have to walk from the fields up the steep hill to the forest to get to the top to where the houses are. It was late spring. A few friends and I were walking home after school as normal. It was a pretty nice day, so we thought we'd explore the woods rather than heading straight home. We were exploring for a decent amount of time, maybe an hour or so, just walking through bushes, trying to find other paths or open areas. We walked through a thick bush and discovered we had accidentally walked into the homeless person's camp area. We were all confused, as we'd never gotten to it from this angle, only through the fence. 
but something felt off, like a kind of sinking feeling. My friends didn't share that feeling. One of them was tired from walking, so decided to sit on one of the plastic chairs and eat some food he'd brought earlier, whilst me and my other friend just walked around the camp, seeing if anything had changed. We walked into the covered bit and could smell something pretty grim, but couldn't exactly figure out what it was. One of my friends thought it was a dead body and decided to look further in while I went back out to speak to the other. I was still pretty freaked out. One of my friends was gone for a few minutes until he called for us to come and see what he found. We refused, so he came out all annoyed and called us names, pulling up his phone to show us pictures of a dead rat. The rat looked rotten and torn apart. He said he found it right at the back in a corner. Either way, we found it creepy and decided to just leave it. I wanted to go through the fence and walk around the forest, but the other two said it would take way too long and that we may just as well walk quickly up the hill through the forest so that they could all get home. I decided to go with them. I didn't really fancy going home alone. We went back the way we came, with that feeling kind of dropping. My friends were just joking around, trying not to think about the rat, when we didn't notice that one of our friends fell behind. As we were walking through, the friend that stayed behind kept saying he saw something, but we kind of just took the piss out of him, saying he was seeing things, but he was certain he saw something and was starting to sound distressed. The friend that was still up with me jokingly shouted something along the lines of, if you're here to kill us, do it already, my leg hurts. And we had a decent laugh until my friend, Liam, at the bottom, started having a full-on panic attack and began to cry. We went over to make sure he was all right, and that's when I saw something a few meters away, an all-black figure behind a tree. But it wasn't a person in all black or anything like that. It was dark, dark. I could see its shape, looking like an elongated person shape, with fingers that were long and wide, holding onto the tree. I thought it was a shadow or something, but I could see that it was 3D. I stood staring for a few seconds with it also not moving. I felt like a deer in headlights, until my other friend, Marnie, started shouting and whatever it was. I still didn't move. Marnie dragged us. He was bawling his eyes out. We got far enough away at that point that we just decided to turn around and run. I really couldn't run that much as I felt as I'd had all the energy drained from me. I turned back around and the thing had barely moved, now leaning more from the tree with its long, thin arms by its side. We kept going. We were quite out of breath, but tried to jog. When we got to the road at the top of the hill, we fell to the ground from exhaustion, staring at the forest. I think Marnie started filming the forest, shouting something, but I can't remember what. Nothing really came after us. We went home, making sure to stick to the main roads. Even though we had school the next day, my friends and I decided to stay at my house and talk about what we saw and draw pictures of it. We told my mum and she didn't exactly believe us, but said she would drop us to school and pick us up the next day to make us feel a bit better. We spoke about it with mates, but they just blew us off, as if we were trying to make something up. We looked through the video footage, but didn't see anything. We would each claim to see it again, but could not really validate it, as it was never clear as it was the first time, seeing it from car windows when driving near, or whilst walking to the shop by the field after school. To this day, me and my friends have not returned to that forest. I don't think Marnie has gone back to the forest, but I haven't spoken to them for a while since high school. But that long black figure always remains in my mind. It still messes me up whenever I walk home in the dark. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am a 20 year old guy from Germany, but at the time of this event, I was 17. My father and I are both fishermen, and I have pretty much fished my entire life. My father lives in a pretty small town so every time I was there, we would always be out in nature, 
either fishing or doing something else. There was a private property about six miles away from my father's house, and since it had lakes on it, my father one day went and bought it. I know it sounds crazy, but that's how it was. Of course, for nine-year-old me, it was paradise to have lakes that nobody else fished in. Fast forward a few years, and we'd made this property our second home. We set up targets for us so that we can shoot them with bows, and both my father and I had become pretty good shots, and had compound bows. We also had built little huts out of logs and other materials that we found on the property. And if this wasn't paradise for me before, it surely was now. Over the years, we had a few problems with trespassers, most of them people who were just there to collect mushrooms or berries, but never had any problems with that. There were also a few people with somewhat sinister intentions. We were out on the property for my two-week vacation. This was the morning of the third day. I slept in my hut. I got up about nine in the morning, and the first thing I did was check my phone. There was a message from my dad saying he would drop off our trailer later, because it was supposed to rain the following night. So I answered him that I would be waiting, and also asked him if he could drop off some extra food, because I was running low on supplies, and he happily agreed. After that, I began making myself my morning coffee and smoked my morning sick. When I finished it, I started fishing. I pretty much fished the whole day up until noon. I remember looking over the little hill on which the road goes through the property all the way to the front gate, and I saw my father's truck making his way down to me with the trailer behind it. So I put my rod down and went to help my father. We unhooked the trailer and pushed it into position. After that, my father just exchanged words real quick on how everything was going, and I told him it was all fine. He gave me the food and water that he had brought for me, and after that he left. This might sound like a toxic relationship, but it's the complete opposite. My father and I both knew he just needed to get home to work for the following day, and we also knew that we could talk on the weekend when he was coming there to stay overnight, so it was fairly normal for us. He left, and I was once again alone. I decided that I was going to make myself some dinner. After that, I fished for a while longer and decided to do a little check to make sure no one was on the property that wasn't supposed to. I didn't find anyone, but it was around that time that it started, the feeling of being watched. I had had that feeling for a whole walk, and it never left me. I was growing a little paranoid, thinking that there was something out there watching me. Maybe it was just a deer that I somehow failed to notice, even though I looked at the trees for what felt like eternity. So I kept on fishing even though I didn't feel comfortable, and just continued trying to brush it off. As it got darker, it was time for me to hit the hay. I moved my stuff from the hut to the trailer, and stored it all in there. Because the feeling of being watched persisted, I decided to put my bow and my knife next to my bed, because I thought I'd rather be safe than sorry. I fell asleep and woke up at 2 a.m. in the morning to the sound of something hitting my trailer. I just lay there, listening. It sounded like little rocks hitting the roof. The feeling of being watched intensified now, along with a new feeling, dread, like something bad was imminent. So I had to make a decision. I could stay put or investigate. So I turned on my headlamp and lantern, which I placed just outside my trailer's front door, grabbed my knife, put it back into the holster on my bed, grabbed my bow and my quiver and went outside. I looked around, but couldn't see anything past the tree line. The sound of something hitting the trailer had also stopped. Now I was pissed, because I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, but I wanted to make sure that no one was really there, so I decided to make another trip around the property, just to make sure. Bow in hand, I made my way round and found no one. Even more mad, because I made my way back to my trailer, and as soon as I saw the front of it, I froze. 
there was something there. I instantly killed my headlamp so whatever it was wouldn't see me and I stood there watching. Because of the lantern I left next to the door I could see the thing pretty well but it couldn't see me. Or at least it didn't react. It was just standing there, banging onto the side of my trailer. This thing was standing on two legs. It was bipedal and that rules out nearly every other animal we have here. Its body was strangely similar to that of a human, but its skin was way too pale to be that of a human, and his arms were way too long. It stood hunched over, about seven feet tall, just standing there, looking at it for about 15 minutes. Once I kind of snapped out of the trance, the feeling of dread was replaced with fear. I had never seen anything quite like it and stayed quiet. I knew I could move unseen right into his six o'clock position, so I made my way silently through the underbrush. Once I was behind it, I was only 40 yards away. I took aim with my bow, and even though the fear was pumping through my body, I was still able to hold the bow perfectly, took aim, and fired. The still of the night was replaced with an ungodly shriek that I can only describe as nothing I've ever heard before. I saw that I hit it, but it didn't go down. At that moment, it turned to face me. I loaded up another arrow and fired again, and it just started to leap towards me. This thing was fast. I don't think it connected, but I didn't care. I turned and I ran, sprinting through the underbrush, cutting myself everywhere. I stopped once I was out, near a paved road on the edge of the property. I stopped to listen, and noticed there was nothing behind me anymore. I dropped to my knees and began shaking, and was completely terrified. I waited there until the sun came up, and made my way back to the trailer. Once I reached it, I looked for signs that I had just imagined it, because I was in disbelief. But I could see the tracks of where this thing started running after me. Not like distinct footprints, but more like a path of destroyed bush and broken branches. Also, to this day, I haven't found the arrows that I fired that night. So I sat down, bow in hand, until my father arrived to check on me like he did almost every day. When he saw all the cuts on my arms and legs, he asked what happened, but I brushed it off and told him nonchalantly I stumbled into a thorn bush. I've never told him this story, in fact, this is the first time I speak about it. We still go to the property every now and again, but now I always carry a big hunting knife and have my bow with me. I had nightmares about what could have happened for two years after that, and to this day I don't know what I saw. I'm pretty sure it wasn't my imagination. I consider myself to be a rather skeptical person and have written off most of cryptozoology and paranormal stuff as straight bunk up until the following event. It was the late summer of 2005 in Northeast Ohio. I was heading into my junior year of high school and was spending the night over at my best friend's house. And we decided for the hell of it to crash outside for the night with just sleeping bags. It was a peaceful enough night the weather was nice, balmy warmth. The air rang with the pleasant symphonies of crickets and far-off spring peepers. The skies couldn't have been more clear, as it was that special sort of feeling in the air where you were far enough away from the last time it rained that it didn't feel heavy anymore and actually felt inviting as opposed to humid and miserable. This was as close to picturesque as summers could get. Everything was blanketed in the dark blue elegance of the evening light. Falling asleep was easy enough. This was a year that mosquitoes were remarkably in pretty low numbers, making sleeping unprotected with just a sleeping bag very simple. Eventually, as bad luck would have it, I had to answer my call to nature. So I roused from my sleep to do so. My buddy's yard was a fairly large-sized one, with an area of woods bordering most of it. After finishing, 
I staggered back over to my sleeping bag and noticed my friend was not in his. We were staged a few feet apart in case a bear came and got someone in the middle of the night or something. It would leave enough time for the other one to run to safety. You know, bro stuff. In any case, I catch him in my peripheral vision, just kind of standing along the side of a shed that was in his yard. I wasn't kidding when I said this night was picturesque. The sky was so unnaturally clear that the starlight and what little of the crescent moon we had left led to quite a bit of light despite being in the dead of night. However, the area we chose to pee with the shed included to be nestled along the part of the yard with the thickest trees leading to a large portion of the yard still being under heavy shadow. Kind of funny when you think about it. Having a well-defined area of shade in the dead of night when you're expecting everything to be dark. Oh, have I mentioned that at this point, everything was also suspiciously quiet. The idyllic chirping of the frogs and crickets that have earlier ushered me to sleep was now nowhere to be heard. I hadn't realized it when I first woke up to do my business, but it was quiet the whole time since I woke. Honestly, the fact that it was so quiet may have been why I woke up in the first place, on top of answering nature's call. Focusing my attention back on my friend, I noticed that he was still standing by the shed. He was around the corner away from me, so I had to approach him from behind, and thankfully it seemed as if he was done doing his business as his pants were up. Hey, what are you just doing standing around here? I ask, as I circle around behind him and approach to his left. I didn't even need to wait for an answer, before I immediately saw what had him frozen. Roughly 30 feet away, hidden among the thicker area of the forest in the yard, way back behind the shed. It stood. I'm not the greatest with words, so please bear with me, I will try to describe as best as I can what befell my eyes. This creature was perhaps a few inches taller than myself and stood at least six foot. However, that's where the similarities end. It stood on two legs with a hunched posture as it appeared to have had its shoulders raised up with its head leaning slightly forward. It had arms but the forearms were a bit longer than the upper arms, culminating into a sickly looking hand with long points, almost like claws. Though bathed in starlight and shadow, I could discern the skin of the beast was a dark grayish color. The head itself was mostly obscured by shadow, but retained a general humanoid appearance. I could not make out a mouth or jaw though, However, one unnerving thing about the head was that its eyes glue red. While perhaps glow is a bit of a sensationalization, it actually looked more like the red eye effect from old photos, but it definitely illuminated the immediate area around the eye socket. So perhaps illuminate is the better term. This creature was so sickeningly frail and thin that there was no way that it was just a neighbor messing with us, as it didn't seem physically possible for something so thin to even be able to support weight on such a frame. And then it started moving. At this point, my fight or flight response told me to get the hell out of there, but I stood frozen in fear. The beast already a horrific bastardization of the human form, now grotesquely bobbed its body up and down, as if attempting to take off in flight. I didn't notice it before, but there appeared to be a sort of cape behind its back. I say cape, but it appeared to be ragged, a fleshy texture, as if the skin on its back was flayed off and it was dragging behind its arms. This sickening flesh cape waved with each flap of its arms, giving the illusion of wings. But that wasn't even the worst part. It emitted a noise, not a growl, nor roar, nor scream. The sound it made was akin to a raspy inhale, like someone deeply out of breath. However, this wasn't like that. 
There was a sort of reverb to this breathing. It echoed quietly, yet still managed to be one of those sounds that you feel in your bones. Each graveling breath raking its claws into your very soul as you are already frozen in fear. This dance felt like it went on for hours, but in reality, only a few brief moments passed. Our bodies finally made enough adrenaline that we were able to finally bolt and sprint to his house. We spoke about it for the next few days following, but after a point, we just didn't feel like reliving it anymore until we researched what cryptids were and settled on the idea we came across one and decided people would think we were full of it and opted to not keep talking about it anymore. To this day, I still don't know what I encountered, but this experience has subconsciously kept me terrified of being in wooded areas after dark for all these years. In fact, last weekend, my wife and kids and I went camping at a state campground, and it was the first time I had been outside at night in the woods since that day, and I was terrified all night. Thankfully, nothing happened, and we had a nice weekend, but it's crazy that this experience affected me for so many years. My wife was the only other person I shared this experience with, and at first she laughed it off thinking I was kidding, until she saw how solemn I got when I spoke about it, and that it wasn't a joke to me. She then confided in me that she too had experienced something paranormal, so that's fun too. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Hopefully I was able to convey it properly. Superficially, I would say it resembled what people have described what the Mothman looked like, but I never saw it take flight, and the eyes didn't glow nearly as bright as reports made it out to. The wings only looked like wings when it was flapping its arms, and I doubt it could have actually flown with that raggedy skin flap. But I'm not going to stay and figure it out. Others say that it was some kind of crawler, but I suppose I'll never know. I was about 15 or 16 years old, and walking home from a friend's place at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with the friend I was living with at the time. My mate was pushing a BMX, and we were just talking and laughing as we walked home when all of a sudden we saw what looked like two very large greyhounds jump over a set of mailboxes at some flats and landed in the middle of the road. These mailboxes appeared to have been 1.5 metres tall and about 5 to 6 metres from the road. At the moment I thought it was a little strange but kept watching them. What I witnessed was something I will never forget in my life. The two greyhounds, as they ran down the road, appeared to both stand up on their hind legs and morph into a much bigger and much beefier being, which I can only describe as looking like a yaoi, which I guess is the equivalent to a Sasquatch to our friends from America and other countries. These yaoi both ran around the corner about 200 meters in the direction we came, and we both sat there dumbfounded a few seconds later, we heard what sounded like a small female child scream in terror, keeping in mind it was around 3 a.m. in the morning, and there were no children out. We both looked at each other in horror, without saying a word, and I jumped on the handlebars on the bike and he pedaled that bike non-stop all the way home about two kilometers away. When we got home, we locked the doors, as we had no idea what we just saw or if they had seen where we went. And after a little while, I asked him to describe what he had seen, and I was in disbelief, as he explained the exact same thing I witnessed. That is probably the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I've only told a few people about it, and don't think a single person has believed me. They all blame drugs or alcohol. I live in a small town called Bundaberg, 
in southeast Queensland, Australia. It's a small farming town on the coast, and the property we're on is surrounded by cane paddocks most of the year, unless they've been harvested, of course, which they are right now. I haven't always lived here. I lived with my mum for all of my life with my other brothers and two sisters, but my older brother lived with our grandparents and has been here on the property for about 15 years or so. Of course, I came and went visiting over the years, but I never witnessed this myself. Grandpa is the custodian and prince of the first people of the area, the Deribalum, and this property we're on is sacred and belongs to us through a native title, which Grandpa won many years ago. Grandpa was actually born on the Burnett River that runs through the property down the back. Anyway, as you know, you have the Sasquatch of the Americas, and I assume people have heard of the Yowie, or the Australian version of Bigfoot, also known as Quinkin. But these are the big guys, the giants, colloquially known as hairy men. There are also a different type, which we call Junjurdi, which are the little ones growing no bigger than five feet high. There's a story that my older brother used to tell me about how there was a whole group that used to hang out right where I'm sleeping, which is a shed. That's been done up about 30 or so meters from the house. But right here used to be a big, bushy, wild orange tree before there were any sheds. And this was a clean cut yard, completely wide open. You can see me clearly walking up from the shed through the sliding glass door when sitting in the lounge room. When the orange tree was there, apparently they used to hang out some nights and usually always in the early hours of the morning, even sleep under it. And my brother Renan and grandpa said you could clearly see them either from the lounge room or a bedroom window. But all the bedroom windows were on that one side of the house and apparently they just completely ignored them until they started messing around with my brother and cousins late at night. Sometimes they would tap and peek through the windows and that. One night my brother is sleeping in his bedroom and one of our cousins is in there. They're only 13 at the time. They slept with the window open for a breeze. Apparently our cousins wake up and sees this thing moving around in the room and looks at them and he just screams and cowers in the corner. My brother wakes up and freaks, screaming for Nan and Grandpa, running straight out the room and down the hallway. And this thing leaps out the window, knocking stuff off the drawers and runs off into the paddock. The next day, Grandpa went and chopped the orange tree down. Yes, he gave him a chance. But once they'd done that, it was time they made themselves scarce. We were playing manhunt, and we saw something swinging from the trees, like a dark brown black creature swinging. Never saw it again. Then years later when I was in high school, I'm working at a sub shop. My coworkers and I were the only ones on, and we're talking about the time when he was walking through the woods with his friend and saw something swinging through the trees and described the same thing. These woods in question are connected too. I was in a different set of woods around the park and it's old Native American grounds. A lot of my city is, but I was talking to three friends and was the only one facing a certain direction. When all of a sudden, I see a fluorescent green person running, almost like a full reflector suit. But as it's got maybe a 20 yard radius, it disappears mid stride. I've held on to this for years and just haven't been able to ever come up with an explanation for it. When I was six, my mum and I took a trip to Mexico to visit my grandparents. They lived in a small adobe house that was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by mountains, rivers and woods. It was beautiful, and I loved exploring the woods all day until the sun went down with my grandpa's two dogs. This particular day, the dogs and I would set out to explore as usual. 
but things were not about to go as they usually did. We set out at about 11 in the morning. We walked through the woods, occasionally ran into some stray chickens from nearby farms, collected sticks, stones, and whatever else I found interesting in that moment. And finally, I came upon this creek where I found a small dead turtle. I had gone deeper into the woods that day than any other day. So this creek was new to me. So I decided to stop there and let the dogs get a drink and cool off while I played in the water. Once they had rested for a little bit and I was done playing, I decided to continue further in and explore some more since it was still early. So we crossed the creek and this is where things got strange. We crossed the creek and the next thing I knew, we were behind a group of trees. The creek was not behind us anymore, so we had obviously walked far enough for it to have gone out of sight. But how? We had just crossed it a few seconds ago. At least, that is all I remember. Well, as we were behind these trees, I noticed the dogs staring intensely at something beyond the trees. So I decided to take a look. What I saw, I cannot explain to this day. I saw a bunch of tiny little beings that looked like tiny people. They were just walking around and did not seem to notice us. They looked like they could fit into the palm of your hand. Their skin was the color of normal skin and they appeared to be wearing greenish brownish colored clothing or what I assumed to be clothing. They did not have hair. I just stared at them and remained hidden behind the trees. Luckily, my grandpa's dogs were so well trained that they would not make a sound or attack anything unless you made a specific sound that they understood as you give them an order to attack. After observing them for a while, I decided to turn around and start walking back. Suddenly, the next thing I knew I was crossing the creek again, heading out of the woods. Again, like when I first crossed the creek to go into the woods, it was like my memory just stopped the moment I turned around to walk away and fast forwarded to me crossing the creek to leave. I have no memory of which path I took to reach the spot to where those tiny beings were or what path I took to get back to the creek to be able to go home, even stranger is that the sun was beginning to set when I crossed the creek to get back out. But it was barely 11 in the morning when we'd gone into the woods. So I lost hours of time. This is all I remember from that day. I'm 25 now and have never been able to remember the parts that got lost. In December of 2011, my husband and I moved to my husband's childhood home in rural southeast Oklahoma. His father died in 2007 and the deed was transferred to my husband's name. The house is located about 175 yards from the community church and its small graveyard. This is a Native American community. It was small and very rural surrounded by hills and thick woods with intermittent cow pastures and community that consisted of a huge family network and extended family, about five or six generations of them. There are 16 homes with an acre each lot. It's country after all. Before we moved into my husband's home, he told me about some weird paranormal activity he and his family experienced at the same home when he was younger. I've had one or two experiences prior to moving to Oklahoma, but nothing on this level. Once we moved in, little things would happen every now and then. My story is about a specific experience I had while I was sitting in our living room one evening. I was watching TV with my husband and our 10 month old daughter in a walker. I had a view of the hallway that leads to our bedrooms and bathroom. My husband walked into the gallery for a drink 
with our little girl following behind him in her walker. At that very moment, they disappeared behind the kitchen wall. From the corner of my eye, I saw what I interpreted to be our ten-month-old go from one of the bedrooms into the hallway. All I saw was the back of the head of whatever it was. I was confused for a second, so I asked my husband if our daughter was with him, just to be sure our daughter was with him in the kitchen, because we always tried to keep her away from the hallway just to be safe. Yeah, why? I got so grouped out, because whatever I had seen was about her height, but walking without a walker. All I caught was the back of a head of a short person entering the bathroom. I told my husband right away, and so he checked it out for me. But there wasn't anyone else in the house with us. After some more experiences, I started to smudge the house on a regular basis. We ended up splitting up for a while, and I moved back home in the summer of 2014. My husband had more intense, scary experiences while he was living there alone during our separation, but I'll save those stories for another time. About ten years ago. My boyfriend and I were in bed sleeping. He jerked awake and started inching up towards the headboard, which woke me. He was making scared moans, and was looking at the foot of our bed. I looked at where he was looking and saw a short man with frizzly hair and a pig snout and jowls staring at him. Not me, him. He started screaming to turn on the light, and I was reaching over to do that when it lunged at him and made a weird grunting noise. I turned the light on, and when I did, it vanished. We started talking about what we saw. I would say he had frizzy hair, and he said yes, a pig snout and jowls. Our descriptions matched perfectly. I felt this wave of absolute malevolence rolling off this creature and towards my boyfriend, not at me but at him. We tried to recreate it with lights and shadows, but couldn't. We slept in the living room that night. We didn't leave the house. I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't know what else to think, and I still get goosebumps thinking or writing about it. I haven't told my current boyfriend because I don't want to scare him. I'm still in the building, and I haven't felt that evil thing since my ex-boyfriend moved out. So a cryptid can be just about any creature that hasn't been documented or is unexplainable. Such as the Skimwalker, the Rake, the Wendigo, Black-eyed Kids, and many others. But now that we've had a general overview of what a cryptid is in our last collection of stories, why don't we double down and listen to some of Skinwalkers? My name is Valadin. I'm 25, and I moved to Kentucky from Vladivostok. When I was ten years old, my parents divorced, and I went with my father, while my mother stayed in Russia. My father served in the Soviet military, specifically in the VDV. He was diagnosed with cancer when I was nineteen, and sadly passed six months later. He left me all of his military gear that he kept when the USSR collapsed, including his rifle. And the cabin that he owns in the south of Kentucky, close to the Tennessee border. This information is purely contextual. My father trained me very well in survival, so that I could be strong like him. I spent much time camping and hiking. I had a couple of friends who would often come with me while in high school: Grisha from Serbian descent, and James, a redneck. After high school, though, James and I got out of touch. But Grisha and I remained close. One day, James texted me and asked if I wanted to go camping. I felt like this would be a good chance to rekindle our friendship, and I offered to have us camp at my father's old cabin. He asked if he could bring his new girlfriend, and I said it would be fine. But not wanting to feel like a third wheel at my own party, I thought I'd invite Grisha along too. Unfortunately, he was busy with work, so he couldn't come. Fast forward two weeks, and I drive up to the mountains and go to my father's old cabin, which is now mine. I parked my SUV, grabbed my backpack full of gear, spare clothes, including my father's old VDV uniform, 
MREs and my rifle. I had brought 500 rounds of ammo with me, and I began to settle in, lit the fireplace, laid out my sleeping bag in the loft, and broke out a bottle of vodka. James was due to arrive the following evening. I had a few drinks and the sun was setting, so I cooked up some MRE eggs and bacon, and after eating, I went to use the outhouse. I sat in the outhouse doing my business. I was quite excited to be away from work and reconnecting with my friend. When I left the outhouse, something smelt awful. It's like the smell of rotten eggs, but I brushed it off as one of the various scents of being in the wilderness and returned back to the cabin, trying to forget about the odd scent. I drank some more vodka and went to sleep. Turns out I slept like a rock for almost a day and I awoke with a bad hangover. After being awake for a little while, I brewed myself some coffee when I heard tires coming up the driveway. In my haze, I had forgotten that James was coming. I was on edge and grabbed my rifle. When I looked out the window to see a beaten up Dodge Ram coming up the road, then I remembered and it all clicked. I felt happy when I saw James driving it until I saw who was sitting next to him. It wasn't just his girlfriend. It was one of my exes. Her name was Alicia. My stomach began to turn. We had broken up less than three months ago. I wasn't really sure how to handle this situation. I felt angry, but still wanted to fix our friendship. He got out of the truck. His loud country music was loud enough to scare off much of the wildlife, which gets on my nerves. They came in and sat in total silence. The tension was so heavy in the air, you could cut it with a knife. Man, you guys are pretty awkward. Have you met before? I became angry and just said, ask her. I could see Alicia's face shift to one of anger. Listen, you Euro trash, you're the one who said I could come. We don't need your crap to start. James asked her to calm down, and they stepped outside, and I'm assuming she explained everything to him. James came back inside without her and was quite angry. He slapped me across the face and asked me why I had cheated on her. I hadn't. It was the other way around. I was angry that she lied about me, and then being slapped had pushed me over the edge and I punched him in the face and pinned him against the wall with my forearm against his throat and asked him what his problem was. He spat in my face and asked me to let him go. I started to twitch with anger. We then heard Alicia scream outside and she threw the door open. I released him from my grip and he gasped for breath and I began to calm down, as did he. James asked what was happening. She yelled out that she saw someone outside. She was sweating and her face was white. What do you mean, you saw someone? James probed. I saw a big man in the woods. He was, he, uh, he looked like he was wearing a goat mask. It's gotta be some silly, psycho, hillbilly, satanic cultist, we thought. I broke my silence and called her out. This is my family land. There's no one around for miles. The closest neighbor is five miles away. She called me an ass and told me that if I didn't go look, she was going to call the cops and say that I hit her. I wanted to avoid dealing with the police, so I grabbed my father's old rifle and stepped out. I looked angrily at James and said, you're really just gonna sit here and let her do this? You're some kind of friend. I walked out. The sky was clear and the moon illuminated the clearing that the cabin sat in. I put a 30 round magazine into my rifle and readied myself. I silently prayed to St. Michael and walked to the back of the cabin and held my rifle in the low ready position. I heard a branch snap in the forest. I looked in that direction and pointed my rifle towards the sound. I heard the sound of the cabin door shut and then I heard two car doors shut as well. James' truck started and floored it down the road. James yelled out the window, Screw you and your communist dad, you can get killed by the cultist. I thought, 
Thanks, ass. I was distracted enough to forget about whatever was in the forest, but then I heard something saying what James had just said. It sounded like, screw you and your communist dad, but it sounded wrong. It sounded like an animal was trying to talk, like one of those cats or dogs you see on YouTube, but it was trying to put together a sentence. Then I realized I could smell the rotten egg smell. I began to yell in Russian to seem intimidating. That is when I saw a pair of yellow eyes rise up. They had to be eight feet off the ground, and I knew it wasn't normal. I heard my dad's voice in my head. He's the one who told me to never be afraid to defend yourself. I grew angry that this person was mocking my painful situation and that they were trespassing. I unloaded all 30 rounds and grabbed the spare magazine in my back pocket and began to back towards the cabin. I made it back inside. I threw the bar over the door and sat without sleeping. And I heard it outside still, mocking my voice and James's and Alicia's voices, mimicking what we had said. I eventually passed out due to running out of adrenaline. I woke up, grabbed my stuff, and left. I never heard from James or the she-devil again, and I have been back to the cabin often, but have never seen anything since. This happened about four years ago now. It was the 4th of July. A few of my friends wanted to do something instead of just lounge in front of our computers like we did every day. There were five of us, me, Neil, Elijah, JD, and Neil's sister, Katie. Neil had the idea to go to his grandparents' house as they owned a farmhouse. We live in Texas. So having that much space, especially with other houses being half a mile out, it was the perfect place to pop fireworks without getting into too much trouble. The drive from where we lived to their house was about a 40 mile drive. Unfortunately, the only car we had at our hands was a two door, so trying to fit five of us into one car was hectic to say the least. The drive was actually tolerable. Three of my friends in the back found a comfortable yet funny position to sit in the car. The music Katie was playing was helping a lot and definitely passed the time. We all bought some fireworks halfway there and my friends jumped back into their designated position for another 20 miles. As we got there, Neil forgot to mention that his grandparents were out of town for the week, which made the experience ahead of us even better. All of us got out of the car except for Katie, who suggested she would get us all food and sodas for the night. She kept the fireworks in the back because she didn't want us popping any while she was gone. She drove off and all of us were left without fireworks. So we did the next best thing and went to the pool in the back. Something that already put me off was that the ranch sat considerably near a forest. Neil even went the extra step to tell me that there are occasional wolves that can be a hassle to deal with. Of course, I got nervous because I had nothing to defend myself with if one jumped over the fence. He handed me his pocket knife, saying that there's a shotgun in the living room if something goes down. He mentioned that he was going to set up a game of risk for us to play while Katie was gone, as the drive to the nearest market was over a few miles away. So Elijah and I sat poolside telling stories to each other about stupid stuff that happened while we were in college. During our talk, I was staring out into the forest line, paranoid about the aforementioned wolves that Neil teased me about. I saw something move. I couldn't tell since the porch light behind me was making it harder to see any details, but the way it moved made my heart jump. Elijah could see my body language change as I leaned in to see what was there. He started to ask me what I saw, and I thought I saw a wolf on the tree line. He looked towards where I pointed and calmed down. That's just Katie, dude, she's trying to scare us. He started calling her name, waving his arm and laughing, saying how she scared the hell out of me. 
Neil came out of the house, wondering what Elijah was screaming about. Then he saw his sister standing in the field. He started to laugh when Elijah told him what happened, and how I was on the edge of my seat. JD came out of the house next, and Neil told him to help Katie with the bags and grab the fireworks. Katie, who was out in the field, started to wave back, but the wave definitely seemed out of place. It wasn't so much of a wave as a jerk motion, like you were trying to pop your elbow. Elijah yelled for Katie to come back so that we could start the party, but JD came back with a terrified look on his face. Katie's not back yet. I just called her. She's still on the road to Walmart. The laughing died abruptly, and Elijah's face faded. His arm fell on top of his lap with a thud. Everyone looked at the still jerking figure in the field. Then, she screamed. The scream was so loud it sounded like it may as well have been a few feet in front of us. We all scrambled, running to the house, slamming the door behind us. Neil shouted for us to all lock the doors and to grab the shotgun in our living room. I ran to grab his shotgun. As it was the closest thing to us, while the other two ran to each of the doors leading outside. Quickly, I grabbed the shotgun and stuffed a few shells into my pocket, running back to the kitchen where we came from, and handed the gun to Neil. I pulled out the shells, set them on the counter, and he loaded one in. J D came back covered in sweat, freaking out, and shouting about what the hell was that thing. We were all just as scared as each other. I look at them both. Elijah quickly joining us again. You don't think it was a、uh, one of those skinwalkers, do you? I've read stories on 4chan and creepypastas, but I thought it was all fake. JD reassured us, saying that that was just children's tales, and to not believe nonsense we read on the internet, and that he was fairly sure it was Katie. Pulling a very elaborate prank. Cut the bullshit, JD. That scream wasn't human. He turned back to the door, pushing the blind slightly, to find that Katie was closer to us. It stood at the gates of the pool, illuminated by the light, and revealing to us something that didn't look much like Katie at all. The hair was a mess. The clothes looked tattered. Her skin bruised. The one thing that caught our eye the most was her face. Her head was tilted, almost as if it was struggling to support the weight. The eyes were blank. The jaw was agape. It raised an arm, jerking, as it did before in a mock wave. The jerking, however, started to get more violent. And the entire body began shaking uncontrollably. Neil quickly closed the curtains and backed off. He ordered us to sit back behind the counter, and set himself in the gap, leading into the kitchen. Gun aimed at the door. It was silent for what felt like an hour. The three of us continued to look at Neil, who was completely focused on the door. A massive, grotesque smell entered our noses. As all of us reacted appropriately, the horrid stench was like if you left groceries to ferment in a box in the summer heat, with a few carcasses as garnish. It was hard to breathe, tasting the smell in the back of your throat, even with your nose pinched. It was so bad, JD actually threw up. Then, without warning, the smell was gone. The hot air that was the smell went away. And suddenly it was easier to breathe. I was afraid to let go of my nose, but was rewarded with a breath of fresh air. Everyone took a couple of breaths to rid their lungs of the pungent smell that lingered beforehand. Neil asked us if we were okay, and we all replied. J D being an exception, as he puked, we heard what sounded like a whine. It sounded like a mix between a dog and a child about to cry. It wasn't coming from the porch door, but from the front, where we came in front of the car. All of us stood up, Neil moving forward while we stayed back. 
we knelt down by the stairs, still hearing the whining. It didn't hit me until we positioned ourselves, but it sounded like something was trying to talk for the first time. In a raspy, high-pitched voice, I could make out small portions of sounds. It kept repeating sounds until it started to sound more enunciated. It sounded like JD, same accent, same speech pattern, nearly the same voice. JD started to shiver and shouted back in a scared voice to leave and get out now. But the thing imitated him. The last words that were heard were in the same scream we heard when we saw it initially. It began pounding on the door, not like it was trying to force itself in, but like an impatient knock. It started to scream in the same pitch we heard it when we initially saw it. It terrified all of us. The inhuman screams, the polite pounding on the door. I started crying. I thought this was it. Neil wasn't scared like us, though. He was pissed. He stood up, storming towards the door, screaming. He swung open the door, pointed his shotgun at whatever was on the other side, pulling the trigger, filling all our ears with the sound of the shotgun blast and the ringing to follow. Neil stood at the door, huffing. His body language was wanting to rip this thing apart. I stood up, looking past his arm, seeing nothing but a shell on the ground. I looked up past his shoulders, seeing nothing but the driveway and the road leading back to where we came from. He turned around, the adrenaline fading away, and a shaky voice coming from his mouth. We're, we're not staying here. JD, call Katie. Tell her to come back. The rest of the time, all of us were in the kitchen. The shotgun sat on the counter with several shells near the butt of the gun. None of us wanted to say anything. None of us wanted to look at each other. It was nothing but silence, until Katie called us. Neil quickly wrote a note, leaving it on the gun as we left. All of us hopped into the car, silent. Katie noticed our behaviour and constantly egged us to tell her what happened. She pouted, put her music on the radio to cheer us up. But the only thing I could hear was the blood-curdling scream telling us to get out. I would often go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it, since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loved the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course all the amazing wildlife I would see. Now I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest to me was like my true home. I always preferred being near trees and dirt rather than buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were much quieter and more peaceful, and I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this recurring dream during the last two weeks of my school year. I'd be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always strangely quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me, usually in my dream. I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, usually a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five, and it lasted until I was perhaps eleven. Over the years, it would be the exact same thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on my hike with it alongside me. But about having this dream for the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel a bit uneasy about this fox. I would hear it making odd noises, but every time I went to look back, it was walking like nothing was wrong, even, somehow, giving me a smile. Now that the dream's out the way, 
I can talk to you about my first true encounter. I was six years old and going on a camping trip with my Grammy and Gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited for it, barely being able to keep myself in my school seat for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats, me always being in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep in the woods and far from other people, as my Gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we camped. As they were getting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig when I noticed how strangely quiet the woods were. It was never quiet not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it, as I continued to dig for bugs. However, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would usually call me Sugar Bugger, that being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I heard, but it sounded like it was very far away and somewhat sick. I looked up, where I heard it coming from, that being from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about my weird encounter though, as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars there never being anywhere I lived. We started to get sleepy around nine and we got ready for bed. There were bunk beds that my Gammy and I would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my Gampy's snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up that late in the night, since I always have had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side, trying to fall back asleep until I heard it again. Sugar bugger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I sat there frozen in fear. I was trying to brush it off, as tree branches or rain. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I could tell that it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look, which was a big mistake. I pulled the curtains away to only peek, and what I saw were these large, yellow eyes. They seemed glassy, yet not entirely real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked, quickly closed the curtain back up, and then hid under the blanket. That being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I had never been so terrified in all my life. I just curled up into my Grammy's side and clung to her all night long. The damn tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. And I remember my Gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I'd gotten up quick enough, we could still go fishing. I honestly didn't want to leave the trailer at all, terrified that whatever I saw that night was out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was constantly looking around, horrified that whatever I saw would get me. 
My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug. When she saw me, she asked what was wrong. I told her what I saw and heard, and surprisingly she believed me. The next thing I knew she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a little to convince him, but he did eventually start picking up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so that I could probably sleep, but I couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, and that if I opened my eyes for a second it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far away when I heard it again, but this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. At that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes when we heard it. Then she got into the truck with me and pulled me in tight in a protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was sobbing so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed he'd take me home. We started to head out of the campsite. Still heard that this trip had been ruined by something, but I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did so, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something. A red fox sitting in the middle of the campsite sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its mouth into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to the campsite. We did continue the camp, but in more populated areas. I didn't tell my grandma what I saw, but she told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities and that it would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of this story, but it's not. There was one more encounter I had with this creature, and it's much more terrifying than the first. The second encounter I had was when I was 17. By this time, I very well knew what a skinwalker was, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas, still worried about seeing the fox, but I never really thought too much into it. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up in a mountainous area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there isn't much reception at all, so unless we hooked onto their Wi-Fi, we basically had no phones. I didn't mind the house, still loved the woods no matter what happened, although it irked me that they didn't close their window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see in. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything happen to us kids. Luckily, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could all look outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black Labrador, about a year old, called Pam. She was very playful, and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. Although she was easily excitable, she was a good puppy. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Although I'm a girl, I would rather have gone hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early, since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was really chilly in the morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam, it being a good way for her to get her exercise in and have fun. About an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued the walk, I began to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had suddenly become, hearing only our footsteps and my brother talking to my uncle. Pam noticed it too, her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get to my brother worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby. I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at the time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. 
I began to feel that horrible feeling again. That ice-cold fear I felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I would worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six-year-old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though. Seeing my shoelace came undone, I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. But that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. At that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still with those horrid yellow eyes and the same smile. Only this time I saw it much clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell of it was like decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox, the back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it, but now they looked emptier than I remember. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I couldn't. I was frozen, as I was too scared to even blink. But I heard it speak again. This time, however, it mimicked my little brother's voice found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a little song under his breath keeping my brother and myself close. I was too scared to look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that the thing was after me, and she protected me. I was very grateful that she was with us, as who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I spoke with my uncle and aunt. Once I told them what happened and what I saw, they had started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tightly. My aunt putting something around the doors, I think it was probably ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short, as they were worried that I was not safe while in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day, them making an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they needed to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I left those woods, I did feel safe again. Before they had to drive me back home though, they told me it wasn't my fault and that luckily it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. Is it still around? How? Why? What did it want with me? Does it want my skin, my soul, or will I just be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have the answers to these questions, and that is what really scares me. Now, I've long since moved from California and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far nothing has found me. While I'm happy it hasn't, the concern is still there. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who truly knows how to get rid of this thing, and that's why I'm sharing this story with you now, so that I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, help me. I've got a cousin down in Mississippi. He's a combat medic for the Mississippi National Guard, and he said he saw something out in the woods on a training op. A kind of mini war games type deal. But what he described seriously impacted me. 
Let's see what you make of it. There were two war platoons per company, and two companies per team. Camp A, his camp, set up northwest of Yellow Creek, and the enemy, set up just south of a farm off Waynesboro, Shibuta, which is east of Waller's Ridge Road. So the exercise starts at midnight, and his platoon commander decides he may as well send out a group recon to scout a good ambush position, or at the very least, figure out what the enemy was up to. So my cousin's squad sets off north following some dirt trails, but keeping just off to the side in case they run into an enemy patrol. So, by about 2.30, they're about 500 meters out of the enemy's camp, slinking around a marsh, which puts them in clear sight through a power line, cut out through the woods. So the marksman pulls out his binoculars to check if the way is clear, and upon glancing just goes plain white and freezes. A few seconds later, the sergeant pulls his sorry ass back to the tree line and asks him, what the hell were you thinking? And the marksman, clearly about to crap himself, stammers something. Huh, there's something down the line. It ain't human, it ain't human. Everyone stood there in shock for a few seconds before some of the others decide to check for themselves. What they saw was described to me as a seven or eight foot tall furry thing. It's as if you took a coyote and put it on a stretching rack with matted white or gray fur with what looked like dried blood all over its chest. Its hind legs were 11 kinds of messed up, incredibly long and slender with knees backwards. The thing was just standing out in the open, sniffing around as if it were trying to track something. So the sergeant radios the sighting into Company HQ and gets back. Get the hell out of there. Keep your heads down and keep off the roads. Get some live rounds and weapons free. The game is off. So his squad gets the hell out, and the marksman, who at this point has finished having his panic attack, checks again. This time with his scope, rather than binoculars and the squad hurries back to Company HQ. When they get there, the sight is something to behold. Mounted patrol vehicles storming around the camp, spotlights scanning the tree line, comms going crazy with people seeing stuff in the woods, and another platoon had to be called to secure the area. There were no training exercises for the rest of the month, and an official order had to, and I quote, keep quiet and not tell anyone, not even family, had been put in order which needless to say, my cousin promptly ignored. To this day, he was sure it was a skinwalker. This is my mother's story, and she allowed me to share it. I'll be telling it from her perspective. We live in the desert, and things are always weird. So I was watching Netflix while laying in bed, and heard the chime of the security camera app notification. Now I had the app set that only the front door would give loud alerts at this time of night. But all the cameras were recording, just not providing alerts. This made me curious as to what is out there this late. And I sat and checked the recording. I saw a large coyote pacing in and out of the front door patio space, which is not very large and sort of enclosed. I thought that it was kind of odd since it didn't really look like the coyote was hunting anything and there's nothing in that area to pique the coyote's interest. So I started heading to the front door. I got to the door and looked through the peephole to see if I could see any animals that it might be hunting for and what I saw stole my breath. I saw what was the back of a bald head in the peephole. It stood for about a minute, not moving nor breathing and this bald head never moved either. Let me be clear. This looked like a man standing very close to the door with his back turned to it. Finally, I ran to the dining room to get a clear view of who was standing there. But when I got there, no one was there. And when I went back to the peephole again to check, nothing was there anymore. Now, there's no way anyone could walk in any direction without alerting one of the cameras around my home. So I checked the recordings. After the coyote, there was nothing. This freaked me the hell out as the cameras are set to record motion and clearly caught the coyote, but never showed anyone walking up or leaving. If anyone has an explanation that gives me peace of mind, 
I'd appreciate it. My immediate thought? Skinwalker. When I turned 18, my brother and his friends took me camping in a spot called the Devil's Hole in Barrington Tops, northwest of Sydney, Australia. It was just a typical camping spot, a clearing in the trees with enough room to set up a few tents and a fire pit in the middle. After a day of four-wheel driving in the roads around the campsite, we went hunting for firewood and gathered a sizable pile, including an entire fallen gum tree about 30 meters long. Night fell, the fire was roaring, and beer was being consumed in great quantities. As usual, people were going off into the trees frequently for a pee, making more room for more beer. At one point, I headed into the bush, to a spot I'd claimed as my own personal toilet. My brother followed me with a torch, since it was pitch black, and it's not a bad idea to stick together in the Australian bush. We walked along a small path, about 50 meters from the campsite. After emptying our bladders, we turned back around onto the same path. We went about five meters when we noticed something standing on the path. A kangaroo, probably, 1.5 meters tall, standing there looking at us. We didn't hear it approach, which was strange since it was fairly dense bush, and there were sticks and leaves all over the ground. The kangaroo bounded off into the darkness, revealing something even more unusual. Behind it, on the formerly empty path, were three sticks standing in a triangle shape tied together at the top. We went in for a closer look. It was the way back to the campsite anyway. Sitting on the top of three sticks was a small human-shaped figure made out of twigs. Underneath the triangle was a piece of tree bark covered in different colored paints. At this point, we were pretty confused, but being a pair of drunk idiots, we picked up the stuff and headed back to the campsite and threw it in the fire. We didn't see any other signs of kangaroos, or wildlife really in general, over the rest of the time there, another day and night. Just that one lone kangaroo that appeared out of thin air. After a few years, I did some research, and it's possible we encountered a cordeicha an aboriginal ritual executioner, sometimes compared to a skimwalker. My mum and I were driving home after having dinner slash lunch at our new property with our friends. My aunt is in front of us and we're following her home as she's doing the same thing to us since we live pretty close together. We reach a bend and my aunt slows down and her lights shine on a dock. Immediately, my mum recognises it and says, Ah, oh, look at the cute dog. It's taller than the average dog, and very wide, but not in an overfed way. Its hair is very long and matted, some pieces reaching the floor and jet black. Its face is huge and smiling with yellow eyes, mouth ajar. I tell her before she finishes her sentence that it's not a dog, about three times in a row. She responds with, Yes, it is. It, Oh my god, it isn't. Before she could tell me it was a dog, it stared her right in the eye. Windows tinted up. She feels the same chill as I did when I originally saw it. After glancing at it, I no longer looked at it directly, because I know they hear what you think. Its gait was as if a human was on all fours, extremely disproportionate and large. I've never seen fur that long on a dog. It looked as if a pelt was thrown on it and hanging loosely. We get home and my aunt says she didn't even see it, though we assumed she slowed down to look at it since my mum and aunt were very big animal lovers and affectionate. We get inside and my aunt drives home. We discuss it and she agrees that it was not a dog. I've experienced the same thing a few times before, but I believe once you know, you can always recognise them. Now that we're escaping the woods, why don't we find this first sign of civilization and head there? Ah, look, a gas station. That's perfect. Somewhere safe, somewhere quiet, where we can get a nice drink and relax a little while before our journey continues. I live in the downtown area of a pretty major city. My street is relatively quiet, 
but I can't say so much for the surrounding neighborhoods. My city as a whole is infamous for drug activity and armed violence. We also have an increasing number of homeless people as our shelters have almost all closed down. I've generally never minded, stuff happens, and I didn't grow up in the best of circumstances either. I would never stereotype anyone based on their housing status, and I was even involved with a homeless outreach program at the time. I left and never went back after this, and I've been hesitant to help anyone since. It's 10 or so at night, and I'm heading to my partner's parents' house, about 30 minutes away from my own. I get about two blocks away before remembering I need gas. I'm not too fond of the idea of stopping at a gas station near my apartment at the time, because it was quite late, but I wasn't going to make it all the way out into the suburbs without it. So I pull into the one of the not so great parts of the neighborhood, but it was brightly lit and there were a lot of people walking by so I try not to think too much of it. I get my gas and go to grab a few snacks. When I come back out, a tall man in a dark coat and a brown beanie started casually chatting to me. I couldn't tell if he was 25 or 40. His voice was so low I could barely make out what he was saying. Something about being a music producer and working on a new project. He seemed friendly enough, while maybe a little erratic. So I let him ramble for a few minutes before politely telling him I needed to get going. He tells me his name is Mac. I unlock my door and get in, and this guy gets in the passenger seat with me. At this point, he is no longer a friendly, chatty stranger. I'm terrified. His demeanor hasn't changed though, and he's acting like it's the most normal thing in the world. While I've had more than my fair share of encounters with creeps, nothing like this has ever happened to me. I don't scream, I don't tell him to piss off. I sit there in fear of what he's gonna do if I resist it. I need money for my son, he says. He's in the hospital with a gunshot wound. His mom's waiting for me. I know this story is a complete and utter farce, but I just want him out of my car. I give him what little I have in my wallet and tell him I need him to get going. Can you drive me to my friend's house? It's right up the road. What? Isn't he supposed to be going to the hospital for his son? I try to decline as politely as possible and tell him my boyfriend is waiting for me. And this opens the floodgates to a bunch of personal questions about my life. What my boyfriend and I are going to do when I get there, and extremely gross, unsolicited comments about my body. I've tried to block out his exact words, but it was incredibly vile. And at this point, I'm sure that this is the end. I'm trapped in my own car. The gas station parking lot is empty and I can't call the police. And even if I could, would it be a bad idea? I wish I could tell you I had some genius idea that helped me to get out of this, but I didn't. I'm panicked and frozen, and finally agree to take him to where he supposedly wanted to go. He has me drive around this neighborhood winding through dark side streets with a lot of seemingly abandoned houses for what seems like forever. He finally had me stop in a parking lot of a beauty salon where his friend supposedly works and is gonna get a ride with her to the hospital. The parking lot is on a very busy street and brightly lit. If he were gonna end me, he picked a terrible place to do it. He was all over the place and speaking rapidly. Little details of his story kept changing consistently, as he's clearly high as a kite and probably mentally unstable too. All the while, he continues to act like we were lifelong friends and nothing about this entire situation was remotely terrifying. He keeps telling me he would give anything to trade places with my boyfriend. Ugh, gross. And I gently keep reminding him I need to be leaving. And he keeps telling me to stay because this friend will give me money and pay me back for helping his son out. I wonder why she couldn't just have given him the money directly if that were the case. I ask him what's taking his friend so long and he says he doesn't know and asks if he can use my phone to call. I say no. Maybe this was all an elaborate ploy to steal my phone and take off. I'm still thinking he could end me though. So I reluctantly hand the phone over although I should have dialed the number for him, and he's taking a long time to dial while I'm looking away. And then all of a sudden, he's looking up. And then before I know it, he's looking up the adult section of the internet, 
and has taken out his member there and then. I wish I had a way to prove this, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. At this point, the image is burned into my mind. Should have seen that one coming, I guess. I lose my call and tell him to get out and that I'm done. What do you think he does? He starts crying, wailing about how hot I am and he hates to think about me with another man and how I turned him on so much. I'm staring at him in disbelief like, okay, but you need to get out now. He straightens up with a big smile on his face and goes, I'm just messing with you. I wouldn't cry like that. Are you sure you don't wanna take me to a completely different location? Yes, I'm sure. I told him my boyfriend was probably worried about me as I'd had to have been there an hour ago at this point. And somehow that got his attention and he left. I drove to my partner's house shaking. He and I had just started dating at this point and I didn't want him to think I was stupid or something. So I nonchalantly told him I was dealing with a creep at the gas station and it took me a little while. Much later, I told him the real story and he was appropriately horrified. I wish I could say it stopped there, but I started getting calls from all kinds of local numbers for the next few weeks. Only one voicemail was left and it was just a lot of breathing and very faint words I couldn't make out. I'm creeped out by this, but tried to dismiss it as paranoia. One time, I actually answered. Hey, it's Mac. I, I have your money. I felt like I needed to throw up. I don't need it, leave me alone. I hang up as he starts rambling about how beautiful I am and all this other stuff. How he can't wait to see me again. I block every strange number that's been calling me and the calls stop. I can't imagine how he got it. My only thoughts was that when he opened my phone to call his friend, he looked at my contacts where my own number was displayed at the top. You may never wonder why I never called the cops. My city is extremely well known for its police using excessive force, especially in the downtown area. People regularly lose their lives by the police here and I've personally witnessed someone being beaten up by the cops for quite minor infractions. I'm not intending to make this any kind of political statement or expressing my opinions here, but I genuinely felt like I would have been putting myself in further danger by calling the cops even after this were over. Best case scenario, nothing would have been done and I would have been chewed out by the cops for being stupid enough to let this man in my car. Worst case, something terrible happens to the guy and I have to live with that for the rest of my life. I've regretted that since though because a friend of mine later had an encounter with him as well on a complete opposite side of the city and gave her the same story about his son in hospital. She ended up driving him around aimlessly for an hour before screaming at him to get the hell out. So Mac, you're welcome. But let's never meet again. Let me take you back to the summer of 2016. I was 15 when all of the weird clown stuff was happening. Me and my little sister and my mother went on a road trip to see my grandparents. Now at this point we were on our way back home and we were in Georgia. We stopped at a gas station around 6 a.m. and it was still very dim outside. My sister and I were dead asleep until we heard my mum leave the car. My sister was still asleep. Let me set up the scene real quick. Me and my sister were laying in the back seat. Her head was on the opposite side of the car and we were directly next to each other on the seat so I could see perfectly out of her side of the window. Anyway, I wake up and I'm really groggy, but suddenly my attention is jerked to maximum capacity when I heard a horrifying, pitchy laugh that didn't even sound real. In that moment though, I was in some weird lucid dream state until I snapped back to reality. I sat up 90 degrees and looked out the windshield. Then there was this man with a red balloon dressed up very similarly to the original Pennywise, but dirtier and cheaper. I watched in actual disbelief as he went from person to person laughing in people's faces. He went up to a little girl of about six and her mother, pinched their cheeks, got up in her face and said something along the lines of, hey princess, wanna be my friend? And when the mum hit him and screamed to get the hell away from them, he started maniacally laughing. Then he skipped over to my mum's car, saw me inside literally shaking under my blanket 
and pressed his face up against the glass really hard and started pointing and laughing. I pulled the blankets up above my head, but I could still hear him laughing his butt off. I swear I heard him try and jiggle the door handle a few times as well. The only thing that sent him away was the same mother of the little girl yelling at him and threatening to call the police. I heard him leave, and so when I sat up I saw him skipping away, and he was still laughing. It almost sounded like gagging at this point. I mean honestly about 45 minutes after he left, we came across an active missing person search in a forest by the road. Not too far away from that gas station. I have no idea if he was involved, but I remember riding by and feeling like it could have easily been my sister or I. I was 15 then, and 19 now. I'm a 19 year old dude that loves horror movies, gore and scary things. But the details of this weird ass experience have never left my mind. Although I was really upset at the time, I'm glad I have an interesting story to share with all of you. But it's really scary to think about what would have happened if the car doors weren't locked. It makes me nauseous. My family live a state away from me, and at the time that this happened, I had just turned 18. I'm a 21 year old female, and my mom would finally let me drive to go see them which was about a five and a half hour drive. No biggie. I was like, but I can smoke some weed on the drive that easy. And I did just that. About halfway there, I needed to stop and get gas and snacks. As you can guess, I had the munchies. I wasn't very familiar with the drive or where the gas stations were on it. And they were kind of spread out. So as soon as I felt it wasn't smart to wait until another gas station came up, I pulled off the highway. I have always been sort of suspicious of people in general, because I've not had an easy childhood and grew up learning to just kind of feel when things aren't right. So I wasn't really worried about being by myself because I knew how to handle myself. So I pull up to this relatively empty gas station, maybe with one or two other cars, but it was a larger one with one of those antique shops in it. I parked at a pump, locked my doors and go inside. There was no one at the counter yet, and a sign was on the counter saying that they would be right back. So I go and pick up a snack and a drink. Well, when I previously walked in, I noticed a man in his late twenties, kind of wandering in the store. I saw him glance over at me when I walked in, but didn't really think about it, not really paying him any mind. I went and opened the door to the soda fridge and was perusing them when he comes right up next to me and opens the one next to mine. This wasn't particularly weird to me, but the fact that he was literally all the way across the store when I came in, and then as soon as I go over there, he does too. I was like, okay, I'ma look for a different drink. So I go to the tea section and stand there for a sec, and he follows me right to the next one again. Only this time he looks at me, smiles a creepy ass closed lip smile and says, hi. I do want to say that even though he could have easily have just been trying to be nice or flirt, I had an instant creepy vibe from him when he first walked over, and that intuition has never failed me before. At this point I just look at him, nod and grab a can of something and go to the counter, and think to myself that I can just grab a snack later. He comes up right behind me with one of those jerky sticks, literally did not even grab anything from the refrigerators that he was looking in right next to me, and just stands super close. I mean, he was right up behind me. I could feel his body heat and his breath on the back of my neck, and I literally just wanted this cashier to come over here so I could get out the way. I start calling for someone, but no one comes to help. The dude behind me is texting on his phone, and looking around at the door, like he's expecting someone to show up. Finally, I'm like, screw it, I'm out. I leave my drink on the counter and walk out. He follows me. At this point, I literally run to my car and I remember feeling him grasp my jacket. But with the momentum of my arm swinging, he didn't get a firm hold. I hop in, lock the door, and turn my car on at record speed. We make eye contact from out of the corner of my eye and I see two men running from around the corner of the gas station. They all three run at my car, which is not very far from where the first guy is, and I floor it out of there, 
almost wrecking my car on the corner. I don't know what they were planning on doing, but I imagine I was about to get kidnapped. I called the police because I don't know where the cashier was, and I just had a bad feeling they did something to them. The guys were gone when the police got there, and I now carry a knife on me when I go out on that drive. Creepy dudes, let's not meet again. When I was 19 to 20, I used to work for a well-known gas station chain. A lot of the time on evening shift between 4 and 12 I was alone. Though both cash registers were behind a wall of plexiglass, and there was still a 2-3 to three foot opening between them, where a sliding door is for the night shift to close to avoid robberies. It was about 5pm and still daylight when this guy came in. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when he walked in. There was something about him that just wasn't right. I should also add that I'm a female. He walked to the back of the store, made it seem like he was looking for something in my coolers, and by the back shelves. He never once picked up anything to read or look over, and every now and then he'd look up at me, and gradually made his way towards me, but would retreat to the back of the store when someone came in and this went on for about 10 minutes. These two women came in and went to my coolers at the back of the store. I quickly wrote on a note of paper that said, please stay with me so I can call the cops. Then one of the ladies came to pay. I showed her the note. She nodded and went and told her friend. I had my eye on this creepy guy while trying to keep from completely panicking. One of the ladies leaves the store and the other lingers around it. She looks outside and sees something, then leaves. Immediately after she left and I was about to hit call, the creepy guy rushes up to the counter. He looks at the glass door and is about two feet away from me, then bolts. I look outside and the two ladies are talking to the cop that had just pulled up as the creepy guy was rushing to my counter to get gas. The creepy guy must have seen the cop and decided it wasn't worth it. The cop looks over the guy as he takes off, then comes inside to talk to me. I explained to him his behavior and how my finger was on the call button as soon as he pulled up to get gas. The two ladies came in to make sure I was alright and then left. The cop leaves, then come back around 30 minutes later saying they picked up the guy. He explained the guy was high on meth and he was looking for someone to rob to fuel his habit more. He was also in possession of a hunting knife and the cop figured he would have seriously harmed me to get what he wanted. To this day, I thank my lucky stars the cop pulled up when he did. Dear Method, let's not meet again. This happened around eight to nine years ago. My husband and I are driving back from Michigan as we went to visit my parents. And by the time we get into the remote back area of Ohio, it's dark. Dark being around 12 a.m. when we get into the backwoods, and by the time we hit the small towns, it was around 1 or 2 a.m. We always make sure our doors are locked because we aren't stupid. Anyway, we make a quick stop to use the restrooms, stretch, and get something to drink. We get back on the road, and we're going along, and we slow down to stop for a road sign. And this woman walks out right in front of us, and I slam on the brakes to keep from hitting her. We sit there for a minute collecting ourselves and think, what the hell? She knocks on the passenger side window where my husband's sitting and I tell him to not roll it down and to let's just get the hell out of here. But he being the kind hearted guy he is, rolls down his window. She tells us that she'd been walking for hours and that her car broke down. She can't get a hold of her daughter and that she has no money and needs $50 for a cab. Quite specific, right? He tells her to hold on, rolls up the window, and I'm telling him, no, you've got to be nuts. Do not let her in this truck. And he gives me this spiel that she needs help and stuff. Hate me all you like, but I learned the hard way to never trust people, especially strangers. And I told him that I didn't give a flying monkeys if she were bleeding on the ground. She was not getting in my truck. He guilts me into letting her in. Now I'm driving a Ford F-150. And there's only one seat, so we're all crammed, and I ask her where she's going. She says to a store, 
Then says she needs to find a cab but has no money and if we can give her 50 bucks. I'm silently telling my husband, like hell are we giving her money as we're driving her, but relents and says yes. We drive and she's telling us all kinds of stories about her, her daughter, how she needs to get home, how her daughter's 16 at home alone, that it's about two hours away in Ohio. The more we drive, the more it changes. I ask her about her daughter, and this time, she's in her late 20s, has a few kids, and is in Kentucky. I said, oh, I thought she was 16 home alone and two hours away in Ohio. She says, oh, that's my younger daughter. It's my adult daughter I'm gonna see. Uh, okay, that makes no damn sense. She just said she came from Kentucky. We find an ATM and thankfully it's broken. We push on to find another and the more she talks, the weirder she gets. She tries cozying up to my husband and sweet talking him. And he is oblivious to women hitting on him. So she moves on to me and I refuse to accept it by constantly changing the subject. Then it gets stranger. She says, are you two married? We reply, yes. Oh, that's good, because I would have had to call Jesus down to smite you if you were living in sin. We were both thinking, what? Ben says, you two are a very nice Christian couple. And we both reply, we're not Christian. She gets upset by this and starts spouting the Bible at us, and the hubby is retorting back at her. We finally reach another ATM, and this entire time, the hubby and I have been communicating through signals that we need to get the nut job out the car. We pull up, and he says I need to get out of the car to get to the ATM, and she says, just have your wife pull up and use it. He says, no, no one uses my card but me. Then she goes, have your wife get out. And he replies, her door's broken, and only the passenger door works, which is a lie, of course, but we needed to get her out. She gets out and he grabs the door to pull it closed. And she grabs the door and starts screaming at us to let her back in. As she's trying to get back in, he says to her, no, your story's full of holes and doesn't add up. She pulls out this knife, assuming like a switchblade, and my husband shoves her. And I peel out of the bank parking lot with the door still open. He shuts it and locks it. She chases us screaming that she's gonna kill us and I floor it, pushing the gas pedal to the floor, and we're doing 120, and don't let up for four miles until my husband is screaming, slow down, you're gonna kill us. I do, and I'm shaking, part due to anger and part due to being freaked the hell out. We made our home safely, but crazy lady that tried to rob us and stab my husband, let's never meet again. Let me take you back to one of the creepiest encounters I've had in my life. For reference, 25 year old female here. I'd like to set the scene. This happened eight years ago. I was living in a dingy little motel with my mother in a terrible area in Metro Atlanta. The motel was full of the types of folks you'd expect to see there. You had your pimps, you had your ladies of the night, and you had a couple of dealers but you mostly saw their clientele. I personally was never bothered. It was what it was, and 17-year-old me liked to think of myself as a mini gangster, despite being a whopping five foot three and 110 pounds, but I wasn't worried. So here I am hanging out at the motel with my boyfriend one lovely dark winter night. We were both antsy and bored out our minds, so decided to take a walk on the gas station across the street for some cigarillos. Sure, it's late, but the gas station is only across the street. What can happen between here and there? I forgot to mention previously that directly in front of the right half of the hotel is a Waffle House. Like you pretty much pull into Waffle House and drive past it just a tad to end up at the motel parking lot. I only mention it because the location matters a little. Anyway, so we set off. The boyfriend and I are arguing, so we barely even noticed when this woman popped out from behind the Waffle House building. But when we did notice, we instantly went silent. This large woman was stomping towards us. I don't mean large like overweight. I mean large as in everything. She was way taller than me and had at least half a foot on my boyfriend, who sat at 5'7". And sure, she was overweight too. 
I only mention her weight and height to help you understand that she was just a really big lady, which made her quite intimidating. When she approached us, her face twisted in a way that looked both angry and confused, and I wasn't feeling very G anymore. As I stood in front of us, she just stared at us with that same face, eyes moving back and forth between my boyfriend and myself. So I take a step or two back behind my boyfriend when this lady finally speaks. Where's the crack? I couldn't tell if it was a question or a demand. Either way, we didn't have any. And we told her that. You're lying. I know some of you have some. No, we don't. We told her that again. But she was becoming increasingly angry as we kept repeating that we didn't have any. So finally, I'm like, Look, lady, we don't have any crack. Try the other side of the hotel. I bet there's someone with some over there. I felt like it was sound advice because we really didn't have anything. And someone likely would have it over there. I just wanted her to leave. But I guess that bothered her more. Because as we started to retreat towards the store, she screams at us, How would you know? Unless you have it. Once she said that, I realized there was no convincing her that we truly did not have any crack. So we noped out of there. I was nervous about walking back. But you gotta do what you gotta do. And fortunately for us, she was nowhere in sight. So we locked ourselves in my room, put the cigarillo to good use while we laughed about what happened. And I assumed she went to the other side and found what she was looking for. And even better, I never saw her again. And to be clear, I do not judge with those addictions. As someone who has lost and almost lost family to it, I find it incredibly heartbreaking and place no judgment on those who get sucked into its spiral. I hope the woman ended up getting help and I hope the same for all the addicts out there. If that happens to be you, let me tell you this. You are strong and you can do it. You got this. But to the creepy lady demanding I give her my non-existent crack, I hope to never encounter you again. This happened about two years ago. One day after work, about five, me and a girl I worked with decided to go see a movie. It was a rough shift, and her and I felt like a movie would be nice. She asked if we could stop by her house so she could change clothes from our work uniform. I said it was fine since it was maybe five minutes away tops. We stayed at her house for a bit, ate a quick snack, then got in my car. She asked if we could stop by the gas station by her house so she could grab a Red Bull. Once again, I was fine with that because it was near her house. I drove to the gas station and the only parking was on the side of an abandoned car wash next to the gas station. To form a better image, the gas station and car wash were right next to each other, both entrances facing the same way. It was entirely dark outside. The gas station was a fairly run down one and didn't have any lights at the gas pumps like most do. So it was pitch black except for the light coming from my car. A semi truck was on the other side of the gas station and had cones indicating the area that would inhibit the driver to do what he needed. So I assumed the parking spots wouldn't be too close and I parked. My friend got out and went inside and I decided to stay in the car since she would only be a few minutes. I locked my doors after she got out, as it was a force of habit to do so. I went on my phone for a bit and after a few minutes I saw a light flash on the driver's side mirror of my car. I turned to look, since it was pointing in my direction. The truck driver had a flashlight pointing at my window and just held it there for a few seconds. I was kind of freaked out, but assumed he had a reason for doing so. He then began walking towards my window, still with the flashlight on, and I rolled my window down no more than an inch, assuming maybe he was just going to tell me to move my car. He stopped when he got two to three feet away from my window and just turned around. At this point, I was pretty scared, just because there was no reason for what he did. So I rolled my window back up and waited for my friend. I'm still watching the guy just in case and I see him rummaging around in the front part of his semi for a bit. Then he stopped and turned back to my car. There was something in his hand. I'm not sure what and I'm glad I don't know. He began walking towards my window. He was saying something 
and it was in a rather loud volume, but inaudible. He got to my door this time and tried to open it. He tried to pull the handle a few times, but he couldn't open it, then started to pull more aggressively. My friend came out the gas station and was walking towards my car and she looked scared. I was scared. The guy saw her coming to my car and walked back to his truck and I drove away as quickly as possible. I'm not entirely sure what happened or what was going to happen. The only theory my friend had was that maybe when he saw that I was a girl, the first time he had the flashlight, he assumed I'd be a good target for something. That's just a theory though. I'm glad I won't ever have to find out what he was doing. Let me take you back 25 years to a deserted highway in the United States. I want to keep as much information as possible anonymous, but we'll tell you what I can. I worked a job that required me to travel from different states to check various facilities. I can't name what they were specifically. But a job like this does involve a lot of driving. And as such, it was one of my usual days driving to work. Today's assignment was taking me to Ohio. I was about four hours away, hadn't really driven this way before, or at least not in a long time. And I was just listening to the radio and chewing on a granola bar, waiting for the next gas station, as I really needed a leak. I had been busting for a while. And after a short time, did I find a run down gas station in the middle of nowhere. Great, just what I needed. The sky was already getting quite dark at this point, and the fluorescent neon lights shining above the pumps were all that illuminated this dingy little run-down spot in the middle of nowhere. I pulled up and took in the scenery, breathed a cold sigh, and went to fill up the car before relieving myself and getting my much-needed snacks. I looked around. It was empty. Was not a single soul around, save for the cashier who I was assuming was probably in the back of the gas station. I see the gas meter fill up, and when it's finally done, do I put the cork back in my car and walk over and into the gas station. I remember it like it was yesterday. It had some terrible band from that era playing on the radio. And I was just thinking to myself, they needed better taste in music. I didn't even look at the cashier first, so intent on finding the bathroom and collecting my snacks. The bathroom, as the sign said, was just on a little door to my left. So I busted through and made use of the facilities while I still had the chance. Once I was done, I walked out and that's when I noticed a strange smell. It was a bit weird, I thought. Could it have been a cleaning product that they used? I made my way, grabbed some chips and a few other bits, and my mandatory Hershey's bar. That's when I made my way to the counter. I noticed the cashier was completely absent. <sighs> I didn't want to be late. I was already running a little bit late anyway, but thought if I sped I could probably make it in time. But now the cashier was absent and I was losing my patience. I placed my candy and snacks and drink on the counter and yelled, hello, is anyone here? I tapped on the desk a few times after about a minute, but no one came. I was starting to get on my nerves. Surely someone was working here. How the hell was I supposed to pay for my gas? I waited about three more minutes, patiently waiting. Sure that whoever was probably in the security building was about to come out. Maybe they were in the staff toilets, I don't know. I started perusing a magazine while waiting, really wasting my time and getting more and more annoyed. So I started to walk towards the staff only door, clearly labeled staff only, and decided to give it a little knock. I knocked the door, but there was no reply. This time, starting to get concerned, I started to push the door open, and that's when the smell hit me. It was a very peculiar smell, and as I pushed it open more and more, did I see the cashier 
lying in a pool of blood next to some crates. I instantly rushed to him and asked if he was okay. I wasn't sure if he was dead or not, and I started freaking out. So I grabbed my cell phone, but there was obviously no service here. Crap. I was sure that I had seen a phone outside the gas station, so I ran out and dialed 911. I told the police what happened, and they said that they were going to send an ambulance, but that it would take at least 40 minutes to get there, as well as several cops. The cops arrived first. I think the kid was pretty much on his way out. I never found out if he made it or not. Either way, that was an interesting excuse for being late for work. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I managed to pay, the manager came in the end, and every time I passed that gas station in the future, I always asked myself if the kid had survived or not, but never had the balls to go in and check or ask. I thought it would be imprudent, let alone the fact that if he had survived, I doubt he'd have worked there anyway. But it always leaves me wondering, what the hell happened there? Maybe a robbery? Guess I'll never know. One day about three years ago, I was at my house with my younger sister and our friend. We were about 20 to 21 years old, all females. We were hungry and decided to go out and grab some sushi. On the way to the restaurant, I noticed I was low on gas, so I stopped to get some. I pulled up to the pump and parked the car. I went into the gas station to pay while my sister and our friend waited in the car. As I was walking across the parking lot into the store, I noticed a man staring at me with a creepy smirk on his face. We made eye contact and he yelled across the parking lot, Hey beautiful, why aren't you smiling? I didn't respond or even acknowledge him. However, a young woman who witnessed this said to him, Do not tell her to smile, she doesn't have to do anything for you. To this day, I think about that woman. I thanked her and continued to walk into the store. As I stood patiently in the line, the same man walked in, came right over to me in the line and started to touch me. He was rubbing my arm and lower back and I pulled away and said loudly, Get away from me, I don't know you. Don't touch me or I'll defend myself. Other customers and the cashier were watching us as I caused a scene. He whispered in my ear and told me to shut up so people didn't think he's a creep. Suddenly the man ran out the store and to my car with my sister and friend still in it. I ran after him. He opened the car door and started to say something to them when I yanked him back so hard from his shirt collar and punched him in the face. He proceeded to of course call me some lovely things and every other name in the book, but he left us alone and got in his car and drove away. I'm much more aware of my surroundings now. To the creepy gas station man, Let's not meet again. I've shared this story enough times to appreciate that not everyone is going to believe me. But I'm leaving it here for all of you to see what you will make of it. Let me take you back to the 1990s. Me and my then girlfriend were traveling around Australia, trying to do the West Coast. It was one hell of a journey. We were driving a car that we had just bought a few weeks ago. Our goal was to try and go all around Australia. Now that we made it, we ran out of cash eventually. Not long after this story, in fact. But the story really begins in the middle of nowhere, roughly around 7 p.m. The sun was just about to set, and we were laughing and having a good time in the car. That's when I noticed that our gas was running slightly low. I knew a gas station was coming up from my map and was excited about the prospect of getting a few drinks and a snack. It'd be a long drive still, maybe a long night until we got to our destination. The plan was that I was going to drive until about 10, swap and then my girlfriend drive for a few hours and just take turns that way so that we could reach it by that day. So we're driving and the gas meter is going steadily south and I see that we're gonna run out of fuel any minute now. I swear the number was almost on zero and I was starting to panic. That's when we see it in the distance, a gas station, poorly lit, but there it was. 
a beacon of neon glory shining out in all the gloom. As we slowly pull up, we see a gang of bikers not too far off. Now saying this place was dingy was an understatement. It looks like it had been built in the 50s and forgotten about until then. But nonetheless, we were desperate for gas. My girlfriend said to save time, she'd go in and grab the drinks while I could fill up the gas, and then we'd pay and go. So I started filling up. I'm there standing, just minding my own business, and I'm cautious about the bikers behind me. I try not to look at them. But just to make sure that one wasn't approaching me, I have a quick look around, make it casual and nonchalant. I look all around in every direction, just make sure they are where they are, and to my surprise, they start flying off, just driving away. Great, I thought. Just me and my girlfriend at the gas station. Now I don't have to worry about getting mugged or something. Not that I have a problem with bikers, but we had been mugged a few days earlier. So, you know, it was on my mind. My girlfriend comes back a few minutes later, says she's paid and we're about ready to leave. But then she blurts out that she has to pee. So there I go, waiting in the car for her to pee. She goes to the restroom, and I'm waiting for about five minutes, getting bored, tapping my thumbs on the dashboard. I'm thinking, what the hell? Why is it taking so long? Maybe the peep turned to a poop. Ten minutes later, I'm really bored now. Remember that we really wanted to make it to our next destination by morning, and these small time wastes were really getting on my nerves. So I close the car door and don't lock it because there's no one around and we are in the middle of nowhere and start making my way towards the shack where my girlfriend was allegedly peeing. I call out to my girlfriend, Sharon, you okay, honey? I get no reply. I start to get concerned. Did something happen? Now, these stalls were literally just like saloon doors and... I could easily just look over the top if I jumped. Knowing that there was no one there and I wouldn't be disrespecting anyone else's privacy, I quickly did a little jump to see if she was on the stall. And she wasn't. That was the designated female restroom. Finding it a bit weird that she wouldn't hear me or reply, I jumped up at the male restroom and she was gone. Then a thought crossed my mind. Did the bikers take my girlfriend? I just about crapped myself, thinking that's maybe why they went off in a hurry. No, it couldn't be. She came back after they'd left, I told myself. But I was starting to doubt. What the hell was going on here? I busted the door open, and she wasn't in either of them. They weren't locked. I walked all around the small shack, and she wasn't behind it either. It was dark by now and I couldn't see into the vast expanse of emptiness surrounding us. So I called out, Sharon, honey? Of course, I was met with pure silence. So I walk around the convenience store part, shouting and seeing if she's there, when my last thought is that maybe there's an additional restroom within there. So I calm down a little bit, open the door and go speak to the cashier and ask, if there was a restroom inside. He gives me a brief nod to where I had just come from, the restrooms outside, and I explained that my girlfriend had just come in here and bought some stuff and paid for the gas. Where was she? The guy shrugged his shoulders. He couldn't have cared less. I asked if there was a toilet in here, and he said there was, but it was staff only. Thinking to myself that maybe she just ignored the sign, I walked up to the staff-only restroom and just knocked on the door. Sharon, are you okay? There was no reply. That's when I looked down at the handle. It was green, meaning not locked. I pulled down the handle slowly, but she wasn't inside. At this point, I was really starting to get concerned. I didn't have a phone back then. I mean, they were rare and I thought I needed to call the cops. I didn't know what to do. Was she playing a prank on me? So I looked underneath the car and looked everywhere I thought she could possibly be. And by this point, I was freaking out. 
So, I asked the guy if there was a payphone, and there wasn't. He told me that if I wanted a phone, I'd have to drive to the nearest town a good 20 minutes away. Crap, I thought. But what if Sharon comes back? I, I don't even know where she's gone. If the toilets were so dirty, I mean, would she really have traveled all the way in the darkness to a field to pee or something? My mind was losing it with concern. I was genuinely getting scared. But thinking that I didn't have another choice, after about 20 minutes of waiting, I jumped on my car and started the drive. I drove for about five minutes before I saw Sharon on the road. I pulled over immediately and shouted to her, asking her what the hell she was doing. She gave me the most funny look and said, you're not gonna believe me if I told you. She said that she was peeing in the little stall and came out. But when she left the stall, there was nothing there. No gas station, no anything. Most of all, I was gone in the car. She had a panic attack, started crying, and said she fell to her knees in despair, so confused as to what happened and just began walking along the road, always looking back to see if I were coming. By this point, it had been nearly 40 minutes, and she had been walking a fair distance, and I could see the tears in her eyes and how the mascara had run down her face. I was feeling a deep knot in the pit of my stomach. I didn't really know what to say. I asked if she was feeling all right and maybe if the heat was getting to her, but she said that she was fine. She said, what happened? And I couldn't offer an explanation, but did say, let's drive back so that we can see the gas station and maybe get you properly hydrated. It was only at that point that I noticed that she hadn't gotten snacks and drinks. And this time we see the gas station, but not like we saw it before. It was run down. The store had been completely deserted. The shacks, non-existent. What the hell was going on here? Were we in some weird time slip? I honestly don't know what to say. I really don't. I've got no words. I have no idea what was going on. But only me and Sharon truly believe the story as we're the ones who experienced it. We broke up a few months after for unrelated reasons, but keep in touch via Facebook. And the only time I ever brought up the story, she corroborated everything exactly as I remembered it. I live in a city known sadly for its crime rate, even though it's an awesome place to be. My street has a lot of variety in race and income level, and generally the vibe is live and let live. We all know each other from sight. One evening I was walking to the top of my street to get something from the gas station on the corner. I leave my driveway, and as I do so I see a pretty rough looking guy on the other side of the street, walking the same way I'll be, more or less directly across from me. The apartments across from me are rougher too. Except, when he sees me, I can tell he's thinking about something. Like he sees me, and then he's considering something. I see him look both ways and I hear him jaywalk to my side of the street. I've already turned at this point. He reaches my side and I hear him about 10 feet away say, Hey man, what's up? I glance back and say, Hey dude, and pick up my pace. He's walking fairly quick too and heavily. I really pour on the walking speed and eventually I don't hear his footsteps anymore. I think he must have fallen back or turned off the road. There are two paths to the gas station from my street. You can walk down the sidewalk nearly to the intersection and then go through the parking lot. Or you can leave the sidewalk a bit earlier for a dirt path that's quicker and takes you right along the back and side of the gas station to the front. I go for the sidewalk, don't hear the guy and don't see him as I turn into the lot. He pops up right behind me from the dirt path. I'm in near panic mode. The entrance to the gas station is 10 feet away and I dart inside. I turn around to face this guy. I figure the cameras are right here on the inside entrance and his face will be on them at this angle. There were two attendants right there. I'm gonna just make myself big and go really loud. What are you doing here, man? 
As I open my mouth to say it, the guy Powell walks past me. A look of total surprise on his face and goes, wait, you really had to piss too? And blows past me straight to the bathrooms, wafting the booze smell on him into my nostrils. The guy was hammered. He'd been trying to cross the street for a while already. The mental math I watched him do before crossing was, oh man, this dude's gonna think I'm gonna try and jump in. What can I do? I know. I'll say something when I'm behind him so he knows I'm not sneaking up on him. And he was probably relieved when he took the dirt path and I didn't, thinking he wouldn't run into me again. Who'd have thought that even at a gas station, there'd be people and things you'd rather never meet again. Which reminds me, we might as well listen to some of those stories now. From the popular subreddit, Let's Not Meet. My story is not about ghosts nor goblins, but something much worse. A man. Yes, a man who forced me to view humans from a totally different perspective. It's a long story, and I've never shared it with anyone, but I have mentioned it to my therapist, as this was a very traumatic experience. Even though this happened to me many years ago, it's important for me to give you as many details as possible, and a bit about myself. My name is Yvonne. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a female, Asian Hispanic. I know, lovely mix. At the time of this, I was in my 30s. I'm about five foot six and weighed 130 pounds. Athletic, fair-skinned, and was also newly divorced. I had embraced my newfound freedom. I must warn you though, my experience can be triggering as it contains many acts of violence, both domestic and sexual assault. So it's really up to you if you wish to proceed. Without further ado, I was going through a party phase, and my way of coping with life was by drinking and partying my life away. Yes, it temporarily numbed my emotions, but due to my selfish behavior, my young children suffered. I was young, but even then, I acted immature. I just wanted to have a good time. I wanted absolutely nothing serious with anyone. My recent divorce was hurting me so deeply, and when I liked someone, I would romance that person until they would be eating from my hand. But then, just like that, I wouldn't contact them again. But when someone showed too much interest in me, I did the very opposite. Yes, I pushed back harder. I had youth and beauty. I was in control, or so I thought. There was this very handsome man who was a friend of a friend's. This night, he happened to be the lucky one who apparently wanted more than to just dance the night away. As you may have guessed, I was most definitely pushing him back. But I had my reasons this time. The last time I had seen this guy, he made comments that made me dislike him even more. You will be mine, he would jokingly tell me. I would respond flirtatiously, yet joking. Victor, it doesn't hurt to dream. I saw anger in the deep of his big brown eyes, but I promised myself he would get nothing but my pity. And I jokingly said, I'd rather be dead. Victor replied in a firm voice. That can be arranged, followed by laughter from him, but also everyone who was there at the party. They thought it was funny too. Then one of Victor's friends said, almost threateningly, you know, Victor always gets what he wants. With my liquid courage out loud, I said, I belong to no one. And just to be clear, I'm the one who does the picking and choosing. Feeling slutty, my friends laughed in agreement. Finally, party night had arrived. The plan was for the three couples to all go together, males and females paired respectively. But when I got picked up, to my dismay, guess who I'd been paired with? You guessed it, Victor, who also happened to be the person driving us in his brand new red truck. I knew it was a conspiracy, but I wasn't gonna back down. I was ready for the challenge. We decided to go to a very fancy club and Victor was being a total gentleman from what I could tell. The lights were bright, the music was bumping, and the alcohol was flowing. I felt alive, and tonight was all about me. I realized at one point that I needed to go to the ladies' room. It was there that I assessed my current situation and concluded that I would slow down on the drinking. It wasn't even midnight, 
and I could already feel the effects, which was odd, because not only was my head spinning, but I would feel terribly sleepy. I also didn't want to drink any more, so I could keep my composure and not do something I would regret. But I was feeling sleepy. There was a point where I almost thought I would fall asleep while standing by the sink washing my hands. At the time, I didn't even realize I hadn't finished up my Jack and Coke. This feeling was new, so now it was a matter of survival. I stormed out of the bathroom to find the girls I came with. I wanted to be near them in case I collapsed, but my steps were getting heavier, as were my eyelids. Then I realized the drink. As I stumbled into the crowd, barely keeping my eyes open, I saw Victor standing there with a grin on his face. He was tall at six foot two, 250 pounds with brown hair and beautiful dreamy brown eyes. His teeth were perfectly white and straight. He was walking towards me and as he got closer, I wanted to yell, you drugged me, you coward. Then I felt my legs give out, but I don't remember hitting the floor. I really don't know how long I was out. I opened my eyes to the humming of a ceiling fan and the cool air hitting my bare body. The first thought was to quickly sit up and find my clothes. But for the time being, I couldn't move. I was able to move my eyes, but my entire body was numb. I began questioning myself. Who did I leave the club with? Where am I? Whose living room was I lying in? I wanted my clothes, but how could I find it? if I couldn't even move my hands. Suddenly I heard footsteps and a familiar voice. You awake? It was Victor. How could he ask so calmly? I wanted to say many obscenities, but my voice wasn't cooperating, it was gone. I realized I was lying butt naked on my adversary's couch. When I realized he was also naked. No, how could this be happening? I was defenseless, pinned to the couch and unable to scream or run. I was Victor's prey, and he was going to have his way with me while holding me hostage. My own body had betrayed me. I was so thirsty, but I wanted nothing Victor had to offer. Sadly, I didn't have a choice. As he grabbed my hair and sat me up on the couch, he got a styrofoam cup and poured a bitter, clear liquid in my mouth, and at the same time he was holding a knife to the side of my throat and screamed at me to drink. The tip of his pocket knife was so sharp, it was best to cooperate. I was being violated in so many ways. I needed to use the bathroom badly, and somehow it seemed as if he read my mind. He dragged me off the couch and threw me to the floor, and had the balls to kick me twice in the ribs. Then, with a closed fist, punched me in the face several times. I could feel the blood flowing from my nose and into my mouth and immediately felt a lot heavier. He pointed towards the bathroom, and I began to slowly crawl in his direction. I knew I was probably not gonna make it out of there alive, but I couldn't understand why he hated me so much. But what about my children? What would happen to them? There was women's underwear and children's toys scattered all over the wooden floor. I grabbed a moist towel from the floor, noticing that neither my clothes nor purse were in sight. Then I heard a phone vibrating. I quickly located it. There it was, a beautiful flip phone. As soon as I opened it, I dialed 911 immediately. I began digging around the bathroom for any information that I could provide to emergency services. They answered, asking what my emergency was. I let the dispatcher know that it wasn't a prank call, that I had been kidnapped, drugged, raped, and brutally beaten by a man. I gave the address I had found on a prescription bottle label in the medicine cabinet. I was in Gilbert, Arizona. I was trying my best to give the best description of Victor, when quickly he tears down the bathroom door. I'm greeted with a fist across my jaw, causing me to stumble and hit my head at the edge of the sink. My heart sank as the flip foam went flying across the floor. I'm losing consciousness trying to protest from drinking whatever he's forcing down my throat, but obviously I don't have a choice, because what I hear next just confirmed that I was very much dead. A click. I knew what it was. It was a firearm. I felt the cold barrel of the 9mm that was against my temple. I could feel the warm blood dripping down into my chest from my face. 
And then Victor said the following. You called the cops. We have to go now. Besides, I need to get rid of you because my wife and kids will be home soon. I could barely stay awake. So Victor tried to drag me by the hair, but it was taking too long and he lost his patience. He proceeded to drag me by the arm from the third floor. As he exited the door, he grabbed me, threw me over his shoulder and was trying to get me in the truck. But somehow I was fighting him. I figured he was going to kill me anyway. I might as well fight this deranged evil man. I was screaming, biting, kicking and scratching, but I couldn't see because my eyes were closed shut from injuries. But I imagined he needed the gun to shoot me, then go through my body in the desert. Then I heard the police sirens and people coming out of their apartments to hear the commotion. And I begin screaming that he's going to kill me in both English and Spanish. As multiple police cruisers came closer, Victor threw my body into the apartment complex garbage bin and peeled off. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I needed sutures in many parts of my body. I had a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, multiple head injuries, many lacerations, and my body was full of bruises. According to the ER doctor, the toxicology report showed five different types of drugs, but my alcohol was below the legal limit. You might be wondering what happened to Victor. I saw him when I was able to testify in court. There were two other women who came forward with their testimonies and gave Victor an additional five years on top of the eight he got for the crimes he committed against me. Victor whispered a threat when he got sentenced, something that no victim wants to hear. Someday, I'll get out and I'll hunt you down and finish the job. Listeners, please be cautious, especially if you're going out drinking. Stay with a trusty group of friends and please keep an eye on your drink and theirs. When in doubt, listen to your gut. This experience changed me. I stopped drinking many years ago and have major trust issues. I cannot emphasize it enough. Always be aware of your surroundings. This is what happened to me this month. I woke up one morning to a nail in my tire. Great. I looked for the nearest repair shop and made my way there. I was very happy to find a place that wasn't by appointment and was within five blocks from my apartment. When I got there, I was greeted by a nice looking man in a suit. He was shorter than me, had a very short beard and was covered in tattoos. I mean, he had four sleeves and some of his head. He wasn't one of those bad looking tattooed covered guys though. Anyway, they seemed to work for him. His name was Jake. I told Jake about my plans for my car and my future in the mechanic field. These were all my usual topics for small talk. His eyes lit up and he said if I ever wanted any hands-on experience, he would be happy to teach me. He wrote his name on a business card and handed it to me. I had worked in a shop previously, but the boss was old, horribly sexist and outright scary. I had guessed that Jake was in his late twenties to early thirties and I was so excited because he was young. It's not common to see people that are young that are the boss. And I went home and told my boyfriend all about my experience. I thought about it for a few days and then called and offered to work Wednesday mornings in the shop. The first Wednesday was uneventful. I watched one of the mechanics work all day and didn't learn anything that I didn't already know. Jake kept checking on me during the day and gave me his personal number so that I could contact him without having to go through the shop landline. The next Wednesday started off like a blast. The first hour I just watched the same tech. Jake came into the shop and asked me if I wanted to run some errands with him. Of course I said yes, because it was hot. I was wearing jeans and I knew the van could have air conditioning. Jake is the kind of guy that rambles a lot. So we went through topics really fast. We talked a lot about business at first, but then it got really weird. He started talking about the girls he was hooking up with and living with his ex. It didn't really faze me because this is how most of the boys in the industry talk. He bought me food and on our way back home, gave me a $20 bill for coming on his errands. He started leaving subtle comments about my boyfriend and that he should be giving me money, buying me stuff, and that I shouldn't rush into marriage because I was so young. Come Friday, I was extremely bored and didn't want to do my schoolwork, so I texted Jake to see if I could come hang out at the shop, even though I wasn't wearing shop clothes. 
I was wearing a semi-long skirt and a long crop top. When I got there, he said, do you want to make some money today? I said, yeah, and he led me to the back office. It was slow that day, so I was just doing odd jobs around the office and reception desk. He kept saying how much he liked my skirt, which I would like to add showed nothing. Okay, weird. Throughout the day, I kept catching Jake staring down my skirt. Men will be men, I thought. He kept commenting on my outfit, saying things like, I didn't know you were hiding all that under your shop clothes. Your skirt's gonna make it hard for me to stand up in a minute. At this point, I was just trying to get the job done so that I could make money and go home. I was starting to get really nervous as the comments escalated. God, it makes me wonder what else you're hiding under there. I responded, Jake, I have a boyfriend, which he definitely knew. That's when he said, and I quote, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put it in you, but like, can I see? Anger bubbled up in me and I yelled, no, you can't speak to me like that. I finished my job to get a whopping $30. Great, all that for nothing. The next morning, Jake called me and told me that his boss came by the shop and got in trouble for having me there. So he told me I shouldn't come back for a while. I was heartbroken and confused. A week went by and I was having trouble sleeping. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Was I really fired for being a liability? Or was it because I said no to him? I called Jake on Sunday and asked. He promised me that I wasn't fired because I said no to him and said that he would have told me if he'd fired me for that reason. Then began ranting and talking about how he went to prison and doesn't play games like that. I told him that what he had said to me made me feel really uncomfortable. And he went on to say that I could still go and hang out whenever I wanted. He was talking about a coffee shop nearby and a restaurant and was like he was trying to get me to come out with him. After he fired me? Okay, weird. Like, did you not just hear what I said? That night as I was trying to fall asleep, I felt this overwhelming need to check the Megan's Law website. In California, we have a website that shows all registered sex offenders. All that I knew was his name and the town he lived in. I must have read about 300 profiles when a face caught my attention his face. I shook as I clicked on the profile which read, Conviction 2008, released 2010. Offense, lewd or lascivious acts with a child under 14. Jake was 20, the child was under 14. Jake was a freaking child molester, but it didn't stop there. I panicked and went down the rabbit hole finding pages and pages of criminal charges dating all the way back to 2005. He had been arrested a lot of times and done really horrible things. There were reports of stabbing, fights, gang-related offenses, and obviously, child molestation. I can't believe I got in the car with him alone. I worked with him alone. I've talked to him. How did I not know? I'm really glad that I got away from him when I did. I've never been more happy to have been fired in my life. So, with that being said, Jake, let's never meet again. My name is Yvonne. I'm a female in my 50s. I'm five foot six, a bit on the heavy side, and have limited use of my hands, but hide it well. Presently living in the state of Arizona, and throughout the years have encountered many creepers, and due to my friendly demeanor, I seem to attract them like a magnet. I can make small talk with just about anyone. I show no fear, and I walk with confidence. For these same reasons, I'm not afraid to tell anyone phrases such as, please back away, you're making me uncomfortable, and I'm not interested. You've been warned, but my favorite phrase is, don't come any closer because I'm armed. I could say that I have trained myself for any kind of encounter. Every month I drive across town to visit my clinic doctor, as I must receive a much needed medication, and my last visit was scheduled for mid-morning, which is when the clinic's lobby is at full capacity. I arrived and parked in the front of the clinic, which is a one-level building with two main entrances facing east. I make it a habit to always do a quick scan of my surroundings before I exit my car. I like to check for any immediate danger before I put myself in a vulnerable position. 
On my keychain, I carry a whistle, a small knife, a screwdriver, pepper spray, and my panic button. All in miniature size. I'm old and frail, but I'm not going down without a fight. No, I'm not an aggressive person. You might think I'm overly prepared, and maybe I am. But if you've noticed, it's a violent world we live in. And people like me are targets, just about anywhere. I noticed that at one of the clinic entrances there was a man of about six foot four, maybe 300 pounds, with a long, unkempt beard and tobacco-stained moustache. He appeared homeless, and I have nothing against the homeless, we're all human after all, but I figured if he's standing by one entrance, I would enter through the other, to avoid him, at least being 12 feet away from him. I began walking towards the door, and this man started to approach me halfway towards the entrance. He then stretched out his hand and said in a southern accent, Name's Jake, little lady. I didn't shake his hand, but did say hello. He went on to say that he'd seen me before, but forgot my name. As he said this, he tried to block my path. I replied, telling him I'd never seen him before, but it was nice to meet him. And if he could excuse me, because I was late for my appointment. He then quickly added, if I could take him down the street to Circle K. It wasn't a request, it was a command. I don't think so, Jake, I replied. As I began walking away, I heard him grumble in colourful words. He was talking about how I could just walk away from him. She thinks she can just make fun of Jake and walk away. Yes, he was in fact referring to himself in the third person. I pretended not to hear him, but I knew not to let my guard down because this man was on a mission. And that had me shaking inside. The clinic's lobby was packed, and for a moment I felt safe. I signed in and made my way to sit next to an exit door, still on high alert. Then everything happened so quickly. I pulled out my Samsung Galaxy earbuds and set up Spotify to listen to my favourite podcast, and put the volume on low. I saw Jake approach me, and I felt my heart skip a beat, but I remained cool and collected. Give me your earbuds. I turned off my podcast, put my earbuds away, and slowly stood up. At this point, his voice was louder. I said, give me your earbuds. I don't think so. He then took a step closer, and by now he was aware that I was armed and was going to defend myself. I gave this man a last warning, and to both our misfortune, he didn't comply. Jake takes two big steps and then sprints towards me as if he was a football player and he was going to tackle me. I screamed and prepared for impact. I knew I was no match for this man, I managed to pepper spray him all over the face, causing him to go down. As he was falling, he attempted to drag me to the ground with him, as he's screaming in pain. He begins pulling me away, and as I'm looking for the exit I sat next to, I notice two people coming in and seeing the action. They froze in place, blocking my exit, and they got pepper spray residue. All the people just stood and videotaped the incident. The staff alerted security and contacted the authorities. I wasn't going to be taken down by this monster, so I basically put all 170 pounds on his back. As I was screaming like a maniac, security finally came and handcuffed Jake. Fortunately, I wasn't hurt, but I was rattled and couldn't stop shaking. Afterwards, I went to the bathroom and cried like a child. My heart goes out to people who were not mentally stable either by choice or by lack of resources. To Jake, if you're listening, you must have thought that I wasn't scared of you, but honestly, you terrified me, and I've had nightmares of you since we met. I don't plan on using the rest of my miniature weapons, but I wouldn't think twice to defend myself. So, Jake, for your own sake, let's not meet. I have a pretty disturbing story to share. It all starts in December of 1993. I was living in Aurora at the time. It was around 9 p.m. and I had just finished my martial arts class and was waiting outside for my mum to pick me up from the school. My martial arts school was in a smaller shopping center near a well-traveled intersection on the west end of Aurora near Denver. Adjacent to my school in the same parking lot was a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. It usually closed around the time my class got out but occasionally some of us would go and play video games or get breadsticks while we waited for class to begin. This particular evening it wasn't terribly cold. It was mid-December 
but the winters in Colorado can be somewhat mild. I was still pumped from class, and I was running around the parking lot with another one of the kids from my class. We were distracted, so we did not see the figure enter Chuck E. Cheese. It was the loud popping noise coming from the building that got our attention. Before we could grasp what was happening, a kid came running out of the restaurant with a gun in his hand. He practically ran right into us. The next thing I know, he's pointing it at my face. He just stood there for a minute. It was like time froze. I could not take my eyes off the barrel. And all I could think of was this was probably the last thing I wanted to see in the world. After what seemed like a long time, but was probably a few seconds, I looked past the gun at his face. He wasn't even looking at me, he looked scared. I can see his finger on the trigger and wasn't sure if he was gonna pull it or not. I was frozen and could not have stopped him if he was. Instead, he turned and ran without a word. I watched him go, glued to the ground, amazed that I was still alive. He took off around the side of the building and was gone. My classmate and I just sat on the pavement. Neither of us said anything. Eventually, my mum showed up to give me a ride. I'm sure she was curious why I was acting funny, but I could not bring myself to tell her what happened. As far as I know, she still doesn't know to this day. I did not sleep that night. The next morning, I heard people in school talking about what happened. The kid's name was Nathan Dunlap. He murdered four people I know personally in cold blood and critically wounded another. He had ditched the gun in an attempt to escape. That led to his arrest and eventual conviction. He was to be executed earlier this year for the crime, but was given a stay by the governor of Colorado. Having known that he had killed those people, I believe he would have killed us too. I'm not sure what distracted him that night, but I'm grateful. My family knows I was there that night. I don't think they know the extent of my involvement. I was never questioned about it, and until now, have never really volunteered any information about it at all. But I am now, because some things you learn to let go of. I don't know how much you know about him or what he did, but for a recap, the kids he killed were my age at the time. I didn't find out the extent of what he did until the next day, when I was face to face with him. At that time, I did not know he had just killed four people. He looked right at me, but I don't think he saw me. He looked more scared than I was, and I was the one with the gun in their face. I don't know if he should have gotten executed. He claims now that he has found God or whatever in prison, and that he's a different person. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it's not. It will never change the fact he executed four children in cold blood over nothing. He is where he belongs, and I'd almost rather see him have him live out the rest of his days reliving what he did, instead of getting the easy way out. This happened around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been about 11. I'm 30 now. I lived in a new area. A lot of houses were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful houses despite being a terrible area, which I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we go around the corner from my house where they are building a bunch of houses, and it's pretty dark. I'd probably say it's like 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. We were walking past houses that looked pretty much finished, we're chatting and a guy randomly shows up out of the blue behind us, grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified and runs away crying and climbs over a fence. He completely ditches me. The guy is very casual despite being creepy and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a Pruvy, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him to just be like, you shouldn't be here at night while we're patrolling the streets. But suddenly we go to a house which isn't completely built yet and nobody lives in it. I'm standing outside this basement looking house while he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling them. The conversation sounds fake, like he's just trying to scare me. 
And this is where I really get freaked out now. Because on the upstairs, there's this constant tapping sound. It can't be a builder because it's 11 p.m. It sounds like someone is locked inside something and trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound and as if they knew I was in the house. It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly he's off the phone and he's like, okay, the cops are coming to your house soon, leave now. And I'm thinking, nah, not really. I didn't give you my address. But at the same time I was freaking out because maybe this guy knows the streets and where I live. So that entire night, I was just looking out my window hoping no cops would come by and they didn't in the end. And he obviously did all that just to scare me. But why? The situation for me is frightening because a random guy grabbing a hold of you in the street in the pitch darkness is freaky, regardless or not whether it's a building site, despite the fact I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door, had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered like why he was there, what he was doing. Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area, unless I had someone accompany me. Truth be told, there were a lot of issues in the area. And I'm guessing that guy was like a bunch of other guys that were just acting like undercover police, since they aren't usually comfortable coming to where I live, since they'd usually get bricked. It comes from the troubles. Looking back though, I think the entrance was blocked off and we weren't actually allowed there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad. Really. I'd recently gone back to my home state for a visit after roughly a year and a half away. I caught up with a few friends on my first night and shot the breeze of dinner and billiards. I come to find my friend Tony has changed his mind about attending community college and decided to try his hand at pursuing a childhood dream instead. He didn't really get into much detail at the time as a matter of fact, the conversation started towards the end of the night. I made it a point to mention that I needed to go and rent a hotel room. Tony wasn't having it. Nope. I'd be a pretty crap friend if I let you drive off right now. I'm only three miles away, and I converted my old bedroom into an office and guest sleeping area after my brother moved out. Save your cash. Tony and I had been friends since the seventh grade. As a matter of fact, we're still friends to this day. Like me, he was a quiet kid, at least at first. His uncle worked at our old school as a teacher's aide, and I overheard them talking about a mutual interest one day. Classic punk rock. I was doing my best not to eavesdrop, but then they started talking about the damned. I joined in on the conversation, and that's how he became one of my closest friends in the world. So back to the evening at hand, I accepted his offer and followed him back to his house. We must have sat up for another three hours, just reminiscing before I crashed for the night. I got off the following morning and am greeted by the smell of fresh coffee and blueberry muffins. Tony asks me how I slept and I told him pretty well and pulled myself a mug of hot bean water life elixir. So do you have plans for today? You mentioned you only have today and tomorrow off work. I look at Tony and sip my coffee. I was thinking of going down to Wildwood or possibly Ocean City. Figured I'd check out the old stomping grounds and see whatever Gateway 26 has to offer. Tony nodded and took a bite of his muffin. Sounds like a plan. You think you could be back this way around five? He said while producing a ticket from his shirt pocket. He handed it to me, and it was for some indie wrestling show at Moose Lodge. I eyed down the piece of paper and thought about it for a minute. Sure, could be fun. I folded the ticket up and placed it within my wallet. After finishing breakfast, I wrote down the directions Tony gave me, and then I made my way to the boardwalk. Knowing I would have to be up at his at five, I opted to go to Ocean City. After enjoying some time at the arcades and devouring a few slices of heavenly pizza, I killed some time just meandering and taking in the sights. It was close to half past three when I made my way back to my car and made the journey to Moose Lodge. Upon arriving, I looked all over the place for Tony to no avail. I figured maybe I'd arrived a little too early, so I pulled the ticket out of my wallet and handed it to the lodge employee, tending to the front door. I get inside and begin looking around the crowd. There were perhaps 50 people. I have been to a few of these indie shows, 
and I can honestly say the crowd turnout has always been relatively small. This was one of the smallest. As I'm surveying my surroundings, I see it. The back of a wheelchair absolutely plastered in punk band stickers. In it, an older gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s, with bleach, blonde, Billy Idol hair and a leather jacket, loaded with pyramid studs and punks not dead, airbrushed on the back. Uncle Frank! I yell at the top of my lungs. The man in the wheelchair looks at me and shoots me an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Get your butt over here and give your uncle a hug. When you're done, cop and squat right here. He pointed to the chair on his left. I made my way over to Frank and he gave me a hug so tight he damn near dropped my back. I took my seat and asked him if he'd seen Tony. He said he was around here somewhere and that he thought he'd gone to grab some cheesesteaks from the concession. As if the timing couldn't be any more perfect, Tony sat down at the chair to the right of his uncle and handed me the thing I planned to make my dinner later on tonight. We sat there watching some good independent talent shows. Lots of flippy stuff on the ropes, tons of crowd interaction. They really wanted to make sure the crowd got their money's worth. When the show was approaching its second hour, it happened. Now, I don't remember the wrestler's name. I could tell you he looked like King Kong Bundy with a mullet. He stood roughly six foot tall, and he was well over 300 pounds, an absolute mountain of a man. His opponent was some kid that was maybe 21 years old and looked like he weighed 170 pounds soaking wet. The mountain man threw him around the ring like a training dummy and proceeded to beat the ever-loving living hell out of him throughout the insanely short match before leveling him with what looked like a rock bottom from the second rope. One, two, three, the match was over. Obviously this man was playing the part of the heel and boy was he getting into it. He climbed out of the ring and proceeded to talk smack to the crowd, even getting a few people's faces. But when he got to Tony, the mood completely changed. Things stopped being entertaining. Now, if you'll humor me for a moment, let me just say I stand at five foot nine, and at the time I weighed 180 pounds. I'm not a big guy, never have been, and certainly don't look my age. This was probably my one and only saving grace. This guy gets in Tony's face, and he shot the big guy a look back before telling him to go piss off. Big guy takes offense, slapped Tony's disposable cup of Dr. Pepper out of his hand, splashing it all over his uncle in the process. Tony goes over the makeshift guardrail. He then rips off Tony's shirt and starts and start lighting up his chest and back with open-handed overhand chops. Everything's in slow motion at this point, and I get the bright idea to hop the guardrail and punch this guy in the back of the head. Everything went quiet and I zeroed in on his expression, on his face, as he turned his attention to me. This is how I die, was the most prevalent thought in my head at the time. Before anything could happen, I felt two hands go under my armpits and grasp my shoulders. Security began dragging me out. As I looked down towards Tony and Frank, they were yelling something I couldn't make out. The security guard looked at me and told me point blank I was lucky. I was a kid. Otherwise, he would have let the wrestler get a few good shots on me. I told the guard I would stay outside my car, but I wanted to make sure my friends were okay. They told me that would be fine as I waited and waited and waited. People began making their way to their cars and driving off as the show was over. I was looking all around for Tony, but didn't see him. Finally, I see Frank wheeling his way through the door with a look on his face. I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was supposed to mean. It was something between bewilderment and fighting the urge to laugh. Well, you know how to melt this old New York punk's heart. You got your ass kicked out there trying to take on the equivalent of human Godzilla. I'd say you have a death wish, but I know why you did it. Proud of you, man. Frank patted me on the arm, and I asked him where his nephew was. Tony's fine, he hit his head. He should be out any minute. I nodded at Frank and watched his expression change to one of horror. As I turn around, I see the wrestler I donkey punched. His GMC Jimmy was parked next to my car. He grabbed me by the jacket and pushed me against his vehicle while winding me up to give me a receipt. At this point, I close my eyes and accept it. Much like a fly hitting a windshield, the last thing to go through my mind was going to be my ass, as this man punched it through my colon. 
I braced myself for impact, and then it happened. It was like a raindrop hitting me in the face. I opened my eyes to see Tony standing next to this shaven Sasquatch, and they're both busting a gut. That's how you throw a worked punch. And he lets go of my jacket and brushes me off. Tony then explained to me he had been there since two, working with the large man. I now know as Mike. They planned out the whole thing. Mike was Tony's trainer, and this evening was supposed to be a storyline beating that would lead to Tony's first ring-in match in about a month's time, for those of you keeping score. Tony was what is known as a plant in the sports entertainment, and yet he forgot to tell me this whole ordeal would happen. Maybe he was just trying to help sell the moment. Maybe he genuinely forgot, but I honestly can't say. That was one of my brightest moments. Tony followed his childhood dream for a little while. I'd like to say about four years, but unfortunately indie wrestling shows don't really pay the bills and they take a huge toll on your body. Today he works as a 911 dispatcher. Occasionally we talk about his wrestling days and glance over it every now and again. Mike, you human horror movie with a weird sense of humour. Should we ever meet again, I honestly hope you buy me a drink after all that. And thank you for not turning my innards into outards. Just dumb kid stuff, right? I'm a 23-year-old, somewhat physically fit male, who, unfortunately, has had his fair share of experiences in physical altercations through the years. I'm not that tall. Maybe five foot nine, weigh around 180 pounds, and while I'm not the most physically imposing guy out there, I do have a pretty broad frame. The reason I bring all of this up is because some people may think a guy may not be able to relate to many of the experiences shared, like girls being stalked or harassed. However, this isn't the case. I was scared to death this night, and I felt the need to share it with all of you. The events of this story occurred while I was approximately 16 years old and in high school. I am now 23 and attending university to become a physical therapist. My life over the past seven years, between the time this event occurred and my life now, have been chaotic to say the least. I am a recovering drug addict, and I abused opiates and cocaine for four years before getting clean 21 months ago and getting my life straight. Because of this fact, I don't have the best memory of that time period. However, I will do my absolute best to recall everything to the finest detail my mind can muster. Nothing will be exaggerated, and if anything is murky, I will either let you know, or omit it. But now, without further ado, let's begin. I live in the Deep South and went to high school in a small to medium-sized town with roughly 30 to 50k people. Because the town is not the greatest size, there were not very many things to do on weeknights or weekends either, for that matter. This was before I got into the big partying phase. I was 16, and at that age you can choose between going to the movies, browsing the mall, going bowling, having dinner somewhere, or going to Broad Street, which is the main street in downtown that is a historical site and has a lot of shops and restaurants and stuff on it pretty much like a main street in most towns that actually have them. In high school, going out there and just walking it, or going to see the fountain or the bridges that go over many rivers in the town behind it, were popular things to do. The bridges over the rivers were also very popular for teenagers to smoke pot or to just hang out and talk. These bridges were very dimly lit and were very barely wide enough for a car to drive over. There were no cars allowed back there anyway. This place was strictly for scenery, or walking your dog or whatever. Well, one night a few of my friends and I went back there to hang out and waste a Friday night. I didn't smoke pot, and there was another friend of mine there who didn't either. His name was Zach. So while my friends started smoking, Zach and I decided to just take a walk over the hill and check out the other bridges on the other side. We probably walked a good half mile to a mile away from them, to the point where if we screamed at them, or if they screamed at us, 
neither would hear. Also because we travelled over other hills, and the distance we travelled, we couldn't see our friends, or anyone else for that matter. It was a cool autumn night, and exceptionally dark out. I remember it being one of the darkest nights in living memory. Not especially cloudy, but there was no moon, or perhaps it was just incredibly dim. Being in the area we were in so far from Broad Street, and our friends didn't help either. The only lights we had were the very dim ones of the bridge. Zack and I were just standing there, looking at the river flow gently beneath us, getting ready to head back to the others when we saw two silhouettes growing larger and larger towards us. It wasn't uncommon for people to walk their dogs back here, even at the later hours of the night. I believe it was around 11pm, and it also wasn't uncommon for other people to just be doing what we were doing. After all, that's what the place was built for. So at this point, we aren't particularly frightened or anything. Personally, I didn't think anything of it. And at this point, we had been gone for at least half hour and assumed they would be finished. So we started to walk back, disregarding the dark figures, which we could now see in our peripheral vision. As we walked, we heard a sharp, loud whistle. One of those that people make by putting two fingers in their mouths and blowing. I still have no idea how to do it. So we turned around and looked. It was the two other silhouettes, now submerged under the revealing light of the bridge. Y'all come on over here for a minute now, boys. There were two middle-aged men, one slightly taller than me and the other significantly taller. They were large dudes, both with completely shaved heads, bald as could be, and I'll never forget the way their eyes looked. The only way to describe them is crazy. Methed out, possibly. Maybe crack. They were absolutely delusional. Both were tattooed on their faces and the rest of their body. But we could see anyway. Which wasn't much, because they were both wearing long black leather trench coats. The shorter of the two was holding a brown paper bag. You can tell when a brown paper bag has alcohol or some sort of bottle in it. Yet this didn't. I have no idea what was in the bag. The guys began asking us a lot of questions, very personal, scary questions, and they were both quite obviously neo-Nazis, identifiable by the shaved head and swastika tattooed on their faces. They would ask Zack and me things like, do you love your race, boy? Would you do anything for someone of your race? You ain't got no dirty blood in you, do you? Any poison running in your veins? When confronted in a situation like this with two drug-induced, delusional, presumably killers interrogating you, you pretty much tell them everything that they want to hear. Oh yes sir, very proud to be white. No sir, everyone in my family for generations has been white. I noticed Zack wasn't speaking. He was even more nervous than I was. Zack was raised by a white family, but he looked suspiciously of Native American descent. I often questioned if he was adopted. They questioned Zack more and more, but I stood there and told them that he was my brother and he was indeed white. After we had convinced them of our racial heritage, they were satisfied that we were white. I thought maybe that would be the end of it and they would let us go, but I was wrong. This was only the beginning. For you to understand why we just didn't tell these two lumps to piss off, we have to go and then run, I should explain to you that the shorter of these two men had what appeared to be a 9mm pistol. I could be mistaken about the calibre, but it was unmistakably a pistol, hanging slightly out of the opening between his jacket pocket in the front. However, that wasn't even our main concern. With every gesture the larger man made while he spoke, he slung around a large knife in his hand, almost as if he had forgotten it was there. It was so casual. It wasn't a pocket knife. It was too large to be. It looked like one of those really large 9 to 10 inch blade knives they sell at convenience stores with dragons on the handle for $20. We aren't from here. We're traveling soldiers for the white race, he explained. He told us they were from the state directly above mine, and they were here to purge the unclean. 
While the second round of conversation and questioning was going on, an elderly couple, maybe in their 50 to 60s, walked less than 40 yards away from us walking their dog. We all just stopped talking and looked at them. In my head, I'm begging them to please call the cops, and I'm giving them that rescue us look with my eye. They got past us, put their heads down and picked up the pace. It was at this point that the scariest part of my night happened. The shorter one took out his gun, casually. He made my friend Zach and I remember his phone number and remember the name of their army, stating they had a full team of snipers with their sights aimed at our heads right now. If we were unable to do so. Obviously, there were no snipers on the rooftops, but don't ask me what his logic or reasoning were behind this. People in drug-induced manias don't generally have the best logic nor reasoning. I know personally. The man said it a couple of times and gave me 30 seconds to memorize it. It was an out-of-state number, so a bit more difficult to naturally memorize it. And the name of their terrorist organization was something ridiculously confusing as well. Perhaps it was just the circumstances, but it was the scariest 30 seconds of my life. Remember, and repeat, and live. Screw up one number and potentially get shot dead on the spot. Obviously not by a team of snipers, but the very real threat was standing right in front of me. The time was up. I repeat it back, praying to a god I don't believe in that it was correct. It was. And after repeating it back, they sent us on our way. We immediately took off running back to our friends, who were no longer there because of the amount of time we'd been gone. We explained to them what happened and called the police. They weren't out there, and searched the place, but the two men were gone. The number they'd given me didn't exist. No one had ever heard of their group. As far as I know, nothing came of it. They, perhaps, were only just drifting in our town. It was the single most frightening night of my entire life. And that is saying something. So please, racist, bigoted, ugly, idiotic scumbags, lower than dirt, neo-Nazis, let's never meet again. In the summer of 1995, I was 11 sleeping late home alone at around 11 a.m. while my parents were at work. I got woken up by the doorbell, so instinctively I hurried up down the corridor, but before I rushed to open the door as I normally would, I remembered the many times my mum scolded me for opening the door without asking who it is first, or looking through the peephole to make sure it was safe to open, especially after some previously creepy experiences having already taken place at this point. So I ask, who is it? But all I heard was some unintelligible mumbles. So I thought about it and brought a chair up, stepped on it and looked through the peephole. We lived in an apartment building and on the right of our door was the elevator and then the staircase. Since the staircase windows were on the far left corner, there was not enough natural light up there to help me see who it was. I just saw a male with some colourful t-shirts standing outside. I repeated the question and then strained to hear the answer. He said he was looking for Miss Marjorie. That's my mother's maiden name. And I replied that she was at work. To give you some context, both of my parents are doctors. And I don't know if that sounds weird for the US or the rest of the Western world, but in Eastern Europe in the 90s, it wasn't uncommon for grateful patients to sometimes stop by, wanting to give them thanks by bringing fresh fruit or vegetables or produce from their gardens, especially those with which my parents had helped but couldn't pay. So the man said he was bringing something for my mum, except even in the murky light, I could see his hands were empty. I asked what it was, and he said he left the package at the stairs. At this point, I'm starting to get this uneasy feeling that something isn't right. So I decide to be cautious and lie to him that I don't have keys, and said my parents were at work, and they've told me to not open the door for strangers. So when they come back, they can help him. 
He starts to get agitated and said he can't wait that long and then says he's actually bringing meat so that it would get spoiled in the heat if it's left outside. I begin to hesitate because what if he's telling the truth? Will I get in trouble for letting the meat spoil? But then I look through the peephole again and see his hair, which means he has his ear pressed to the door and he's listening in. This spooked me. So I said that I was sorry and couldn't help him and asked him to come back later when I wasn't alone. He once again said he wouldn't have time to come back later. So he offers to leave and says he will leave the package at the stairs. So when he's gone, I won't be afraid to open the door and retrieve it myself. I keep quiet and intently observe him as he goes down the stairs and makes noise climbing down. And then I freeze because in the silence that ensued, I was just about to really open the door and check when I saw his t-shirt sleeve behind the corner of the stairs. He was hiding, probably hoping that I would open the door thinking he were gone, when in fact, he was preparing to what? Pounce on me? Break into our apartment? Maybe something worse. I got so scared I froze and just kept on watching, standing on the chair behind the door, and finally after what seemed like hours but was probably maybe just 10 minutes, I heard him descend the stairs. I still didn't open the door. I called my mom's hospital but she couldn't be put through, so I waited for them to come back home in the afternoon. They both got worried but proud of me that I did the right thing. A few hours later all the kids from the building and I are at the little square playground slash bench area in front of it. It was buzzing with kids running around and grandparents, so it was very safe. My best friend Nina and I were sitting on one of the benches when suddenly a strange man approaches us and stands next to the bench and asks our name. I hesitantly say what it is, although my heart starts to beat faster as I recognize the voice. It was the man from the morning. This time I'm not alone, so I instinctively press myself closer to Nina when he says, well, I'm bringing something for Harry, but it's in the car and I've parked it there on the street. Will you come bring it to me? For context, Harry is my father. Encouraged by my friend's presence and all the people around, I say to him that actually my dad is home. So if he waits there, I'll go get him and he could help him bring whatever he wants from the car as I'm too little and can't carry heavy things. The moment I said it, the guy got quiet and then quickly began walking away, not running, just very quickly walking. My friend who already knew about what happened this morning and I ran to my apartment and told my dad. He ran in his shorts to chase after the guy, but of course he was long gone. My dad started asking away then, as once again, something typical for Eastern European countries the grandma sitting on the balconies and the benches, looking out at everyone and everything that's going on, like a live-in security system. But no one has noticed anything except one grandma, an old lady living alone on the first floor, who says that a guy approached her earlier while she was sitting on her balcony and started asking about our family, then tried to ask for money to pay for the meat he was bringing. And he told her that my parents have purchased it from him. She told him she has no money, but stupidly gave him a lot of information like my name. We never heard anything about the guy, but thank God. Those questions are still puzzling me though. What did he want? Why did he say my mum's name? But then he said he was bringing something for my dad. Was he actually focused on me? Would he have abducted me? Whatever the answer, I hope to never meet him. I also remember that when school started after that summer, there was another situation that seemed weird and possibly dangerous. I was coming back from school and saw my friends gathered in front of the apartment building, but in the entrance furthest away from the one I live in. I was talking to them when I heard my mum calling me. I turned and saw she was heading to work towards the bus stop, but she never called me to go to her. And when I did, she told me she wants me to immediately go home. I grumbled, but obliged. 
So from my point of view, what happened was this. I reached our entrance of the building and opened the door, when I feel someone coming close behind me, but I don't turn and think nothing of it. Then I start climbing the stairs quickly because I was afraid to take the elevator alone. But I hear that there are equally fast footsteps following up behind me. And just when I was fiddling with my keys about to unlock the door, I hear my mum's extremely worried voice shouting my name from downstairs, which startled me. And then the footsteps stopped right before the person reached my floor and they started coming back down. Then my mum climbs to our floor, hugs me, and we lock the door, and she tells me what actually happened. She's going to work, but sees me talking to my friends. Then she looks around and sees a creepy older man standing near us and staring at us kids. While we are all oblivious to his presence, she calls my name and tells me to immediately go home. She turns and starts for the bus stop once I head home, but then an impending sense of dread consumes her, and she turns to look back seeing that the guy is no longer where he was, but actually following me, and in very few movements, sees he enters the building after me, and disappears. My mum begins to run in a sheer panic, reaches the entrance and shouts my name, and then she hears his footsteps back down, and then when he reaches the ground floor, he passes by my mum, and says he gave her such an evil menacing glare, as if he wanted to strangle her for preventing his intentions. She said alarm bells rang in her head, and her whole body was full of adrenaline ready to fight if she must, because she felt that I was in real danger. Do you think it was the same guy? I never got a chance to see him, and my mum didn't know what the guy from before looked like, so who knows? All I know is that I never want to meet either of them again. I was 10 at the time, and was visiting my hometown, Ecuador, for the summer. At the time, I knew just about everyone in my small town, Alausi, and so did my parents, which is why they let me go out on my own that day. Back to when I was 10 years old, my family decided to take a visit of my hometown in Ecuador. We went for the summer and planned out about our whole stay. One day, my mum and dad were getting ready to go to a wedding, when I was in the house with them. My big sister went over to a friend's house, and my other relatives had already left for the wedding. I was supposed to stay home, alone, during the duration of the wedding. But I saw that it was a beautiful day outside, and asked my mum and dad if I could go to the park, as it was no more than two blocks away. They were reluctant at first, stating that there would be nobody to take care of me, but I argued that it was a beautiful day out, and there was no way that the park would be empty. They kept getting dressed as I argued until they finally gave in. They said that I could go to the park, as long as I was back before it got dark. I agreed and ran outside to head for the park. It took me no more than 10 minutes to get there, and I was ready to make new friends and to play around. But oddly enough, there was no one there. It looked abandoned which was weird seeing how this was one of the two parks in the whole city. It should have been packed, but I paid it no mind. I believe I ran over to a swing set or slide and played around. As I played, I suddenly heard a voice from the distance. A clown was on the other side of a gate and motioning me to get closer. Behind him was a white van, which I had noticed before, but just thought it was a delivery truck of sorts. I slowly started walking towards the clown, and stopped a good distance away from him. He asked me in Spanish, Hey kid, do you like clowns? I nodded no to him, and he gave me that clown frown, and then said, Well then, let me see if I can change that. He opened up his car, and by looking inside I saw that there were only two boxes though I wasn't sure what they were filled with, and that was it. No seats, no posters, just those two boxes and then complete emptiness. Being a child, I still paid no mind to it, and watched as he pulled out a deflated balloon. He wrapped his lips around the end of it, and blew till the balloon was fully inflated. He tied the end, and started to form a balloon into the shape of a dog. He showed it to me and I smiled. 
He then motioned for me to come closer to which I complied, and handed the balloon to me and said, Do you like it? I nodded yes this time and gave him a small smile, and he then grinned in the creepiest way possible. The grin was so creepy that even as a kid, I knew to back away a bit. The clown then said that if I wanted to see the rest of his tricks, I would have to get into the truck. I told him the exit was on the other side of the park, and I wouldn't be able to climb the small gate. He then said a few words that still haunt me to this day. Get a little closer, and I'll carry you over. Then we can have loads of fun in my truck. Come on, kid. While saying all of this, he still had that creepy grin plastered across his face. I merely backed away and told him, No, it's okay, sir. His grin turned into anger, as though he were annoyed by this. He placed his hands on his hips and said, Oh, but we're having so much fun. Right when he said that, I heard a voice on the other side of the park yelling, Son, son, I'm here to pick you up. I turned and saw a man that I recognized as a local neighbor. He was not my real father, obviously, but the little me knew to run over to him. I said nothing to the clown and just ran to the man and gave him a hug. The man waved to the clown and said, thanks for keeping my kid entertained. To which the clown replied, no problem. As we turned around, I was able to hear this man murmur, sick creep. I looked at him and asked, what exactly is going on? He gave me a sigh and explained everything. As it turns out, he was not a real clown. He was a man that had been kidnapping kids all across Ecuador. He would lure children with a clown costume and take them away to God knows where. The people of my town had a feeling he was coming to our town, which is why the whole park was deserted. He said that he was walking by when he noticed that I was talking to the clown and ran over to save me. As he told me this, he also dialed for the police to report the incident. We had finally arrived at my house and the man said, Be careful who you talk to, son. Not everyone is who they seem. I gave him one final hug, gave him a thanks for saving me, and he gave me a rub on the head and said, It's okay, boy. Now hurry in. I have my own things to worry about. I nodded and ran into the house. No one was there and by the time they had returned, I decided not to tell anyone since I knew they'd flip out. It took a while to forget about the whole incident, especially with those words that kept reminding me of him. But I soon forgot, till I came across this page, and memories of that clown flooded my head. I'm not quite sure what happened to the sicko, but hopefully he is now behind bars. So, to that creepy clown from long ago, let's not meet again. This happened in 2005. I was just about to turn 20. Between my first and second year of uni, and I found a summer job at a local video rent store. I miss those. It was open 8am to 1am, so whoever was working afternoon shift had to close up, and was located in a calm downtown area, only a couple of blocks away from the city centre. And whenever I had to close, I always took a taxi home, so I never had a reason to worry about my safety. After the first months, I had already learned who the regulars were, and because I was friendly and chatty, I started feeling in my element soon enough. I knew who were the good clients, who were the ones who always tend to be late to return DVDs and try to evade the fines. There was, however, one client in particular, who always gave me the creeps from the first time I saw him. He was young, maybe in his early thirties. Dirty blonde hair and blue eyes, and whenever he came to rent or return, he was always kind of hostile towards me, even in mundane exchanges. The sulky and rather sarcastic way he spoke to me gave me that vibe. I didn't take it personally but let's just say he wasn't my favorite customer. So imagine my surprise when one day I come to work and my colleague tells me that one of our clients has asked about me and when I start work, she was teasing me, that he must like me. And I couldn't really think of 
who said client was, because she didn't remember his name. When he came to ask about me, he didn't rent nor return a DVD, so she couldn't access his account. She leaves, I start my shift, and it was really busy that day, so I quickly forgot all about it. But then, in the evening, when it was less busy at around 8, guess who shows up? The Grump. At this point, I still haven't made the connection in my mind, and I groan inwardly thinking, Ugh, why always on my shifts? Then instead of going through the aisles to pick a movie, he heads straight for the counter, where I am, and starts asking me questions like what my name is, where and what I study, if I have a boyfriend, and I'm trying to be polite and casual, even though he is, once again, talking to me with that hostile vibe, which didn't really make any sense to me. Then he starts going away, mid-sentence, but suddenly turns back to me and declares that he will come pick me up tonight after my shift is over, and will walk me home. I stand there completely puzzled and weirded out. Then I try to politely dismiss that offer by saying that I normally call a cab, so there is no need, but he doesn't even hear me. He stubbornly says, tonight I will walk you home. I will be there when the store closes. Now after he left, I felt relieved and tried to laugh it off and think nothing of it. However, the later it got, the more creeped out I started to feel. I was wondering what if he really does come? What would I do then? So I decided to risk closing off early. And at 11.30pm, I've gradually started the process of finishing the shift, when suddenly I see a few guys passing by the store on the street, and I recognise an ex-classmate of mine. I quickly run outside and shout his name. He comes back and we greet each other with a hug. We used to be friends in high school, and I tell him about the creep and that I was scared. My friend Theo says he was going with his friends for drinks, but he'll make sure to return around closing time to see me home. I exhale in relief, because I no longer have to close early, something that made me quite anxious to do as I hate breaking the rules, even though it was unlikely I would have been caught. And as I get back inside arranging DVDs in a much calmer state of mind, the clock goes on, and 12.30 comes around. I start washing the floor, and thinking I might have overreacted by getting so worked up about this whole situation, and that maybe the guy was just a harmless grump who wouldn't act on what he said. Then I hear the bell jingle, indicating that someone had entered the store. I go to the counter and stop in my tracks. I see him, the guy, slowly approaching me with a determined stare. I start shaking all over look outside but the streets are empty. So I try to remain calm and not give any nervousness away in case I trigger him somehow. I continue finishing my shift when he asks if I'm ready and once again repeat that I don't need to be walked home because I have other plans. This seems to annoy him and he asks what kind of plans since I didn't mention anything before and my facade slips a little when I indignantly explain that it's not any of his business, but I made those plans after he last came. So I ask him if he doesn't intend to rent to please leave and allow me to finish up and close. He doesn't even budge, just stubbornly stands there and says, yes, you have no plans. I will walk you home when you finish. Now at this point, my treacherous chin starts to tremble a bit because I'm on the verge of tears. I feel angry, frustrated and scared. I'm looking at the clock every few minutes and contemplate my options in case Theo forgets about me and doesn't fulfill his promise to return. It was 12.58 now. I was still stalling, seriously wondering if the situation warranted a call to the police. I was anxious to call them anyway, because I didn't want to trigger the guy, but also I was afraid to be scolded for bothering the police with insignificant things. That was my young, stupid brain. That's when I hear the doorbell ding again, 
and we both turned to see Theo walk inside. I had never been more glad and relieved to see him. So I put down what I'm holding and run to him. He slides a protective arm around my shoulder and asks if I'm ready, and looks at the creep in that non-verbal, defiant male way of saying, You got a problem, bro? Now this would be a good time to mention that Theo was a tall, bulky guy who did sports, so he was not someone you wanted to mess with, in comparison to the other guy who was rather slim. The creep looks at us for a few seconds, as if weighing in his options, but then resigns and leaves. But before he goes out the door, he turns to me with a vicious glare and says, This isn't over. Theo starts for the door, and the guy quickly left. He walked me home and warned me to speak to my manager and colleagues and warn them about him. The next day I told them everything, and I had to start taking only morning shifts for a while. A few weeks later, one of my colleagues said the creepster appeared and asked about me again. Mind you, he asked when I would be working the evening shift. They told him I only do mornings, and he seemed disappointed. He then started ranting, said that I led him on and then rejected him, and my colleagues told him that she actually knows what happened, so it would be best if he leaves, and leaves me alone, unless he wants trouble with the police. That seemed to work, because since then he never returned to the video store, at least not while I was working there. I don't know what his intentions were, but boy am I glad for Theo being there at the right place at the right time. Who knows what would have happened if he hadn't have been. This happened back in the late 1980s, when I was home one summer on break from college. About two years prior, my dad had purchased an old house with the intention of eventually tearing it down to build a new home. The house was built in 1916, and like most homes built in that era, it had a really unconventional floor plan. There was a central living room and a kitchen like any normal home, but the three bedrooms were more akin to a separate apartment. Each had its own separate outside entrance, a private bathroom, and a door that led to the common area living room, and a kitchen. Perhaps the place was originally intended to be a boarding house or something. I really didn't know. The other thing that was a little creepy about the house was that it was all wood, the ceilings, walls and floors were all brown, and nothing was ever painted nor plastered. My dad was a pretty cool guy. While he was waiting for permits and financing, he let three of my friends live there for free in exchange for watching the place. They had a lot of parties, but my dad didn't care, as long as none of the neighbours complained. I went to a few parties there myself when I was lucky enough to be home from college. Eventually, two of my friends moved out leaving my one buddy there to watch the mostly empty house on his own. He was not the type of person to be afraid of living alone in a half-empty house. In fact, he was fine with the situation. I'm at home one afternoon when the phone rings. It's my buddy, and he sounds terrified. He tells me to call the police and to meet him in front of the driveway of the house, but to under no conditions go in. I ask him why, and he tells me that there is a crazy clown in the house. Apparently he was sick with the man flu, in bed for the previous two days, when he finally felt well enough to go into the kitchen to get something to eat. He runs face to face with a crazy woman dressed in a clown suit, and makeup starts screaming at him. It was then that he ran out the house and called me in a panic from a nearby gas station. I called the police, and then drove over to the house which was about two miles away and find my buddy on the sidewalk out front, and he's very shaken up. I ask him to describe what he saw, and he keeps saying that there's a crazy clown woman in the house. I press for more specific details, and he describes her as dressed in a white clown suit with red makeup smeared all over her face. He's still a little sick, and looks really bad, and honestly, he's really freaking me out as well. There's no way in hell that I was going into that house to investigate the story. After what seems like an eternity, a cop shows up. My buddy tells him the exact same story. The cop then goes into the house while we wait outside. 
and after about five minutes, he emerges escorting a crazy clown woman who looks exactly as my friend described. She has wild, unkept brown hair, wearing this weird baggy one-piece all-white body jumper suit that is really strangely styled. What is really disturbing though is her face. She had a tube of lipstick which she crudely spread red all over her cheeks in a failed attempt to make them look rosy. Although we were both freaked out, the cop thought it was hilarious. The clown woman claimed it was her house and then accused us of being on drugs and trespassing on her property. When the cop told her to get in the back of the squad car, she warned him that she had powerful friends in Tinseltown who would have him fired. When he comes back to talk to us, he tells us he can't arrest her for breaking and entering because the house is half abandoned. He said the best he could do was drive her a few blocks away and hope she didn't wander back. This of course freaks us out even more. Fortunately though, when they did a background check on her, it turns out she has an outstanding warrant and would be going to jail instead. That is the last time we saw her. When we go back into the house, we find all kinds of crazy stuff written on the kitchen cabinets in the same red lipstick that she rubbed all over her face. There was also some 10 day old fish in the fridge that my friend never got around to eating that she cooked on the stove and ate. The really scary thing though, was this crazy woman was in the same house with my friend for at least a day while he was sick and semi delirious in bed with a fever. She was probably harmless, but who knows what she could have done if she stumbled upon him while he was sleeping. His door was unlocked the entire time. Fortunately, she never did as far as we know. One of the things she wrote on the cabinets and lipstick was her name. While I'm not allowed to disclose what it is, I googled it and found a mugshot that was taken of her some years later. So creepy clown lady, let's not meet again. I think at this point, given all these horrific people, I'd rather leave by foot. So I'm gonna hike the rest of the way guys. I'm sure I'll be fine. So join me as I hike through the middle of nowhere. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that's ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still do not know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting uni. Our home was and still is just outside of a small town with forests all around it. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would always go on led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was quite hidden deep in the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone, or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never saw anyone else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running, my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away coming from the north. Someone was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, wondered if it was some kind of lost hunting dog and started moving towards the sound. Yes, I know I'd be the first person to perish in a horror movie, but that's the way I was heading anyway. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. 
I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me, and stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to be a person, and I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally, until I found a badger, a blue and dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh, the body was still limp and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, so had I. So the badger was put there, maybe killed there, at least decapitated, while I was walking that way, I suppose. I'm not sure, really. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at around 6pm, and made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, and decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late, and it was raining quite heavily. The sunset was around 9pm, and I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, with its head strung to his front paws. That area looked like a ham, because of the way it was tied. Just swinging from a tree, like an almost literal load of bollocks. It was at this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid, that I started to gag. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain and my senses became confused. It felt like an bucket of ice cold water had been thrown over me, when I realised I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd see it. So was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running half walking away from the stream back towards the path for a while when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad. I told him to meet me on the path where it turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, and to go as fast as he could, and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I just crapped out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still just a bit far away. Just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time. On and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing, and the fact that I couldn't breathe properly was making me lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mum, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mum was screaming at the phone at the same time that they were on the path and I needed to run, and that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half run, half speed walk thing again as I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break, clear footsteps, and for the first time from down the forest, the bell rang louder. I didn't want to look over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure, 
creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability, or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police, they're on the path. Dad, I can see you, I'm here. I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was gonna happen. I felt like the man was right behind me and I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping, wheezing, crying so loud and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched off. I ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mum could hear it on the phone and she was waiting with the car ready to leave fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car. He said he could hear the bell and thought he wouldn't have been able to see me and asked what if I didn't have my phone and what if he hadn't have picked up. They were almost as terrified of me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run and they could hear the danger. They just couldn't see it. The police couldn't really do much. They searched the area and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. I didn't really question that. And my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest, but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault. There are just too many what ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It was like he had trapped me. I didn't see any more detail. I just ran. To this day, I can't go anywhere where I'll be alone. And the sound of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life. So go hug yours now and take decapitated badges and bells as pagan signs that you're unwelcome. During college, that was located away from major cities, the woods were all around us. That being said, there was a highly rated trail, the Loyal Stock Trail, which was about an hour's drive from the university. I invited a friend to come with me as he had never been on an extended backpacking trip, a 50 plus mile trail that we intended to backpack over the four day weekend. I am an Eagle Scout who has spent countless hours in the woods and went on backpacking trips consistently throughout my college experience. As many have said before me, you get used to the minor spooky things that happen while out there. Coyote howls, raccoons in the middle of the night, even the occasional unknown noise. However, the scariest thing that you will find in the forest are people. We were about 20 miles into the trail and being Pennsylvania where the underbrush and trees lined the trails pretty densely, I always walk about 100 meters off the trail to reduce the chances of me disturbing people or people disturbing me, especially in the early morning when I choose to sleep in. Following that same strategy, my friend and I go out of our way to be in this amazing spot, a good ways off the trail where it would be even more difficult to see our flashlights from the trail. The spot was on a peninsula where the creek met a river, meaning there was only one way to our campsite and one way out. We start a fire, cook our food and drink some, but not enough alcohol to get us drunk. 
We put the fire out around midnight, head into our individual tents, and all is quiet. It's the fall semester, so leaves are on the ground, the moon is brightly shining through the bare trees, and the air is cool. The only noise is the occasional time where I would hear my friend turn over in his sleep. And then, I hear the voices. The voices sound very close, especially for us being over a hundred plus meters away. I check my watch and it's 3 a.m. Who hikes at 3 a.m.? We're 20 miles in. I slowly get out my sleeping bag, slowly unzip my tent, only to see my friend peeking out of his in the exact same fashion. He quickly moves his finger over his mouth in an exaggerated shh sign and then used the same hand to frantically motion towards the way of the trail. Then we see them. Four adults, three men and one woman walking directly to our camp. No lights illuminating their path. They are walking silently at this point. Only one of them has a backpack, an impossibility for the long hike, as they were a third of the way through. Being a long trip, you bring wood cutting supplies to chop branches into smaller branches to burn. For me, this was a survival knife, grabbing the knife, believing it to be my only way of defending myself. I am more disheveled than I have ever been, especially knowing that a knife is barely a defense at all. These people walk into our sight, sit down by our extinguished fire pit, and just sit there for what felt like an eternity. My friend speaks up and asks what they're doing in our campsite. Without answering, they ask if we have any food, Having packed as lightly as possible for the long trip, we only had a few extra Mountain House MRE-style meals. I grab one out of my bag and toss it to one of the men. In rapid succession, I ask why they aren't using a light, and if they need help finding the trail, and why they're hiking so late. And they respond with the following. We don't use lights. We know where the trail is, and it's better to hike late at night. Unnerved at this point, my friends asked them to leave. They responded by asking if we wanted to light the fire and hang out for a bit. No, we don't. They grab their bag, get up, and leave without speaking another word. We watch them leave and take shifts, making sure they don't come back. Needless to say, we both got very little sleep that night. And when the sun rose the next morning, we finally got real sleep. By the afternoon when we awoke, it felt like a weird dream of sorts. The only evidence was a fuzzy cap that they must have dropped, that I still have to this very day. I have never had something as weird or spooky as that happen in the woods, and I hope to never have it happen again. In the eight years since that trip, I haven't been back to Loyal Stock Trail. This happened to me about ten years ago or so, when I was around eighteen or nineteen. At the time, I was in a new relationship, still in the early stages, when everything was brand new and an adventure. My girlfriend came from a well-off family and had a very strict upbringing and parents who weren't fond of her being out much, nor of our social groups, so it was often difficult for us to meet. To this end, we would regularly sneak out of our houses and meet up at 1am and stay out most of the night. The road she lived on was on an upper middle class area connected to a park slash river slash forest that was by day a very popular destination with joggers, kayakers and dog walkers, but by night was a hot spot for dodgy folk. Not the safest place to go to at night, but a regular haunt nonetheless. On a different occasion, my friends and I nearly stumbled on a deal while we were all realistically airsofting. On a different occasion, my friends and I nearly stumbled on a deal while we all had realistic airsoft rifles on us. You would think I would learn. Anyway, so this night I head to her lane and wait around outside. I should mention that I look very out of place with scruffy hair and a long coat, and that it's 1am. She's delayed getting out for reasons that now escape me, so I decide to chill and wait out for a while. Location-wise, I am at the side of a road, with two large fields on either side, both of which have large trees and a hedge line between them and the road. After maybe 20 to 30 minutes, I hear a car driving up the road towards me, and I get this horrible, 
gut reaction telling me to get off the road. I felt like Frodo sensing the impeding arrival of a Nazgul. I quickly climb over the hedge and drop down, prone to the other side, and stay as still as possible, and I can hear the car slow down as it approaches where I had been standing and wait. I'm fairly certain the driver must have seen me. The car stays there and no one leaves. The engine idles, and they just stay at that spot on the road waiting, I assume, to spot me again. I am terrified. I have no idea who they would be, but I can't shake that horrible feeling in my gut at all. I hide for what felt like hours, but in reality would have been no more than 30 minutes. The car eventually drives on, heading towards the car park for the forest and dead end. I still can't shake the fear and won't want to risk getting caught, but also don't feel safe, so I move to the opposite side of the road and hide behind the other hedge. Soon enough, I hear the familiar sound of an engine as the car comes back down and stops nearby where I had been waiting. They hang around for another 20 minutes or so before driving away again, this time for good. I can't remember how long it took me to get the courage to eventually leave. In hindsight, the rational part of my brain likes to just think that someone had just phoned the police on the scruffy guy loitering around after midnight, but I'm really not sure. Their behavior felt very off and the feeling in my gut was like nothing I felt since. At the time, I couldn't shake the fear of this unknown person just sitting in a car waiting for me to try and move, much like a hunter waiting patiently for prey. Best part, at some point during the night, my girlfriend advised me she couldn't get out that night anymore, so I just went home. Driver of the car, let's not meet. After lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents' house to spend a few weeks there. My grandparents lived in a small city in the north of France, and they have a dog who's quite big. When I was young, I lived at my grandparents for about a year. At the time, the dog was only a puppy. Her name, Chippy, which in French kind of means like little devil, but in an affectionate way. Considering when I was living there, I played a lot with her, we were both very close, and that detail is important for later in the story. Now, two of my hobbies I have are long walks and running. Thus, every evening, I would go out for a long walk with the dog. There's a track that follows a path through the forest, and a small hill, as well as lots of fields for us to go through. The air is fresh, and the view is quite beautiful. So I would go out with her every day. I was also helping my grandparents as she needed lots of exercise. The first time I went out with her, nothing happened. We just enjoyed our walk. It was about an hour's walk, traversing roughly six to seven kilometers. The next day when we arrived on the top of the hill in the field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was still some light because it's summer. There were three other persons walking in the field. They were younger than me, probably about 15 to 16, and I also noticed they were smoking. So my guess was that they used to come here so that they couldn't be seen by their parents. We passed them, greeted them cordially, and they greeted back. Once again, nothing special. I did this for a whole week, and roughly around the same time, 10 p.m and passed those three guys several times, and had no further noticeable interaction. The second week, as I usually went out for the walk with Chippy, I arrived at the fields, and there were only three of the boys. One of them wasn't smoking this time though. When he saw me at the entrance of the field just after the little hill climb, and with the forest behind me, he made a sign with his hand, to catch my attention, and asked if I had a lighter, which I actually did in my pocket. I told him, sure, so I went up to him. He had his hands in his pockets. When he came close, for some reason I felt a cold shiver. It's crazy how sometimes your instinct knows there's something wrong, but you don't listen to it, because it doesn't look that strange to you. I hand the lighter to him, and when he passed by it, at that moment my dog was staring at him. Then everything happened really fast. 
He did a really fast movement with his hand coming from the hoodie, and I saw something shining. I instinctively pulled back, and then I fell down. I realized that he was holding a knife and had just attempted to stab me. What saved me was the dog, God bless her. When she saw the guy attempting it, she jumped on him and he fell down. She is quite a big dog. I immediately got up on my feet and heard something in my back. From the entrance of the forest, I saw two guys wearing animal masks running towards me. They were probably the two friends that I'd seen prior. At this moment in time, my brain was acting by itself. You don't think about it. All that you do is run. I began running, the dog following, and I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who was just getting up. Catch him! Don't let him go! At that moment, I was totally terrified. I wasn't just running. I was not just running, but absolutely legging it, giving my all. I was hearing them chasing behind me, thinking to myself, how long will they follow me for and who the hell are they? This was the first time in my life I was quite glad that I'm a runner. I was clearly a much better runner than they were, because they chased me for what felt like forever, but I ended up losing them. At the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest, and this time, it's a descent with a road at the end. I heard the steps of the three guys fading as I arrived at the end of the forest, though I didn't stop running until I arrived at my grandparents' house and locked the door. I caught a breath and gave a huge hug to my dog, and I saw in her eyes that she totally understood what happened, and I had never been so happy to have her in all my life. After that, I told my grandparents everything, who called the police, but they couldn't find anyone. I don't know what these guys wanted, but the animal masks really made me think they were some kind of weird cult or whatever. I really don't know. Satanist, perhaps? I still do long walks with Chippy, our dog hero, but I now go much earlier and to places with more people. To the three guys in the forest, let's not meet again. This happened a few years ago when I was 16. It was a warm summer night. At nights like these, me and my friends would often grab a pack of cigarettes and a bottle of beer each and go outside to enjoy them. We come from a really small town where everyone is somehow connected. So the only way for us to smoke and drink without our parents knowing is to go to secluded places. Luckily, the town is surrounded with a huge forest and we were all familiar with them since we practically grew up there. This one time it was night as usual. We both grabbed our forbidden contraband, some flashlights and headed out. We took a path through the long meadow, which ended at the edge of the forest. From there, it led to a path through the forest, which is about a 20 minute walk back to town on steep downhill terrain. At the place where the meadow is and the forest meet, there is a gazebo and a fireplace for picnics if you are so inclined. As we were walking through the meadow, we would stop a few times to ensure from afar that the gazebo was unoccupied. It was around 11 p.m. and the night was incredibly dark. Even though we were out in the open, we had to use our flashlights to see anything. When we made sure the air was clear, we approached the gazebo to light our first cigarette. We were just standing there puffing and talking while always scouting our surroundings with the beams of our flashlight. When after about five minutes, we decided to take the path through the forest back to town. We walked about 30 meters, at which point we couldn't see the place where we were previously standing. That's when we heard it. From the gazebo where we were standing just seconds earlier came a long, terrifying scream. It sounded as if a man was being cut to pieces while still alive. The kind of scream that turns your blood to ice. After the first scream, there was a pause for a few seconds. During this whole time, we were both so scared we couldn't even move. Then it started again, even louder and more terrifying. The second scream snapped us back to reality. Without a word, we just started sprinting through the rough terrain, not once looking back. At this point, I was so pumped up with adrenaline that I couldn't hear anything except my own heartbeat resonating in my ears. I've never run that fast, and we didn't stop until we reached the lights of the town. 
When we finally did, we both just sat there on the sidewalk under a lamppost, panting and screaming for air. Nobody said anything for a good half hour. After a while, we started talking about it. We came up to the conclusion that either someone was having fun at our expense, or someone was seriously hurt. In the end, we decided to head back there first thing in the morning. But surprise, surprise, we found no signs of anything. We decided it must have been someone playing a prank on us. However, to this day, it keeps gnawing at me. Something just doesn't add up. I'm 100% sure it wasn't an animal, as as I've previously mentioned, I spent a good portion of my life in those woods, and I'm fairly familiar with local fauna. There is nothing around these parts that could have made those noises. I am absolutely positive it was the scream of a man. On the other hand, it would be almost impossible for anyone to just walk in there without any light since it was so dark, and even if he had some kind of torch, we would have certainly spotted him. Anyway. Screaming man in the forest. Let's not meet again. I may not be an expert, but I do believe that there is more to this world than we understand. For all my life, I've had a very fine-tuned sense for sensing things that some might be unable to explain. Later in life, I would learn or be told that I have some kind of supernatural energy by a Wiccan witch. Nothing too impressive, but just enough to let me feel entities even if I can't see them, like the ghost in my grandparents' guest room, or the malicious entity haunting the stairs and basement and garage. The same uncanny sixth sense that my mum observed when my younger brother was born, stronger than her own maternal sense to the point I understood when my brother needed something, before even he knew and could make a sound even waking minutes before him in the middle of the night without fail. But I think there's more to it than that. And this incident, as you will soon hear, is what leads me to believe this. My family had recently moved to British Columbia, Canada. That winter, I was 10. And while we were by no means in the boonies, we lived in an old trailer near a well-known hiking trail and a small Christmas tree farm. Immediately, there was something off about the area something that my parents waved off as new home anxiety, or just not being used to the place. I did my best to put it out of my mind. But within two weeks of the move, I began to notice strange things happening. Firstly, the unsettling aura that I couldn't shake. Sleepless nights, as I felt like there was something that was watching me from the window. Strange shadows there one second gone the next, voices soft whispering my name and only when I was alone and in my room near the window. However, these incidents happened soon after and I felt something brush against my shin and ankle, something that lessened the aura for at least a while. These instances would be near constant until I struck out my very own eight years later. But it all came to a head that fall months after the move. My parents insisted we take a family walk on the mountain, and though I didn't want to because I am by no means an outdoorsman, something in me screamed not to go and that it was dangerous. But being barely 11, and of course, my parents completely dismissing my concerns as just being lazy, we were making our way to the trail entrance. As soon as I set foot out the car, the warning bells in my head were blaring louder. Something in me kept saying that we had to leave, that something bad was gonna happen and a little voice in my head kept focusing on my diabetic mum who at the time had a weight problem. Dad with his disability that made him outright unable to run and that my bad lungs would make it impossible for me to run myself. The three of us were essentially sitting ducks. I didn't know why I was so hyper-focused on running. I knew we just needed to get away. We were halfway through the walk when suddenly I froze. The apprehension I had felt about the whole event wrapped up to 11. My parents thought I stopped because I was tired. I took the opportunity to take pictures of the lovely fall leaves and dappled sunlight. It was a gorgeous sight, but I knew something was there watching us, and it was not something we wanted to meet. I looked around trying to find whatever was setting me off, and all I saw was an occasional fleeting shadow. I could feel the brushing, but the feeling of dread and fear only got stronger. 
the familiar touch, unable to drive it away as it normally would. Whatever it was was close. If it came at us, we wouldn't stand a chance, and I still didn't know what the hell it was. My parents still hadn't noticed something was wrong, and I felt my voice catch in my throat, not out of fear, but as if something wasn't letting me speak. I then heard the leaves rustle. It was close, so close, and I glanced to where the noise was coming from, and saw a shadow for a split second before it vanished behind a tree. And as it vanished, something changed. Hot. It felt like a volcano had erupted in my chest. Not like the slow, gentle oozing one might see in Hawaii, but explosive, angry, spewing, burning clouds of toxic grey ash, spraying molten rock and fire. I was still afraid, but I wasn't frozen. I was angry, eyes locked on the area that I had seen the shadow. I was no stranger to anger. I am an aggressive woman and always have been, but this rage was entirely new. The feeling against my legs stopped, but the fire was burning hotter, and the thing, the dangerous thing, hiding just outside my field of view. I felt it lock up, in fear all on its own. I felt like my body was controlled by something else, still me, but somehow different. I convinced my parents to pick up the pace and practically sped out walking the rest of the loop, not daring to let the fire, sparked in my chest, die out until we were safely back in the car. This strange presence lingered, much further off but still watching, still malicious but almost curious now. We left the trail and never went back. A few weeks later my mum found out she would be having my brother. As time passed the whole incident kept nagging at my mind and I found myself doing research from time to time to try and piece together whatever happened. And while I may never fully understand it, I think I finally have a part of the answer. I think, perhaps, I was protecting my brother. As I stated earlier, I've always had an unexplainable connection to him despite being so much older, and a terrifyingly vicious protective streak over him. When this happened, my mum would have been a month or so into her pregnancy. I think that whatever was in me allowed me to feel these presences early. Perhaps I knew he was there long before anyone else did. A phantom touch? Maybe. Whatever it is, I'm glad that he was kept safe. I live in the UK, and my flat is located next to a pretty large forest. There is a path which used to be a railway track, but has now been converted into a cycle walk path which links into the city. To preserve the heritage of the railway track, some of the old train stations still exist with their platforms, although the building itself has been converted into an open space to walk around. The path is fairly lit up, except the train stations. Last year, my friends and girlfriend had visited me over the weekend to party and have fun, since we live about at least one and a half hours away. My roommate, who's also from my hometown, and friends with the group, suggested we should have a campfire. Now, being a forest, I didn't want to alert neighbouring flats and potentially get in trouble. The abandoned train station had good coverage from watchful eyes, and was safe enough to do a campfire. It even had a pit from someone else who had a similar idea before. My roommate and I had checked out the place prior to our friend's arrival. So here we were at 11pm. We picked a time where there would be practically no one using the path, laid out our blankets and started our music and tried to light our firewood. It just wouldn't light and we were running out of paper. Suddenly we heard a voice, although we could not identify where it was coming from. We all went silent thinking a passerby had heard our music from the path outside the station, and after a few minutes of silence we resumed our activities. Fifteen minutes later the voice was more audible and more aggressive. It started off with a grunt, and worse, and then sounded closer than we were getting comfortable with. Who's there? There was a metal sheet in the corner of the station, and my friend and I said he saw it moving. We all made a decision to pack up shop and leave as quietly and as quickly as possible. One of my friends was visibly upset and wouldn't move. We literally had to drag her out. I turned around and saw a shadow of what I believed to be a tall man staring at us. He started quickly walking towards our group. I shouted to leg it, and we ran until we reached the street lights in my housing estate. We were all quite a bit shaken up, and in hindsight it was probably a bad idea in the first place. I bet it was a homeless man, or perhaps a druggie, 
that was disturbed by our fire. But I don't want to know what would have happened if we'd have stayed a little too long. I was hiking in the woods near my mum's house outside of Los Angeles. I have various health issues and have a medical alert dog called Riley that has been trained to do lots of different tasks such as detect seizures, help with directions, as well as various other helpful task services. In the past, whenever we've come across a dead animal like a bird or something like that, Riley points to the object and freezes. Upon coming across this bone that you can see on screen, many people I spoke to about it, including two women at the bottom of the trail laughed and said that it was probably just some kind of animal. But I was in school for medicine and know for a fact it's very human-like and resembles a sacrament spine. After realizing this, I immediately called the sheriff's department and the next day, they must have collected it. Nothing made the news, so I'm guessing that I was either wrong, no foul play was involved and it was too old, or perhaps it was something else entirely that they don't want us to know about. I'm from a really rural area and have recently moved to this city for university. I started feeling a bit homesick and missing the countryside, so decided to go on a walk in the woods close to my accommodation, as I live in the outskirts of my city. It was still light when I started my walk, around 2pm. With it being winter, it's been getting to be pitch black at around 4.30. After about an hour and a half of walking, I noticed that it was starting to get pretty dark, so I turned back because I didn't want to be in a forest I'd never been in before in total darkness, mainly in case I got lost. On my way back, I saw a guy maybe in his early 30s, obviously drunk with a plastic bag full of bottles of alcohol and muttering to himself. As I was on a path with steep slopes on either side, I was pretty much forced to walk past him, doing so with keeping as much distance as possible between myself and him and keeping my eyes focused straight ahead. As soon as I passed him, his muttering became much louder and I was sure he was trying to talk to me, but it was still unintelligible, so I ignored him. Then I heard him yelling and turned around to see him walking towards me. There was around 10 meters between us. I still couldn't make out what he was saying, but he was walking quickly towards me and eyeing me up and down with a really creepy look on his face. Not wanting to have any trouble, especially considering I'd only seen one person quite a while beforehand, I simply said, nah, leave me alone. He clearly heard, as I saw him register my sentence through his drunken brain, yet he simply shook his head and carried on towards me. At this point I panicked, pulled out my cell phone and shouted, I'll call the police. I know this was an empty threat considering the fact I didn't even know the name of the forest I knew that it would be a long time before the police would get to me. Not to mention my phone was on 10% before I'd even left and knew that most of the battery had been drained taking photos. I guess in this case I was lucky because he was drunk and he froze. He put his hands up and mumbled, all right, before beginning to back away. I walked quickly away looking several times over my shoulder to check if he was following me. It was probably a good thing I did seeing as each time I looked he was facing me, maybe to check to see if I would notice before he could get to me. Like I said, this could have been nothing, and had simply been a harmless drunk guy that I blew out of proportion. Either way, next time I go for a walk, I'm taking my phone fully charged. A college buddy and I were out one night, in my hometown during some break. I was obviously still living at home with my parents and he was down for the weekend. It's a pretty small town, nothing to do there, so we found ourselves wandering around for a bit and wound up starting a small campfire in a small sandy clearing in the woods near our local softball field. It was a clear night, not a single cloud in the sky and the moon was full, so we could see very clearly everything around us. It was just one of those nights that was barely night because the moon was so bright. We were just chilling out and talking, no big deal. When suddenly we heard this scream coming from deeper in the woods. We both instantly shut up and started listening intently, trying to figure out what we just heard. 
and we heard it again, this time clearer, and it definitely sounded like someone screaming, like a little girl in absolute terror. We both kind of just stood there for a moment staring at each other. I was mostly staring at him, hoping to get answers as to what we were hearing. My buddy was one of those guys who practically lived out in the woods. He's been an avid hunter and fisher for his entire life, and has spent a summer camping in Denali. I was expecting him to write it off as an owl or a hawk or even a fisher cat. Something, but the look in his face was probably more terrified than mine, simply because he knew it wasn't any of those things, and that just made me even more scared. Then we heard it again, louder and closer, and seemingly coming from up in the trees or in the air. We both freaked. Somehow, we had the presence of mind to quickly put out our little fire. The abundant sand helped in that regard, and the moment the fire was out, we both ran as fast as we could, just to get the hell out of there. We ran out of the woods, into the softball field area, where it was a straight shot out into the road, where we were both running for our lives, and the entire time we could hear this thing getting louder and closer. Scream, scream, scream. It was clearly chasing us. Just as we reached the road for some reason, we both stopped and turned and waited and then heard it again getting closer and definitely coming from the air and not the ground. And one more time, this time right above our heads. Remember when I said it was a cloudless night with a very full, very big moon? I could see the sky as clear as anything and I heard a little girl screaming terror right above my head, but there wasn't a damn thing there. We both turned and ran, and this time we didn't stop until we reached my parents' house. I've told this story numerous times, including to people who are more woodsy than I am. Nobody's ever able to come up with an explanation. Some part of me is convinced it was an owl, but so far I've never heard an owl that made a sound anywhere close. Going on a hike is fine and all, but one thing that we forgot to mention is that you may encounter the notorious and legendary Bigfoot. Many stories have been shared about encounters with this elusive creature online and for several hundred years in many ways. One of my favorite stories from the missing 411 cases is that of a little girl, and it always sticks out in my mind. I know it was somewhere in the 1800s. Anyway. A father, mother, and daughter are out in the woods. I'm unsure what exactly they were doing. Maybe they were just out there for leisure. In any case, the parents are discussing something when the daughter suddenly goes missing. They go chase after her, call out in the woods, but are unable to find her for an extended period of time. When the father comes close to the edge of a cliff and he sees his daughter in the arms of a horrific creature, Tall, brown, shaggy-furred. I suppose what we today would call a Bigfoot. The father is in disbelief, and the creature leaves the daughter at the edge of the cliff and jumps down himself. The father, of course, runs up to grab his daughter, absolutely besides himself with grief and confusion and a whole mixture of emotions. Like, what the hell was that creature? Why did it have his daughter? And is she all right? Thankfully, she was. They then both peered down the cliff, which was an incredible drop to see where the creature had landed, surely falling to its death after trying to take their daughter. But there was nothing there. No body, no anything. The daughter seemed to have very little recollection about the whole series of events. That's always been a story that has resonated with me. So why don't we find out if it bears any truth with this collection of Bigfoot stories. This is my father's story. He and my grandparents were camping out by Lake Tahoe, and all day my grandpa said that they felt like they were being watched. My grandpa described a general feeling of just something not feeling right. That night, they had built a big fire and had gotten in their tents, and they began to hear all strange noises. They described it as a wolf howling, but if it were 10 times deeper. My grandpa decided it would be best to keep the fire lit at night. My grandpa stayed up all night out of protection of his family in fear. At around 3.45, he says he opened the tent flap 
and looked outside to see what he says is the most terrifying thing he's ever seen. A large black humanoid figure walking circles around the fire. The thing had no distinguishable features except for its giant pair of yellow eyes. Just then, my grandpa said an awful scent filled the air, like something had been rotting for over eight years. The last thing my grandpa saw before he went back into the tent was the figure returning to the woods, and he saw three others exactly like the one he saw waiting for the figure. Grandpa loaded his gun, and he says nothing else happened, and they left the next day. The story still gives me nightmares to this day. I was 27 and working at a Boy Scouts camp far up in the woods of very northernly Northern California. Where I worked, there was a large population of black bears, which for the most part were rather harmless and easy enough to scare away with a shot from a rifle. However, we had a very large number of Boy Scouts at this camp weekly sometimes as many as 500 heads, with a lot of vastly spread out campsites. There's going to be a few campers who sleep with candy bars in their pockets and basically make themselves pre-packaged dinner snacks for a bear. I tell you this, black bears love Reese's peanut butter cups. As part of staff, oftentimes I was scheduled for bear watch and basically strolled the entirety of the camp with a rifle going from site to site, making my presence known as to ensure the bears wouldn't come anywhere near. One of these routine nights, everything was still and more quiet than usual. I remember finding it rather odd and unsettling. I had just checked in on the camp furthest away from all of the campsites. It was a good mile and a half away from base proper. As I'm strolling along the trail that runs beside the lake, I stop and take a number one and light a joint that I had stashed away for such an occasion as being out by the lake at two in the morning. As human beings, we have a natural gut feeling we must always adhere to for our survival. There was definitely a gut feeling I had that things were amiss. Not only was it unusually still and quiet, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched and that I was most certainly not alone. I nervously took a few puffs from my J and then put it out. Now, being more aware of the unnerving sense in the air, I've been face to face with a bear. I've been stalked by a mountain lion. I've slept a little too close to a den of coyotes late in the night, but this was different. I didn't have the sense that I was in the presence of any of these animals. The smell was overwhelming. It didn't smell like any bear I've experienced. It was almost sour, but still musky. I'll never forget the smell. It's truly hard to accurately describe. And as I reached for my flashlight, before considering readying my rifle, a massive boom hit the ground, falling from the trees above me and nearly knocking me to my ass from the sheer force of it. I reached for my flashlight that had fallen to the ground as I heard something large and massive run away into the tree line, up into the hill above. Immediately I considered it was probably the biggest bear I'd ever come across, and black bears can be spooked easily. So at first I considered myself lucky. But as I lay there hyperventilating, shaking and quaking in my boots, I started to consider the sound of the beast running away. It didn't sound like the stride of a black bear in a flight. It sounded bipedal, it almost sounded human. I braced myself, stood up and readied my rifle, released the safety and shot upwards into the air toward the lake. It woke up many campers and the scoutmasters alike. I stood there for a good 10 minutes alone before a camp leader came, as well as other staff, towards me. During that time I had my flashlight out and was inspecting the scene. Whatever had dropped from the branch above fell from possibly 20 feet and in its wake had torn off the branches in the hill line that stood 13 feet from the ground, and some smaller trees were bent almost all the way into the ground. I have never seen a bear do that, that's for sure. By the time some of the staff and some concerned campers arrived, everyone was stumped. Most campers, to comfort themselves, insisted it was just a bear. But I do know this, 
No bear running on all fours stands 13 feet tall, and no bear can run on two feet for 12 yards uphill on two legs. They just can't do that. We're all thinking it, so I'll say it. I think I encountered a Sasquatch that night. If not, I really don't know what it was, but I'm glad it was running away from me and not at me. Because whatever that thing was, beast or man, it was gargantuan, and I would not have stood a chance had it decided to confront me. I've told this story before, but it's worth repeating. I live in central California in the valley border on all sides by hills and mountain ranges. There were some great hikes and campgrounds all around, and my ex and I chose to go hiking in the Sespe wilderness. It's about a two hour drive from home, and it's basically hiking in the mountains southwest of Bakersville off the highway that leads to the Ojai and the coast. Gorgeous country, very remote, no cell service. We were both archeology span hobbyists and decided to hike out past Piedras Blancas, a giant rock formation, and keep on that same trail, paralleling the Sespe Creek, in order to look for some Chumash pictographs. It's about a five mile hike, hilly terrain, full of scrub bush and smaller trees. The trail is well maintained, and we were mostly alone out there. We reach an old campground about three to four miles out, and I'm feeling tired. So I stop to rest at the campground. It's pretty much circular. There are several different campsites, all in plain view of one another, and just to the east there's a large rock formation that overlooks the creek. The rock formation is kind of flat, so I go over and lay down on the warm rock so that I can listen to the water. He decides to continue further along the trail to see if he can locate the pictographs. I don't know how much time had passed when I hear the strangest howling scream I've ever heard. It went on for longer than a human should have been able to scream, and it alternated from being very low and guttural to high pitched like a woman. So I shoot up off the rocks and start looking around, and I don't see anything. The sound didn't repeat, and I started to think that maybe I was just hearing an animal. All of a sudden, he comes crashing down the trail at full speed, thinking that he is hearing me scream. He describes hearing it a little differently. That sound I heard was not the sound he heard, but we both agree we heard something very strange we cannot explain away. We both kind of looked around the camp, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary, and decide together that it's time to head back. So the sun is starting to set. It's late afternoon, and although it's still light out, it's that late afternoon golden hour kind of light. We're walking back and still on the trail that parallels the creek, and we start to hear boulders being thrown in the water. If you've ever been a kid by a body of water, you know what it feels like to pick up the heaviest rock you can and toss it in the water to hear the satisfying kaplunk sound that heavy rocks make. This was heavier than that, and we knew it. We heard it several times following us along the trail and crashing sounds in the brush from across the creek. Whatever was throwing the rocks was following us, making sure we knew that we were not welcome. I have no idea what type of animal could throw very large boulders in the water like that. If it was a human, they did a damn fine job of pranking us because we were terrified. We hurried as fast as we could, and I ended up slipping on the trail and got a splinter in my arm that I wasn't able to dig out for months. We made it back to the parking lot near dark. I've only found one other online post about strange things happening in this Sespe Creek. I still don't know what we heard. I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day we were snowed in, and when you're snowed in there, you're stuck. Now there are plenty of bears and deer up there, and we kept salt licks, corn, and all kinds of stuff around it, not to hunt, but just to feed them. While I walked by the back window, which is over the underground garage where we keep snowmobiles and four wheelers, and I see this big brownish looking thing in the woods, probably 50 feet from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. 
I was shaken because I'd never really seen a bear there, but heard the stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mum to show her, and as we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up. And I don't mean like a bear, I mean like a big, tall man standing up. In that turned around and walked with a huge stride, and took off into the woods. We stood there shocked. What the hell was that? And my uncle just says, Oh, that's just Sasquatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with a comic remark, but I never went into those woods alone again. My grandpa had a hunting buddy in the 70s who was basically a hermit in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was staying with him in his cabin, deep in the Cascade Mountains during a hunting trip. No running water, no electricity, miles away from the nearest town or paved road. His cabin was built on stilts and on an incline. They had a 10-foot balcony from the base of the bottom of the stilts with no stairs or ladder to climb up on. My grandpa claims that he knew this man for a long time and said that he didn't have the personality to lie. I've also known my grandpa never to be one for BS. One night during the trip, they were relaxing at the cabin after a hunt and his buddy tells him that Sasquatch is in the area and to be careful going out at night. Thinking he was pulling his leg, my grandpa chuckled and didn't think too much about it. His friend then put on a very serious face and grabbed a few pieces of fruit, bread and jerky and placed them in a bowl. He took the bowl out of the balcony and set it on the edge and said, it'll be empty by morning and then went to bed. It was an open floor single room cabin, about 300 square feet. My grandpa had a cot set up near the balcony window and was awoken in the middle of the night by rustling outside. He peeked through the windows and saw the bowl empty. And still to this day, claims he saw four fingers resting on the edge of his balcony just before letting go. He never went hunting in that area again. The woods by where my father grew up have old abandoned houses scattered throughout the woods. I am from the Hudson Valley, New York. Anyone from around the area should know that the woods have old houses or at least the foundations remaining. When he was younger, he and everyone else basically would climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up there to smoke and hang out so a lot of things were smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, blanking on proper term, just a flat rock surface you had to scale. This was also his usual way down. So one night he went up alone and was working his way down. Night was settling in and he was lowering himself down the drop when he felt an odd presence and glanced up towards where he was standing. Basically, what he saw was a quick glance because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. It wasn't a bear, at least from the glance he got. Normally, you'd take things your parents tell you and have some doubts, and her sharing some of his stories that he told me made it more believable. There was also the whole, you see what you want to see thing, so who knows? I'm terrified of heavily wooded areas, if I'm honest. A group of friends and I were staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no real roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three-quarter day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else due to work obligations, so decided to head up that same day but later. It would mean I would have to camp for a night by myself though, as the latter part of the trail is too dangerous to be taken at night, especially by someone who doesn't know it. I didn't care. I was kind of looking forward to it as I've never camped alone before, so I was in the middle of these woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in this small clearing, probably about 40 feet across, get my campfire going, and pitch myself a small one-person tent. 
do all that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs over a stick over the fire and s'mores. I'd probably stay up a good two to three hours after dark. It was mid-autumn, so the days were somewhat short. The entire time I thought I heard stuff moving in the woods at the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at the time, because the woods are of course full of animals. But as the night went on, I realized that whatever it was, was just circling the clearing over and over. Once I started paying attention, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stooped up, and I thought I heard sound going away through the woods. I just shrugged it off, thinking it was a fox or some curious critter that got scared when I stood up. I decided it was time to sleep, douse the fire, and climb into my tent. I start to doze off and stay in that half-asleep, half-awake state for a while. I normally hear weird stuff when I'm in this state, so I don't think much of it when I hear a voice. Something then wakes me up all the way, and I realize the voice is real. I'm right outside my tent. It's just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was another language, or if they were just speaking English in such a way that I couldn't understand it. I lay there for some time, I don't know how long, listening and waiting for something to happen. There was just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent, so I can see a ham pressed into the wall of my tent down near my foot. This freaks me out, and I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside the tent tore ass out of there, like running full sprint through the woods. I get out of the tent and shine my flashlight around to see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody hamperet on the tent, but nope. I didn't sleep that night. I packed up camp at first light and booked it to the cabin. About 16 years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandpa in the front seat and my mum and sister in the back. I was in the bed of the truck along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road and all of a sudden my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it's maybe a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall dark figure walking parallel to the road about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see Bigfoot, he laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look at it, the figure had changed direction and was walking away from the road. The last thing I saw were the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have any explanation for what I saw. And every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell everyone my story, just so that he can laugh at it. When I was about five or six years old, my mother, father, grandmother and I went to this restaurant out in a semi-remote location, which has since been turned into a factory area. But at the time, it was a log cabin type restaurant backed off the road in the woods. My father is a really big talker, and he'll pretty much have a conversation with anyone if they got him talking. He was closing up a conversation with this guy who he went to high school with and hadn't seen in a long time. My mother, grandmother and I went outside to head onto the vehicle. I was getting tired because it was late, so my grandma picked me up. She was holding me in a bear hug. Then I saw something, a very tall figure illuminated probably seven to eight feet tall, completely covered in blonde hair, sort of like Cousin from the Adams Family movie, but with more noticeable features. I just said to my granny, it's a monster. She turned around and saw it too, and we began running towards the car. About this time, my mum noticed it as well. It didn't come towards us, it just turned and stared. We were freaking out, and then my dad came out the building. He started running too because we were terrified, but didn't get a chance to see it, because once he came around, it took off into the woods or at least out of eyesight. 
I know Bigfoot seems like a hard pill to swallow, but I saw something that night. I know it was a child, but we all saw it. And my mum and I talked about it for the first time in years today because we drove by the place the restaurant used to be at. And she described it exactly how I remembered it. I was in third grade, staying in a small cabin with my family. My parents slept in one room with my younger brother in their bed and my older sister in a sleeping bag on the floor. I slept on a couch that pulled out to a bed with my best friend Colin, who they let bring with us. We stayed up very late playing Game Boy, and I had fallen asleep when it was his turn at around 3 a.m. He woke me up by nudging me, and as I woke up I asked him what he wanted. He shushed me, and pointed out the window above the couch where we were sleeping. Outside the window, we saw a swing set that was definitely taller than my dad. Towering over the swing set was this hairy, shadowy figure. It was very dark, and we were deep in the redwoods with no outside light other than the moon. The cabin we were staying in had a bit of a clearing, so it wasn't quite as dark as the forest. I was frozen in shock. I'd heard many stories of Bigfoot, but never thought it was real or that I would see one. The area was known for sightings and they sold many souvenirs related to it. After staring at the creature for 60 seconds, I could see its eyes were looking back at us. It then walked downhill into the trees with long strides. We both confirmed with each other that we weren't dreaming and it was positively amazing we were both excited at this point, not scared. We must have both been exhausted from hiking all day and staying up late because we went to bed shortly after. The next morning we told my parents. They of course didn't believe us and said it was a nice story. We joked about how we both saw Bigfoot for years to come. I live in a really small town in Hungary at the very end of town, just me and my neighbor next to a forest. We have been playing a lot in the forest and we saw strange things in there from a very young age. My friend Barland showed me about Bigfoot. I immediately opted to take a look for it in the forest. Keep in mind I was seven at the time and we went with a hatchet, knife, flashlights and food and swept through whichever area we could. Part is separated by a train track and also the ruins of a house. There was a bridge under the train track for the river passing under. And there, we found large patches of fur. My friend kept a sample from it. We also have a ranch as we keep horses and some fences were scratched, torn and broken in half, some even gone. And in the scratches, bits of fur. So we kept going back to try and find Bigfoot. We set up traps, bait, and even when camping, sometimes sleeping in the forest, having watches at night from my house. Here are some encounters. The first time was a patch of fur. The second was a human-like creature eating parsnips from the barn we had, which I saw at night while feeding the dogs. I told father and we came back with his gun, actually seeing the thing run away, even faster as I didn't know who or what it was. And this is the kind of person who will be slapped by an alien and not believe it. One time my friend's rabbits were cut open and freed from the cages, almost surgically precise, with half of their insides missing. Then during a late night sweep, I laid down to tie my shoe while my friend was looking around, when a six foot tall thing ran past me towards my friend who jumped and his flashlight threw a clear view of it. It was definitely nothing from this world six foot tall, light brown hair, and built like the Hulk. The thing ran over my friend, literally leaving him with a broken rib, and we never went back to the forest since. The town mayor, who I maintained a good relationship, called the police on dogs vanishing. He told me that animals would go missing or turn up dead. I wonder if I set up traps if I'll get anything. No one in the town suspects Bigfoot, 
nor is my friend's rabbit incident Bigfoot related. I'm just saying it's all suspect. There's definitely something strange out there. My husband and I live in Willow Creek, California. Our small town revolves around Bigfoot and everything here is Bigfoot themed. We even have a cage in case he's ever captured. Our property is 40 acres and surrounded by forest service land. We have no neighbors and we've always felt like we're watched. We barely hear any wildlife and have rarely seen any despite living in the woods. A couple of separate nights, we've had knocking on our bedroom wall slash window and it certainly freaked us out, but we've since brushed it off. Tonight though, my husband had to take our quad up to the generator above our house to fill our solar panels with water. It was pitch black and as soon as he turns around the quad and turns it off, he is loudly screamed at by what he was convinced and described to me as a large male humanoid. He did what he had to do and left quickly. He is convinced whatever it was, was not human, as it's extremely unlikely we have someone else living in the woods. I'm trying to chalk it up as an animal, but it's getting hard to. Do you think it sounds like Bigfoot behavior? We were camping along the Sunshine Coast in lower mainland British Columbia. It was the off season, so not too many campers in the area, and we were in some beautiful land, lush jungle-like forested area right beside the ocean. 5 a.m. in the morning, right before dusk, right behind our tent. We were camping by literally no other people. I hear this strange sound, like a woo-wee kind of sound, as loud as it could possibly be. I woke up real quick and asked my husband if he heard it too and he said he did. I asked him what he thought it would be, and he said, do you want me to be honest with you? I think it was a Sasquatch. I'm like, there's no way, there's no way, and started thinking about all the animals in the area and the different calls they would make, and I'm a pretty avid camper and live in the country, so I recognize plenty of different animal calls. Cougar, no, bear, no. Owl, nah, I didn't think so. I didn't go to sleep and kept the knife in my hand for an hour before the sun came up while I was on my phone googling what Sasquatches sound like. I know there's a ton of conspiracy about this, but we did find a recording of a supposed Sasquatch that sounds similar to what we heard. I can't find it now. We went to town later that day and told a local and he's like, yeah, lots of sightings around here. Natives even have a totem dedicated to them. My cousin and I were heading home from Montana, through the Black Hills. I had picked out a spot to camp at and planned on just setting up camp in the back of my truck and sleeping. So I could just set a pin for what looked like a dead end road to sleep at. We pull up onto the main road and get to the spot probably two miles back and we notice there is a logging operation going on. So I pull off the side in case they're gonna be working on a Saturday and I shine my light around the perimeter and we don't see anything. So we're sitting up our bed and my cousin hears this bang that sounds like someone is smacking a stick on an excavator beam. Whatever hard metal was out there, I suppose. And so he looks at me and says, did you hear that? And immediately after saying that, we hear a second bang and decide to get the hell out of there. So we pack our stuff up and drive by the area where we heard the noise. So I pull up and open my windows and shine my flashlight at the area which is a hill and see two sets of eyes. The space between the eyes were probably six to eight inches apart and they were both clearly looking at my vehicle. One was about six feet off the ground and the other was probably four foot taller. So I reverse because they're moving around and I yell out the window, hey, who's there? I don't get a response, but just drive the hell out of there ended up concluding it was probably standing on some sort of equipment, but I'm not sure what those eyes were. I'm gonna to speak to the local rangers and community tomorrow. I really need to know what happened in Hay Draw. When I was 14, a friend and I would go fishing just about every day of summer. We would walk about an hour 
to an hour and a half through the woods and over bogs to a series of rivers that we called the Steadies. They flowed into a very large lake. The last trip there, we were walking along one of the rivers. The rivers are narrow, maybe five feet across. At 14, very easy to jump across from side to side. We stumbled up on a large pile of animal bones and kind of got worried, but assumed perhaps a hunter had quartered their game in there. We walked to the edge of the bank and right in the center of the river, clear as day, was a large footprint, barefoot, distinguishable toes, but just one, the left. It was big, even more so magnified by the water. I called to my friends and looked. But as I said his name, I heard a loud rumble and the tree shaking on the other side. I looked at my friends, but all I saw was the dust he was kicking up from running away, to which I promptly followed. We never went back. We told people, but no one believed us. All of this takes place on Vancouver Island. My name is Cameron. I'm 17. And it was about two years ago now, at the beginning of June. My friends and I went up to the island to go camping. We camped out on a sandy beach with the woods behind us. The first night there, there wasn't much activity. It was just the sound of waves, which was pretty calming. But on the second night before we went to sleep, we were all around the campfire. When after a while we started to hear bats and got freaked out, so went into the tent and joined the others, and told scary stories. By the time I had started to get paranoid and tried to calm myself with music, and drifted off to sleep, at every two to three hours I would get up for absolutely no reason. It was probably between three to four in the morning when I woke up, took my headphones off, and heard someone or something walking around outside on the sand. It didn't sound like an animal walking on its four legs, but more like someone heavy walking on two feet. And after a while, I fell back asleep. It started to rain during the night, so I didn't get to investigate to see if there were any footprints. And thankfully, we already planned to leave that day, but it got me thinking. What if it was a Bigfoot? It couldn't have been someone else from another campsite since we were quite far away from anyone else and it couldn't have been anyone from our group since it was four in the morning and everyone was already sound asleep. Was Bigfoot the reason why I was so paranoid before going to sleep? Anyway, just think about that. For now, I've got another story. All of this has been happening for almost a year. I also want to point out that I live by a small town near the native reserve. My house I live on is on the reserve side and has bushes at the back of the house. So we would always hear of bear sightings and cougar sightings around here, but I've never heard any of those at the time this happened. I've lived here in the same house for almost my entire life and never had any experiences like these before. One night I was trying to sleep downstairs in the living room on the couch. The couch is right next to the window, and our backyard at the time didn't have a fence around the garden or yard, although we do have a wooden porch we made. I was trying to sleep on the couch when I heard something move in the bush and turned off my music to listen, and I hear it happen for a few seconds, and the next few minutes I hear what sounds like someone heavy walking on the wooden porch. After a while it stops. But a few seconds later, I hear two taps on the window, so I run upstairs. All of this happened around Christmas at one, going into two in the morning. Every few nights in summer, I would hear something move in the bush, like someone walking around big tree branches. I've never gone back there to take a look, but I've noticed an almost dead tree taken down somehow. It's never windy in the summer, so someone or something must have done that. Usually every morning my mum would open our back door to let our dog out in the back to use the washroom. At this time, we have a fence around the garden and a yard and have two gates. One to get into the backyard that we can open from the side of the house 
and one to get into the garden. So my mum lets our dog out, but the yard gate is open. My mum goes out to start the car for work, and my dog's there running around smiling. My mum's confused because we had the yard gate closed, and we didn't have anyone over the past night. No one else knew how to open this particular gate, but our very close friends and family. Another morning I was awake with my mum, and she opened the back door to let the dog out, but found the garden gate was open already, and no one should have been there. A few days passed by, and I go out for a ride with my mum to town for some groceries. On the way back, I tell her about the noise in the bush. She turned down the radio and started talking in a serious tone, and said that there had been stories from up in the island about Bigfoot, and that he's a part of our culture. We talk a bit, and she talks to me about the gates opening without any of us using it, and we both start to get suspicious and drive home. This happened another night after I came home from work. I usually go upstairs right away and chill on my bed. This time I heard something moving in the bushes again, but I pushed it off as nothing and went downstairs to open my can of fruit. As I went into the kitchen from the living room and looked outside, and for a split second I saw what I thought were two yellow eyes behind the fence shoulder height. I didn't realize until I got upstairs. The next morning I went down and looked out the window to see if anything was there and there was nothing out of the ordinary. We have solar powered light bulbs in the back but they don't really work all the time. They're blue and are dim and weren't bright as the eyes. There weren't any lights on the fence and I saw them much brighter. Nothing much has happened since but I do believe there's a Bigfoot that lives on this island. I lived in Southern Oregon at the time, on a 30 acre ranch. Our property backed up to a river and across from the river, the woods. I came home from work one night to an empty house. And as I'm walking to the back door from my truck, I hear rustling in the bushes. We normally get a lot of deer traffic through the property. So naturally I just come and yell, hey, it wasn't a deer though. Nothing ran away. Instead, I hear whatever it was come through the bushes, take two huge steps towards me, and takes breaths exhaling loudly and deeply, unlike anything I've ever encountered living out here. I froze up for a second, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up as I realized this thing was a lot bigger than I was. I ran inside, turned the spotlights on, but didn't see anything. I told people this story, and they always say, Oh, it was a bear or an elk. I'm familiar with bear and elk sounds. And the only bear we have out there are skittish black bears. What do you guys think it could have been? The two steps towards me sounded like a man stomping as hard as he could. And the breathing was deep and gruff, almost like a bull. My mum likes to tell me the story of how my great grandma could run faster than her. Apparently they were going fishing in the creek, about a mile or so behind my grandma's house, when they started smelling some rotten smell and hear splashing. They turned the corner and saw a large humanoid creature covered in dark hair splashing around and having a good time. They dropped the poles and grandma beat mum back to the house by a good hundred feet. They found several deer carcasses gutted around that time as well. Also, we live in Illinois, so probably not a bear. More likely, a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. My brother and I lived in a neighborhood in Idaho when we were kids. The school to my house is just a few blocks, so we always just walk because it's close by. One day, I had to stay after school because I needed help on some homework. I'm the eldest, and at the time my brother is afraid to walk home alone, even if it's just a few blocks. I get annoyed and tell him to just walk home by himself, that there's nothing to be afraid of and it's nearby. He goes and I do my homework, when after a few minutes he comes back out of breath with a shocked look on his face. I can tell he got spooked and just told him to wait for me in the classroom. 
On the walk back home, he tells me that he saw a black Sasquatch-like creature going in circles around him super fast when he was walking home. He then saw a brown Sasquatch hiding behind the shed near our house looking at him and also running super fast elsewhere. I won't lie, I did start getting spooked by stuff he was telling me. Me being the big brother told him that if something comes, I will hit it with our backpacks. We make it home and I start unlocking the door. I did it fast because I was kind of creeped out. My brother walks in. And as I'm about to walk in, I turn to see across the street a bright yellow Sasquatch-like creature looking at me. Then it turns around and runs away very fast. It was incredibly fast. I bolted and shut the door behind me, locking it. I'm totally freaked out and tell my brother that I saw one too. We call our mum and freaked out over the phone. She told us we'd just seen too many horror movies. I have no idea what those things were. The fact that I saw a yellow one makes it even crazier. And I need to know if anyone else has ever encountered anything like this. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed and clearly heard footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. I'm a believer in Bigfoot, so I look out the window and there was no sign of anything. No prints in the fresh snow either. I laid back down and it happened two more times. Each time I looked out the window, there was nothing. After that, we heard a wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a few times, but I didn't dare go outside to look to see what the hell it was. They sounded heavy. You can certainly say that Bigfoot is elusive. With such strength, so powerful and so dangerous, it's really quite curious how no one, or at least any government institution, has never seen, captured, or documented him officially. Maybe there's a reason for that. Who knows? Maybe they're trying to stalk him. Which leads us to our next topic. Stalkers. Maybe humans are the scariest thing after all. Let's find out how. Before I start the story, there are a few things you need to know. I am an artist, and I've always been very in my own world. Almost as if I were always thinking of a story, or character, or picture I wanted to draw. I'd walk into wars, forget anything, anywhere, and place items in the strangest of places while I was thinking. To give you an idea to the extent of this, my first place to look for anything I've lost is the fridge or freezer. I found remotes, my cell phone, art equipment, anything really inside there. Second. I've always had a very negative view when it comes to alcohol or any other narcotics. I don't mean to shame anyone if you're hearing this, but it was always something that I generally regarded as pointless. However, if you find enjoyment in it, all the better to you. Third, I'm an asexual person. I never desire it or have any interest in finding a mate, so flirting usually flies over my head. And finally, due to my childhood, I have a mild case of anxiety disorder which has lately been worse due to this event and escalated by others. So now that you have a good understanding about me, let's begin. This particular story begins when I graduated from an upper secondary school for visual arts. Upper secondary is the type of high school there is in Scandinavia. I had a decent enough grade, my best being biology and English, and art, of course. I immediately looked for work after graduation since I had graduated half a year late due to some health issues and the entrance exam for universities were already done. So by the time I graduated, I had around a year and a half before I even had the possibility of applying for uni. I also sent hundreds of applications to any place that would take me and hardly even got invited for an interview. This all took its toll on me. The constant rejection triggered depression and I'd hardly leave the house and I stopped taking care of myself altogether. I wouldn't shower, put on makeup, brush my teeth, anything. I'd avoid mirrors and felt as though I was a complete and utter failure, which was not made better by my parents who pressured me with, how many applications did you send today? Or, you really need to get this job so you can start saving to move out. This might sound mean, but they don't mean it in a bad way. 
since I'd expressed the need to get my own flat for the past few years. Not to mention my relationship with my parents at the time was very strained and my depression made me very irritable and angry. So I can't really blame them for pushing me to get out of the house. This continued for around half a year until I finally got a job in a supermarket about eight miles away from where I lived. Life really picked up from there. I started to take care of myself once again. The people I worked with were all very nice and I had no issues with anyone, though they were very normal. So I'd get invited to get togethers or have a pint after work. I always made an excuse why I couldn't go and would play MMOs or something instead at home. This might sound sad, but I enjoyed myself more like that. Fast forward a year of working and I was accepted into my number one choice of university. And due to this, I cut my work hours to half. I was only at work two to three nights a week. This particular supermarket chain I worked at had a yearly festival week gimmick to boost sales. And this year we were handing out scratch cards at the checkout. Apparently the chain had a contest with every location and the winning supermarket would be given an 1,000 euro cash prize for employee refreshment purposes, i.e. booze. Our supermarket decided we'd take everyone out for a night of drinking in a hotel slash resort area connected to the shopping mall for our workers with the money. No surprise there, and since I had grown to be close friends with many of the other employees, it was motivation for us to win. Even if I didn't enjoy going out, everyone in the department was so excited for it, it was kind of infectious. Long story short, we won, and we went drinking. Our boss was ecstatic with how well we did and how motivated we were. He even opened us a tab in the first bar we went to. So I had quite a bit to drink. When the first bar shut, we went with our own money to continue to a nearby nightclub. I hardly remember anything else other than I drank like a sailor and sang karaoke horribly. We stayed until closing time and I made my way to the train station to catch the last train home. On my way, I was stopped by a man with a thick accent, who asked if he could walk me home. I laughed and just said, no worries. I was literally a few steps away and motioned towards the station. He then apologized and said he thought I lived in the student buildings nearby and went on his way. I thought it was quite an endearing way to ask someone out and thought nothing more of it. Another year passed by and I was now living alone in a student block not far away from my parents' house. The area I moved to was very poor, since it consisted of only students, so in a weird way I actually felt very safe living there. The walls were as thin as paper, so everyone else could hear if anything happened to me, or if anyone tried to break into my home. Granted, I got an email from the company that funded the cheap student blocks that the bike seller in your address was broken into, but I never kept anything in there, so it didn't faze me. Sometimes I'd even forget the keys on the lock in the front door and would wake up in the morning to a neighbor ringing my doorbell and handing me the keys with a joking, nothing to steal, eh? There was also a very convenient bus that stopped right outside my door that I could take for both school and work, though I needed another bus to get all the way to work. One Saturday, after a nine hour shift at work, looking and feeling like a total zombie, I was making my way to the bus stop through an underpass late at night when I heard someone call out to me through my earphones. I always stopped if I heard someone call out to me when I was near work since it was usually a colleague offering a lift or a regular customer wanting to crack a joke or one of the guys from GameStop upstairs wanting to talk to me about Skyrim or something. I was basically friends with nearly every employee in the mall at this point so someone stopping me late at night in a sketchy parking lot or an underpass was relatively common. I didn't recognize the man, but then again, I handled around 600 customers every day, so I hardly ever did. I also was conditioned to flash a bright smile through years of customer service whenever I met anyone's eyes, even outside work. I'm sure the ones who've worked in customer service jobs for long enough can relate to this. The man spoke hurriedly in a thick accent, about how he was in love with me and how he had been watching me. It was very hard to make sense of anything he was saying. He spoke almost like it was a stream of consciousness. What I did make out was that he had seen me in a bar, which he named, and ever since he had been watching me and never before found the courage to talk to me before now. 
I was unsettled by the choice of words, but chuckled to him, not being a native speaker. I listened to him while I nervously eyed the underpass, feeling glad that there were a few people walking through it during this whole spiel. After he quieted down, I just awkwardly said, Okay, thanks, but I need to go or I'm going to miss my bus, and turned to continue on, when he grabbed me and pushed me towards the wall of the underpass. I was around 30 centimetres taller than him, but he had a lot of mass over me, since the most sport I had ever done was acrobatics and ballet, and I'd quit even that many years before. I considered punching him or screaming, but I felt it better not to escalate the situation, so I sternly told him to let me go and that I needed to get to the station. He pleaded for me to give him a chance and said that he wouldn't let me go before I did. I was racking my brain about the safest way out of this situation, so I tentatively told him, what if I save your number and I'll see if I call you? I had used this on another persistent suitor before and it had worked just fine. Now I wish I'd never said those words. The man's face lit up and he started to spell out his name. He was from somewhere in the Middle East. While I pulled out my phone and hammered his name and number into my phone, sighing in relief, I was almost back at my house. He suddenly grabbed my hand and tore my phone from it. At this point, I angrily screamed, What are you doing? Give it back! But to my horror, everyone had moved from the underpass and I was alone with the creeper. He ignored me struggling and screaming completely, and calmly just called his own phone number from it, before handing it back to me, as if what he just did was completely normal. I stared at him, terrified and dumbfounded. Then he hugged me tight, cupping a feel and tried to kiss me. I hurriedly blocked his mouth with my hand and forcibly pushed him away. I didn't see anything anymore. I just ran out of the underpass and he didn't try to stop me. When I was safely at home, I blocked his number first, then deleted it, thinking any deity possible that when I moved out and got a new phone, my father had insisted on an unlisted one, so he couldn't find my address out by Google. I asked my manager to not give me the Saturday night shift for a while and explained the issue I had with her. I also asked her if he could be banned from the store or something, but she told me that she couldn't do anything before I filed a restraining order. Obviously, I had no idea what the man's name or number was anymore. Not to mention, getting a restraining order on him based on what I had as evidence was very unlikely. A few weeks went by, and he showed up when I was at work without fail, as if he knew my shift, even though I had a different shift every week. He would just stare at me from outside the shop, or buy a single lollipop or something else, something cheap, multiple times a day, paying with cash, so that I had to extend my hand out to him, which he always took, and held for as long as possible if there was no other customers there. The horrible thing about this was that it was not unusual to get a creepy customer every so often. Every now and then, you'd get them if you worked as a cashier. Mentally ill or just socially inept, desperate people mistake customer service as genuine interest painfully often, and you hardly paid any more attention to it than the other customers since nearly always it's a short-term kind of thing and harmless. The man could have been stalking me for God knows how long, and I don't think I would have noticed. The thought that I only noticed this now, now that I'd had the earlier encounter with him, was enough for me to lose sleep over, and getting recurring sleep paralysis nightmares of someone entering my room and breathing heavily in my ear as a result. This went on, and it was now a few days until I had eight weeks off work for summer vacation which I had requested, half paid, half unpaid. The thought of not having to go to work and face the man every day was enough to cheer me up, so I threw myself into an extracurricular school project, a game for a museum exhibit. One day I had stayed at school working on a 2D rig for said project until school was closing and the janitor ushered me out of the classroom. I had a little while before my bus was due to arrive at the stop, so I decided to catch some fresh air after working nearly 12 hours on the computer and walked to the nearby station that was at the end of the line. The bus was already waiting, so I rushed in and after I paid the fee, I faced the back of the bus and my stomach turned. There he was, with three friends, the guy in a thick accent. My stalker. We were the only passengers. I contemplated exiting the bus, 
but the next one wouldn't be for at least an hour. So against all common sense, I decided to stay on. I sat at the very front of the bus, hoping he wouldn't notice me. But as soon as the bus left the station, he moved to sit next to me, and his friends moved to sit beside me, as if he knew this was the line I usually took, and just waited so that I couldn't exit the bus. I was ready to throw up, so I turned the music in my ears so loud it hurt. I ignored every tap and shoulder grab. I clenched my laptop back on my lap, ready to sacrifice my computer and smack him in the face with it if he tried to do anything else. Then the realization hit me. This line stopped literally on the front door of my building. My name was plastered on the front door of it. He would know where I lived. I felt as though I could burst into a howling cry at any minute. My thoughts were going a mile a minute, considering everything that could happen to me if I didn't have a way to get out of this situation. I knew there was a longer stop coming up later, so I decided to try and make my break there. When the stop rolled around, music still breaking my eardrums, heart pounding, I said, sorry, I need to get off, and made my way to the mid doors. All four men followed me, speaking fast in what I assume is Hebrew. When the door opened, I stepped out and walked for a while, before suddenly turning back and running like I was possessed, back into the bus and yelling at the driver, Please drive, just drive! The driver looked taken aback, looked at the men who were running towards the bus and back at my face, twisted into loud sobs and how I was shaking and decided I was serious. He closed the doors and sped off. He stopped the bus at a garage a few miles away and asked if he could do anything, like call the cops. I just kept crying and retold my first encounter to him. When something in my head clicked, the bar, he had specifically named it. It was the nightclub we went to to continue our drinks over a year ago when we won that contest. I had never been after I had visited that time. He said he saw me there. He had been tailing me for over a year. That night, he was the one who offered to walk me home. That's why he showed up at my work without fail whenever I was working. I sobbed, howled like a damned, tortured cat, and the driver told me to go lie down in the back and that he'd drive me home. I told him it was the last stop. The driver dropped me off safely home before he continued his round, risking his job for my safety. I couldn't thank him enough. I didn't even know his name. After the second incident, I called in work sick until my vacation and cut my hair and dyed it black. I also spent the vacation biking around my hometown during the day, not venturing to the town my work and school were at for the whole two months. I occasionally still sometimes have those sleep paralysis nightmares, but very fortunately, I never saw him again. A small part of me thinks it's because he doesn't want me to. One thing's for sure though, I never left my keys in my lock again. So to the creepy man with a thick accent, I implore you, never come looking for me again. My story takes place in Florida. I was around 12 to 13 years of age. At the time, I was struggling with some family issues and school bullies. So I was in and out of school, and my mother and I were discussing putting me in homeschool. My aunt suggested a way to help me make friends and keep me in school. Girl Scouts. You read that right. Send me to the group of little girls that sells cookies and makes the whole United States fat and their mouths water at the thought of them. So I agreed because I was desperate for friends. When I say that, I mean I talked to stuffed toys and made up voices for them so that I didn't feel alone. Sad, I know. But this was the truth. It is also very important because I want you all to know where my head was. I ended up going to my first troop meeting. A week after the choice had been made, I was super excited. Sadly, it wasn't what I thought it would be. The girls there, although nice, were a bit hard for me to get close to. It was a small troop of about five to eight girls, and they certainly ran in different social circles than me. Their parents were also way more gun-ho about this whole scout thing than my mother expected. They wanted this to be a stepping stone to their daughter's huge careers in college and classes. Anyway, after being part of the troop for two to four months, it didn't go well. 
The girls shunned me and I grew even more lonely. I even decided to approach a girl asking her why she didn't like me. She had no problem telling me, so my mum withdrew me. Another two to three months later, another troop showed up in our area and my mother decided we'd give it another go. After all, not all girl troops are like that. People are different and she was certain someone would want to be friends with me. She was really right. I did end up making friends. Not the entire troop was in love with me, but the troop leader's daughter and I had become the best of friends. Of course, my mother was thrilled. I finally had a friend and was starting to smile again. It hurts parents quite a bit to see their kids upset. Her and I did everything together. We didn't go to the same school, but it didn't matter because we'd have sleepovers every weekend. I'd go over to her house every other day after school and do homework. She had parties, lots of them. Any time her mother thought her daughter had something to celebrate, she'd throw a big party for her, and being her daughter's best friend, I was always seated next to her. It was one of the happiest times of my life. I felt important to someone other than my family. I had a place to go outside my home, where trouble always seemed to lurk. A year turned into the second. We finished Christmas. She actually came to my birthday party and got me a gift and everything. Then things started to get weird. Because I was a year older than her, I had a bit more homework, being that I was also a grade level ahead of her. She had apparently convinced her mother to change her schools. So now she was attending mine. This was great, I was once again over the moon. The only sad thing was that we didn't have the same classes or the same lunch period. Well, that soon changed too. She showed up once for my lunch and I thought it was weird. Apparently her mother had pulled some strings and got her to lunch at my time. I didn't know the details. I just knew my best friend and I could eat together. I remember telling my mum and she didn't let on that anything was the matter. But later when we talked about this after I'd grown up a little, she admitted the news concerned her. Then though, she just acted like it was the best news and I was happy. I started to go fishing with her and her uncle during the summer. Spent weeks over at her house with her mother and uncle. I'll admit the uncle was a bit different. I mean, he didn't set off any alarm bells, but he wasn't your usual uncle. As far as our Girl Scouts troop went, we became the leaders. We pushed our troop into camping trips and selling cookies more and more. It was great. I'd never been so highly regarded. The girls in the troop even began treating me like one of them. I was so happy to fit in. That ended up changing quite a lot, actually. Towards the end of the summer, I discovered her uncle wasn't really her uncle, more of a guy trying very hard to make her happy so that he could bang her mum. He eventually stopped coming round and her mother, I noticed, drank a lot. More than I'd seen any adult drink at the time. The end of summer meant our trip was coming to an end, the last camping trip we would get before classes started up again. I was excited to go. My mum and I bought everything we thought I would need, and my best friend and I jumped right into the van. I waved goodbye to my mum, and away my troop went. Now, it's important to admit here that I had a love of horror stories. I've always loved spooky stuff in the occult, so the idea of a camping trip meant campfires and scary night stories. I was excited. Once we got to the campgrounds, I realised it wasn't going to be like camping with my family. It was a huge gathering of other troops all over. Older scouts, younger scouts, and us. Of course, the older scouts told us there were some creepy gnomes or troll-like creatures near the lake, but none of us believed them. It was a fun weekend, just not the same kind of fun I expected. I never got to tell my stories, and it was more about building teamwork and girl scouting stuff than I thought it would be. I know, I know, what did I expect, right? You live and learn. Anyway, the last night I decided I would tell a ghost story. In fact, I insisted on it. So after the troop leader went to bed, my friend and I gathered all the troop in one tent, as we'd been separated into two, and the stories began. We each told a story, or a funny embarrassing one, and then I was the last one to tell a tale. I told my story, scared the other girls, and we hurried back into our respective tents before daybreak. Then we all packed up and got our rides home. Everything was fine until the next meetup for my troop, a week later. My mother and I showed up, and there were the adults looking very angry. Mothers, fathers, all of them. My friend's mother stepped up to my mum and pulled us aside. This is what I remember from that conversation. Listen, your daughter isn't welcome in the troop anymore. What? 
Why? What happened? Well, it seems that she told a story at camp, and it gave some of the other girls nightmares. The other adults requested she no longer come to troop meetings. Are you serious? It was just a story. You can't cheat. She didn't know she loves this group. This is where our friends are. Why didn't you tell me this early in the week when I was dropping her off at your house? The troop leader shrugged and sighed. At this point, I took off running away from my mother and friend's mother. I wanted to talk to my friend, to the other girls of the troop. I was going to apologize to them and their parents. I found my friend. She didn't seem heartbroken in any way. In fact, she was okay with it. My friend went on to say, "I never liked sharing them with you anyway. They were all stuck up and snobby. They just didn't get you. I get you." We're like sisters, so now you and I can be together more. What? But I liked the other girls and being in the troop. And what about when the troop meetings happen? So you're asking me to quit the troop? I'll do that. I'll make my mum quit too. No more troop. No, that that's not what I'm saying. Listen, we're best friends. Best friends forever. Remember, BFFs. Anyone who doesn't like you isn't a good person, and I don't like that. It was the sweetest and nicest thing I'd ever heard from anyone. She was so into being my friend, best friend, that she'd give up this entire group. I broke down in tears. I was happy. I was sad. It was a lot to take in. Sure enough, the troop would be disbanded after this. It would be a month, but eventually, it no longer carried on. Her and I remained friends, though, and I continued hanging out with her at her house. Another uncle came into the picture. That Christmas, I spent at her house. Christmas night, her mother and the uncle let us, a couple of thirteen to fourteen-year-old girls, take a full flute of champagne. I wasn't fond of it, but we felt so adult. The uncle kept making some rather inappropriate comments about my friend and I. Her mother became annoyed. They fought. He left. The next morning was hazy at best, but I remember finding my best friend in my sleeping bag with me. It didn't weird me out. We did that sometimes. Crashed in each other's beds. The next week, she called me any time I wasn't with her. Our friendship became much more creepy. The calls were every hour when I wasn't with her. She said a lot of "I love yous" and "You are mine, my best friend, mine." I didn't think anything of it. Our sleepovers got weirder. I was waking up and always having my friend in my sleeping bag. If she wasn't there, she'd beg me the night before to lay with her in her bed. I just thought, you know, her home life was as rough as mine, and that's what drew us together, right? Then, one day, she admitted she liked me, in a way that I like you, like you. I was speechless, and because I felt I was way too young for a relationship or anything, that thought came with it. I bowed out. I told her I cared for her as a friend, and we could still be friends, but that I wasn't ready for that to change. She said she understood, and went a week without calling me. I thought I'd hurt her. I even thought about calling her to say I loved her too, if that's what it would take for us to be friends again. I didn't though. I was scared to. At the end of the week, I got a call from her, and she's acting like nothing happened. We started hanging out again, though she kept bringing up that she felt something for me. It got to the point where she was even attempting to try physically help me love her. Yeah, I ended up noping it out of that friendship. One day, I just had enough and told her we couldn't be friends anymore. She seemed to handle it okay. I mean, she cried a bit. I cried a bit. I felt so heartbroken. I was in eighth grade and honestly didn't like where we were at. And since I'd be going to a new school, I thought a clean slate would help. Some things happened to my household, family-wise, and I ended up being homeschooled instead. Weeks after school started, and I hadn't heard anything from her, I got a note in the mailbox. There were notes every day in my mailbox now: love letters, angry letters, sad letters, all from my ex-best friend. Then her mother began leaving letters, not for my mum, but for me. Both of them would leave letters in the box. The ex-friend always had them varied, but the mothers were pretty clear. I'd heard her daughter, and she wasn't happy. That's when the phone call started. As cliche as it sounds, the phone would be answered, and all we'd hear is breathing. Then they'd hang up. This persisted for six months. After three months, their letters stopped, and it was just the phone calls. We had so much going on family-wise that this harassment was tame, so we never dealt with it. And after six months, it all stopped. 
We didn't hear from the girl nor her mother again. They still live in the same city. My mum still saw her mum around town and stuff, but they never spoke. Fast forward two to three years and I ran into my ex-best friend again. We were at the library and I was polite and she was polite. It was pretty chill and it sounded like her life was good. After that meeting though, the call started again and they carried on for about a month then stopped. I never heard from the girl again. I've since moved away and everything. The only reason this memory came up is because I was on the phone with my mother the other day. She said she saw the girl. She said she looked pretty rough. I felt bad for her, but not at the same time. It's only when I got older that I realized how serious and sinister things got with that, well, toxic friendship. So to my ex best friend and her stalker mother, let's not meet again. I was in California visiting my brother who went to Pepperdine. So me and my family are out shopping on this really big street full of amazing stores. The first night we were on the same street for dinner. And in fact, we spent a lot of time on that little strip. There was a homeless man sitting on the side outside the restaurant. And as we were walking out, my dad gave me a $5 bill to give to the homeless man. He had white hair and a long beard. He reminded me of Gandalf. I handed him the $5 and he said thank you and nodded and I smiled and skipped off back to my parents. Well, then I started noticing this dude everywhere, seriously everywhere, walking around the hotel parking lot and chilling out on the sidewalk like multiple times throughout the week long trip. On our last day in Cali, we went back in the same area where I originally encountered the man. We were on our way back to the car, but we decided to go into the souvenir store really quick. My parents walked out with me, being the third child, this is normal, as I'm not sure if my parents are even aware I exist sometimes. My life is literally the dark sequel to Home Alone. Once I realize my family are not in the store, I walk out the door trying to catch up when Gandalf the homeless man grabs me by the shoulder and literally turns my whole body to face him. He looks me straight in the eyes and tells me how beautiful I am, passes me a piece of folded up paper, hugs me so tight, this was weird by the way, and kissed me on the neck. Obviously I knew this was whack, and once I was fully aware of the danger, I untangled myself from him and booked it down the sidewalk to catch up with my parents. As I was struggling to get away from the man, he keeps repeating, don't show your mum, don't show your mum, over and over. Like, dude, come on, I'm obviously gonna tell her. Anyway, I run up to my parents and I'm like traumatized and they don't even notice. I open up the letter he gave me and it says, I have been watching you. It's been such a pleasure being in your company for the last week. I find your smell and look so appealing, and you're the most captivating person I've ever come across. This was only a tiny fraction of the letter. There was much more to it front and back. Unfortunately, I never got to read the whole thing because my parents finally noticed I have this weird, dirty, and crinkled up piece of paper, and the look on my face was priceless. My dad grabs it out of my hand and reads it, but not aloud. He gets about halfway down the paper, then screams, that's disgusting, crinkles it up, and throws it aggressively in the trash. I wish I knew what it said, but it's probably best I didn't for my sake. There were so many questions like, how did this guy know my hotel? Was it because of the parking lot? I saw him once out the window wandering around the hotel, which was a good mile away from where I first saw him. How did the dude show up so many times in my week long trip? Obviously he was stalking us on purpose. Did he know it was my last night? And that's why he felt the need to give me a letter? Is he even homeless or just a creepy stalker that likes to prowl the streets for a new child? Who knows? I guess I never will. But I hope I never see him again. I want to start this off by saying that I haven't shared this story with anyone, mainly due to fear. Because the guy in question is the son of one of my dad's friends. And I just know for a fact that my father will inevitably end up blaming all of this on me. I am currently a senior in high school and live in a pretty nice town in Northern Carolina. It all started a year ago when I was 16. At the time I was working at Starbucks as a barista. It was Thursday and surprisingly the cafe was almost empty. 
A few minutes before the end of my shift, one of my colleagues informed me that a cute guy is here to see you. I was somewhat confused. I didn't have a boyfriend at the time and I'm pretty average, so I couldn't imagine that a guy would be interested in me. As I turned around, I recognized the boy instantly. It was Skip, my dad's best friend's son. He's three years older than me, and for a reason that I wasn't aware of, he enjoyed making me feel miserable, calling me fat and ugly, and all other sweet things that you really want to hear as an already insecure teenager. So for obvious reasons, seeing him at my workplace did not fill me with joy. Now, on a completely objective point of view, he was a very good looking boy, blonde hair, blue eyes, but he knew that he was attractive, which made me want to punch his smirk off his handsome face. Skips was there to apologize for being a complete douchebag and confessed that he actually really liked me, but didn't know how to act around me because I radiated such a powerful energy, almost like it was destabilizing. Weird timing, but okay. Being the dumb girl that I was, I accepted his apologies, and from that moment on we kept in touch every day. He would send me a good morning and a good night text, give me cute nicknames and whatever couples do. However, he never asked me to be his girlfriend, but would introduce himself to others as my one and true love. I should have seen the red flags from the start. He would show up at my place without asking me at least once a week. I live alone with my dad, who's actually really like the boy, so my old man didn't really care about his constant presence at home. After a few months into our relationship, I decided to call it off. He was being really possessive. He was jealous of my girlfriends, and I discovered that he was in contact with his previous girlfriend and kept on telling me not to worry about it. Yeah, did that ever work for anyone? Didn't think so. His reaction wasn't what I expected. He shrugged and was like, okay, whatever you want, bae. Don't get me wrong, I didn't want him to hurt because of me, but he seemed no nonchalant about this. It was almost worrying. I thought this story would end there, but oh boy was I wrong. Even after the breakup, he kept on coming over and taking naps on my bed while I wasn't home. When I confronted him about it, he would respond with, I came to see your dad, or we're still friends. I don't see what's bothering you. Well, honey, what's bothering me is that if you weren't wearing an expensive ass cologne with a strong ass smell, I wouldn't have known you came to my room to begin with. I tried to tell my dad that Skips and I were no longer together and that he had no right to come over and make himself at home in my own room. He laughed and said I was being a drama queen, so I guess you understand why I'm kind of stuck at this point. What I didn't know was that Skips was basically following me everywhere. I noticed it a few weeks ago, but I'm pretty sure that it had been going on for quite some time now. He would follow my car as I was going to school, park his truck in the Starbucks parking lot whenever I was working, and would peek through the bedroom window and leave handprints that I only saw after some time. How did this dumb chick not notice it before? Well, as any horror movie fan and true crime podcast enthusiast, it's not unusual to feel observed or spied on, at least I think. Plus his truck was pretty common, so I couldn't tell if it was him or not, until a few weeks ago my car had a problem with one of the tires so I had to take the bus for a little while. One morning as I got to my house, I saw his truck and immediately made out his face as he was sitting in the driver's seat. That's when I connected the dots. My gut feeling was going into frenzy whenever I was out. Three of my tires being slashed, the handprints on my bedroom window. When the realization hit me, a shiver ran down my spine. I felt paralyzed and a tear welled up in my eyes. I felt nauseous and decided that I needed to talk to someone about it, because I have read enough stories about it, and trust me, when I tell you that crazy ex-boyfriend plus helpless girl never go well together. I made my mind up and told my friend Tyler, who's five years older than me and is studying law. After I shared the whole story, he told me that unfortunately there wasn't anything I could do, because I didn't have any concrete evidence, and it would be my word against Skip's and he's a damn good manipulator. Now I'm stuck because I don't know what to do. I tried to take pictures of his car, but due to the lack of light in my neighborhood, I never managed to snap one in which he would be recognizable. Whenever he's parked in front of the house and we make eye contact, 
he usually just starts the truck and drives off. I haven't seen him in three days, but my gut feeling is still making me go crazy. Who knows when Skips will show up again. This super happy fun experience took place five years ago, after a whole other incident with a neighbor stalking me. But this isn't about that. I had just started working a new job after Christmas. The company I worked for took over an account of a building closer to my home, so I transferred to the newly acquired location. After my first week there, some of the people began to ask me about my relationship status and began to take an interest in me. This little ray of sunshine happened to be single back then, but I was not ready to mingle. I was focused on work, my family, and school. I was only there for about three months and didn't end up liking the new location, so I left for a better suited job. Imagine my shock when some of the workers wished me an early happy birthday and luck at my new job. In a completely clownish move, the manager had disclosed where I would be working which I thought was a bit crappy. As I'm leaving, I'd seen something that I'd never noticed before. A phone list of employees with first and last names printed in the break room. Of the many what the actual hell moments to come, that was the first. I let the manager know he needed to remove me from it as I no longer worked there, and two would not be okay with it, even if I were to continue as an employee. He shrugged it off with the attitude of someone who assumes an upset woman is having her time in the month, rolled his eyes, and begrudgingly removed the piece of paper. I was thrilled to start my new job when the call started. Looking back, there had been maybe three months prior to what I believed was the beginning of this, but they weren't as persistent, so I didn't link them together. I just want to say that I have a tendency to bleach every red flag white, Please trust your instincts and scary movie. Run away when red flags are presented. So, I began to receive phone calls from a block number every week, only Fridays to Sundays, up with holidays, and always between 1 to 4 a.m. I have a weird thing about having my phone near me, and often at night, ever since my sister's accident. When she had said accident, and they tried to call me about her, my phone was often in the other room. For everyone who wants to ask why I didn't just shut it off or put it away, this is why. I am an insomniac and a night sleeper, so the calls always woke me up. I tried answering them without saying more than hello, but always just heard breathing. This had gone on for three weeks when my birthday came. I worked my new job, then the rebel that I am went and got a red box to take and have pizza and movie night with my parents to celebrate. So I'm scrolling through the ridiculously dull selection of red box tiles on my phone ring. When one of the girls from my new job tells me that a guy who identified himself as my boyfriend had come and dropped off pizza, flowers and a card for my birthday. Confused, I said I didn't have a boyfriend and she nervously laughs and said that she found it very strange my boyfriend wouldn't know it was my day off work and that he would need to leave the stuff there rather than give it to me in person. I thanked her, got my movie, and didn't give it too much thought. It was my birthday, so that was a problem for me tomorrow. The next day I opened the card at work, and it's tickets, photocopied. Not the actual ones I could have used to a place four hours away. In the card there was a lengthy poem and details on the trip, complete with dates, hotel name, and the person planned to take us on. Creep factor raised. I had no idea who this was from, and when I asked the co-worker, they could only give me a generic description. The weekend comes, and like clockwork, the calls come in. I decide not to answer and just decline the call. Life goes on. My mystery night and potential restraining order never came back to my work, and the calls continued. These calls went on for three years. I'll save you the unnecessary details, but I've changed jobs and moved in those years. The calls did not stop until the winter of last year. I tried answering and asking who it was. I tried screaming and cussing them out. I had even tried having my friend answer. I tried having males answer and threaten. Basically, I tried more than Sam I Am tried to get you to eat green eggs and ham. A few times they would have a song queued up to play when I answered. The more it went on, 
the more emboldened they got. Then they started heavy breathing and then whispering my name. At one point, they ended up graphically describing what they dreamed of doing to me. I called the cops who said without an actual threat, they couldn't do anything. Dreams don't count as threats is what I was told. I called the phone company to see if they could tell me the number of the caller, who told me they couldn't disclose that and to call the cops. I ended the phone call with a cheery, when you see someone wearing my skin as a suit on the news, remember this, have a great day. I am now debating on changing my phone number. There are personal legit reasons why I didn't do this before, but also seriously concerned with who the hell this is. For someone to be committed to calling you every weekend for the rest of that long is extremely frightening. One morning after another two unknown missed calls, I wake up from a text for an unknown number and I'm greeted with an unsolicited dick pic. Fun fact, no one wants an unsolicited dick pic. I responded stating if whoever it was ever contacted me again, their photo and phone number would be placed on Craigslist men seeking so that they could get their own share of dick pics. I reverse searched the number and lo and behold, I got a name of someone who I briefly worked with at the beginning of this story. And then it all started to click that the call started once I began that job. This guy would have known where my new job was and about my birthday since the co-workers I had working there wished me an early happy birthday on my last day. Sending him that pic solidified that he was the caller. That's all folks, anticlimactic ending, never saw or heard from him again, thankfully. So to the weird obsessive guy, I guess we probably won't meet ever again. Now that we've had our fill of disturbing people, why don't we head out to a remote cabin just to be out of the hair of all the creepy people. I'm sure we'll be fine and safe here. About a year ago, I got an Alaskan Malamute puppy. I was so excited to have a dog. I wanted to go hiking with him, camping, travel. It was fall in Iowa, so it can get pretty cold for camping. So I decided to start researching cabin rentals. I had found an amazing cabin in Wisconsin on Airbnb. It was fully loaded, very secluded in the middle of the woods, which included a hot tub, internet, pool table and a great kitchen. The cabin was so beautiful and it was pretty cheap to rent. The first time I had visited this cabin, I had a great time. It was just me and my dog. I relaxed, we went hiking, I cooked a great dinner and I slept pretty well. I only stayed one night just to get a quick getaway from my day off work. And after getting home, I told my friend Martha about this great cabin and she was eager to want to make a trip up there with me. We decided to go up there the night before Halloween. We took off just Martha, my dog and myself. And that night we had a blast. We drank, cooked dinner, chilled in the hot tub and then decided to watch scary movies since it was so close to Halloween. I was pretty drunk by then and was standing in the kitchen when I could have sworn I saw Martha running down the basement stairs, which were right off from the kitchen where I was standing. Then I looked over into the living room and Martha was sitting on the couch watching the movie. I was so freaked out, but again I was drunk, so I kind of blew it off. We both ended up passing out late and nothing else exciting happened. What happened the next morning is what has made me a solid believer in the paranormal. I was always a sort of skeptic when it came to ghosts. I had some experiences that were weird, but I could somehow justify it as something else. So I always had doubt in the back of my mind. But that morning we were pretty hungover. We ate a little breakfast, then decided to go sit in the hot tub. So I decided to lock my dog in his crate and we went outside to get in the hot tub. It was so magical because it was literally Halloween and it was dumping down snow. We sat in the hot tub for perhaps 15 minutes and I could have sworn I heard a bang inside the cabin and my dog was barking at something. We got out and ran inside to the kitchen since it was so cold and then we literally froze in our footsteps. The entire kitchen was torn apart. All the cabinets were open. The refrigerator door at the top freezer doors were open. The bar chair was all flipped onto their backs. Drawers were open, pans were thrown off shelves. Martha's phone was charging on the counter and it was unplugged and on the floor. I have no other explanation than paranormal. My dog looked terrified. 
But there's no way he could have done that. He's still a puppy. So he wasn't even that big. And besides, he was still locked in his crate. Before we went outside, the kitchen was a little messy from our night before, but nothing like what we walked into. The kitchen was trashed. I know Martha didn't do it because we both went outside at the same time and there was also no way someone broke into the cabin to do it. We were in the middle of nowhere and it was snowing. So we would have heard footsteps and the hot tub sat right next to the long driveway leading to the cabin. And we would have seen someone drive up there for sure. I just have no other explanation as to how that stuff happened. So now I'm a believer and so is Martha. I'm sure my dog saw some crazy stuff. We left pretty soon after this happened and believe it or not, I actually stayed at this cabin again multiple times and nothing happened since. Maybe Halloween stirred up the spirits and they just wanted to be seen or heard in some way. Maybe I really did see a ghost the night before, but who knows what crazy things might have happened in the cabin. It is very old and actually bookable this summer. It's literally booked out all the way until the end of September. It must be pretty popular. I noticed it's available on Halloween again. Maybe I should go back. I lived in Pennsylvania until I was one month shy of being 12. I know that exact date because you had to be 12 to hunt in Pennsylvania and I was looking forward to it. We moved to Florida and I get to hunt down here too, so that's okay. I had a few good friends that live right down the street from me. We lived right out in the country. My address was literally 1692 over two Stanley Road, middle of nowhere. So we'd hang out at my buddy's place or we'd go up this hill for about half a mile until we reached the burn pile and cabin at the top. It was a really basic cabin, outhouse, no lights, nothing. We'd hang out there and use it as a fort for nerf battles, manhunt, CTF, whatever. Well, one night my friend invited a few of his friends slash cousins up to the cabin so we could roast marshmallows and play manhunt. It was something like 13 of us to start, but the number slowly went down to 10 by nightfall. So we played manhunt 5v5 in the dark. Around 11 p.m., we were in the middle of a game and two of my friends had hung back with me because we were the fast ones. We realized that there were only three of us left on our team and that we hadn't captured anyone from theirs. We tried to make a jailbreak and lost my friend, Francis. It was just myself and Lewis. Lewis and I were a hundred yards from the other team and they had three out of our five players now in their jail. They began to press our sides more to mess with us until one of them told us that we were cheating. Lewis and I looked at each other, unable to figure out why. Our side had about a quarter of it covered heavily in trees. The other side was about the same with both wooded areas near the back of the sides. At one point when we were chasing someone off our side, I saw Lewis and I run in the same direction and someone on the other side of Lewis. I quickly cut behind Lewis and intended to surprise the other person and nab them on our side as I was probably the fastest person there and didn't want to be on the team to capture no one. Once I emerged from behind Lewis's trajectory, we were both running and I saw absolutely no one, nothing, no trees, no scarecrows, absolutely nothing that I could have mistaken for a person. I surmised that there had to have been someone from the other team hiding behind our lines, waiting for us to cross over and then tag us there. Well, the game ended up dwindling down to just us two left and the other side with four. We capped one person and then all parties were exhausted. I asked the other team, mostly Lewis's cousin, who was behind the line waiting to cap us but no one claimed responsibility. And I figured it was someone trying to mess with us. Back at the cabin, we started cooking hot dogs and marshmallows over a fire. 
we were about 10 to 13-ish, with one person being maybe 15, that being the older cousin. So we're all drinking soda and not beer. Note, if this had been beer and I'd have been older, I'd have just chalked this part up to booze. All 10 of us are around the fire, when we saw someone coming up the hill. It's hard to see outside in the dark when you've been staring at a fire for a while, but at least four of us had seen this person, so we figured it was one of the people who left coming back or someone new. After about a half hour, no one came up. We went and looked, but found no one. Being the intelligent young kids we were, we decided to investigate further. It's summer, after midnight, and we're all out playing with fire and flashlights, looking for a mystery person. Yeah, we're not honor students. We went to the path that led down the hill and could clearly see my friend's house in the distance. They left the outside light on for the dogs you see, but there was no one in between. Someone was trying to mess with the group. So they ran into the woods and came out directly on top of us, scaring the crap out of everyone. After we all changed our pants and regrouped, we headed back to the cabin only to see someone on the very far side of the clearing. There were three of us with flashlights and all of us attempted to illuminate the person, but we were too far away to get a good look. And as soon as we lit them up, she or he vanished into the woods. Okay then, now a few of us are freaking out. Six people decide to go down to my friend's house to spend the rest of the night where the axe murderer from hell won't be able to get them. Since they have six and the four of us who decided to rough it are only four, the larger group got the flashlights. I was the only one left with one. We decided to figure out who this was. Lewis had an uncle who was only 10 years older than him and we figured that it was just him messing with us. We knew his place was less than a mile from where we were, as there was a big extended family that owned much of this land. Lewis, Francis, and one of Lewis's cousins called Charlie and myself began to walk across the clearing. Once we were about 40 feet from the edge of the woods, we could hear someone moving around in the bush, not stomping or anything, but very carefully moving through the fallen sticks and underbrush, trying to make as little noise as possible. We figured it was Lewis's uncle, Uncle Josh. So we split up again and two people waited in the clearing, Francis and Lewis's cousin, and myself and Lewis went into the woods to try and flush out Uncle Josh. We figured Francis and Charlie could see okay into the clearing, and to be honest, they actually could. Lewis and I eventually were about 50 feet into the woods, further than we thought we needed to go when we heard this low rumble noise. This is one of those times where I regretted acting so macho. Lewis and I looked at each other to make sure that it was neither of us rumbling and basically just stopped dead in our tracks. I shined the flashlight up in the direction of the noise directly away from the clearing and the fire and couldn't see anything. There was nothing there. It was to this day, one of the most eerie noises I've ever heard, like a Halloween decoration would have made, but real. We stayed 50 feet into the woods, never venturing much further and searched the general area, but never found anything. After a half hour, and it's now past 2 AM, we heard a noise just at the edge of the clearing and both of us turned around. I had expected it to be Francis and Charlie coming to figure out what the hell was taking us so long. But instead, I see one person basically hiding halfway behind a tree looking at us. I've never not wanted to shine my flashlight on something before that moment. If it was dark, I wanted to see what it was. But in the distance, well past the shadowy character, I could see Francis and Charlie milling around the fire. I had this awful feeling that there was no way Uncle Josh was being this creepy. I didn't want to see who it was, and I really wanted to get away from them. I mean, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Lewis must have seen it too, because he slowly started backing further into the woods. We moved in a wide circle as we went around this shadowy person and managed to make it back to the clearing. 
When we got back to the cabin and grabbed Francis and Charlie, we began to make our way back to Lewis's place. When we were about a hundred yards from the cabin, we heard its door slam and we bolted. When we made it back to Lewis's house near the bottom of the hill, we debated what to do. Should we call 911? Was it a trespasser? Or was it simply a family member messing with Lewis? We went to notify Lewis's parents, who we figured would be overjoyed at the promise of being woken at 3 a.m. by a bunch of sweaty, terrified 11 year olds. They weren't home. Apparently Lewis's grandfather had a heart attack around 10 p.m. and none of us had cell phones as this was 1998 and no one had been notified except for Lewis's 19 year old step cousin. I never really figured out that relationship, to be honest, who had drank himself near blackout drunk as soon as the adults left him in charge of the younger kids. He got a serious talking to the next day by basically every adult in attendance. That meant that Uncle Josh and basically every other member of Lewis's family who could have been messing with us were all at the local hospital with the patriarch of the family who'd had a mild coronary. At 4 a.m. we knew sleep wasn't an option and began to watch and wait for the shadow guy to show up at the bottom of the hill. Less than 10 minutes later, I hear a sound coming from upstairs. Our only problem is that there is no upstairs in Lewis's house. There's something or someone on the roof. Lewis grabs a pellet gun because that's gonna be super effective. And we go outside cause you know, we're smart and stuff. We shine every flashlight straight up at the roof and seeing completely black silhouette jump off the far side of the house in a mad sprint. The way Lewis's roof was shaped, the part he jumped off was over 25 feet high and there was a huge vaulted ceiling in the back room of the house and the roof was even taller to accommodate for the attic. We watched it run from the hill and towards the creek, 10 feet wide and maybe two feet deep. And we followed it until we realized how much faster it was than us. Once it reached the edge of the creek, it stopped and looked back at us. This rumbling thing came back and it jumped the creek and we lost it. The next day we told Lewis's parents and they informed us that the cabin was being torn down. A cow had been killed and dismembered in the cabin earlier that morning, presumably after we left. It could have been a panther as cows weren't uncommon in that part of the property, but tended to avoid people. It could have been a bear, but hell, we never went back up that hill at night. We never saw that thing again. It might not seem like much, but to 11 year old me, I had a new face for fear. I lived in an old mountain cabin from when I was six to shortly before my 15th birthday. That is to say most of my childhood, I lived with my mum and stepdad. And at any given time, we had pets. For most of the time I lived there, we had a Rottweiler named Kayla. She's important to the events that happened here. So things started happening around when we moved in. The cabin is built in the side of an incline. So there's sort of a bridge from the back of the top floor of the house that you can use to get outside. This bridge is connected to what was my first bedroom there by a small balcony and a sliding glass door that didn't have a curtain. So at night, it was just this incredibly dark scene outside the door, which would scare any kid my age. Eventually, a few years later, my mum reorganized the house and put me in the downstairs bedroom. It was warmer, being closer to the fireplace. And that move was a birthday present from my parents. This was my room for most of the time I lived there and the room I had when my family got our dog, Kayla. My parents would leave me alone at times to go shopping or run errands, leaving me alone until eight or 9 PM on my own. I didn't mind this at first, but then I eventually started to experience things when I was alone that left me afraid to be there on my own. I would hear a male and female voice calling or whispering my name knocking, rustling, footsteps and the like. Kayla would also suddenly start growling or barking at absolutely nothing. Note that we lived in a small mountain town, so there weren't many cars or pedestrians that went by, especially not after dark. I began to keep Kayla close, feeling that we were safer together. 
Eventually, my mum moved me back upstairs, this time to the front room, which had its own small balcony. Around this time, when I was 12 or 13, is when the activity became much more intense. I remember sitting in my room around sunset, reading a book of ghost stories, no less, a book that I still own, and suddenly hearing a man call my name very loudly. I was surprised, of course, and went downstairs to ask my parents if they had called me. They said they hadn't. So I told my mum what had happened, which she didn't have an explanation for. During the summer, I would camp outside near our house on my own. I can recall an instance where I had brought my DS out to my campsite with me, and after playing for late into the night and leaving my lantern on, I fell asleep with my sleeping bag only pulled up to around my waist, right before I drifted off. I felt a warm wind blow through my tent and woke up in the morning completely tucked in, as if my mother had come to check on me which my mum denied doing, and she probably went to sleep before me anyhow, and my lantern was off. At first, I thought that I had left it on, and the bulb burnt out, but I was able to turn it on just fine. Back in my new upstairs room, whenever I came down the stairs, I would have a clear view down the hall to the sliding glass door I mentioned previous. Usually nothing noticeable was out there, but I always got a bad feeling about the area. One night around dusk, my parents called me down for dinner, and as I'm heading down the stairs, I see a glimpse of a woman in a big black dress, pressing her hand against the glass. The main thing that scared me about her, she didn't have a face. It was just a skull. That evening terrified me to the point that I started having Kayla sleep in my room with me. At night, I would hear whispering and footsteps that sounded like someone pacing and muttering in the living room, right beneath my bedroom. My mum told me she heard it too, being in the downstairs bedroom next to a hallway leading right to that living room. One night shortly before I left the house, for other reasons, not the activity, I had left the curtain covering the glass door that led to my balcony open so that I could see the moon and stars. I woke to the sound of Kayla growling, and looked outside to see a transparent form on the balcony, kind of reminiscent of that famous photograph of the brown lady, but instead it was hooded. It looked like the same entity that I had seen out the back door. That was my last major encounter before moving out, but the whispering and the footsteps from the downstairs persisted for the remainder of my time there. To this day, my mum and I agree that the house was haunted. My stepdad, however, is more of a skeptic and denies it. I also want to add that right after I moved in, that being opened the closet in my first upstairs bedroom and finding what appeared to be the naked, shuddering form of a woman in the fetal position caused me as a six-year-old to slam the closet shut and never open it again for as long as I lived there. I used to be a scout leader, and each year we go during the New Year period to a camping site. Being in Canada, New Year weather is pretty damn cold, think minus 20 to 30 Celsius, so the camping is done in lodges. The lodge we slept in had no toilets, so each night before we went to bed, I'd round up my scouts and walk them to the bathroom, which happened to be in another lodge at about a minute walk away. That year, I happened to have two really immature kids that were taking too much time to get ready. So I sent my scouts to the washroom and told them that I'd catch up to them once the two guys would stop mucking around. A few minutes later, we were on our way. By then, most of the children had already brushed their teeth and went to the toilet. When I finally enter the lodge, I can see that most of them had congregated around the vending machine in the hallway across the toilet. So I enter the toilet with the two kids that were with me, and I check to see if there was anyone in the stalls. Is anyone in the toilets? Yeah. I recognize the voice of Jay, one of my scouts, and then proceed to brush my teeth. 
A few minutes later, I ask again. Everything good? Yeah. This time I recognize the voice of another kid. Walter. At the moment, I make nothing of it and assume I just misheard the voice the first time round. A few minutes had passed and even the two difficult kids I was with had finished prepping themselves. So I ask if everything's good again, but get nothing back. So I asked the two kids to start opening the stores to see if something had happened to Walter. There were about eight of them, all empty. The two kids start freaking out because they also heard the voices. And since they had been using the sink, which was right by the door, there was no way for someone to pass them without being noticed. So I send them to the shower stalls and once again, there's no one. The two kids were now becoming really agitated. So I decided it was time to regroup in the hallway and head back. Back in the hallway, I see both of the kids who we thought we heard, who denied having entered the washroom after I came in. To this day, my scout squadron refers to this incident as the poop monster incident. A group of friends were staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no roads leading to the cabin and it was a good three to four day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else due to work obligations. So decided to head up the same day, but later. It would mean I would have to camp for a night by myself though. The latter part of this trail is too dangerous to be taken at night, especially by someone who doesn't know it. I didn't care. I was kind of looking forward to it as I've never camped alone before. I was in the middle of the woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in this small clearing, probably 40 feet across, get my campfire going and pitch my small one person tent. Do all that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs on the stick over the fire and s'mores. I probably stay up for a good two or three hours after dark. It was mid autumn. So the days were somewhat short. The entire time I thought I heard something moving in the woods at the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at first because the woods are full of animals. But as the night went on, I realized that whatever it was, was just circling the clearing over and over. Once I started paying attention, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stooped up and thought I heard some sound going away through the woods. I just shrug it off thinking that perhaps it was a fox that was curious and got scared when I stood up. I decided it was time to sleep, douse the fire and climb into my tent. I begin to doze off and stay in that half sleep awake state for a while. I normally hear weird stuff when I'm in this state. So don't think too much of it when I hear a voice. Something wakes me all the way up though. And I realize it's real and just outside my tent. It's just above a whisper. And I'm not sure if it was in another language or they were speaking English in such a way that I didn't understand. I lay there for some time. I didn't know how long I was listening and waiting for something to happen. There is just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent. So I can see a hand press into the wall of my tent down near my foot. This freaks me out and I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside tore us out of there, like running full sprint through the woods. I get out the tent and shine my flashlight around and see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody handprint on the tent, but nope. I didn't sleep that night, packed up camp at first light in the morning and booked it to the cabin. My family, along with four others, own a hunting cabin deep in the woods of Pennsylvania. When hunting season is out, the cabin becomes a vacation spot for these families. We would often all end up there during the 4th of July weekend. One year, my parents decided to take me, my uncle, three years older than me, and my two childhood friends up to the cabin for Easter. My parents decided to go out to the bar for a bit and leave us kids at the cabin alone. The youngest of us was seven at the time and the oldest 14. It's cold and there are eight inches of snow on the ground. The sun has started to set and the four of us had gathered around the table in front of the wood stove and are playing Una. 
we have several battery-operated lamps set about in the cabin, as well as two outside to light the walkway for my parents when they come back. Just as we are finishing a game and getting ready to take the 30-yard walk to the outhouse, we start to hear the snow below the window crunch. Being kids, we all felt a bit uncomfortable, but reminded ourselves that we were in nature, and it was probably just a deer. And finally, after some coaxing, me and the other two girls convinced my uncle to peek out the window. He said he saw nothing. As soon as he sat back down, we started to hear a low grunt and heavy creaking sound on the front porch. Now, before my parents left, they gave my uncle the keys to the gun cabinets and a rundown on which gun to use if there were trouble. So like any good protector, he arms himself and we hear heavy breaths and heavy paws on the porch side, on the other side of the door. Those heavy paws then start to crash repeatedly into the front doors. All four of us ran upstairs and locked the wooden door like it would provide any kind of protection from the 400 pound black bear that was trying to break in. About 10 minutes go by and we finally hear the front door fall and the bear was in the cabin with us. He rummaged through the downstairs for half an hour. As a small and frightened child, it felt like forever until he finally left. It never attempted to come upstairs for us. My parents were happy and we were all all right. And they never left us alone that long again. Last year, I vacationed in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Georgia. It was a wonderful trip, save for a few things. You'd need to understand the area where I stayed. It was a large cabin close to McKaysville, but not really in any town. There were cabins nearby, however, the closest which was about 150 yards, with one about twice as far on the other side. This distance is filled with dense trees, steep inclines, rivers and streams. This is the front door and deck area of the cabin. Moving to the right of the previous perspective, this is the side of the cabin. Something to note on this one is that the two windows there were the windows of my bedroom, and it was possible to just stand outside there. Honestly, nothing happened in relation to those windows, but with everything else that happened, I was on edge because of the placement of them. And finally, we have the back deck. As you saw, where the house sat was at an incline. Walking in the front door and down through the basement would bring you to the backyard. Upon walking through the front door, you would see the living room to your left and to your right was my room and the basement, the doors sitting not eight inches apart. The living room is connected to the kitchen and dining area with the upstairs having my parents' room, a bathroom and a locked door. As I mentioned, some of the decorations were a little bit odd. With this being the first painting in the living room, this is a picture that sits upstairs and here's a broken picture in the basement and two locked doors, which is not uncommon in an Airbnb, but they didn't have a lock like a bathroom or bedroom door. They had a different kind. You could completely turn the knob and the door wouldn't open. It wouldn't even rattle between the sides of the lock when pushing or pulling. The door had no give. It had to have been bolted from the inside, which makes me wonder how it's opened. Being the blubbering fool that I am, I didn't take pictures of them, just figured it was storage. But now to the meat of the story. We arrived on the 19th and my birthday was the 23rd. The night of the 22nd, at 11.35 p.m. is the time in question. I was staying up with some close friends until midnight, so we could be there as I turned 16. They had all already turned 16 earlier that month or prior, because a lot of us were born in July. We were in a Discord call, watching Nikocado Avocado eat an exorbitant amount of food, at me laughing at his gluttony fueled breakdown because he's a clown. My dog was asleep on my bed, but began scratching at the door because she had to use the restroom. Something to understand about her is that she's big, but has the energy of a small dog at times. She is a 90 pound pit bull and was on edge entering the cabin, which is very uncommon for her. In any situation, I would describe her as just happy to be there, but this time was different. 
I had to take her around the perimeter of the cabin multiple times before she would come inside. And even then, she'd just walk into her cage that we had brought with us for her while we were in town. Rarely would she go in there unless told to, but she almost ran to it. I told my friends I would be right back because Blue had to use the restroom. To bring her outside to go to the bathroom, I had to go down through the basement and out the backyard where a very long tether was spiked to the ground. I was standing just inside the door and flipped the lights on. I reached to grab Blue's collar, but she wasn't there where she just was. I looked over and she was staring out the window into the backyard. She's honestly the goofiest dog, so I figured she must have seen a bug. And I opened the door, grabbed her collar and tried to pull her outside, but she wouldn't go. She's big enough that I can't make her move if she doesn't want to. And it took some convincing. But even when she was outside, she didn't take her eyes off the other side of the backyard, which I couldn't see. It was too dark, even with the porch light, which only illuminated about 10 feet in front of me at best. The end of the backyard being 30 feet in front of me. I was starting to grow nervous because she usually doesn't act like this. So I attached her to my tether and kept her close. After about 10 seconds, she started to pee, but kept her eyes locked on where they had been. Then I heard the most unnatural noise coming from the other side of the yard. I need you to understand that at its core, it sounded like a person. If it sounded like an animal, I wouldn't have been so afraid. But it sounded like a person badly mimicking the noise a frog makes, and it was loud. It had to have been because southern bugs never stop wailing. The bugs and other wildlife were very loud. For me to have heard this noise as loud as I did, that noise must have been yelled. Blue, who has never done this and has no aggressive bone in her body, started growling very aggressively. She still wanted to go inside, and after I unhooked her, she started backing up, but she was showing her teeth and foaming at the mouth and growling. As we backed up, I heard it again, from more to the left on the trail with wooden logs on either side. I pulled her inside and she took no time darting back up the basement stairs and into my room. I slammed the door and made sure to lock it and went back up the stairs and specifically remember locking the door at the top as well. It can only be unlocked from the main part of the house where I was. And I swear this to all that is holy as I locked the door quickly. We all agreed that it was really weird and I should look over there when I wake up in the morning. I didn't sleep until two or 3 a.m. At seven, my alarm went off and I woke up and the basement door was wide open. My sisters were asleep down there because it had a bedroom. They couldn't have opened it. It can only be unlocked from the other part of the house. My mother and stepfather weren't even awake yet. The door was opened abnormally wide, swung all the way around so it was hitting the wall behind it. And after checking, the door from the basement to outside was unlocked as well, but not opened. I haven't the slightest idea how this could have happened. These doors can only be unlocked from the opposite side. The following day was my birthday and it went all right. The night of the 23rd, we were packing up because we were leaving to go early on the morning of the 24th. It was between nine to 10 PM and I had to retrieve the spike and tether from the backyard in order to finish packing. I psyched myself up, grabbed a light and power walked over. I pulled it out the ground and quickly walked back up to the house. Around the time I reached the porch, I heard the noise again. This time immediately to my right and extremely loud. Again, the bugs are constantly producing the most deafening buzzing noises to the point where having a conversation a little bit apart is rather difficult. It was the same very human like noise. Still the best description I could come up with was a human very badly mimicking the sound of a frog or toad. This is where I was standing. This is similar to the picture from the backyard facing the house, but over 20 feet. You can see where I was near the door and where it had to have been. For a moment, I thought about going over there to see what it was and finally answering the question that I had been asking myself, but I valued my life too much. So I ran inside, slammed the door and drew the blinds. Truthfully, I didn't sleep at all that night. 
I stayed awake listening for the noise again and pretended to wake up the next morning. I've been searching online for whatever may have been responsible but can't find any logical answers. If anyone has any idea on what could have made that noise, I would love it if you could get in touch. A few years ago, me and my friends went on a trip to this secluded cabin in the mountains. We were there for the entire weekend and had a blast. However, around midnight on a Friday, we heard a blood curdling scream and a loud crashing noise coming from outside. We thought nothing of it at first, but the screams continued. So we decided to investigate. What we found was something that no rational mind could ever have imagined in a billion years. We found ourselves staring at a bizarre creature, which we can only describe as a cross between a goblin, a demon and something completely unnatural. It had no eyes, only hollow black sockets, which gave it a completely hollow stare. This thing was covered in a thin sheen of dripping blood, which glistened in the moonlight. It was busy hacking apart what appeared to be the lower half of a girl. It had already made a pretty good job of it. And when it noticed us, it let out a bestial roar. My best friend screamed and fainted. The other friend ran and hid. And I froze in fear. We never told anyone about this, not our parents, our friends, no one. Even now, after years, I get nervous whenever I have an encounter in the woods after midnight. We got out of there as soon as we could. No way we were gonna stick around for nature's oddest work of art. The murderer was long gone, thank God. Back in September of 2013, I went to North Carolina with my husband, sister-in-law, mother-in-law and her fiance, soon to be father-in-law, to attend my mother-in-law's wedding. We stayed in a very, very cute little cottage in the Smoky Mountains in Franklin in a cute small neighborhood with decently spaced out houses swerving up a hill on the bottom side of a mountain. We spent a lot of time in Cherokee at the reservation as well, which was relatively close if I remember correctly. But all of this happened back in Franklin. One evening, we were all sat outside the front porch of the cabin decorating wine glasses with paint while my father-in-law played the guitar. We noted how silent everything in the neighborhood was. No crickets, no birds, no wind. A little later, my sister-in-law and mother-in-law went to bed early, and my father-in-law and husband were on the couch in the living room watching TV. I decided to go into the kitchen and make macaroni and cheese. The living room was right next to the kitchen entrance, and the couch my husband was on was the closest to the light switch to the kitchen. While I was draining the noodles, the light suddenly turned off on me. I yelled, Hey! and turned around and saw my father-in-law sleeping. I walked into the living room to see my husband sleeping as well. I said his name to wake him up and asked him why he turned the light off on me, thinking he was pulling a prank. He woke up and was visibly drowsy and said he didn't. I told him what happened and my father-in-law woke up and heard what happened. Both my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were in their bedrooms still sleeping and there's no way that they made it past me that fast and turned around as soon as the light went off, as I had a clear view of the living room entrance to the ground floor bedrooms and the start of the stairs that lead to the upstairs bedroom. My father-in-law and husband came into the kitchen to investigate. We all looked at the light switch, which was in the off position, and my father tried messing with it to see if he could get it stuck in between on and off to see if maybe that could have been the option. He couldn't get it to work. My husband told me to stop talking about it as they were both getting creeped out and they both resumed watching TV. Even later that night while I was sleeping with my husband and sister-in-law in the upstairs bedroom with the AC on, blaring on full blast, I woke up to a blood curdling scream I sat up and listened to it for a while and was surprised at just how loud it was since I could hear it over the AC. I was pretty sure it was coming from outside and I had to pee badly. So I slowly crept downstairs to the bathroom. 
I was able to hear the scream much more clearly from there. It was so horrifying I stood there in the bathroom in fear, and after I was done, shaking a little in fear, I realised it sounded like a woman in pure agony. It started out high and by the end got really low, and sounded like at the end of each scream she had to put up with something being ripped from her abdomen, as if each scream physically hurt. About an hour later, it was still going on, and it was only at that point where I gained the courage to go upstairs again. I tried waking my husband, but he's a very deep sleeper, and I had a hard time getting his attention. I knew if I'd have managed to wake him up, he would give me attitude and tell me half asleep he doesn't hear anything over the AC, and to just go back to bed. His sister is a lot like him when it comes to sleep, and she was still knocked out on the bed across the room. I gave up and tried to sleep it off. The bedroom we were in was in the attic. It had a door leading outside with a stairway leading down to the yard. When I was trying desperately to fall back asleep, I couldn't help but imagine a tall, skinny, lean, muscly being with very long limbs standing on the other side of the door. The image haunted me for quite a while, but I somehow managed to fall back to sleep. I don't think that I was necessarily seeing what the thing looked like. I'm just trying to express the amount of fear this thing gave me. I became far too afraid to wake anyone up to investigate whatever it was. I considered someone might be in danger, but it sounded too unreal, almost like it was something pretending to be human. For the past six years that happened, I've been trying to figure out what it was that I heard. I looked up YouTube videos of different animals screaming, foxes, deer, mountain lions, you name it. Nothing was quite like what I heard. The closest thing was a mountain lion, but it would have had to have been a pretty large one on steroids being an axe murderer or something. If anyone else has had a similar experience or is able to point me to a video with what they think it sounds like, I would appreciate it. There was a really creepy wooden figure of a duck in the living room of the cottage, but all its legs were painted red and the red paint dripped down its unpainted legs and its head was on backwards. It had a name tag on it that said, my name is Melissa, and we all joked that it was trying to scare us. I am an East Tennessee native and have grown up going to the Smokies. I have also had a strange or seemingly paranormal experience while in the area. So my grandparents own a bunch of rental properties and cabins in Townsend and surrounding the Smokies for holidays, etc. And my extended family would always gather together at these cabins for the holidays. I'd had little things happen here and there, like feeling watched while playing in the woods growing up with my brothers and cousins, or hearing strange and human sounding noises outside at night where there weren't any animals or predation as I'm very aware and educated on the local wildlife of the Smokies. But nothing super substantial or scary enough that I actually experienced true terror or fear. Mostly just weird little things here and there. Some things being knocked off a table in the cabin or bumps in the night. Anyway, one Christmas around 2010, me and my twin brother were given a cabin to ourselves for the weekend within a half mile or so from the rest of the family cabins, and my grandparents' main cabin. We are both 19 at this point, so not little kids by any means. First night there, we drink and I fell asleep early downstairs on the couch, and he passes out in the upstairs bedroom loft. No big deal. Next night, he's asleep on the couch, and I'm upstairs in the loft laying in bed. I begin getting the feeling of being watched. Like, not just the little paranoia feeling. It starts off and it builds up to the point where I'm almost in full-blown panic. Now I'm a 20-year-old male at this point, and keep telling myself that I'm just being a coward, and the gut feelings are ridiculous. But 
The feeling persists. I'm now wide awake looking around the cabin in the pitch darkness for something. I keep seeing movement from the corner of my eye. And just like that, all of a sudden it becomes completely silent, like the Oz effect or whatever other people have called it. I'm laying there heart pounding when I hear something whisper in my ear. When I say whisper, it was in a raspy, drawn out tone, but was still startling loud as if someone was leaning over the bed directly above me, saying it into my ear. I jumped up, went downstairs, and fell asleep on the floor beside my brother on the couch, scared like a little kid. We woke up next morning, and my brother was extremely surprised to find me down there with him, but didn't say anything or ask any questions. As to why I was curled up beside them on the couch. Within a year later, around Halloween, we were talking with some family and friends about strange experiences. And out of nowhere, my brother says to everyone, Yeah, I definitely think Grandpa's cabins in the Smokies are haunted or something. And goes on to talk about how he had the same weird feeling the night before I slept upstairs in the loft. He's feeling watched, panicked, and all the same feelings as me. He, like myself, couldn't really even verbalize the feeling of being watched by something malicious well. I kinda like yell in excitement about having the same gut feeling there, but that's when he realizes the reason the next night why I was asleep on the floor next to him. But afterwards, I did confide in him embarrassingly. I might add that to this day I have no idea what happened in those cabins. My grandparents sold them all and we haven't been back. It was strange and weird. My personal opinions is that something to do with the energy from the mountains. The energy from the Native Americans who lived there for centuries before us. I believe the entity that spoke to me was purely malicious. Growing up. I had a neighbour who spent as much time with me as my own family. He also had a son a few years younger than myself, and we were all friends. They lived across the road from us. Behind their house was a heavily wooded ridge with an overgrown road going partially up it. At the end of this road was an old mobile home trailer from the 60s or 70s. It was captured by my neighbour's father who was a state trooper during a drug raid and was used as a hunting cabin for many years. At the time of this story, it was in a horrible state of repair and by no means was probably safe to be in. My neighbor was utilizing it to store random stuff. So one night, I was over at their house as usual and myself plus my neighbor's son were starting to get bored. At this point, it was around 2 a.m. We decided to take the walk up to the trailer and sit there for a bit. So we gathered a flashlight and a small lantern then headed up. At first things were uneventful. There was a light mist and rain, and it was a bit chilly but not that bad. We sat in the trailer amidst stored items and the decay of the place with the lantern for about 20 minutes just hanging out and talking. We were discussing leaving when we heard footsteps outside. I have grown up in the woods and the cadence or rhythm of steps people tend to make compared to animals is noticeable. These were human and heavy. We had heard nothing come up, nor had we seen anything on our way up. At this point, it made its way to the door of the trailer and stopped outside. We called and asked who was there, but there was nothing. No steps, no rustling, nothing. I, at least, had no inclination to be trapped there by anyone or anything, and picked up a rather heavy metal rod that happened to be there, and we whispered a plan. After a second, I kicked the door open with enough force to slam it against the trailer, and almost shut it again while my friend shone the light out. There was nothing there. No sounds of running, nothing at all. We gathered all our courage, hopped out and looked around for a minute, still nothing to see nor hear. No footprints, no anything. We decided it was best at this point to take our asses back to the house, to which we did. We still didn't see or hear anything on the way back. 
And I don't know for sure what it was that we saw that night exactly. Context. I was 17 when this happened. I'm female. And, spoilers, I'm a lot more savvy now than I used to be. I was 17, and had just started a relationship with a guy who I thought was the world. Turns out he cheated on me several times, and was no good for me. My parents warned me off. They told me he was a loser and a bum. You see, he was 27, so a lot older than me. Had dropped out of high school, and had pretty much been homeless for a long time. He and I met through mutual friends at a party, and we really hit it off, and I thought he was the love of my life. Oh, to be 17. In any case, he told me to run away from home, that my parents didn't understand our love, and that we should be free to do whatever we pleased. It didn't matter that I was still going to school. He convinced me with his sweet words, and off I ran. We were gone for about three weeks when this happened. Life had already started to seem quite bleak. Being homeless was nowhere near as glamorous as he made it out. Sleeping rough, having to struggle for food, and he rinsed the little money I had in my bank account relatively quickly. He told me of a cabin that he knew, right near the edge of the woods. He said that he had rented it off the owner before, and that they went way back. I, totally smitten, agreed with the proposal. It would be nice to have a roof over our heads. Truth be told, I was starting to miss my parents, but I was still blindsided by love. He took me to the cabin, which was about a four-hour walk, and when we finally got there, it was heaven compared to how rough I'd been sleeping. To think I'd finally be able to shower. We got there. It was lovely. The only problem was that we didn't have a key. He told me that the guy had left it somewhere for us to find, but hadn't specified, and since he'd only contacted him through a payphone, as he didn't have a cell phone, well, then there weren't many options. We started rummaging around the little path that led up, checking for fake rocks, under rocks, in bushes, buried in mud, and all the like. We looked for about two hours, and I was starting to get less and less convinced that this was true, and getting angry at my boyfriend for this. But he told me not to worry and that we will find it soon. He really did have a way with words. I grew tired of looking for the key, and went and looked at the house itself did a perimeter check, and found that one of the upstairs windows was a little bit open. If I stood on my boyfriend's shoulders, I might be able to just touch it, and crawl in perhaps. Well, after falling down twice, I just about managed to prop it open with a stick, and climb my way in. It was plenty big enough for me to go through, which I was very grateful for. The cabin itself was simple enough. I got in on the upstairs part, let's call it the attic I suppose, of the cabin. It was a very nice bedroom, and I made my way down and unlocked the door. One of the things I realised when I got down, is that it had two different locks, so even if we would have found one key, we still wouldn't have been able to get in. I was wondering at this point if my boyfriend's testimony was true. but. Trying to think the best of him, I unlocked the door and let him inside. We spent a really comfortable few days in the cabin. It was absolutely charming, just to be at one with nature. He was into yoga and a whole host of other interesting things as well. And at one point when he went out to get the green stuff, I was left there by myself, just trying to relax and calm down. While I was waiting all alone, as my boyfriend had already been about three hours at this point, I started looking around and found a book. I perched myself in the little living area on a chair and started reading, feeling quite happy with myself. That's when I see a car pull into the driveway, a really nice fancy looking car too. 
Four people get out of the car. They all look about 25 to 30, with an assortment of camping and trekking gear. They start opening the door with keys, and when they open it, I give them a funny look and ask them what they think they're doing. They give me an equally puzzled look and ask me the same thing. At this point, there was no genuine confrontation, but I was starting to get afraid. But, confident that my boyfriend hadn't lied to me, and that he had in fact booked the cabin, I told them that we had booked the cabin for the week, and that my boyfriend knew the owner, and that there must be a mistake with their reservation. They told me that they had just received the keys from the owner himself, who lived about a mile away, and that there was no way he'd already booked it out. He was some 40-year-old guy, no way his memory was falling apart just yet. We gave each other quizzical looks. The guy asked where my car was, and I, not wanting to sound like I had walked here, told him that my boyfriend had gone out in the car and that he'd be back shortly. I didn't really know what else to say from embarrassment. So, with a defeated look, he said, Come on, get in my car and we'll drive down to the owner and see him this point I was about soiling myself. As the confidence of these guys grew, I started to get more and more confident that my boyfriend was perhaps full of garbage and had lied to me completely and that we had broken in and used the resources of someone else's cabin. And the guilt was weighing me down. I told him that wouldn't be necessary, that I would go speak to the owner myself when my boyfriend got here and that perhaps we were assigned another cabin and were given this one by mistake. That was quick thinking on my part. I didn't even know if there were any more. But the guy kind of shrugged it off and asked if in the meantime they could set up as he was fairly confident that they were going to use this cabin. So I said sure, went upstairs and gathered our small two tattered backpacks and came back down. It was awkward and uncomfortable reading the book there. And at that moment is when I hear laughter coming from down the hill. I jump out the door and see my boyfriend and a few of his homeless buddies coming up. Looks like they were coming to stay as well. They had a lot of their stuff, one of them pulling a duvet behind him. When he gets to the top, he sees the car and asks where it came from. I told him that some guys were here to rent the cabin and sweetly said that we should go check with the owner who lives only a mile away to see what the mix-up was about. He gives me a deadpan look and says that there must have been a mistake and la la la. That's when I catch him out. I could tell in his eyes that he had no idea that this was already rented out by someone else and that he had basically forced me to go in and break into a cabin. I was mortified. He tells me that we'll be fine and starts leading me down the hill and tells me that there's another cabin and there must have been a mix-up. I grab my backpack, very upset. But there was something off about my boyfriend. It was like the fact that I had challenged him that had really irritated him. Him and his buddies were starting to display a lot more bravado than usual, and I was getting uncomfortable. They were telling nasty jokes, saying nasty words and calling me names, all banterously, apparently. That's when they got to a little brook. My boyfriend then looked at me dead in the eyes and slapped me in the face. I was shocked. No one had ever hit me like that before. Just when I was about to say what I thought of him and give him a piece of my mind, did I feel two hands push me square in the chest and I fell straight, backpack and all, into the brook. He said that I should never speak to him that way and called me all manner of horrible things, said that I needed to learn my lesson, and him and his buddies laughed heartily and walked further into the woods. I dragged myself out of the water, crying, clueless as to where I was and where they'd gone, with little intention of following them. So I did the only logical thing. I went up to the cabin and spoke to the guys who were in there, told them the truth, that I'd run away from home that my homeless boyfriend was a piece of work who I was pretty much done with now 
and that I really would appreciate a ride home as I had no idea where I was or what I was doing. I was lucky enough that the girlfriend gave me a lift home. Turns out I was only 40 minutes away, lucky for me. My parents gave her money for gas and a little extra and thanked her when I got home safe. Something important to note is that I had actually left my cell phone in the house as I didn't want to be part of my parents' system or use anything they had given me other than clothes when I left with him. That was part of his doing. I'm glad to say that I learnt my lesson about going and getting in with the wrong crowd and my life has gone pretty well since then. One thing, I never saw him again. But I did read about him in the local paper a few years back. He apparently had gotten into a lot of trouble with some dangerous people and was on the run. And his mugshot was also available in some shops for petty theft. Looks like he never straightened out. Shame, really. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change colour. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. This was on Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark, and my mum started thinking about that we were the only ones on this road and we didn't know the nearest neighbour, which was a little unsettling. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms in the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then my mother heard what sounded like footsteps, and she saw what appeared to be the outline of a hat. There was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear by the woods. By this time, both of us are terrified that the man is going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source, and I decided to sleep in the bed which was under my mother's room. We tried to sleep, and then were awoken by an owl howling. My mother could see the owl's eyes which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way, and the owl didn't take its eyes off my mum the entire night. The owl also hooted all night. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep, as every noise jarred us. It would be like, what's that? What noise is that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of the hat walking around the general area. Then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out at this point, but we weren't able to leave in the middle of the night. There were no phones in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were in common usage. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A few days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man we saw was a mountain man, who was a handyman and had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. We hadn't seen this guy until Friday night when the power went out. Had we known that, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He had told the band director that we left a day early. We could laugh about being scared. It was a memorable night after all. Perhaps the cabin wasn't such a good idea. Turns out I don't fare well in haunted cabins. They just don't agree with me. And now we're back in the woods, and I really hope that we can leave here nice and safely. So join me as I make my way out of the woods. I was camping with my husband and his family at a small remote lake in our state. New Mexico has always had many stories of paranormal activity just about everywhere. Well, on this camping trip, there were about 10 of us off the shore, off the lake, 
and one other group of people camping, maybe six of them, and the next sight over off the shore. It was a nightmare, and both our group and the other group were doing typical activities, making s'mores, having a few drinks, telling stories, when all of a sudden we all heard what sounded like a little girl yelling for help. The other group of campers asked us if we had any children in the group, which we didn't, and neither did they. But we were all positive of hearing a little girl and decided to search the area where we heard the noises from. Rather quickly, we found something together. There was a field behind our campsite and we all saw a very tall, pale white figure standing a hundred feet away from us in the field, making the noises. We all agreed this thing looked maybe six feet tall, skinny and white as could be. Everyone got quiet, but we all were together and still made our way closer to investigate. Whatever it was saw and started backing off as we got closer until it vanished beyond some trees. Every single person in both campsites was freaked out by this. And that night while we tried to sleep, we continued to hear those little girls calling for help. It still gives me chills thinking about it. I used to have a delivery route on the third shift. Part of my route had me passing through a national forest. The first few weeks going through this forest had the hairs on my arms standing up. It was in the first week that one day I stopped to get gas at the town just before going into the forest. I never walked away from the car and I used my card at the pump. But as soon as I got to the forest, I felt like something was in the car with me, in the back seat. I didn't see anything through the rear view, and I was petrified of turning around, but I knew what it looked like at the same time. To sum it up, an old lady with a face similar to a screen mask with long stringy gray hair. After a few weeks, I came to peace with whatever the hell was guarding the forest. Basically, I told it that I respected the forest and I'm not there to tear things up and litter. Months later, I'm being sent off to other areas to fill in. I'm friends with the guy that took over my route and one night we're both talking before the routes were set and I asked him if he had ever had anyone join him on the route. He knew exactly what I was talking about, knew that it was the National Forest and that something in the back seat had joined him. Only for him, it was a jackal-headed creature, not an old lady. Later, I asked someone else that used to have the route if they had seen strange things in the forest. It got to become amusing, since if I filled in on that route or anything, I never had any problems anymore on that stretch. I used to see other weird things out there though, mostly strange lights. One night, I thought there was a police car somewhere, until I realized the forest was too dense in the area for a car to be in. There were just these weird flashing blue lights. There's camping areas out there, but not near the main road. I don't usually discuss this much because people try to explain things away, but they weren't there and I saw what I saw. When I was traveling to Oz, I was staying with a good friend. I was there for about a month, and I had access to his car, and was out of town on my own for a few days. My plan was to meander from Melly to Wilson's prom, and I decided to take a detour up to Nuji State Park. I had noticed in my guidebook that there was a trestle bridge not far from where I was going to set up camp and wanted to see it. Not sure why. Thought perhaps it would look cool for photos, maybe. The thing about Oz is once you're off the main highway, things are often not clearly marked. I drove past the old aged sign and had to pull a U-turn to hit the bridge. I'm not sure what the purpose of this bridge is. It used to be a rail bridge and now it appears to be a short three kilometer hike from Nuji. Other than that, there were no houses nearby it, and it's not a loop route, the only way in or out. I get to the parking area and there's no one there, and I mean no one. It's late in the day, the sun is getting ready to dip beyond the horizon, and I am pumped because I have solitude. 
I walked up the stairs to the bridge and start walking along it taking pics. When I notice there is nothing about, no birds, no bugs. What the hell is this, Oz? I ponder for a moment, continue taking pics and look up. When I see a woman standing in front of me. At first I thought I was imagining her and then she spoke. She seemed very kind and asked where I was from and if I was enjoying my trip. I was a bit taken aback as I didn't hear anyone approach and she definitely wasn't prepared for a six kilometer walk dressed in shoes and a blouse. And from what I could see and later confirmed in the guide, there aren't any houses nearby. We chatted for a good 10 minutes and then said our goodbyes. I turned to take a pic, turned back and she was gone. I didn't hear her leave. She was not strolling off in the distance, she was just gone. As soon as that registered with me, the sound of the birds and bugs came back instantly. I can't explain it, and I never felt that scared or threatened. It was just a very strange and surreal moment. A few years back, a few friends and I decided to go up a hiking trail to drink and have a laugh. This happened around Halloween. It was around 2015. The place we went to was Murphy's Ranch Park in Whittier, California. It's in a suburb in the foothills of the city if anyone is familiar with the place and they know exactly where I mean. At the entrance of the park is a benched and wooded area that leads to multiple hiking trails that we were sitting at around 50 to 100 feet from the mouth of the park that leads into a residential street. While sitting around, we heard an owl hooting about, but it didn't sound right to us, almost like a human imitating an owl. As we were talking and drinking, we started even joking about it, and it seemed to get louder and closer. After about five minutes, from almost nowhere, a man started walking through the park between the benches. He was around five foot ten, dressed in all black, with a cloak. Now the part that was weird to us is that while he walked, there was no stride or bounce in his step. His shoulders and body almost seemed stationary and as if he were a few inches off the ground. His feet did not strike the dirt at all from what I saw. While he was walking through, the owl sounds were much louder than before and a lot closer. It felt as if it were almost right behind us, daring us to look. When we decided to make a run for it, it seemed as if time stopped and there was no sound, no light, no nothing. And the man turned to us and looked at us as if he were looking into our eyes individually but at the same time. He was as pale as a sheet and had yellowish blue eyes that were piercing and almost glowing. As dark as it was, you can see them, but no other features besides his bald head. After what felt like forever, it was only a few seconds, he turned his head and walked, or glided rather, straight towards into the trails. The owl noise was back, and it seemed as though he was following it, and within a second of walking, he was nowhere in sight. In that exact moment, we all sprinted to our cars and took off immediately. None of us have ever been back since, knowing the history of what goes on in these hills. I really can't say if the person in question was even human. A friend of ours tried to talk to him, to ask him what he was up to, and he just ignored the call and was gone. Anyone have any idea what I may have witnessed, or even been around? Nearly 20 years ago, my best friend and I were camping with my family, a place we both had basically grown up at so we knew the location quite well. Being the delinquents we were, we both left the campsite around midnight to 1 a.m. to smoke a joint. We walked five minutes to a park that was on the ocean, with a dense forest jutting up against it. We were on the beach when we finished smoking and are enjoying the stars for a few minutes when we both noticed something about 150 feet up the beach along the forest trail. I still have a hard time describing what I saw. There were approximately six orbs of light appearing on the trail which runs parallel to the beach. They form in a horizontal line 
and begin moving towards us. These lights are orbs, and unlike a flashlight, they do not project any light. No beams like a flashlight, no area like a candle, none of the trees nearby lit up. They were more like a white light, rather than the orange of a candle. Upon them moving towards us, we were both filled by an immediate sense of dread and decide that we're not sticking around. We hightail it out of there. My friend glanced over while we were running perpendicular to the location, and he insists he saw them from a circle and hover down to the ground. Upon discussing it for a bit, we go back armed with weapons and flashlights to see, and there's nothing to note. I have to iterate that this was not in a location where fireflies reside, and even if there was a human element behind the lights, they were moving towards us at a pace people couldn't possibly move through a wooded forest in the pitch dark. I'm in my thirties now with a family, and whenever I see my friend, we still talk about it and shake our heads to try and explain it. What are your thoughts? I'll start this off by saying that I'm not a very spiritual person, traditionally. I've always been quite cynical of paranormal activity. And even though I know that there may be some things beyond our understanding, I've always believed there's usually a very logical and scientific reason for most paranormal occurrences. Everyone in my friendship group also shared this view. Until what happened the other night. So, my mates, my boyfriend and I live on a uni residence, which is surrounded by a dense Australian forest. I've been here for a year now, and I've enjoyed going on multiple bushwalks, both during the day and night. I grew up surrounded by the bush. My high school was on 200 acres of bush, and I live on a country property in the middle of nowhere. So at this point, the land and the forest have become my safe space. I have been in the uni forest plenty of times to take a breather from uni stress, and have never noticed anything sinister in there. Over the past few weeks, my boyfriend and his mates have been building a pretty impressive fort in the bush. They have spent every free minute taking an axe to old dead logs and building this fort, which is about the size of a caravan. Understandably, they're pretty proud of this creation, so last night, they decided to show some third years what they'd been working on. As they were walking towards the fort, these third years stopped and told us they didn't want to go any further. They told us they'd had some bad experiences in that section of the forest, and they told us that they were too scared to venture in it at night. I thought these third years were merely pranking us, so I began joking and making light of the situation. To my surprise though, my boyfriend Matt and his best friend Darcy were very accommodating of the third year's fear and told them they'd be happy to accompany them out of the bush. They oddly seemed kind of freaked out themselves. I then remembered that Matt had actually told me before that the bush could be quite scary at night, which actually amused me because usually he's the type of annoying macho man who believes fear is a sign of weakness one of the third years, Nick, wanted to press on, but the other two, Kyle and Adam, wanted to head back. I had seen the fort so many times, I volunteered to go back with Kyle and Adam. As we were leaving the forest, I asked them both what made them so afraid. They told me they didn't want to talk about it when they were there, but they did point out to me that the section of the forest we were in was unnaturally still and quiet. As a cynical person, I had to admit that it was a bit odd that the only section we were in was dead still. Where about 20 meters away across a road, the trees were blowing madly in the wind. Once we had left the forest, Kyle and Adam's demeanor changed significantly, and they finally felt comfortable expressing to me what they had experienced in the bush before. To make a very long story short, Across the three years that they had lived on the residence, as they, and a few other people, have had multiple encounters with what seemed to be an odd-looking spirit in the shape of a man in a hunched-over position. 
the spirit was always accompanied by the bush going unnaturally silent and an overwhelming feeling of impending evil and doom. He told me the reason the forest goes so still and quiet is because something inside it is listening to you and is hunting you. Kyle, being a man of indigenous culture, told me that at one point the spirit was so close to one of his friends that he had to call in an Aboriginal elder to run a smoking ceremony. This elder told Kyle that the presence of evil was overwhelming in the forest, and she warned him to never go too deep in again. Kyle also began educating me about other Aboriginal legends and expressing his fear of the noises, like screams and whistles, distinctly human screams and whistles, not bird or foxes, and the feelings he had experienced within the bush. At this point, I listened ardently, but was also viewing these stories as purely fictitious, as opposed to something to be concerned about. Even though I didn't really believe in the stories, I was interested in learning more about the Aboriginal culture, and was honoured that Kyle was opening up to me about something which seemed to be so very personal and significant to him. About half an hour later, Matt, Darcy and Nick emerged from the forest and headed back over to us. As they approached, I could tell that they seemed pretty obviously shaken by something, and for the first time that night, I suddenly felt very anxious. Matt and Darcy explained that they were showing Nick the fort, when all of a sudden, they felt an overwhelming feeling of dread, and they all unanimously decided that they needed to leave. Matt also admitted to momentarily catching a glimpse of what he said looked like a hunched over man in front of a tree near the fort. He said he would have thought it a shadow at first, had he not seen the man's eyes reflecting in the light of his phone torch. At this point, my belief that they were pranking us diminished entirely, as Kyle was visibly freaking out and Matt looked shaken. I could tell they weren't acting and I also didn't believe Kyle would exploit his own culture for the sake of a cheap joke. We all now headed back to our respective dorms and figured we'd better get from as far as the forest as possible. It felt much better to be inside, only until Matt turned to me and suddenly said, I need to go back and talk to Kyle. When I looked into his eyes, I could tell something was very wrong and my anxiety amped up significantly. Him behaving this way was very unusual and something was clearly bothering him. So we headed over to Kyle's unit and knocked on the door. Matt explained to both of us that two days prior, he had come across a massive tree in the clearing that was covered in some odd sorts of bulbs. Him being an absolute moron, decided it would be a clever idea to take an ax to the bulbs to see what they were made of. He admitted that the reason he was asking Kyle about it was because he couldn't shake the memory of the tree and it was becoming unbearable and stressful. Kyle was obviously furious about this and it turned out that Matt had damaged a very sacred and ancient tree and Kyle believed that Matt may have angered the forests and spirits that dwelled within it. He asked Matt if he had experienced any incidences over the past few days, and Matt matter-of-factly told us that the gash on his face, caused by a falling branch that missed his eye by a mere centimetre, actually happened only 20 minutes after he axed the tree. He also told Kyle that he had lied when he initially told us that he'd seen the hunched man for the first time tonight. He had in fact seen him three times over the course of the past week and twice in the past two days. He also told us that the reason he left the forest the night of the axing of the tree, beside the fact he had a bleeding cut on his face, was because of all of the boys working on the fort when they suddenly heard a very loud and very unnatural sound in the forest, something between a human scream and a whistle. They said they thought it was an animal and everything else had suddenly gone completely silent. When they heard the noise again, closer, they grabbed their stuff and legged it. 
It was also at this point when I realized that over the past two days, and I could literally pin it to whenever Matt was around, I had felt extremely agitated and sad. It was a very intense feeling, and I felt really guilty, because it was nothing Matt was doing to upset me that was causing me distress. It was simply as it being his energy, or his vibe that was bothering me. I mean, I love this man. We'd never had any arguments. But the night after he'd axed the tree, which he didn't tell me about, and which I don't condone, by the way, I remember feeling such a distinct feeling of discomfort whenever he was around. It got so bad at one point that I locked myself in my room and cried all night about it. I was confused and sad that the person I loved was making me distressed when he'd seemingly done nothing. I pinned it on my period, except it's not due for another week and usually doesn't cause my emotions to run haywire. I'm still not necessarily saying that the tree and Matt's energy were linked per se, but it was a feeling that was so weird to me and so unexplainable to begin with. It almost made sense. Kyle now told Matt that he, I, and everyone else involved in making the tree fort needs to be saged as quickly as possible to ward off any evil spirits. Matt, despite his initial disbelief, agreed immediately, and we met another Aboriginal student called Ash and their partner, Key, and they provided us the sage. Before the ceremony, Key told us that we were going to gauge the vibes, and Ash told us that Key had an innate ability to feel spirits in the wind. The second that Key walked out of the unit, I swear to God that the wind did one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. It was the biggest gust of wind so far, and it carried the faintest howl of about five different notes and octaves. It came from well beyond the tree line like a wave, and flew unnaturally quickly in our direction. It flew through me, as if collecting my shadow, and it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It didn't feel sinister though, and Key reassured us that it was a normal phenomenon and that they experience it whenever in touch with the spirits. What wasn't normal though, was the smell that permeated in the air about 30 meters from the tree line. It was almost artificial, like nothing I'd ever smelt before, and it clearly scared Key, as they began to tell us something was very wrong. She told us that something was stalking us from just beyond the tree line, and that it was very angry. Apparently we needed to begin the sage now, or else it would follow us into the residence. As we walked to the glow of a nearby lamppost, Key told us it was already too late, and that the evil thing was already pursuing us. And that was when the brand new and relatively expensive lighter we had recently bought broke. It just completely broke. We tried to light the sage, but the button fell off and the thing cracked open. We now needed a new lighter and Key told us the thing was getting closer and closer. Whether it was related or not, I couldn't stop shaking despite being warm under many layers of clothing. As we packed, we headed to a room to get a new lighter, and Ash advised us that Matt should stay away as we tried to light the sage. After a few attempts, where the fire bent around the sage, and I mean literally was repelled by the stick, Matt stood far away enough and it lit. Once we were fully saged, and we were all feeling significantly better and were ready to sleep, it was probably around 2.30 a.m. I got back to Matt's room, now completely comfortable around him for the first time in two days, and we got into bed. Matt and I spoke for a while about random things, nothing ghostly, and I ended up feeling very comfortable and happy as we eventually stopped talking and he drifted off. I'm a bit of an insomniac, it takes me a while to doze off, so I usually go on my phone until I start to feel sleep grasping at me. That was when it happened. It started with a very faint tap that I paid not too much mind to, but in hindsight, I didn't know the source. Then the dogs from the suburb across the uni went nuts. It was a very faint sound, but they were certainly disturbed. Nothing made me think it was anything paranormal until multiple things happened at once. The room went very still and silent, as if a ward of cotton had replaced the air. The heater stopped, 
The faint noises of breathing stopped, even Matt next to me was silent, and then my legs went icy, icy cold, unnaturally cold. The rest of my body was warm, but my legs were freezing. Then my whole body just as suddenly became uncomfortably hot. Initially, I was worried. I was having a stroke or heart attack or something. Finally, an all-consuming, overwhelming, intense feeling of evil permeated everything. It was evil and angry, and like nothing I'd ever felt before. I couldn't link it to a specific spot in the room, but I knew it was strongest near Matt. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't speak. I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis because I'd been on my phone the whole time and wasn't remotely sleepy. I could also move freely and didn't feel paralyzed. So I sat bolt upright and felt a panic attack approaching. I'm usually not one to cry very easily and I'm never one to have a panic attack, but this rendered me to both. I was sitting upright and praying with everything I could for this thing to go away. I was shaking and crying. I didn't want to wake the others to ask them if they could feel it too because I knew it would anger it. I didn't end up needing to wake them though because Matt suddenly awoke with a start. It scared the life out of me because his voice cut the silence, asking if I was okay. But I wasn't. The thing was now feeling more evil than ever. I couldn't speak, I just sat there terrified. Matt then went dead silent and said, you feel that right? I couldn't even nod. I was praying with everything I could muster and I'm not even religious. I was just repeating in my mind that I meant no harm and that I'm sorry if I offended it. I remember saying aloud, something is very bad and Matt just nodded looking terrified. Eventually, after what felt like a lifetime of prayers, the feeling began to diminish and everything slowly felt calm again. Noise returned, the breathing of others in the dorm, the heater cranked on and the wind outside resumed. Whatever it was seemed to have left. Once I felt safe enough to lie down, Matt and I snuggled up together and tried our best to fall asleep. I was worried the thing would return when Matt fell asleep in order to attack him when he was vulnerable. But thank God it didn't. My sleep was ridden with nightmares about spirits and I woke up unnaturally early. In the morning though, I seemed to feel okay. Matt and I spoke, but he reckons we were both freaked out of the back of a really creepy night. That's weird though, as that's before the encounter with whatever it was. I was not even remotely scared. To be honest, when I went to bed that night, I was still pretty skeptical that there was even a spirit to begin with. Not that morning though. I'm still convinced that it was a spirit in the room that night, as I've never felt anything before or since like that. I've watched horror movies, intentionally freaked myself out in creepy places before, and only that night did I feel some sort of presence. I asked Kyle, Ash and Key that morning if we should have become concerned about it visiting our room, and they told us that if whatever it was wanted to hurt us, it would have done so. They said they believe it was more of a warning for us to leave it alone, more of a threat than an act of violence. We also then discovered, as Darcy went back to the bush that day, Matt and I declined the invite, that their well-structured, carefully constructed fort that could carry the weight of all of them had collapsed in the night. It wasn't a stormy night. It wasn't any more windy than any other night had been. But the fort had entirely caved in upon itself, almost as if it had been trampled by a large creature. Whether these things are coincidences or not, I'm not sure but it sure freaked the hell out of me. I have not had any odd experiences since, but I also have not returned to the forest, and I still don't know if I want to or not. This event happened around 2013 when I was 14 years old. I've never experienced hallucinations in my life, and my family has neither. Back then, the Slenderman hype was at its peak, and of course I wanted to reenact the game with my brother. So I drew some figures similar to the game on some A4 paper sheets and went into the woods next to my residence. It was midday, and my brother, two years younger than me, was fiddling with some sticks at the entrance to the woods. Meanwhile, I was nailing the sheets of paper to some trees. Even though it was sunny, I felt like this place had a weird vibe to it this day. So dumb me continued nailing the papers to trees, 
thinking that the atmosphere would make the game even better. About 10 to 15 minutes later, I started nailing the papers. I came upon an old fallen tree with its roots sticking out of the ground. As I passed it, I felt something strange going on. It wasn't a sound, just a feeling that I had to turn around. As I did exactly that, I saw an approximately 2.5 meter tall figure, all black except its face, standing around four to five meters away from me. It had no facial features and just stood there watching me. The whole encounter lasted about two seconds before I was turned back around, screamed at the top of my lungs and bolted towards my brother's location. I was in total panic, running like my life depended on it. I felt relieved when I saw my brother fiddling with some rocks on the side of the road. I tried to explain what happened to him, but he thought I was messing with him. The game was cancelled, and I made sure to stay by his side while taking off all the pictures I'd nailed to trees. I went back to the spot of the encounter with him, examined it clearly trying to tell myself I'd just seen an illusion or something, but nothing even remotely resembled the figure. I kept this encounter mostly to myself, I never told it anywhere, thinking people would write it off as a troll post or spooky story. My family are also heavily religious and I doubt they'd believe me. The whole thing happened in France, in the 92nd department. To this day I still have no explanation to what I saw. Could it have been an entity of some kind? I didn't get a clear look, but my instincts told me to run. But I'm sure that there was something there. This happened a few years ago, when I was working at my childhood summer camp. I've certainly gotten strange feelings around the area before, but nothing especially malevolent or frightening. My coworker and I were taking our group for a sleep out, up in some shelters about half a mile into the woods and away from the rest of camp. I'm used to being in the woods, and I generally don't scare easy even at night. So when I woke up in the wee hours of the morning, I set out for the latrines without a second thought. I figured it was around 4 or 5 a.m. based on the red glow of the horizon. The light fell softly through the trees, illuminating the path and the colour side of the shelters. The walk was only a few hundred yards, but felt longer with only my flashlight. I was about halfway there before I heard something behind me. Again, I knew these woods. I knew what most of the animals in the area sound like, from the camp's horses to the local family of black bears. Whatever this was, it was huge. Its presence seemed to close in on me from all around, and I could hear twigs snapping, vines tearing, mud squelching underfoot. I'm not fast. I knew that running on uneven path in the dark wouldn't get me far. So I walked. I walked like I owned the woods slowly and deliberately until I reached the light on the side of the latrine. The presence then faded. I was even starting to feel good, confident, like I could keep going, keep walking through the dark wood until I reached the sunrise. I had to tell myself to stop, to turn where I meant to turn, and eventually I returned to the shelter and fell asleep. Maybe I would have forgotten about it, if not for the sunrise. I've watched so many sunrises over the lake I should have known better. That red light in the woods wasn't in the east where it should have been. It was out on the west side of the pasture, blood red and a little too bright for where it was pretending to be. The more I think about it, the more it felt like I was being herded somewhere. I haven't met anyone with a similar experience, but my friends have theories from fairies to alien abduction. I'm not sure I believe that but I'll never go into that part of the woods alone, again. I live down in Georgia, deep in the country in Dublin, where the closest store is six miles away. I've lived in the country for half my life, recently returning to it. But let me elaborate on what happened. Me and my buddy Sean were sitting at our bonfire. As we have an RV, and when it gets dark out there, it gets very dark. So we were making jokes and talking about things and looking at the stars when the dog we have on our side started barking and growling aggressively before going silent. 
So Sean and I got up, grabbed my shotgun, and walked over to check it out, thinking he just saw a raccoon or something. But when we made it over there, he was standing still staring into the woods, and we heard something mimic the way the dog was barking, but deeper, more guttural. I'm not really sure how to describe it accurately, but when we heard it, instead of investigating, we fled back to the RV, locked it, and the noises stopped. But later in the night, we heard something walking around the trailer slowly before going off. I'm not sure what it could have been, but we were very scared. So Sean and I had this girl, Liberty, round, and we decided to have a campfire that night. After the frustrations of having to fight the fire and be able to cook the hot dog and bratwursters. The thing is, we didn't have long enough metal poles. I built a fire that was too big, and it was hot. So we decided to leave the baby in the RV and just chill, have s'mores and hot dogs as we passed around Lager. We started hearing noises that sounded like laughter in the woods, similar to mine, and a bunch of mumbling before all was quiet. The dog wasn't doing anything, and it hadn't barked all day or night, so we were freaked out a bit, but decided to stay outside and be ballsy and make jokes. But it stopped, and eventually, we cooled it back down and kept talking at the campfire. Then the motion lights behind the RV turned on and went to go check. There was nothing. So we went back to our seats when the motion lights next to the dog pen turned on and something dark was laying behind the dog fence, covered mostly by the hill that meant the road. You know how roads have sewer systems and the ground dips before coming back up again. And when the lights turned off and I shined the flashlights over there, nothing was there. So once again, pretty much paranoid, we returned to the fire, which was almost out and Liberty said she saw something off to the side, which we sort of ignored, as she was quite scared and has schizophrenia. So between her demons, which she already sees, and what was real, we couldn't tell. After that, there were no incidences for a while, before I turned to my left. There's two trees right in front of the dog pen, and I decided to flash the flashlight over there, and I saw something duck behind the tree something big and dark, which at that point we decided to call a night. We went back inside the RV, locked and shut all the doors and windows and added covers to them. I'm sharing this with you almost immediately after it happened and we're unsure what's going on. There was this one road that cut through a fairly deep forest that had train tracks running perpendicular and were also slightly elevated. It was pretty fun if you're in an SUV because you could get some air. However, if you were in a car, you couldn't see the other side. And if not exactly entirely in your lane, you would crash into an incoming car. Many people died there. And I think there was also some mythology around it, like a Native American burial ground or something. Anyway, we went ghost hunting as we'd heard many rumors about that spot. And screw me if as soon as we were walking near the train tracks, some bright blue goddamn orbs popped out of nowhere, floating about four feet off the ground. It was maybe 12 feet in front of us and around 10 inches in diameter. We looked at each other to see if everyone else was seeing this, looked back at the orb, looked back at each other, and then booked our asses out of there. This is one of the craziest things I've ever seen, and I don't have a way to explain it. When I was about 14, my friend and I went bow hunting on his dad's property. Mainly we just walked around the woods all day messing around. As it started to get dark, he called his dad to pick us up, so he would drive us to his mum's house. His dad asked us to wait at a certain spot right by the road at the edge of the property. It quickly got very dark, and for some reason, I don't even remember why, we waited sitting down facing each other about 50 feet from the road, in a spot that was pretty dense with trees. 
There was absolutely nothing around here but the road and the trees for at least a mile. We were talking about whatever 14 year olds talk about when suddenly I saw light hitting my face. It came from above. I looked up, but I couldn't see what exactly or how high it was. It was very focused, white, and only seemed to hit my face, nothing around me. My friend also saw it, and both of us were very panicked and freaked out. The light hadn't come on and then moved to my face. It was on me from the moment it came on. It shone for about three, maybe five seconds, and then went back off. There didn't seem to be anything in the trees or above them, although it was damn dark, but we were both convinced it came from the trees. We heard nothing, even though the night was super quiet, and we both said nothing the moment it appeared. We booked it to the road and waited for his dad. I'm still freaked out by this some 15 years later. My boyfriend and I are solidly freaked out at what happened the last two nights, as it had me convinced something bad is in the woods behind his house. For context, my boyfriend lives in northeast Pennsylvania in the boonies. He has an expanse of at least 500 acres of woods behind his home. There are no power sources for any structures in the woods, and the man who owns the property already told us there's nothing out there that he's aware of that could be used causing this. We've talked to the neighbors, and they are just as confused as we are. You see, for the last month, we have been seeing a bright light in the middle of the woods behind my boyfriend's house. I want to say about three quarters of a mile away. Big and bright enough to see through the trees. It comes on around dusk and goes out about 10 p.m. It's the same spot every single night. We had gone out during the day to investigate if there were any power lines or deer stands with solar lights or anything like that, but found nothing, just wilderness. Last night, my boyfriend decided to go out and investigate on his own. I asked him to not go alone, but he armed himself to the teeth with firearms and made his way in the dark after spotting the light. He gets about 200 yards from where this light is and it vanishes, gone does a 360 to look for it and sees nothing. He's texting me during all of this and immediately I told him to get the hell out of there. The night previous I had been over and around 9.30 we pulled up to the house after getting something to eat and I looked into the woods. I didn't see a light, but I was immediately gripped with that primal fear that something was watching us. I was so terrified once I got inside the house, I couldn't look through the windows without wanting to burst into tears. I've never experienced that fear at his home before. I'm used to his woods and the dark, but this was different. So he heeds my warning and starts trekking back to his house. He gets up a hill about halfway back and turns to see the light has reappeared, only it's much lower to the ground. He watches it for a while and it begins to move through the trees. Behind his property is a large pipeline right of way. So there is an open kind of field before the tree line and it comes through the tree line and into the field at the bottom of this hill. He watches it and tells me it's moving very slowly, but the light is bright and large. He says the wind was still blowing and swirling around him, but nothing was blowing directly on him, and he felt like he was being watched. The light begins to move up the hill towards him, and he makes a run back to his house and jumps into his truck, because whatever it is, he doesn't want it to follow him inside the house. Now this vehicle is backed in the driveway and facing away from the woods, so he can see what's going on in his rearview mirrors. He sits for 10 minutes and says, the eerie feeling is gone. I tell him to wait. He begins to see some flashes of light. He's on the phone with me at this point and he sounds scared and he's pretty damn fearless. I've never heard him this worried. Then he says he saw a figure pass in front of a mower he has sitting in the yard that he can see in his rear view. It's here, something's here. This rifle isn't gonna do a damn thing. He sits in silence with me on the phone. Something passed in front of the street light. Something's making a shadow on the street light. Mind you, it's only his house and his neighbor's house across the street about 200 yards away. One street light at a right corner of his house. There's a shadow passing through this light about 10 feet up in the air. 
I tell him to put on his late grandfather's coat and make a run for the house. He gets inside and said the feeling was still with him. His dog isn't acting strange, but his bedroom door is wide open, and so is his basement too. His entire house was locked up right when he left, and his basement door is always shut. It swings out too, so the dog couldn't have opened it, and his bedroom door was shut before he left. Swings in, but was latched closed. Again, something the dog can't open. Nothing else seemed to transpire for the rest of the evening, and he didn't see anything weird outside the windows. By the time the adventure was over, it was about 10 p.m. This all transpired during the course of two and a half to three hours. So it's safe to say we will probably be heading out again sometime this week together and try to figure out what the light is again. It made no noise, was way too big to be a flashlight, and we are just scared out of our wits and dumbfounded as to what it could be. With that being said, the floor is open to theories or similar experiences any of you have to share. The woods was certainly an experience. Perhaps too many horrors for one lifetime, but I'm glad to be free of them. But something feels odd, wrong even. Almost like reality isn't everything it seems. I'm feeling a tad glitchy. As have these people who have experienced a number of curious events that cannot be explained. Perhaps you can explain them away. Let me know what you think down below. But for now, join me with these Glitch in the Matrix stories. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of lights move across the sky. Keep in mind the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amount of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down and just lay down on the snow, looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. It doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one night in particular, without asking my parents, as it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be retrospective. It wasn't all that interesting of a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring, actively affecting the magnetic field. And that's when I started noting a clicking noise. At first, I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was there must be an animal nearby, in which case I needed to get out of there fast. You don't really want to mess with a wild animal, but the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding, and again the source of the sound wasn't coming from anywhere around me, laterally. It was coming from up, so naturally I look up determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see, stars, northern lights, and some lazy satellites floating across the sky, all normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I noticed something strange in the aurora borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring with morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still, only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk and clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops, the lights are gone, the clicking is not heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking perhaps I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer to start up than usual, and I am beginning to worry. But soon it's running and I'm heading back to my town. 
as I'm driving back several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine or some strange northern light behaviour etc. Probably not that big of a deal. I pull up to my house, lights are all dark, strange. It wasn't like that when I left. I open the outer doors as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear and enter the inner door. The house is quiet, really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anyone noticing. Proves to be easy as I'm soon under my covers and go set my alarm for the next day. When all of a sudden everything made sense. Engine hard to start, stiff rather chilly, nobody up when I was gone for what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11pm when I left and now it was creeping up to 6am. I stood staring at clicking lights for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late night snow machine rides anymore. It was the early 2000s. It's 3 a.m. and my house phone starts ringing. The phone was on the other side of the room. I stand up on the bed and start heading for the low dresser to answer it and my wife gets up to get the phone as well. By this time it's at the third ring, and I remember thinking, crap, it's going to go to voicemail. The ringing stops. My cell phone starts ringing, and I immediately change gears to, someone really needs to get a hold of me. I grab my phone, and the caller ID is just 0000, lots of them. I answer, hello? and a voice comes through the line, as though it were a distant overseas call, parting through the static and asking, Is this Joel? To which I replied, Yes, who is this? Immediately, it was as though those words, Is this Joel? were being pulled back through the line, echoing in reverse. There was static, and the call dropped. Jump forward several years. I'm installing a phone system, and we're joking around that it's so advanced, it could place calls back in time. I punch in my old phone number and call it, realizing the number is still active and that my wife may answer. I hang up and call my now years old and retired phone number. Someone answers. I freak out and ask, is this Joel? The voice on the other end of the line answers, through space and time, yes, who is this? At that instant, I immediately remember taking that call, and I am struck dumb. I cannot speak without thinking. I reflexively pressed the hang-up button. I am now freaked out. I look over to my colleague who isn't as freaked out as I am. From his perspective, I called a number, and someone had the same number and answered. But he realized that was my voice on the other end of the line. I told him, I got that call. It was five years ago, but I got that call. Then we both freak out. I hit redial and get a message that the number is no longer in service. I call my home back and my wife answers. I tell her I'm testing a phone system and ask if she had any previous calls. Nope. None. I'm kind of freaking out, but with her on speakerphone I ask her, Hey, do you remember that 3am call we got all those years back? Yeah? Where I asked, is this Joel and the line went dead? Yeah? I'm just looking at my colleague with my wife still on speaker. Do you remember what year that was? Hmm, it was before we had kids, so it would have had to have been around 2002 time frame. I don't know how to say this, but I'm pretty sure it was me that called. A few weeks ago, my friend's dad told me a pretty bizarre story that scarred me for life. About 15 years ago, my friend's parents, Michael and Julia, were woken up at 1am by a very loud thud that rattled the house. Worried that one of the kids had fallen out of the bunk bed, Michael went downstairs to check on them, but the kids were sound asleep and safe in their beds. Julia told Michael to check the house in case of intruders, and Michael checked the doors and windows before going to take a look outside. 
After about ten minutes of investigating, he found nothing unusual and went back inside to go to bed. He found his wife absolutely worried sick and demanded to know where the hell he'd been and what happened. Confused and tired, Michael told her he found nothing and tried to calm her down before she pointed out it was now 4 a.m. and that he had been missing for three hours. She had even gone outside to check on him and he was nowhere to be found and didn't respond to her calling his name. Unable to figure out what happened, they returned to bed and slept until Michael had to get up for work a few hours later. Michael owns a painting business and a few hours after working on this house, he notices his eyes start to feel itchy. Then his eyes start to burn. Then after a few hours, his eyes burned so badly, he was holding his eyelids open to not blink because it felt like his lids were sandpaper against his eyes. His employees rushed him to hospital and Michael was treated for second degree flash burns on his eyes. He was told his burns were the equivalent of staring at welder torches without eye protection for an extended period of time. His eyes were treated and he was lucky to have his vision fully restored. He is one of the most stand-up guys I know and the way he told this story gave me the creeps. Dead serious and no explanation for what happened. His wife was there too and she was visibly upset when he was telling me that story. I have always loved the outdoors. I was fortunate enough to be born in the Great Pacific Northwest, the Western Washington Cascades to be exact. My father and I spent much of my early years of life exploring the mountains, fishing and hunting. There are parts of the Cascades I know like the back of my hand. One of those places is called Goblin Creek, up the Index Galima Road off Highway 2. When I was a kid, we would drive up there to do some fishing and shooting, but also to collect a specific type of rock that when cut in half polished would resemble a scenic picture of the view of the mountains from within a cave. I do not recall the true name of the stone, we just called them picture rocks. My father's friend and neighbour owned an art gallery slash mineral shop that used to be a church. If you have ever driven through Startup, on your way up from Sultan to Gold Bar on Highway 2, you might remember seeing the robot sculpture outside the shop that my dad built. This is the place that we sold the stone for $2 a pound. It was lucrative revenue for a preteen. The walk from the creek where we harvested these rocks to the dirt road wasn't particularly long, but lengthy enough that you could presumably get lost while en route if one didn't know where to go. In the years we spent at the creek, I had only ever seen two other people out there. One was a game warden that heard the gunshot from our target practicing session and tracked us down to make sure everything was fine. The other is the subject of my curiosity. When I was about 14, I distinctly remember hauling a backpack full of these rocks up from the creek to my dad's truck. Along the way, I ran into a man that looked to be about 30 years old. We both appeared to be surprised, as we would, running into anyone in this rather remote section of the mountains. But as I got closer to this man as he was standing down near the creek and I heading up the road, he seemed to grow increasingly more startled, as if he was seeing a ghost. He didn't say anything as I passed. He just stared at me, seemingly trying to figure out the appropriate words to ask me something. After I passed him, I remember thinking how much this guy looked like he could be in my family. The similarities were striking, and I continued on to the truck, dumped my load of rocks off at the truck and headed back down to the river with my dad. When I arrived, I told him about the encounter and asked him if he had seen this man, to which he replied that he had not. I have remembered this encounter quite vividly since then. Last year, I was visiting my family in Snohomish and decided to visit up Old Goblin Creek for nostalgic purposes. It had been about 15 years since I was last up there. Along the way up, I found out that the Index Galima Road had apparently washed out years before. Luckily, I knew of another way up, via Jack Pass. I found the dirt road and parked where my dad used to park, 
and proceeded to walk through the woods down to the creek. Along the way, I saw something that shook me to my core. As I was about halfway through the woods, I was startled to see someone else coming up from the creek. A boy, about 14 years old. He was wearing a backpack that looked to be burdened by heavy weights. And as we got closer, I began to get increasingly confused and shocked, as the boy looked exactly like I did at his age. I meant to say something to him as he passed, but could not figure out the right words to express what I was thinking at that moment. He passed me and kept going. I walked a little ways and finally stopped, when it all really hit me. I remember both the encounter from my teenage years and realized I had just lived the other half of that experience. Both the man and the boy were me, roughly 15 years removed. I turned around to catch up to the boy in the thick, western Washington woods. I ran all the way back up the road to where my truck was, to find nothing. There wasn't anyone else there besides the road for him to go down, and I hadn't stood so long as to not be able to catch him up. He was simply gone. Curiosity got the best of me, so I hurried down to the creek half, expecting to find my dad fishing on the bank, 15 years younger, but found no one. I ended up going home, and decided that this experience was too unbelievable to even tell my friends and family. I just wanted to get this out to this wonderful community, to see what others thought, and hopefully know if anyone has had any kind of experience like this as well. I went camping with my buddy when we were 15 or so. We walked down from his family camper to sneak a cigarette in the field at the front of the campground. While standing there we saw a light in the sky moving, erratically, in all directions really fast, very slow and everything in between. Fascinating. We finished our smoke and headed back to the camper. As we walked up, his mother came racing out to us, absolutely irate, frightened. She said they had been looking for us for three hours. They had checked the field that we were in, and we weren't there. In our minds, we hadn't been gone more than 15 minutes. We lost three hours of our life and never found out how or why, and never got to the bottom of it. This is my dad's story, and he shared it with me when I was about 10 or 11. When he was around 22, he was out of town visiting some friends around 30 miles from where his parents lived. Being the kind of person who was a clean freak, he hated having stubble and a beard of any kind. So he called his parents from his friend's house phone and said he'd be back in around 45 minutes or so and then hung up. Now. He said that the faster route was on a country road that skipped out any major dual carriageways, and after around 20 minutes of driving, and around 5 minutes after getting onto this country road, he said he saw an incredibly bright white light, and thought it was a broken down car in a side road. He got out of the car and investigated, but the white light promptly got brighter, then vanished. At this point, he was crapping himself, so he jumped back in his car and concentrated on the road ahead and finally got home. As he got into the driveway of his parents' house, they ran outside to him crying and hugging him as he was getting out of the car. Being incredibly confused, he asked them what happened. They told him that after he called them, they were waiting for him to get home, but he didn't get home that night. Apparently, it had been three days since his phone call. After calming down and calming his parents down, he went to his bedroom and glanced at himself in the mirror. As he walked past it, he had a freaking stubbly beard on the go. To this very day, no one knows what happened that night, and his family hate talking about it. Back in 1987, I was sitting in class, and had to this day, the most intense and vivid daydream I'd ever experienced. I was sitting in class looking at the clock, when the next thing I know I'm walking through the mall with a woman who I've never met before. I was an adult, and I knew she was my girlfriend. 
As we were walking and talking, some guy started shooting people randomly. Before I had the chance to react, I felt something like a punch to my chest. When I looked down, I was standing over my own body, with a pool of blood spreading around it. I watched the chaos of the scene unfold in real time. My girlfriend was over my body screaming, and I was trying to comfort her. I watched the police neutralize the shooter. Then the other emergency workers cleared the scene. I watched them remove my body. I tried to follow, but I was unable to leave the mall. I lived slash haunted the mall for a few years. As a spirit, I was bored, so I would mess with the security guards during the night shift. During the business hours, I would try to interact with the customers. Every now and then, I would get someone to nod hello or walk around me so we wouldn't collide. I remember an elderly man sitting on one of the resting benches have a heart attack. As he was standing over his body, I walked over to comfort him. I had an overwhelming feeling that it wasn't his time to die, and told him so. He climbed and sank back into his body as the emergency workers were resuscitating him. One day I was sitting on one of the resting benches as a young boy around the age of six or seven sat down next to me. He started talking to me, and when he did, I felt something weird happen and I knew I was about to leave with him. I became his invisible friend. His name was Brian, and was the only child of a single mother. She was an abusive alcoholic. I helped him survive life. I taught him not to talk about me, so that they wouldn't think he was crazy. I experienced being with Brian for years. When he was about 10 years old, his mother came home drunk. She went into a drunken tirade and hit Brian. I lost my temper and was able to slam her into the wall. She never hit him again after that. I watched him grow into a teenager, and when he was 18, I knew that my time with him had come to an end. We said our goodbyes, and just like that, the daydream was over. I looked at the clock and maybe a minute had passed. I had experienced just short of two decades of existence as a ghost in a minute of time. Where I live, there's a train that goes from my school to my home. The distance between those stations is about 15 minutes. One day, my friend and I left school together and boarded the train. We were both getting off at the same stop. Let's just say the station at the train is station one, and our home is station five. The distance between each station is about three minutes. We boarded at 3 p.m. and chat. I've taken this train more than a hundred times before, meaning we know how long it takes, what our stop looks like, etc. Even the train announcer announces the stations as well. We constantly look outside for scenery to tell us it's our stop, and keep checking our watches and the stations we're at. We continue chatting, and then, as usual, we get off the train. We exit, turn right, and take the escalator down, and... it's not there. Confused, we give a quick look around and notice we're not at Station 5, we're at Station 8. No problem, we just sat past it, right? So we checked our watch. 3.15. Both him and I have never been able to deduce what happened. The time needed to reach Station 8 would have been at least 10 more minutes. The train itself is automatic, so the distance and time never need to change. We take the opposite train and discuss what happened. We both saw the last station the train announced was Station 4, and was at the scenery we saw a million times over passing by a school we always used as our landmark. Up to this day, I can't find a reasonable explanation of what happened, and it still creeps me out to this day. When I was in high school, I had a habit of taking power naps while everyone was having lunch. I'd curl up in a quiet part of the hallway, put my jacket over my face, and sleep for maybe 15 minutes. This one time I was startled out of sleep by a passing crowd of fellow students. Everyone was in a rush to make it in before our strict teacher would start taking notes of absences. I ran after the crowd, 
walked up the stairs straight into the right classroom and sat at the only desk that was left for me. The teacher told us to open our books. Then the world froze, and suddenly the situation sort of reset. I was back in the hallway, blinking sleep out of my eyes because I'd been awoken by passing students. I thought it was a funny coincidence, some sort of brain fart. I went upstairs after the others and sat at the same empty desk. The teacher told us to open our books, and again, reset. The same two or so minutes, woke up to a noise, go upstairs after the others, sit at the same desk, teacher tells the class to open the books, replayed again. For the first few loops, while it was still more interesting than terrifying, I had so many questions. Was I having an intense nightmare, going insane or something? I was and am an atheist, with zero belief in anything paranormal, so no options other than, this isn't real, didn't cross my mind. Some loops later, I started doing all these things I'd read about online to see if it was a dream. You know, reading signs, trying to put my hand through a wall while looking away, that kind of stuff. Everything seemed as real as reality to me. My theory and contemplation got more outlandish though. If there was some sort of complex temporal situation going on, the loop would continue indefinitely. Would that mean I'd eventually die of hunger? At the same time, I tried to mess around with the loop itself to see if something would happen, deviating from the route, but nothing happened. I tried staying in the hallway or going outside, but after about two or so minutes, I was always back in the hallway regardless of my actions. I tried to engage other students and teachers, but everyone seemed preoccupied with their own tasks. If I managed to get someone to talk to me, they were always irritated with whatever I did to deviate them from the loop. You shouldn't skip class, or the teachers are going to be mad if we're late. I get the same default responses and same tones over and over. I even tried to injure myself with scissors, an incredibly ill-advised move, I know, but at this stage I was basically out of my mind with fear. Luckily, it only resulted with the loop ending faster. I honestly didn't know how many repeats of the loop I experienced, because as soon as I stopped counting as I was getting more and more scared, I stopped wondering about the inexplicable hows and whys. As far as I could tell, the situation could not be explained, at least not by me, and I was the only variable in the loop. So I became obsessed with the idea that perhaps a certain behavior was required or expected of me. I had seen the time loop trope in fiction before, but in those scenarios there was usually some sort of event that had to either be prevented or instigated. In my case, there was nothing. My self-imposed goal became to stop acting like I was aware of the loop, so I tried to replicate my behavior from the first loop down to the finest detail to my best recollection, but that changed nothing. But I latched onto the idea of perfecting this routine because I had nothing else. Loop after loop of the same thing, they all blurred together in my memory. When you're scared of a fate potentially worse than death, it's incredibly easy to stop asking questions and just function on autopilot. The thing is, I'd have written the whole thing off as a dream, if not for the very last loop. By then I'd completely accepted my fate of living in some sort of limbo where the loop no longer reset. My teacher told the class to open our books, and when I usually would have woken up in the hallway again, the world hung, I guess. I don't know how else to describe it. Time seemed to pause for less than a second, just like you might experience in a game when you quick save, and then the teacher went on with a lesson of the day, and life resumed. I don't know what to do with this experience, other than share it on the internet, in the hope that someone is amused for a few minutes, or perhaps if they've got answers to what the hell happened that day. I had just been watching a show that was talking about alternate realities and time travel, and it got me thinking about something that happened to me many, many years ago. I'm going to take you back to 1967. We moved into this house in Martinez, California, on Adelaide Drive. I had some weird stuff happen at this place that, to this day, still perplexes me. But I'll try and keep this on the subject of my blue steamer trunk that I found in the tool shed of this residence shortly after we moved in. 
I say my blue steamer trunk because it literally had my name on it, first and last. It was taped on the top center of the trunk with the raised letters plastic label maker tape. I found it while exploring the property and wandered into the tool shed aside from the main house. I go inside and ask my mum and dad if it's something they had hid from me and would be mine soon or maybe that belonged to my auntie after whom I was named. They both said no, but suggested it could have belonged to a previous tenant as we were renting the home. So I let it go for a bit, which was odd for me because I was quite the inquisitive child and had always sought answers to all the mysteries of life. I had no idea if my name was common or not, as I was simply ten. Sometime later, I got friendly with the landlady who lived just one street over, and asked her if someone with my name had ever lived there, and explained about the trunk that should be returned to the rightful owner. But she went on to say that I was the only person with that name ever to live there, and suggested perhaps my parents were just hiding a gift for perhaps my birthday or Christmas. But I knew better. My parents were not the types to think that far ahead about gifts, and I would most likely be the recipient of a last minute gift from the grocery store or something from a thrift store or hand-me-down. I tried to put it out of my mind for a while, and it worked. Our dad and my older brother Jack had used the shed to store tools and stuff for working on the car, but neither of them ever mentioned seeing this blue streamer trunk that took up a large amount of space for the relatively small shed. I remember that Jack had removed the transmission from his old car and stored it in said shed because of the minimal space. It was practically in the middle of the floor, set next to the trunk that was placed neatly under the workbench. Then one Sunday in late spring, I had a great idea for a slumber party. Remember this was the time of the hippie protests and things like sit-ins and even love-ins were all the rage. So I decided to have a bacon when me and my chosen list of guests would bring their favorite cookie recipes and bake cookies for fun, entertainment, and of course, the all important ingredients for a slumber party, snacks. All in all, it went pretty well, although my poor parents had to deal with a loud gaggling of a constant train of young girls trapezing back and forth from the patio and the kitchen and bathroom. Whoever thought to build a four bedroom house with only one bathroom never had to deal with a preteen bladder. When it got late, we finished cleaning up the kitchen. Though I'm sure the patio was a lot messier, we washed our faces, brushed our teeth, and put our pajamas on, and prepared for lights out at midnight. Of course, we rolled into our sleeping bags and pillows and such to pretend that we were going to sleep. We were so high on sugar that we had no intention of doing just that. We tried to play quietly, but if you can ever find a way to have a pillow fight quietly, I'd like to know how, because we certainly did not succeed. My older sister, who was up and sneaking talking to her boyfriend on the phone, told me that if mum got up and found her on the phone because of us, that we would regret it for the rest of our lives. As you can imagine, we decided on a quieter game. We got into a circle with me standing in the center as the other girl sat on the floor and were trying to do what is now called light as a feather, stiff as a board. Although I wasn't lying down, I'm not sure what we chanted. It was dark except for the street light. I was watching myself in the reflection from the window and saw myself start to rise. It freaked me out, so I looked down at the other girl to see if they were seeing what was happening. Most of them had their eyes closed and were saying something like, rise in unison. It was then I noticed that Eleanor Nichols had her eyes open with her jaw gaping. She and I looked at one another and screamed. I promptly fell the six inches or so that I had been raised. Everyone had stopped their chant in fright and my mum popped through the door and yelled that we'd better shut up and go to bed right now. We tried, well, some girls made it, but Eleanor and I were still too freaked out to sleep. I get up and ruffled through my top dresser drawer, took out a cigarette and matches I had hidden there and motioned to Eleanor to get up as we tiptoed out the door. We peeked out to see my sister sitting there watching the door. We weren't gonna leave that way. The only other way was to climb out the bedroom window and go back around to sneak a smoke. So that's exactly what we did. I took the Salem menthol cigarette, placed it to my lips and struck the match. 
and as I did so, I saw my little sister coming around the corner of the patio, closest to the back door. She just wanted to share the smoke, but when I said no, I was blackmailed into giving to her son because she was the baby girl, and mum would believe whatever she wanted to make about me. So I passed it to Eleanor, and she passed it to Sylvia, who of course got hotboxed by it, taking too many drugs. I stomped it out, and thought we'd go back to my room to try to sleep. This is where things get a bit more weird. I thought we went back in the house via the front door where Sylvia came out. Deb, our big sister, wasn't in the hallway, so we got back in the room and our sleeping bags with no issues. However, I awoke just around dawn sleeping on the floor of the tool shed next to the freaking blue steamer trunk that had my name on it. Suddenly the shed door opens and it's Eleanor and my little sister. They say something like, you win hide go seek, we've been looking for you since last night after the smoke. I just laughed and went along with the idea that I'd hidden there on purpose, but I was perplexed. It's strange, but when you're a kid you can somehow let stuff you can't wrap around your head just go and proceed with whatever comes next, or maybe it was an aspect of the trunk to mask our thoughts about it. Such weirdness was a part of this time. I tell this short event to help express that many other strange and weird and even borderline outrageous things happened at the house. Not sure if it was just the trunk or the location that was the vortex of weirdness. But anyway, my brother graduated high school, joined the army and was sent off to Vietnam. Our parents started having even more issues than before when I was 12. Things were changing. I finally went into the shed and extracted the trunk. Nobody could tell me how it got there or why my name was on it but I slowly opened it. It never had a lock on it, but for some reason I never thought to open it, nor had any other member of the family. Who doesn't open something like that? It had been there for nearly three years, yet with all of my questions about it, I'd never once as much peeked inside. Let me tell you, my sisters were always going through my stuff. Anyway, this part is a bit confusing. There was a picture of a girl called Yvonne Streeter, although my sister said it was just her friend Debbie Streeter. A few years later, when incarcerated in Juvenile Hall, I met Yvonne Streeter. Yes, Debbie Streeter's little sister. Debbie and my sister Deb had been friends in school, and I had gotten that picture from Yvonne herself. There was also a picture of a cute chubby baby, a black nightgown, a glass water picture clear with yellow flowers, and some things that proved to be the objects that would astonish and amaze me. One was a paperback script of the play The Wizard of Oz. It had the initials PJ on it. There was also a library book for the script of the musical The Music Man. The card in the front said the last person to check it out was me. And the return date was July 30th, 1975. Remember I was 12 and this is 1969 when the trunk was first opened. How many years later I know how this trunk came to be. It was bought for me by my 26-year-old boyfriend to help me pack up stuff while I ran away to live with him in Green River, Wyoming when I was 16. I was found, returned to California, and incarcerated in Contra Costa County Juvenile Hall, where they used the label maker to put my name on it. Okay, so that happens, but there's more. I was sent to foster care in Oakdale, California, my trunk was lost for a time, but eventually got sent to me in my new home. I buckled down and managed a B average on the last semester of my junior year, as well as throughout my senior year. It was quite fun there, and without my family dogging me, I did pretty well. Senior year, I had chosen to be Glenda the Good in my high school performance of The Wizard of Oz, and I had taken the nickname PJ, as my aunt, for whom I am named, had always called me Peggy, and my middle name is Jean. I later also participated in the high school musical The Music Man, though after graduation I went back to Martinez to live with my mother and stepfather. Not a great move, but it brings me to another object found in the trunk. The library book of the script of the aforementioned musical. The local summer stock was holding auditions for The Music Man. I'd already done this musical, and I thought I'd be sure to get a singing role. I went to our local library and checked out the book. I really didn't get the correlation at the time. Really, how could I have completely missed that? I just went forward and did not give the trunk that I found as a young girl a single thought. 
So there was the picture of the cute baby. Now years before, when I'd first opened it, my mum said that it looked like my baby brother, but it wasn't. This is who it was. And now I can write it down and deal with the weirdness. In 1977, one month before my 20th birthday, I gave birth to a 10 pound, nine and a half ounce baby boy. Me and my then husband named the baby Jason Adam Nichols. Oh, my goodness. He was the baby in the picture. That's the family resemblance to my baby brother. I still don't know how or when the trunk traveled through my own timeline, but I was the one who packed it when I moved out of our house during the separation and eventual divorce from my now ex-husband. This is just some of the weird ass stuff that happened to me. It is hard for me to even write this out and still perplexes me to this day, but I know that someday I will hopefully completely understand. Now that reality seems to have regained its composure, I find myself at the foot of a church, surrounded by a most beautiful graveyard. Perhaps it's time to pay respect to our fallen comrades and recall our loved ones. So join me for this peaceful time in the graveyard. I'm sure nothing can go wrong. When I was six, my babysitter was this nice middle-aged lady and her equally nice husband. My twin brother and I were always at their house in the summer and hung out with the couple's two grandkids, another boy and girl sibling set of similar ages. This was literally my happy place. This lady had the best movie collection for a six-year-old. It's where I saw the last unicorn for the first time, as well as the little mermaid, the great mouse detective, the first land before time and the brave little toaster. And her husband was a phenomenal cook by a kid's standard. Every day was chicken nuggets and pizza day. They had kid-sized four-wheelers, a pool, a huge kid's playhouse and a jungle gym set up in the backyard. And they put on the best 4th of July show in the county for years. Six-year-old me was the happiest girl on the freaking planet. And they were some of the wealthiest people in the area too. Neither of them worked so I had no idea where the money came from, but I didn't care. One day midsummer, the two boys were being typical boys, and the little girl and I thought they were being mean. In reality, the boys wanted to play war or something, and the girls wanted to play weddings, or something similar. She and I were sad, and we refused to play with the boys. Instead, we decided to pick flowers that grew at the edge of the forest, we thought it was baby's breath, but it was really just poison hemlock. Seriously, kids, right? So we're walking along the edge of this dense forest in the middle of Banjo country in Southern Ohio. So we're walking along the edge of this dense forest in the middle of Banjo country. This was in 1990. So we weren't worried about stranger danger because we were just so far out into the country. The adults did worry about animals from time to time because the next county over had bears and mountain lions, but us six-year-olds were fearless. We ended up walking on the neighbor's property, picking these flowers when we found a break in the tree line. It was an old, well-worn path leading into the woods. For whatever reason, i.e. we were dumb, she and I decided to ditch our flowers and take the path into the woods and see what it led to. The path itself was unremarkable, well worn but unmaintained, as there were tree roots growing up through the path in places. We came upon a little bridge at one point. We were both a little confused about it, because we had been told there were no creeks in our area, yet there was a bridge. It wasn't a particularly old bridge either, but the creek bed under it was dry as a bone. Weird. We kept going because, why not I guess? I'm not sure how far we walked beyond the bridge, but we ended up in a clearing with stones all around it in a circle. The clearing was big enough that there was a gap in the trees that allowed the sunlight in, and in the middle of the circle was a massive stone-walled well. 
it was big enough that there were stairs built into the dam wall in a huge spiral. My little friend was mesmerized by the well. She found a rock and tossed it in. We never heard it hit the bottom. As we were searching for more rocks to throw in, I was rooted around in the brush by the bigger stones and actually looked at the big ones. They were not normal stones. Nope. I was a smart cookie. Ori reading at third grade level the summer before first grade, something that I loved to show off to anyone that would sit still for three seconds or more, so I could read the stupid stones. There were names and dates cut into the rough hewn stones. We were in a graveyard, in the middle of the woods, far away from our adults. I remember getting chills realizing this. Moments later, my little friend got really quiet and poked me. She pointed to the edge of the clearing on the other side of the wall. Thankfully, not the side that we had entered the graveyard on. My little heart would have exploded, I think. She was pointing at a dark shape standing just inside the woods facing us. We both stood up very slowly and stared at this dark shape. At some point, the little girl took my hand and tried to get me to leave, but I couldn't move. The fear was paralyzing. I didn't move until the clouds covered the sun and our bright, inviting clearing became slightly shadowy. Then, the shape moved. It was an adult-sized slash shaped thing, wearing long dark robes with a hood over its face. We were stupid kids, but we weren't that stupid. We both turned tail and ran as fast as our little legs allowed. My friend was faster than me because I was a chunkier kid with a love of reading and movies and pizza which leads to overweightness. Who would have thought it? So she made it to the bridge first. I wasn't far behind her though. I looked back after we got over the bridge and that thing was standing at the edge of it, just standing there. I screamed, wept myself and kept running. I tripped over a tree root in the path, ripping my pants and shredding my knee in the process. I scrambled up and kept running. We burst out the trees like our hair was on fire, screaming and crying and made a beeline for the girl's grandparents' house. Her grandfather was in the backyard planting something and came running when he heard us. We were absolutely hysterical and nothing could calm us down. We spent hours sobbing while the grandma and grandpa got us bathed and in clean clothes to try and soothe us. The more they said there was no one in the woods, the more hysterical we became. It took both of us months before we'd even go on the back deck again. Everyone was convinced we'd made up a story with our hyperactive imaginations, but the adults humored us. The kids, not so much. The next summer, we were forced into the backyard for the annual 4th of July party. Tons of kids. They all knew our story and one of the teenage boys, a badass, don't you know, called BS and bullied us for hours until we told him where the path in the woods was. And then he made us go with him. Cue another incident of me pissing my pants. Yay. To my utter relief, when we got there, she and I both remembered where the path was. There was nothing, no path. Just a very heavy growth of hemlock. He tried to wade through it and ended up with chiggers from neck to foot. And he got into a ton of trouble for dragging us kids down there once we got back. So she and I were relieved not to go back there. But from then on, all those kids thought we were stone cold liars. Fast forward 15 years later, 16 years after this all happened, my mum mentioned that the grandpa passed away a few months prior while I was off school. I was 22 at that point and had mostly forgotten the events in the woods. I expressed my condolences and asked what happened 
I mean, this guy was a friend of my mum's for 20 plus years. My mum started being evasive, so I got curious and pressed her, and she said that he had hung himself in their garage. Jesus, wow, okay, that sucks. And then she told me the bad part. His granddaughter, my little friend, was the one that found his body. All around him were notebooks with crazy writings he had amassed over a very long time. Some dating back to the early 70s, apparently. Detailing his dealings with demons and spirits and other crazy things. He had left notes for all of his loved ones. The note for his granddaughter was an apology for not protecting her from the demon at the well. And the note for his wife was an apology for leaving her as it was the only way to protect her and the other people he loved. It seems that the explanation for their wealth was deals struck with the demons. After a few decades of these deals, they had started coming to collect on the debts the man owed, and what they wanted was for him to kill his family in payment. So, he killed himself instead. It was the craziest thing I'd ever heard, but it made total sense. Everyone wrote the guy off as having a serious mental health issue, threw the journals away, buried him and moved on. No investigation, nothing. I can rationalize everything we saw and experienced to some kind of weird psychological reaction to picking Hemlock. That wouldn't explain how both of us had the exact same delusion though. I know what I saw was real. I might not remember all the details nearly 30 years after, but I do remember the fear, and I still have that scar on my knee that has never faded. I'm not afraid of the woods nor the dark, nor anything like that, but I have a very healthy respect for the dead and don't mess with demons and stuff. In the immortal words of Ducky, nope, nope, nope. When I was a child, I used to have the strangest dreams. I would find myself in a sun-drenched field playing ball with a six-year-old African girl, her hair in twists, clad in a red and white checked gingham romper. Eventually, her dad, an enormous dusty farmer equipped with a pitchfork and leading a horse, would call her home. She would wave goodbye and I would seize awake. I had this dream several times, each time similar, with the difference being the game we played. Perhaps ball, maybe other times hunting for insects, or simply lazing around on the grass. I knew her name was Sarah. I knew her family worked on the land. Somehow, I knew the land. Then one night I had a lucid dream. I was in my bed asleep, and thought it was the middle of the night. Light streamed in though as if it were noon and Sarah was by my bed, tugging my nightgown sleeve. She pleaded with me to get up, to play with her. So I sluggishly rose from my bed and followed her out my room and to the foot of the stairs leading to the spooky third floor. I was suddenly leadened with dread, a feeling akin to seeing that particular look in my mother's eye before she told me my great-grandmother had died. Sarah whirled around eyes inquisitive, her playful demands to come upstairs to play, honed by something sinister. Her father appeared at the top of the stairs, horse and all, and all I could think of, this is ridiculous, how could a horse go up all those stairs? I told her I could not and would not come up and play, and she looked so sad at me, the saddest, oldest sad I'd ever seen. I woke up that morning asleep again at the foot of the stairs, with the deepest sadness I had ever felt. I never had the dream again. However, shortly thereafter, the gardeners unearthed an old hitching post in the backyard. Many years later, I went for a hike across my street in search of an apocryphal graveyard, the oldest freed black cemetery in the north. I waded through the smallish swamp in my neighbor's yard and trudged up the hill to the area I had seen marked on an ancient map. There was the cemetery, 
and visible from the road with 15 or so headstones. While many were impossible to read and others fallen and broken, one stood out. Its memorial tree had grown around it, encasing the stone in the tree, shielding it from the elements. The body beneath was named Sarah. She had died at the age of seven and had inhabited whatever structure existed where my house now stands. When I was about 15 years old, I was a very curious teenager. I had only heard stories of the Ouija board, but had never actually tried it. So one weekend, my best friend slept over, and we decided to take our chances. My mum was super against me buying one, and she would have killed me if I brought one into her house. So my best friend and I took a big poster board and made our own Ouija board. We lighted candles, turned off the lights, and at about 1 a.m., we tried it. Everyone in the house was asleep. When we started, it was slow, but the planchette started moving all across the board. I was convinced my best friend was the one moving the piece around, but she denied it, and I trusted her to not lie. We asked for a name, and they gave us Charlie. We asked their age, and they said ten, and we asked how they died, and they just said sick. After a bunch of other questions and scared skeptics, we asked how they could prove they were real, and who they said they were, and they responded with cemetery. I don't fully remember all the questions, but I know that it led to Charlie giving us some details. It was by a path and tree, small, around the year 1820. My mum's house is literally right across the street from the cemetery. I could look out the window and see directly into it. So we were very, very close. It is an extremely old historical colonial cemetery dating back to 1690. The next day, my best friend and I went over to the burial ground and started our wild goose chase for Charlie's headstone. Lo and behold, we found it, exactly as he described. His headstone was a cylinder shape. The name Charlie was listed, born 1810, died 1820. Behind the stone was a huge tree right next to a pathway. I could not believe the Ouija board actually worked. After discovering Charlie's grave, my best friend and I would visit him every day after school. We would just hang out there sometimes when we were bored. Sometimes, we would just sit next to him, smoke cigarettes and talk. Maybe Charlie was just lonely and wanted some friends. So, that's what we tried to give him. When I was younger, I was part of a youth organization of sorts. One volunteer thing we did was regularly mow and do maintenance on an old cemetery. No one had been buried there since the 80s, but once we took care of it, people started using it again. Keep in mind, it's a really rural area. We're mowing and doing other stuff one day, and I was in high school at this point. It was near the end of the day, so most people had gathered by the gates. I was in the far corner, crouched down in tall grass, in part of the unused cemetery. I was going through an old pile of flowers, finding the years and years worth of plastic flowers that had been tossed away so that they could be disposed of properly. A few young kids come over and start playing in the tall grass. They are making their way towards me, and I could tell they hadn't seen me yet. When they got close, but still hadn't seen me, I said, stop walking on my grave. They instantly froze and looked around and they took off sprinting so fast. One kid even started crying. Once my mum found out what I did, she was pissed. But I still thought it was hilarious. In March of this year, I became employed by a funeral home in my area as a student and funeral director's assistant. To paint the mental image, the funeral home is small 
and sits in the middle of a graveyard dating back to 1803. However, most of the graves there are not that old, and we still have plenty of space for future burials. The funeral home is cosy and inviting. It has a lot of natural light, and is not creepy looking in the slightest. That being said, everyone who works there tells the same story. When alone in the funeral home, whether it be day or night, the sound of some unseen person walking around can be heard. I had not been told any strange happenings until I had an experience of my own and asked others about it the next day. I had been at the funeral home at around 2 a.m., preparing paperwork to go remove a descendant from the place of death and take them into our care. When I began hearing some weird noises coming from the common area, but at first brushed it off as the AC kicking on. However, the longer I was doing paperwork, the more distinctly it sounded like someone walking around. I knew that I had disarmed the alarm myself while coming in, so I didn't really think anyone was there with me. But just to be sure, I got up, turned on my phone flashlight, and walked back there to make sure I was alone. Of course, I found nothing, but I thought it was really weird. Today I stayed later to work on a project for school that needed some of the funeral's home's materials for it. It was around 4 p.m. I was packing up a few things in the office when I began to hear the walking again. I've heard it a few times by now, and after talking about it with other people who worked there, I'm getting used to it. I was never really scared. It was just unusual or odd. But today was different. After hearing the walking for a minute or two, I began to feel watched like something was in the office with me, looking at me. I don't know if I was just more easily affected today, or if it's becoming aware that I can hear it. I went to this school for four years, and still live really close to it. The years I went to this school were the only years I had sleep paralysis. It was built on a graveyard, they moved the graveyard somewhere close by because the area wasn't big enough, so they moved it and made a school where it had been before. The bodies were not moved, because in our tradition, we don't bury the bodies within their coffins well-dressed. We bury them with white fabric wrapped around them. They're naked, and this fabric is the only clothing they have so it isn't really prudent to move the bodies. There were projections in every class. We were looking from Google, things like haunted places, possessed people and scary paranormal stuff almost every day. There were screams in our classroom sometimes with no one behind them. The girls were really scared by these. Another day, someone found some writing on a board it said sleep paralysis demon, and then it had my name and a few other personal and identifying details. On other times, the lights would start to fade, turn themselves on again, and then stop working completely. This happened just when the projection started to show the images, and then we learned that part of the light was the lighting exploding. Since we were looking at this kind of stuff in school, like ghosts and stuff, it's predictable. But we were also, apparently, summoning jinns. Basically, they are creatures that Muslims believe in. That they live in the same world as ours, but we can't see them, but they can see us. They're like spirits, I believe. One day we tried to summon a jinn, when something strange happened. Some of us who joined in the summoning went to the graveyard on a lunch break. A girl in class accidentally stepped on one of the graves and was so scared when she realized another girl, her friend, had something weird on her neck that wasn't there before. When we realized and told her, she began to cry for a long time. 
everyone was very scared. We thought it was a joke at first, but the seriousness and intensity of her crying made us realize it wasn't. And I don't think those cries would be jokes. Her neck had what appeared to be the letters R and T scratched onto their surface and vanished the next day. We never spoke about that again. Another girl in our class was really interested in the paranormal. Another girl in our class was really interested in the paranormal and said that it probably meant spirit of God and this scared everyone even more as in our language the first two letters would be RT. Now, I need to say something everyone believes here. According to them, the street of the school is where you can see the light of someone that died who was someone God loved so much. So now he is being a light to people in the street. The street also includes the new grave. When I was little, I remember being with my family passing from another street that also crosses that street. When I see a light, not a street light, an independent orb of light floating. But I was really little, so perhaps I was confused. In any case, this final story is from when my grandma went to my school working as someone who cleans. This was with the first few years after the school was made. She told me that the principal cared about her opinion a lot, which was making another woman working there very jealous, when all of a sudden the principal started to act not so nice to her. Months, maybe even years later, when they were cleaning the principal's office, she claimed she found a paper that had Arabic letters on it. Then she got the paper, got rid of it, and the principal started to act nice to her again. So basically, my grandma assumes the other woman who worked there cast a spell on him so he would like my grandma less. I was walking around the forest near my house with a friend and we decided to cut off the path and see how deep we could get through the trees before they became too thick. Where I live is sort of mountainous so it's pretty easy to walk among the trees without getting too caught up in branches. Everything is sort of spaced apart well. We walked for about an hour when we came to all these little arranged pebbles. They were all put in little circles of different sizes and definitely put there intentionally. We kept walking and noticed that some of the circles also had crosses with them, some serious Blair Witch stuff. We really should have just left, but we just so happened to have taken some acid and this was 100% not a hallucination and everything was hilarious to us. Eventually we kept walking and found a sign that explained it was an animal cemetery, at which point we realized we had been walking over hundreds of buried animal corpses. We noped out of there as quickly as we could, but because we hadn't followed the path, it was quite confusing to go back and took much longer to arrive home. If that wasn't bad enough, we came across the biggest pure white dog we've ever seen on the way back. There was no one else around but this massive dog with no leash and no collar. And obviously, in our drugged up state, we convinced ourselves it was the ghost. It followed us as we tried to find our way for 20 minutes, when finally its owner wandered out and found him. It was some old hippie man who just let the dog wander around. Turns out the dog was so big because it was part wolf. Really not too unusual for where I live. But like I said, we were on acid, so the whole thing was more of a trip than we were expecting. We tried to find the cemetery again when sober, but couldn't figure out where we had veered off the path. Definitely the weirdest trip and the creepiest thing I've ever found in the woods. My friend and I decided to go on a late night drive to find this creepy cemetery one night. Great start to a story I know, but we were bored and in a small town with nothing else to do. After close to 40 minutes of driving, we got to the state park. Now typically, parks are closed after dark, but these roads were still public access, so they weren't off limits to general drivers. However, we were the only cars on the road at this point 
and it was isolated, we thought. The lanes were surrounded by thick trees, and it was dark, no streetlight dark. We're on a narrow dirt lane looking for this cemetery, but we drive by it, unknowingly. The area we were driving through was kind of like a square of roads with only one way in and out. We get to the crossroads, where the road we are on goes straight through, or you can continue back through by a left-only turn. Next to the ditch across the road from us, we see a dark green sedan pulled into the brush. No lights on, no people around it, not an accident from all we could tell. Whatever kind of weird, but we slowly turned left and began to loop back around looking for the small rows of old headstones again. As we get back around the intersection about five minutes later, the green sedan is still pulled off in the bushes. But now, it's not the only vehicle there. There's a big pickup truck, idling in the dark across from us, blocking the straight away. Now, it had to have come from the other direction since no other cars passed us or were in front of us or behind us. That was the way we had planned to go, to leave the park since we hadn't found what we were looking for, but we couldn't pass through. This truck was in the middle of the road, taking up all the space on either side. At first, we were thinking, this guy's pal probably got his car stuck and called for help. Then this truck guy turns on his headlights, his high beams, and starts revving his engine hard. My friend and I exchange looks, like wondering who's overcompensating for something. And when we turn back, trying to see through the blinding light, we see a silhouette of a big bulky man. He's standing in front of the truck, hands on his hips, just standing there. We aren't a car's length and a half away from this guy and there's nowhere to go but left, which we know just leads us back around to the same place. We sit staring at each other for a few moments, trying to decide what to do. My friend starts pulling the car forward at a snail pace, trying to keep as much distance between us and this truck as possible, and we make the left turn. He's just standing there, not moving, looking in our direction. We weren't scared yet, really. But I'm a bit paranoid generally, so I was waiting for him to lunge at the car, throw something at us or something. I don't know, it just really felt off. After we turn I check the rear view and see the guy holding something as he takes a few steps behind our car in the outline of the light. It's long, barrel shaped and threatening looking. We peel out of there now, wanting to put distance between us but forgetting we are stuck in this square of roads. When we get back to about halfway, we begin to see the start of the straightaway in the truck, whose headlights we can still see. We pull off to the side of the road, trying to figure out how we can exactly get out of this situation. I look out the window and see that we are sitting right next to the cemetery we had been looking for, but we are both too freaked to get out now, and we laugh at the irony for a second. Then we see headlights coming from behind us. It's the guy, and it gets closer. We see it's a white SUV, and it slows next to our car. The window rolls down, and it's a car full of guys our age. What are you guys up to out here, the driver says. We're just here for a drive. And they say some stuff out of earshot. My friends and I don't have a strong menacing aura, so we hoped we could just send some chill vibes and have them leave us off the hook for whatever was going on. Were they with the truck guy? Because this wasn't truck guy, but was all too weird. We asked if they'd seen a truck ahead, where they had to have driven in, but they said that they hadn't. When we looked back, we noticed the lights from the oncoming direction were gone. They laugh and pull away slowly, telling us to have a good night, and we pull back onto the road and take off for the exit only looking out the windows long enough to notice that only the sedan was still there. Sorry, buddy. Hope your car's all right. We made it back to his parents' place without further incident and told them about the encounter, but we couldn't explain what had happened really. It still kind of sounds stupid when I write it out, but something was going on. 
Growing up, my family frequently traveled to rural Mexico. Almost everyone there believes in supernatural things and are very superstitious. I am honestly a skeptic in many things, but I did see a few things that I can't explain. This is one of them. Light orbs. Growing up, I heard many stories of strange light orbs. Everyone believes they're witches. One of my uncles, who was a retired soldier, woke up one night as usual to feed his sheep at 6 a.m. He said he saw a big orb fly above his barn. He watched it for a few minutes and decided the best thing to do was shoot at it with a rifle. He says this was a Vietnam era M4. He fired a few shots and saw they hit the orb, which was spinning like crazy, and it charged towards him as he ran inside his house. He waited all day and night inside. He believes it was a witch. I loved that story as a child, but thought it was a lie until I got to see them. In Mexico, it is common for teenagers to go to parties to the next town over. One of my cousins had a truck and it would get filled inside the cab and on the bed. There would be maybe 12 of us on our way back at around 1 a.m. I was riding in the back of the truck and I was tired. So I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings until the truck stopped. Someone inside pointed to a small hill which had a cemetery on top. There they were. Three orbs around the cemetery, circling about 20 feet above it. They had to be about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. We were about half a mile away and just stared at them for about three minutes. They would circle the cemetery, drop to the tombs and went back up. Then all of a sudden, they just went up and didn't want to come back down. I have to admit, I was yelling at my cousin to go. I was afraid I didn't want to die at a glowing orb. I've always been interested in the paranormal from a young age and was super into looking up things near me that were haunted. I found an old website as a kid that I to this day visit on occasion as it has a massive listing of every city in every US state and different encounters in the area around them. These encounters are usually pretty low key, but it's fun to read up on. I remember reading about a small, roughly 10 stone graveyard in the woods about two miles away from my house. I even looked it up years ago when I heard about it on Google Maps and actually saw a very small opening in the woods where it was mentioned. I had always wanted to go and see if it was truly there and I was just a bit too scared of going because it was said to have headstones from the 1800s along with whispers and energies inside. However, one day, a friend and I decided to take the chance and go searching. We went out to the woods that was in question and looked around for any proper way in. To the left of the woods was a preschool with the title of something like Little Angels we never thought anything of it, but tried to see if the parking lot had any way to give into the woods. We found a slight dirt path off the lot and went up into the woods, but ran into a gate blocking us further from going in. The gate seemed as though there was nothing deeper beyond it, just more woods. So we quit fairly easily as we were being bitten by bugs. Fast forward a few years and a few more friends and I decide to go back and check it out again. This time the gate was open. We go beyond it and actually find the cemetery. Surprisingly enough, it had a sign at the start of it that looked fairly updated. Yet like the posting said, there were only about 15 stones in it. They were really old, some barely legible. It was kind of crazy to see such an old cemetery that was used at some point. We never encountered anything at all, but it was interesting to visit nonetheless. 
I think the thing that stood out to me the most, though, was something that I didn't notice until later. The Little Angels Preschool that was built right next to this cemetery from the early 1800s had their phone number in huge numbers on the front of the building. The last three digits was 666. I found that quite creepy, although it's probably nothing too interesting, as we didn't notice anything happen to us. Still feel like it was a crazy coincidence, the placement and everything. We have lived in this house for almost eight years now, and there are lots of things to share. Our neighborhood sits on the original town cemetery from the 1800s. In the 70s, when they built the neighborhood, they only removed the graves they needed to put in the foundation and the sewage system. We didn't know this until we had been living here for three to four years. But when we found out, it certainly explained a lot. While we were still in the process of moving in and hadn't even spent the first night in the house, I heard two little kids talking. I heard it clear as day. A girl probably of around 10 or 12 and a little boy who sounded no older than five. I only have two brothers, both younger than me, but still older than either of those kids. It sounded like any younger siblings playing. And because it sounded so normal, can't remember exactly what was said. Obviously, the first thing I did was call out to them, and then the playing stopped. I never heard them leave. I searched the house and no one was inside. Everyone was in the backyard putting together our swing set. I told my mom what I heard, and she of course didn't believe me. I dropped it, and we moved on. Months later in my room, I'm trying to sleep when I roll over and see the reflection of a girl in my TV screen. I realized I was seeing her back, long curly blonde hair, and a blue dress that appeared to be from the 1800s. Somehow in my sleep deprived brain, I thought it was my own life sized doll and ignored it and went back to sleep. It definitely wasn't. It was the wrong color and the doll was facing the TV. So there's no way it was her. I didn't tell my mum this time round because she didn't believe me the last time. After that, stuff started moving around. Things fall off the stairs that are carpet, and the lights around the house turn on and off at random. I hear people walking around the house all the time, and still my mother does not believe me, which is really stupid because she believes in ghosts. I affectionately named the ghost girl Lizzie because it just felt right. Finally, one day I'm out with my friends doing teenage stuff. It's roughly 11 p.m. at night, and all of a sudden, my mum calls me. Tell Lizzie not to scare the crap out of me. Turns out, she'd gotten up to use the bathroom, and when she returned to go back to bed, she'd seen a dark orb hovering over her side of the bed. When she saw it, it quickly exited via the ceiling, and then she called me. Not long after that, we found the local news articles about our neighborhood in the cemetery. We also found out that during a flood one year, one particular casket kept popping back up and it had to be moved. And that a lot of the neighborhood still have headstones visible in their yard. We're horrified because we definitely noticed some weirdly flat stones out near our garden and one only five or six feet from fruit trees that we planted. So now we all accept that we live with a ghost or two. Weird stuff happens all the time. They stop throwing stuff off the stairs, but they now show up in our Xbox Connect, turn sinks on, and occasionally knock stuff over. But I also sometimes will hear them talking faintly. I haven't seen either of them since the first time, but I know they're still about. We treat them like family, talk to them, offer them snacks, leave toys out to play with. Life is weird and new people in the house never take long to notice. Lately, I've also been seeing a shadow cat hanging around. We have two cats already, but neither of them can disappear through walls. So there's that. Another story I have to share is one day my friends and I were leaving the house. I don't remember where we were going, 
and my mum comes around the corner swearing she saw someone walking down the hallway. We were all in the living room and my brothers weren't home. At the time we had our Xbox set up on a dresser with its own TV so the kids could play games without taking over the living room and said dresser was right next to the doorway that leads into the hall. My mom says she thinks she heard the Xbox turn on and comments on how easy it would be probably for the ghost to turn it on since the button is so sensitive. We all have a chuckle at the ghosts playing video games and continue to the door. Not 10 minutes later, my mum calls me to tell me that the Xbox had in fact been turning on and off repeatedly, that she was trying to watch TV and it started to freak her out. I laugh because of course Lizzie would do that. You just told her how it works, I say, and I hear my mum politely ask her to stop because it's distracting and the beeping from the console stops for maybe a minute or two before it starts again. My mum makes me come back early supposedly because Lizzie likes me and she'll stop if I ask her. The Xbox continued to turn on and off at random, albeit every once in a while now for the next few weeks. Now when our consoles or even the TV turn on by itself, we'll ask her what she wants to watch and play, but never get an answer. I have always been interested in the paranormal and going ghost hunting as me and my friends call it anyway. This story takes place on an October night in 2005, almost 15 years ago now. We had gathered at my dad's house for a party. He lived way out in the country in an old farmhouse. We decided to drive up the road to an old cemetery because one of my friends showed up with a Ouija board. I said we weren't going to use it in my house, but I was game to use it elsewhere about six of us piled into the vehicles and took off. When we got there, we set the Ouija board up on an old concrete barrier that surrounded the entrance of the cemetery. For context, the cemetery was set on a hill surrounded by cow pastures, fields and trees, and across the road stood a white church. There were two security lights that lit up the church area and the entrance to the cemetery. There was one more security light that lit the field next to the only house for about two miles. We all stood in a circle, planchette in the center and hands on it. My friend led the seance and asked if there was anything in the cemetery with us. At first, nothing happened and we all stood still and quiet. Then the planchette slowly moved towards yes. Immediately, we start accusing each other of moving it, of course, but everyone swore they didn't. An eerie feeling fell over us as the planchette moved back to the center of the board. About that time we heard what sounded like wind at first, but then began to get closer and it sounded like footsteps of multiple people running in circles around us. We were all wide eyed, looking at each other when someone said out loud, I'm out. Another person said, we have to tell it by or the spirit will follow us. The leader of the group spoke to the board and said something along the lines of, we are saying goodbye to you. And the planchette quickly jerked to no. It was pretty obvious by how shocked we all were that none of us had done it. Mind you, the sound of the footsteps is still surrounding us. The planchette moves to the center and we say bye again. And again, it moves to no and back to the center. This time we all say together, goodbye, we're leaving. And it slowly agonizingly moved to goodbye. We were relieved and took off running to the cars, which were parked by the entrance of the cemetery side of the road. Me and my buddy jump into the truck. Then I hear my friend scream, guys, I can't find my keys. She checks the ignition, her pockets, and all our friends check their cars and their pockets to no avail. Everyone else here loads back into the truck and we speed the three miles down the road to my dad's house. My friend searches her pockets, her purse and everywhere, but couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually someone takes her home and she says she'll get her spare and get a ride back to her car in the morning. We were all too scared to go back and look for them that night. The next day, 
My friend searches the cemetery and never finds the keys, even in broad daylight. We haven't walked around the whole lot, and where we used the cemetery was very close to where we parked, which didn't leave much room for things to get lost. Me and several friends scoured the entire cemetery over the course of the next week, but never found the keys. My friend said she was 100% positive they were left in the ignition when she got out the car. It's where I left mine, and a common practice in the area, where I'm from, which, like I said, is pretty rural. This was by far the scariest, but not the only Ouija experience I've had. I have had countless paranormal experiences during my life. Two years ago, two friends and I decided to go on a late night adventure and drive to a bigger city about an hour away from our hometown. We got to the city around 11 p.m. and were just exploring random areas there. I had my iPhone plugged into the car playing music, and out of nowhere the music cut out, and the screen changed to maps. A destination was entered in the map, and a male AI voice began telling us where to go. We decided to follow it like it wasn't something straight out of a horror movie. The first destination it took us was a worn out road at the back end of a construction site. The road went up to a forest that was surrounded by large fences. There were no trespassing signs everywhere, so we decided to turn around. The GPS then rerouted us to another point about 20 minutes away from the first. We drove to the second point, and it was a dead-end road on the opposite side of the forest from the first road. We were pretty freaked out by the experience, and reconnected my phone and went back home. Fast forward a few days ago. One of my friends who I had gone with was talking to me on the phone. He brought up the experience and we decided to look into it. We found the two roads on Google Earth, and could see a house in the forest with a clearing behind it. We started doing some research on the house and came across a court document connected to the address. Developers had bought the land and were denied approval to build on the land where the house stood. I didn't think much of it until I read further and saw why they were denied. The clearing we saw on Google Earth ended up being a cemetery where the original settlers of the city were buried. With more research, we came to find that a man who had owned the land sometime before the 90s had moved every headstone, leaving the graves unmarked. It took historians years to discover the cemetery, and they were granted permission to make a thorough report on it. They found 99 grave shafts, but 60 of them were much smaller, meaning they belonged to children. The developers had unveiled in court that they simply moved the remains into a corner of the new subdivision without any cemetery. The other road that we were brought to was on the other side of the forest, as if it wanted us to drive from one side to the other, when we didn't make the main road. The weirdest part about this whole experience was when we noticed the court date was exactly 10 years ago from the date we did the research. We found it odd that it took us so long to look into what the GPS could have been taking us to, and that out of every day it happened, it happened on the 10 year anniversary. It's pretty crazy. I honestly believe that our GPS was being manipulated by a spirit that belonged to the graveyard, and they wanted to let us know what had happened there. If you care to do your research, it's called Lime Kiln Road, Ancaster. The road into the forest, Bailey Road, Ancaster. Second Dead End Road, Cooley Hat Pioneer Cemetery. My entire life, my grandfather has lived in a large home in a somewhat wooded area in a town outside of Dallas, Texas. We would camp out and explore the area when I was younger, before people decided to start building more in that area. In order to get to the house, you would have to turn off the main road into a cemetery. Not sure why, but the road cuts straight through a pretty large old cemetery. I like to go there on nice days and look around sometimes. It's a good walk from my grandfather's house down a road heavily lined with trees. I've seen gravestones with dates as far back as the early 1800s, 
and they are always really neat in my opinion. So at this point in time, I'm between homes and staying with my grandfather. It was about 1am and I'm hanging out with a friend from work, telling them about how I like this cemetery. They're interested in going to see the place and want to take some long exposure pictures with a camera that they recently got. So we head that way and I take them to where all the really old graves are. Now I've always been somewhat sensitive to things considering paranormal. I've had a few weird experiences and tend to trust my instincts when I feel something's off. From the time I parked inside the cemetery that night, I probably knew that I shouldn't be there. My instinct was kicking in. But I ignored my gut because my friend was excited and I really wanted to show them this cemetery and explore the surrounding woods with them. So we walked along the wood line towards the far back corner where the oldest graves are to take some pictures of the headstones and pay our respects to the people who have been there the longest. My friend takes a lot of pictures and I walk around with the flashlight, adding lighting and reading the graves. The entire time I'm feeling like I'm being watched. I shake the feeling and again ignore my instinct because my friend looks like they're wrapping up. They start looking through their images while I make sure we got all our trash and water bottles that we brought with us. A friend calls me over while I'm doing this and asks me to look at one of the photos they just took of some graves and the tree line. I look at the photo a little bit freaked out. But I realize I probably need to stay calm for my friend's sake. I look up to where the photo was taken and see what the camera saw. What my friend doesn't see is in the tree line is a large black humanoid mass with glowing red eyes. I'm not sure how else to describe it, but it looked and felt like rage personified. In all my life, all the times I've explored the area, I had never seen or felt anything like that. I ask my friend to slowly start walking back to the car. I'm pretty sure they knew something was wrong because I was dead serious and hardcore staring where they just took that creepy photo. I'm backing my way to the car and watch the shadow watch us as we leave. We get to a point where I can see the car, but not the shadow anymore. So I turn around and start power walking towards my car, key in hand. I'm still on the edge, but I'm feeling better that we're getting out of there. All of a sudden, the shadow appears about 20 foot to my right in the tree line. I tell my friend to run the rest of the way to the car, and at this point we are running, and are almost to the car when my friend glances behind us and sees this thing for the first time. They freak out, speed to the car and frantically leap into the passenger side. I have just gotten my keys in the ignition when the shadow slams into my friend's door, its face right up against the glass. Imagine having a solid shadow, featureless, and then with two red LEDs where the eyes are. That's about what we saw menacing us on the other side of the glass. I get in the car and started to pull out as fast as I could without hitting any graves and start to drive the hell out of there. I find the official gate, even though there are plenty of other closer exits to the road, but I've always heard if you enter and leave through the same gate of a cemetery, you leave everything you found there and can't take it with you. I'm telling you now, that's all BS, but that's for another story. We're leaving when this thing is keeping up with us all the way to the gate and it stops. We head to the main road and to my friend's place, laughing hysterically because the adrenaline was wearing off and we survived something crazy. I get them home, but I have to go back through the cemetery to get home myself. And thankfully I didn't see the shadow again, but I believe this is because my friend wasn't with me. After that night, I had a bunch of more crazy things happen to me in the area while hanging out with them. But I think for now, that's enough. I thought we were being respectful. In any case, remember to respect cemeteries, everyone. 
The story I'm going to tell you happened when I was little, and is basically my mother and uncle's version. When I was four years old, I was really sick. I basically couldn't digest the food I ate, so my body had no defences, and I was sick pretty often. I never spent weeks on intensive care at the hospital. The thing is, no one knew what was wrong with me. For a year, three different doctors were trying to find out what was happening to me. They would make a lot of tests, even for rarer conditions, but they were always negative. My mother was completely desperate, and in her own words, I was going to pass before I could even figure out what it was trying to take me. So one day, my mom was with me at my uncle's house. He and my dad's brother, and he, live with his wife, and the mum of his wife, who is also like a grandmother to me. So this old woman told my mum that she was beginning to think I was possessed by a spirit. I live in a place that has a lot of esoteric beliefs and traditions, especially followed by the older generation. She asked my mother if she remembered going to the cemetery while she was pregnant with me. At that moment, my mother remembered that she had gone to take flowers to her father's grave on All Saints Day. There's a legend here that if you go to the cemetery when you're pregnant or with a newborn baby, the spirits will try to possess them in order to live again. My mother and uncle threw me into the car to take me to a church known for such cases. My mum and uncle said I was screaming and crying the whole time in the car and that I didn't want to go. I didn't even know where we were going or why since they didn't tell me anything. My uncle was driving and suddenly we ran into a traffic jam. He tried to slow down the car and then he realised the brakes weren't working. He kept stepping on the brakes without the car responding until we were about to hit the car that was standing right in front of us. All of this and then in a matter of seconds the car stopped completely inches from colliding. When we were already standing, the strangest thing of the trip had happened. They both felt as if several people from outside their cars were pushing the car and shaking it from one side to another. I was about to scream. Long story short, we arrived to the church. I didn't want to go in, but I finally did. I was crying the whole time. And when I got out and I was in a much better mood, my mum bought me donuts in our way to the car, and I ate one and then puked. But it was as if I puked something with sand and texture, something completely dry. My uncle stopped the car and got out just in case I was going to keep going. Suddenly I did a strange sound, like a burp, but it was way too loud and deep sounding for a four-year-old kid. The next day on Monday, one of the doctors called me. One of the tests was positive. They already knew what was wrong with me. I have had a number of paranormal experiences happen to me during the course of my life. My first experience was at my own home in Florida about six years ago. We had just moved about roughly a year before, and the house was brand spanking new. We were the only residents ever to live here. My dad and his wife both went on a trip to another state, and my brother was back with his dad 2,000 miles away. I was completely alone in my two-story house for two weeks. I've been home alone countless times, and the first week was nothing out of the ordinary. But by the second, I was feeling uneasy with my surroundings. And you know that feeling that you get when someone stares at you, and you immediately look and there's something locking eyes? That's the feeling I had when I was always throwing my eyes and head around the corner of my house or doors. I personally I'm not one to freak out nor be scared, so I didn't think much of it. I went to sleep that night like I normally would. During the night, I felt pressure on my bed. That same pressure when someone sits on your bed, it was enough to wake me up and make me look at that general direction. I thought it was my dad sitting on my bed, which is something he is known to do, and it would often wake me up. Perhaps it was him telling me he'd come home early. But when I opened my eyes, I saw nothing. It was pitch black. And for what felt like the longest two seconds of my life, I was just staring into a dark room. I could feel the side of the bed being pressed down. 
and all of a sudden the pressure eased as if someone stood up. I started breathing heavily and jumped from a laying down position to my feet on top of the bed and tried to pull my light switch from my fan on. As soon as the light came on, could I notice that I was alone in the room. I was panting, feeling sick to my stomach looking around. I sprinted to the bathroom and locked myself in, putting water in my face and trying to comprehend what exactly I had just experienced. You can bet the rest of the week I was cautious around the house, since I was still feeling uneasy and skeptical. My uneasiness disappeared roughly two months after all this, and I never had such a strange experience again within my own home. My second experience was four years after the first. Me, my father and his wife decided to take a road trip. This time, we landed in Charleston, South Carolina, and my dad thought it would be cool to visit the Drayton Hall Plantation built in the 1700s, as it was so nearby. We're history nerds and love to visit old historical buildings, museums and cities, and we take our tours, so this wasn't a big leap for us. It was the middle of summer and easily 98 degrees and humid outside for the entire tour. It felt like we were in another, and the sunlight was just incinerating. As soon as the tour ended, we decided to leave, but one of the tour guides told us that down the dirt road of the property, if we look to our left as we drive, there is a modern plastic arch that if we walked through further into the property using the arch's reference and kept going straight, we would find ourselves in the old slave cemetery. She gave us a pamphlet about it and we left. Mind you, my family are non-believers and my father especially always talks about how the paranormal doesn't exist. We thought it would be cool to see an old 18th century slave cemetery. So we drove and parked our car on the edge of the dirt road, but my stepmother decided to stay in the vehicle as it was so hot and she had air conditioning. Me and my dad walked all the way to the location and got lost since it was taking me further into the forested area. And we expected tombstones and such on a clearing. But as we walked in, we read the pamphlet and it said the cemetery was actually a mass grave where hundreds of slaves are buried and that we should look out for the only market, which is this pair of tombstones that were put in recently of deceased people who wanted to be buried there as they traced their lineage to be that plantation. We eventually found the tombstones that we were now in because the area looked untouched and it just had this pair of modern tombstones that looked new in the middle of the forest. Surrounded by this tree, which each one being about 12 feet apart from each other and sunlight peeking through the leaves. We walked around for 15 minutes talking and speculating where the slaves were buried and how big the area of the graves could actually be. Remember, it was hot balls outside and there was absolutely zero wind whatsoever. At one point, we found ourselves at the tombstones and decided to leave. My father started walking away as I read the tombstones for a solid minute or two. And I had this cold area in the back of my neck and the entire back of my right arm, and I could feel cold on my shoulder through my shirt. I froze in place for a few seconds, and it was extremely distinct, and there was absolutely no wind or gust, nothing. It was just as cold as ice. As soon as I looked at my dad and talked to him, he walked away. The cold disappeared, almost instantly. A few months later after this, I found out coincidentally in college about cold spots during paranormal investigations and completely blew my mind about it and made me rethink what was happening in the plantation. Ever since the second event, it's made me look more into the paranormal and I'm not sure if I'm a believer or not, but it certainly freaked me out. This event occurred back in the beginning of October 2019. But let me give you a little backstory. A branch of my mother's side of the family moved from Illinois. They were actually all immigrants from England to the Pacific Northwest country. 
I currently live here. And back in the 1880s, to work in the mining and logging industries, at least three subsequent generations of the family moved here at the same time. A number of these family members were buried in a family plot, in a historic, large and still active cemetery on a hill overlooking the town that I live in. There are a total of five people buried in our family plot. My great-great-grandfather, Elijah Bird, buried in 1911. My great-great-grandmother, Emily Bird, buried in 1927. My great-grandfather, Nigel Bird, buried 1940, son of the two mentioned above. My great-grandmother, Deborah B. Bird, buried 1991. And my great-great-aunt Sadie, buried 1902, aged 12. Now, to my story from October 2019. I was riding in the passenger seat of my husband's truck. We were driving to my brother-in-law's house. We were passing by this cemetery, and I have a great interest in my family history. So I've done a good deal of research about them, and that is how I know where many of them are buried. The family plot is located about 25 feet in front of the cemetery fence, and about 30 feet from the road that passes by the front of the cemetery, the road we were driving on. The plot is marked with a large headstone, and has the surname carved in large letters facing the road. It is very easy to spot. There are some bushes along a portion of the fence line of the cemetery, but they are not present where my family plot is located. On this clear October afternoon, as we were passing my family's plot, I looked out my window, as I always do if we're going by, and was surprised to see someone sitting on my family plot facing the large gravestone. I turned my head and body to see her as we progressed down the road, and when I finally got a good look at her, I saw her for around 10 to 15 seconds. I saw that she was small and female, in a white dress with some ruffles on the shoulders. To me it looked very old fashioned, like something worn during the 1800s, late. She was sitting with her knees pulled up to her chest and her forearms resting on her knees. I only saw her left arm. It was wrapped around her bent left leg. Her brown hair was long and as far as I could tell, was lying loosely down her back. I caught glimpses of what I thought were black boots on her feet. She didn't move at all while I was looking at her. I asked my husband if he saw a girl in the graveyard and he said no, but he had been concentrating on the road. I told him I saw a girl sitting on my family's plot and he just grunted and said it was weird. I thought a lot about it on the way to my brother-in-law's house. And while we were visiting, we took the same route home, but by this time it was dark, so I couldn't see anything in the cemetery as it wasn't lit. My mind went straight to Sadie, who died as a preteen and is buried there. She could have been around the same size as the girl I saw during her life, and could have worn something like that girl was wearing. I never have seen an image, though, of what Sadie actually looked like. My mother had a lot of old family photos from her side of the family, including two or three photos of passed away infants from the 1880s to 90s from my great grandma. So lots of pictures, but none of Sadie that we know of. Safe to say I was quite creeped out by what I saw. It could very well have been a living person dressed up in Victoria era clothing. That does seem far more likely, but it's odd and kind of creepy nonetheless, just to be sitting on someone's grave, don't you think? I find it more disturbing that there was a living person using my family's grave as part of some dress-up game than for it to be a ghost. I'm the only one in my family that is descended from these people that lives in the entire county. Thinking about Sadie does make me a little sad. She passed so young. Child and infant mortality were very common back then and it is tragic. I have no information of what she died of. I just thought I'd share this because I've been thinking about this sighting lately and wanted to see what others think of it. I moved to a new apartment at the start of last month. It's only got one room besides the bathroom and the kitchen and was fully furnished. 
The view from the balcony is stunning. However, there's also the graveyard of this small village I moved to that's literally around the corner. And I can see this charming graveyard from my kitchen window if I stand on my toes. I went there once because it happened to be the way I was walking as I was chatting with my boyfriend. It's a very beautiful place, well taken care of, with some noble graves and a very small church in the middle. It has no locks on the gate, so people can visit whenever they feel like it. The thing that kind of bothered me was the fact that the gates make this really annoying noise, like they need to be oiled. After we got back from our walk, we never returned, but we kept speaking about it. At the time, we really didn't notice it, but my boyfriend was very nervous and seemed kind of scared. But I was also just enjoying the walk and looking around, looking at the graves, that I hardly paid attention to his mild discomfort. It was only a few days ago that he got really upset when he saw the grave of a girl who passed away this year in March, at the young age of five. Looking at him, you wouldn't really expect him to be upset by a mere grave. I spoke to him about it, until we changed the subject as he got sad, and he eventually went home. Fast forward to yesterday. I woke up pretty late since I was staying up late, doing the laundry, sorting out clothes, and looking at things I needed to get rid of. I know for a fact that I cleaned the apartment to its peak, so that there was no possibility of garbage and no dirty dishes or anything. When I came back home yesterday, I discover a puddle. I thought my mind must have been playing tricks on me, or maybe the floor was reflecting light from a lantern outside my window, but I touched it and smelt it and it was clearly water. When I looked up to the ceiling, it looked fine and was dry, no leaks. So I brushed it off, thinking maybe I had just forgotten to clean something in my haste the other day. Hmm, that was weird, I thought. I did leave the house in a hurry after all. I was very tired, but just couldn't seem to fall asleep. I was restless and felt as if it would be wrong to go to sleep now. So I got dressed again and took a walk and stopped by the graveyard and sat on the bench in front of the gates. I remember being exhausted and my legs felt like they were pulsating. After a while, I went back home, and the puddle had vanished. Everything was as it was before. As per habit, I lock my door twice at night. Last night, as I wanted to lay down to fall asleep, I heard something playing around with the door. It was 2am. I was petrified and frozen under the blanket. I knew for a fact there couldn't be anyone there since my landlord lives in the apartment below and has been asleep at the time and the door to enter the house itself is always locked at night. I've heard how something or someone was trying to turn my doorknob and got more aggressive every minute. Even though it's the middle of August, I felt as if I were in a freezer because it became so cold. I could hear my door shaking and the doorknob was probably about to fall off at that point. And then it stopped, slowly, but it somehow did. Not much later, I heard crying, and I listened very closely when I heard someone whisper, Mommy, please let me in. I'm scared of the dark. At this point, I almost wept myself. I grabbed my phone, which I took with me and called my boyfriend. The crying stopped the moment I dialed his number, and when he answered, I slowly crawled back into the living room before I finally started talking to him. Someone, please. Tell me how I'm supposed to sleep at night. Ever since I was younger, I have always been drawn to places where the dead dwell, such as local cemeteries, columbarium and mausoleums. I've always had a strange sensation when stepping foot inside cemetery grounds, particularly within indoor mausoleums. It feels like a chill coupled with an increased spiritual pressure as if gravity is intensifying. This feeling is always spot on as soon as I would enter a cemetery or mausoleum. I would have thought that I would want to avoid places like that, especially when I'm not visiting my deceased loved ones. However, I find myself subconsciously drawn to these places, 
Just driving by local cemeteries slash memorial parks, I'm subconsciously drawn to enter, even if I express no intention whatsoever. I thought it would perhaps be my emotional response to entering a place of the dead. Therefore, I asked my friend to conduct an experiment where I would deprive myself of my senses. I wear a blindfold as well as earmuffs. He would then drive me around to local places, grocery stores, libraries and the cemetery, and then tap me when he stopped. I would then identify if I were in the cemetery or not. Shockingly, I was able to identify whether the places were cemeteries or not based off of this feeling or increased gravity as I call it. As a scientific individual, I am highly skeptical of the supernatural. However, I have not been able to discern why I have this particular sensation, neurological, spiritual, emotional or otherwise. What is most baffling to me was the ability to sense spot on and more than once and accurately whether I was in a cemetery, even by blocking my sound and sight. I definitely feel like there's some sketchy stuff going on in this graveyard. Maybe some spirits with unresolved issues. And I have just the solution for that. Behold, my trusty Ouija board. Why don't we just ask them directly what's up? I'm sure we'll have no issues here. So who wants to join me in communing with the Fallen? About two years ago, my Nana bought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal, and it's always been one of my peak interests. I've heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board. And quite frankly, they sort of freaked me out. So I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it would be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in the hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother of 11 and my cousin of 12 bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain it to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling. And when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it, at first they denied it, but I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done and they said they did. My cousin likes to over-exaggerate stories big time and make up details to be overly dramatic. So when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other. So I assumed that that was happening now. A couple of nights later, I got into bed. And as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I look over at my closet that has two large sliding doors and I notice that one of the doors is slightly ajar, which left a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep and the next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much, I was shaking. I look around my room and don't see anything. But then, all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point, it wasn't funny. After laying there a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm, but I still could feel a tingling pulsing sensation on the back of my head. 
I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up, and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my nana got up around six. I didn't tell her what happened, because I knew she wouldn't believe me and say that I was acting dumb. After she got up, I had breakfast and called my boyfriend again and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent, so he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this and told him what happened and he felt so bad and like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was so apologetic. Later that day, he never came over and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened and I didn't experience anything after I got rid of it. Moral of the story, Ouija boards shouldn't be messed with. I am the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time I was about nine and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two story house with a basement. At this time, my mother was single and dating a lot. So during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters, a Canadian kids channel, YTV. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old cardboard box and made a Ouija board from it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so that it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle and asking questions, but got no response. Then me and my brother asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran into the kitchen. When we got there, we heard a crash come from the living room. It sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. But when we ran back, we saw that nothing was wrong. After this, we decided to grab a Bible and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV and saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was going to be something funny. But when the audio began, the first words from Dave were, and all the people died, to which the audience started laughing, and then it went to a commercial. Freaked out by both of these strange and unlikely things happening, the waterworks began, and we got up and ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours run up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or our friends late up the stairs. But then we realized we were all in the room and no one passed by the door. We began to panic. So we held each other freaking out. It's hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened for now. Two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might be all in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mum's computer in her office, Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open and immediately after he pushed the door, it slammed back on his arm and all the way from the basement, we heard clear and loud laughter. The only way I can describe it is it was the sound of a witch that echoed through the entire house. At this point, we ran down the stairs, out the door into my grandmother's house, which was down the street and waited for mum to come home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I'm 23 years old now, and this story sticks out as the only and craziest paranormal experience I have ever had. Back in the 80s, I was in college and lived in a dorm room. I never owned a Ouija board, but if someone had one, 
then I'd either watch or participate. To be honest, this was one of the first times I ever used it. I had a question for the board. My grandmother had my father when she was young and single. That was a big deal back in the 1930s. When she found out she was pregnant, she ran away from home, dropped my father off at her parents' house when he was six months old and left, coming to visit less and less frequently. By the time he was five, she'd never come back at all and vanished. So my father was raised by an aunt, never really knew his mother and didn't have any idea who his father was. By the time he was in his 40s, he wanted to find her. Lots of dead ends, but he eventually did. Anyway, that night I asked the board if my grandmother was alive. The board said yes, and I asked if she lived in my home state. The board said yes. I asked if she lived in my hometown. The board said yes. I asked what street she lived on, and the board spelled out the name of the street, Washington Street. At the time, I wasn't sure if there was a Washington Street in my hometown, but it turns out there was. No, grandma didn't live there, but two years later, my father found his mum. She lived in my home state in the town of Washington. It wasn't the street's name, it was the town's name. How messed up is that? More than 30 years later, I still have no explanation. I tried to contact a paranormal entity and some not so fun things happened. So this is the time my friends and I decided to be extra dumb. And I say this because I want all of those listening to understand that I, as well as my friends, now fully understand how stupid we were being. The important backstory for this location, Proctor Valley. Proctor Valley is in San Diego County and connects the towns of Ote and Jamal. It is protected and is a wildlife area. So there are no houses, no buildings, no businesses. It's situated behind a prominent mountain with hilly ridges boxing in the valley. It is said that this valley is a center for the unexplained. Stories ranging from lights in the sky, ghost cars, ladies in white, random screams, the usual stories that surround almost every isolated dirt road. The place is surrounded with rumors. It is, however, in actuality, a dangerous place. Being situated near the US-Mexico border, it is a pathway frequented for drug smuggling, and being an isolated dirt road on the outskirts of a major city, things tend to go down there. You have your usual terrible stuff, carjacking, people having their lives ended, as well as lots of bad other things. But a murder in particular stands out. The apparent poisoning of a teenage girl in a blue floral dress that was never identified, found barefoot on the side of the road. Now, time to share my experience. I had driven down the road late at night several times with friends for fun. The place has very few trees, let alone any large ones, but about midway down the road, there is a very large tree hanging halfway over the road. This tree has always given me a bad feeling, so I never felt comfortable stopping there to explore. However, this night, I was determined. So once and for all, I had to know if this place had something weird going on. I wanted my own experience, and I wanted it badly. I had dug up my family's old Ouija board and studied for weeks on the proper use of it and how to get the results you want. The whole shebang. We purchased the correct candles and found the most pure salt we could find and we drove out to the road. This ended up being a bit of an event as about 10 people showed up. Four of us used the Ouija board, two filmed and four sat in lawn chairs. Once we all got ready, we began. I, being dumb and unoriginal, thought we should go straight to demon land and try to anger a demon and contact it. Which demon? Pazuzu. Again, I was dumb and unoriginal. Well, after we initially started, we heard what sounded like orchestral music being played. Being on a road, we figured it was another car driving down in the distance, but would wait for it to pass and continue, 
because it would be a bit awkward if someone drove by and a bunch of people were summoning a demon. We waited 25 minutes, but no car showed up. There were no headlights, no noise besides the music, and us being a bit confused and somewhat scared, we carried on. The planchette was moving, but based on the answers, someone had to be moving it. So when a random twig snapped and everyone jumped out of fear, I just stayed with my finger on the planchette. One person, the person moving the planchette, got too scared and opted out. So I and two others braved on. I did my best to anger whatever could be out there, and to my surprise, we got a response. There was no music being played anymore, and the piece was moving. I asked if anyone was there, and if they wished to communicate. The piece slowly moved to yes in a slow, smooth motion that honestly felt terrifying. It felt like it was being dragged across the board. Not like someone was pushing or sliding it. With the confirmation of something wishing to speak, I moved to the next question. Are you Pazuzu? The same feeling. The planchette moved to no. My heart sunk. I was thinking, okay, well I got something biting, let's see what it is. I see everything is fixed on the board, eyes locked, and I asked probably the next logical thing that most people would. Are you a good spirit? Then the two phones that were being used to film the event turn off. They then wouldn't turn back on, and the planchette begins to move. It slides to the letter G, and we all let out a big few. Everyone was relieved it was going to spell good, but then unsurprisingly, it moved to O. More confirmation. But then it stopped. Nothing. No movement at all for over five minutes. It was telling us to leave. I asked, do you want us to go? And as I finished the question, my friend drops to her knees. She was screaming and crying. I moved the planchette to goodbye and I say it and rush to her and ask her what happened. She said someone was walking over us and pointed down the road. I looked down, and all I saw was a cloud of dust roll off the road 15 feet away. This was the most honest person I'd ever known, and decided right then that we were leaving. She described the person walking towards us as having dark hair, long limbs, but no distinguished facial features. They walked like a video game character, Glitching where they stride definitely didn't match pace at all, and their feet didn't seem to touch the ground. When she looked at it, she said she felt every emotion she'd ever felt come over her. She equated it to the feeling of your family dying while you win the lottery on your wedding day. This was almost two years ago, and my friend still refuses to go out at night. I tried a year ago, and she cried in the car the whole time, saying she's getting closer. And yes, she's been attending therapy for this. I don't know what she saw that night, but I personally don't want to find out. I have not returned to the road since. I stored away the board, but it went missing six days later to the day, along with the candles and books. This story takes place in a cabin in Vermont. It was a small room, with a lofted area for the bed, a wood stove for heat and no running water, attached with a composting toilet pretty far away, nestled into the mountainside on a dirt road, off another dirt road, both formerly logging trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together, because in lieu of rent. We could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and the wild setting, and I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man with the initials DC in the mid 70s. He suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't pay the rent and wouldn't move out, and that upset him. While they were gone, he burnt their home, which he owned, to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended, 
and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two small rooms with a low ceiling, adjacent to the rubble, and moved in. I assume that was so that he could rent out his larger cabin. But no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of the history comes from our landlord, who briefly knew DC, and a college friend of his who still lives on the mountain in a shack made of plastic and tarps, with a propane cooking stove for heat. He is a lovely guy, and a beautiful artist who doesn't like talking to strangers. But he and I connected over our love of nature, and the pursuit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property, but the roof is full of holes and is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is stays up, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin, and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window, and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see it in the moonlight. The story I'm about to share took place on November 18th of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I moved in. Kaylee had some problems, and still does. I loved her dearly, though at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day starts normally. She went to work, I stayed home and gave the dog a bath. A statty stopped by, looking for her, second time she was out, and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and told her to get in touch without thinking, and that set her off. I had to go to work, so I sent her a message that I said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord, I mean old POS, one of the bad yogi variety, and left my phone and my coat. We were bucking logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work as the old saying goes, so I tossed my coat on the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting wood, he needed me to help him drop off a car for his repair as he needed my help because he has no friends and the place we were going to was some rando rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally take a look at my phone and there's the one message you never ever want to see. The note that says you'll end your life. We get back to the mountain and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting there since the day I bought it over because the battery is dead and it has no gas in it, because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it. And her car is a reliable one, and wherever she is, she isn't answering her phone. I tried calling her relatives to no avail, so I mentioned the predicament to my landlord, and he cracks a joke, that she's probably already deceased, before covering up with a very hollow, it's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas from the can, and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving, and I was in no mood to be wasting energy. So I set out, jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas, which was literally all I had at that point, because you don't work for rent if you're flush with cash, and I white knuckled it to town, praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all our usual spots with no luck, and went to the bar where her sister works in the hope of finding her. She wasn't working, so I gave the bartender my number, and asked him to reach out to her, saying that it was urgent. Then I went to Kaylee's work, which was babysitting, and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me she had left bitterly, swearing that she was going to end her life. But she hadn't done anything because she didn't think it was important. Just think about that for a moment. Then a glimmer of hope. Her sister has a heads up, a single text message of the letter S. But after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing, and you can't imagine my relief. So I went home and waited, and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell, and I was in the cabin alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet, and so I finally sent this poem. Sweet baby girl out on your own, who knows the way that will guide you back home? We love you, we miss you, our beating hearts have flown out from our chests to seek our missing one. She came home a half hour later, 
staggered through the door and fell into my arms sobbing. She said that she had stopped three times on her way up to the mountain because she lacked the strength to return, but she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was and she said that she felt heavy and cold, like she'd fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find her way out and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her through her Ouija board. At this point, I felt thoroughly up against it. Her Ouija board is over a hundred years old, one of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice, but didn't like it much because of my background. I'm Christian and strongly believe in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door to hell. Her board is stored in a closet under the cabin, reachable only by a steep dirt path tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kaylee had been down there, she very nearly fell on a pair of scissors. To put it bluntly, there were very bad vibes and they were strong. So I told her I would deal with it if she agreed to follow my instructions until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was to climb to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift to me from a man I met walking my dog, passed down to him from his German grandmother who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about the crucifix, but that's not for today. I sit her on the couch and hand it to her with the order to hold it in front of her and to not say anything. My father is a pastor and my mother a devout, so I called them. I told my mother what the situation was and she says, you can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board on when I got back. I laid my Bible on it to be ready at hand and put my coat on and looked at the front door. I didn't want to go out. I can't tell you how much I did not want to leave. The board made me uncomfortable on a good day. Now I had to go find it in a closet in the dark by myself with the full knowledge that it was harming my girlfriend. I put on the only headlamp we had, mustered my courage and stepped out. It was dark. There was a slight breeze and the area felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of walking in a heavy wind, but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shuffled down to the embankment to the closet, took a deep, deep breath and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space and I didn't enjoy that. Fortunately for me, the board was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it that I got from the man that gave me the crucifix with the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively place sated. The shawl was super soft and the board said it should be cleaned with a silk cloth before use. Unfortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating everything and didn't want to drop the board or anything. So I was moving slowly and deliberately, but I put my foot down and braced myself from falling over. The second step was the same. I can't really describe it because I didn't feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over. I carefully climbed up the embankment and went back in and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped it, placed my Bible directly between me and it, sat down, put my hands flat on my desk and went for it. I tried to cast out the evil and bind the board with the most powerful, clear and distinct language I could. As soon as I was done speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kaylee if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes and said that she could feel the light again and the feeling of being trapped was gone. 
Now there's one last wrinkle I want to leave you with, and I swear to you, it's true. The night before it all happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran onto a pier through the ocean, through a fence, and the wind and waves were crashing to get to Kaylee, and I carried her back as the storm winds howled and tried to throw us into the sea. When we made land and took shelter, I opened a door into a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s, some earlier. There were about 13, but this was a dream. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from his upper cap and a very haunting look in his eyes. I opened the door and pulled us both out of the room, and that moment was when I woke up. Outside my town, there is an old abandoned orphanage and a memorial for all the children that were abused and passed away. And five of us decided it would be a great idea to go out there and explore it. We scoped the place out during the day to find ways to get in and came back at night at around 11 to 11.30 p.m. We parked a few hundred meters down the road from it, out of sight, just in case of police, and we began walking. We got close to the gate before one of my friends, who was the biggest skeptic adrenaline junkie alive, stops dead in his tracks, turns around and starts sprinting, telling us that he saw someone in front of him. We all start running back towards the car. The entire time, there's rustling from the bushes like someone was following us. We get in the car and I turn around and see two to three figures clear as day standing behind the car watching us drive off. Two girls and a boy, between the ages of 13 and 60. So we decide to forget that and go to the witch's grave. In hindsight, an awful idea, but we were excited to go out and explore. I'm very into pendulum and actually had mine with me. And on the way up was communicating with a spirit that decided to follow us from the orphanage. Her name was Faith. And she was absolutely lovely. Around this time, I started getting a massive headache and my eyes were watering, but thought nothing of it. I started getting really tired and disassociated and fell asleep, or at least I thought I fell asleep. I woke up and it seemed like only five minutes had passed. We were just reaching the town with the grave and one of the guys sitting beside me, Jay, was saying how I was staring out the window the entire time, going into a burst of laughter and I sounded different, and my laugh was different. We pull up to the witch's grave. Jay swears that we saw someone walk past it. We made a Ouija board and wanted to communicate with spirits. I didn't want to get out the car, and neither did Jay. So we sat in the car listening to music while the rest of us sat in front of the grave messing with the board. Music started doing all funky and weird stuff. The radio was acting up, and prior everything was working perfectly. About 15 minutes pass, and Jay decides to get out to see how they're doing. He comes back in, followed by everyone else, seeming a little freaked out, and I asked what was wrong. And my other friend says that Jack was staring behind him. When he goes, he's right behind you. He turned around and went back to the car. Jack had no memory of this, but the rest of the guys backed him up. The music stopped working and we started driving back down the mountain. It got incredibly cold even with the heater on, so I started getting a massive headache behind my head and back of my ears, which is apparently a sign of spiritual attachment. Charlie is driving, Darren is in the passenger seat, and Michael was right with Jay in the middle and I was on the left seat. Jay started tearing up a little bit and went silent before he started laughing. He turned to me very slowly with the biggest grin on his face and just stared. I asked him what he was doing and he never replied. A few minutes later he was himself again. Charlie a few minutes later started spacing out really bad. We were using the pendulum consulting and asking if there were any possible harm coming out this way. In which it violently answered yes and we all yelled for Charlie to pull over. He was refusing but eventually he did. 
and they swapped seats. I blacked out from there. From here I only remember what the guys filled me in on and what happened. So apparently, Charlie joked and said they should use the Ouija board and see what it wants. Upon that, my other friend replied in the most polite and formal tone that they should. Keep in mind that it's also the only thing he said the entire time. And I agreed with him, despite being very against wanting to use the board before. Apparently the three of them all decided it would be the best option to get some sage and burn it away whatever it was that was attached. I'm the only person who owns sage, and upon hearing the mention of it, they said I burst out crying, apologizing and begging for them to not get it, saying that I didn't want to leave. Jay was freaking out, so him and Darren swapped seats. Darren's family is a line of white witches, so apparently he tried his best to bless both Charlie and myself, in which my responses to that were violently pushing him off me, thrashing about repeatedly and saying no, and very coldly and calmly saying, I don't like that. Darren is like one of my best friends, and I hold no ill will against him. So they do the sage. I let them in and flat out refused to touch the sage and stood very far away from it. I got in the car and headed towards the river bank. It was pliant but very slow to follow. They described him to be a zombie, my other friend. I was resisting, hesitating, crying and refusing to follow them. So they practically dragged me along. As soon as the sage was lit, they told me that I bolted and got as far away from it as possible and tried to jump over the edge of the river. They had to grab me and forcibly hold me and drag me in place. They said I was crying violently and that this would be over soon. I wake up. I was on the ground, still being held, with Darren raving the sage around me. Charlie checked on his phone and the first thing he said was, it's only 1am two minutes ago. I felt confused and disoriented and tired. So of course, the best action for all of us was to go home and sleep it off. I stayed with my friends for the night, woke up the next day feeling like I just drank two bottles of vodka and went home. I still felt awful. So I went home, the headache behind my ears, and that still wasn't good. I felt cold despite having no fever and it was a warm day and I was wearing a hoodie. I was hearing knocking noises and footsteps outside my door. I had that heart pain, I was throwing up and my nose was bleeding badly. My friends messaged me saying that there was something wrong. Their mom was concerned about me and they were coming to get me. So I went with them back to theirs. I explained to Jay's mom and dad what happened. Jay's dad, who doesn't really believe in this kind of stuff, but both of them had had paranormal experiences before, told me to go outside and stand on the grass barefoot and ground myself. That kind of worked. My other friend also turned around to stare at the gate because we both heard and saw something, and Jay's mum later confirmed that she saw it too. Ever since then, I see and hear things a hundred times more than I used to, and I always carry obsidian with me. All my life, I've been told I'm special and that I have abilities and to trust my intuition. I always have, and there have been many times where I've encountered supernatural entities. As a toddler, when I would be at my grandparents, I'd spend hours in my grandparents' bedroom in the corner, looking at the window and talking to my deceased great-grandfather Jack. I don't recall what I would talk to him about, but this did scare my family quite a bit, as I knew things from my conversations with him about my family that happened before I was born. This went on for years every time I was at my grandparents' house. When I was around 10, I got up in the middle of the night near Christmas Eve to go to the restroom, and halfway there something caught my eye. I saw the black silhouette of something, or someone, hiding behind the archway. I could see a big beard, and it was taking deep breaths, slowly. I thought it was my father and said, Nice try, I see you. But there was no response. Just the slow, deep and constant breathing from this dark figure with a large beard. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread that made me feel sick 
and I dropped to my knees. Whatever this thing was, it looked malicious, and the energy from it was affecting me physically. I looked back up to confront it, but it was gone. It had vanished, but I was still very physically sick for the next few hours, as its residual energy remained. Sometime later, when I'm 18, I'm in my bedroom, AC off, windows closed. It was a still night, and there was no drafts in my room. I was browsing the internet on my iBook, and all of a sudden I had this pain in my head. It felt as if I'd been hit by something at the back of my head, and started to make me feel the same type of dread that I felt when I saw and felt the entity when I was 10, and also made me feel like I was being watched. I began to look around my room to see if there was anything in it. I couldn't see anything like I did when I was 10, but I could feel it. The level of dread I felt was no way near as intense as when I was 10, and it didn't make me feel weak and physically sick, but it did make me feel ill. I then saw the dream catcher hanging over my window start to move. It moved slowly and gently at first, but then it became faster and more violent. It built up speed, moving back and forth over a few minutes, until it was being so violently moved that it ripped off the wall above the window and flew across the room. After this, the feeling quickly lifted, and I assumed the entity had left. In my early 20s, I encountered the most malicious entity I'd ever felt. I'd moved into a new house, freshly built, and at first, things would be out of place or moved, and I just thought it was me, as I've always been a scatterbrain. The first time I saw it, I was in my ensuite, and I got the most intense chill down my spine, and every single hair on my body stood on end. I didn't feel dread this time. I felt what I can only call pure hatred and rage. There aren't quite words to describe it, but that's as close as I can put into words. That's when I saw it, in the ensuite mirror, that just outside the door, there was the darkest silhouette I've ever seen. It was darker than the darkest night, and it wasn't in an unlit hall. All the lights were on, but it was as if it was absorbing all the light coming near it. I could also see black, tiny orbs floating around it. Due to the rage and fear I was feeling from it, I wasn't scared or sick. I was furious, screaming at it. What do you want? What are you? I picked up a bottle of aftershave and threw it at the entity. It went through it and shattered the mirror behind it as it faded away. Not instantly disappearing in the blink of an eye like my previous experience, no. It just slowly dissipated into nothing. Over the next two years, I continued to randomly see this entity. There'd be months between sightings at least. I'd always see it in only two areas of the house, the kitchen and the ensuite. I'd always feel these feelings of hatred and rage every time, and the chills down my spine would become more intense. I could feel this thing wanting me dead. I tried to communicate with it, but it never would respond or show any sign of wanting to communicate. I'm a pagan, so I tried some rituals to no avail, and as a last resort, I decided to try a spirit board. I performed a protection circle ritual and wore protective crystals and started at 3 a.m. I lit six candles in a circle around me and asked for any spirits with me to speak up through the spirit board. And the planchette started to move. W E C U. The chill returned and all my hair stood on end. After I read that, I was terrified. I looked up and was in shock and couldn't move a muscle. It wasn't just the one pure black entity. There were six of them, side by side watching me. I opened my mouth to ask what they wanted, but before I could make any words out, the candles blew out, and the salt protection circle was blown away in a gust of air breaking it, and I was violently pulled by my feet and dragged out the circle while screaming in terror. The entities weren't touching me, they were watching me. Nothing visible was pulling me. 
I was dragged up my lounge room and towards the garage. And as I was pulled through the garage internal door, I smacked my head on the concrete floor and passed out. When I came to, my head was pounding and my head was bleeding severely. I remember what happened and my flight response kicked in and I got up and ran as fast as I could to the front door. I ripped the door open and got into the car that was on the street and started it before I put it in gear. I looked back and the figures were watching me from the front bedroom window. I put the car in gear and floored it. I never returned and had movers move everything to a new home. The entities didn't follow. There is a spirit in my new home though, but I believe it's my great grandfather. And every now and then I smell the strongest cigarette smoke and I feel loved. I believe he's watching over me in my new house. And I've never experienced anything that's so malicious and plain evil like I did with those six entities. And I knew they wanted me gone. But why? I'll never know. Not that I wish to know. Strange things have been happening in our flat. So for starters, I am a practicing pagan and have been my whole life. I am no stranger to the paranormal. I regularly sage our home or bless it while burning incense. We frequently have windows open, allowing a breeze through to whisk away any negative energy. I have a lot of experience with Ouija and seances. What I'm trying to say is that I'm not new to this kind of thing, but I'll be damned if they don't freak me out. I moved into the flat on the 14th of December 2018, when we came to view the flat. I immediately felt a positive energy. It was like I belonged there with my little one. The energy remained positive for the longest time, and little things happened. For example, I'd put my phone down in the living room, pop up to check on my daughter, come back and my phone would be nowhere. I would spend the next 10 to 15 minutes searching for it everywhere to no avail. Then I'd go back to where I had left it, and you guessed it, right there it would be. Now of course, this could be put down to simple absent-mindedness on my part, but after it happened not only to me but also my fiancé and friends who regularly visit, I'm inclined to believe it's something a bit more. I own a Ouija board, just a cheap little thing. I store the board in the living room, currently on the bookshelf and the planchette in my kitchen with my other witchy bits. It would frequently fall off the bookshelf or the fireplace or the TV shelf, regardless of how it was placed. And of course I have no logical explanation for this. One night after my fiance had moved in, our daughter was at her dad's for the weekend and my mum was over for dinner and we did a seance. My mum and I have conducted and practiced in many seances over the years, so we're not just kids messing about, and I can't stress this enough. We were slow to start, the energy was low, but we soon had something come through, but it was sluggish and easily confused. It was finally able to tell us that it was not alone and that something was stopping it from communicating with us. Whatever was stopping it came through stronger and started asking us to lend it our souls. Nope. After a while without much contact, we closed the seance and saged the crap out of the flat just to be safe. And at first it seemed to have worked, until a few weeks ago when lockdown started. Our little girl frequently gets in bed with us. She's three, and we co-slept until we moved in here when she was nearly two. We have times where she spends most of the night in her bed, but since lockdown began, she wakes up at least two to three times a night, gets in bed with us, as her room is right next door, and there's a light from the bathroom so that it's not too dark, and she's never had a problem walking from her room to ours, often without us even realising she's gone into bed with us. The bedroom doors do not slam, the carpet is too thick at the bottom, and they're fire doors with a chain that causes them to close slowly. We've tried to slam the door to our bedroom. It doesn't slam. This is important. Another important tidbit. My fiance sleeps like they're dead. She never wakes up to our daughter at night. But a couple of weeks into the lockdown, my fiance woke up to our daughter crying and what sounded like a little person's footsteps on the laminate flooring in the hall, but wasn't fully awake until our bedroom door slammed. 
She got out of bed to see where she had gone, and she was in the room, as far away from the bedroom door as she could possibly be. When Little saw my fiance, she shouted that she wanted mummy, and ran straight past her and straight to our room, into bed with me. She's had no history of sleepwalking. The next morning we spoke about what had happened. I had very uncharacteristically slept through the whole thing, up to Little getting into bed with me. This is important to note, as I always wake up every night, and I wasn't especially tired. There's no reason for me not to have woken up like normal, and yet I slept through it. We came to the conclusion that firstly, the door should not have slammed, particularly if my little one had pushed it slightly open to get into bed with us. Secondly, why did she run out of the room instead of just getting into bed with us as usual? And thirdly, why was she cowering in the corner of her bedroom? Another important tidbit, our daughter and my fiance have a wonderful relationship and has zero reason to fear either of us. She's never reprimanded for getting into bed with us or waking up with us. Now this is creepy, but it gets spookier. Later that day, we were all sitting in the living room and our daughter's phone used for Paw Patrol and kids puzzles that was on the fireplace fell rather violently without rhyme or reason. We were all sitting down. Daughter wasn't jumping about. Our neighbors weren't banging on the walls and there was no reason for her phone to have fallen. There have been times where the living room, which stays open when pushed all the way, has randomly slammed with no breeze or anything that might have caused it to close. And then our little one woke up. I went in to soothe her back to sleep. She had kicked her covers off, so I pulled them back over her. Then she woke up again talking about a monster under the bed and asking me if she was safe in her bed. She had a mid-sleeper, so there's space under her bed, but she'd never worried about monsters being under there before. I wanted to share our story and maybe gain some outside perspective on it, and I'll keep anyone updated on what else happens. But I cleansed the flat today, and I'm really hoping it does the trick. In my life, I have neither seen or felt anything I would classify as paranormal. Yet, I do believe it does exist except what I decided to call the window episode and some Ouija tests. Here's my story. It must have been during high school. I was home just after being left alone by my father and brother. So I decided to make something to eat for myself when I heard it. Some rather strong knocks against my window. I assure you I was convinced my father or brother were back to get something that they must have forgotten and just warned me of their presence. There had to be someone around the window, but there was nothing, no one. I checked all the windows in the house, but still nothing. So I just freezed for a few seconds, not understanding what happened. Was it bugs? Is it impossible for an insect to cause such a loud noise multiple times? Birds, perhaps? The wind? In any case, could it have been the neighbors? But then again, they live on the opposite side of where my brain has located the sound, and I have definitely recognized the noise that my windows could produce. I had thought about this during at least more than one year, searching for any explanation, but there was still none. But there are two elements drawing my attention in this episode. First, I heard the noise a bit after being left alone, as if the thing that caused the noise was heading towards me and just waiting for me to be alone. And I recently noticed that the window episode concedes with the period where I made a Ouija with friends. It wasn't a very troubling experience. The glass was moving, forming more or less credible answers, that's all. But if the window noise is linked to my Ouija experience, I admit it's a bit more troubling. I have to talk about this with my friends. I have to talk about this with the friends I made the Ouija with. None of them gave me any other explanation, and I haven't told my family this. Not even sure if they take it seriously. When I was in my senior year of high school, one of my friends had a Ouija board that we would play with often. One night we decided to play the Ouija board at the cemetery because we wanted to see what would happen. We believed in the paranormal to some extent, but we were also skeptical. We just wanted to have a good time and 
hopefully get spooked. We specifically liked this cemetery because it was the easiest to sneak into. Its fence was a very low short wall that you could hop over. There were recently dug places for new burials that were going to happen. We played a few times and spoke to some ghosts, nothing really scary or weird. We asked them if they were alone when they died, what their names were, etc. While playing, we started sensing this really awful smell, like rotten eggs and dead animal. We looked around and assumed it was coming from the holes that were freshly dug. We eventually left it because we got bored and the smell was gross. When we got in the car, we took off our shoes and started to sanitize our hands. That smell suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It was very strong. It smelled like death. We kept putting hand sanitizer on our hands, and when we would sniff them, it still smelled like it. After realizing the smell would not leave our hands, we all of a sudden got a chill and began screaming. We were all screaming inside my friend's car like girls from a horror movie. We finally calmed down and my friend turned on the engine and we bolted. We eventually started laughing because the whole ordeal was pretty funny and we got what we wanted. But we'll never forget the smell and how it wouldn't leave us be. And there we have it everyone. I hope you have enjoyed tonight's collection of scary stories. It has been probably the longest episode I've ever done and I truly hope you got some enjoyment out of it. If there's anyone listening who has sat through the whole 24 hours, that is insane, and I salute you. You deserve a medal, some token of your commitment to spooky stories. Anyway, that's it from me. If you'd like more stories, you can find a link on screen. Until next time.